Sound off for Chesterfield. Chesterfield, the only cigarette in America to give you premium quality in both regular and king size, brings you Dragnet. Ladies and gentlemen, the story you are about to hear is true. The names have been changed to protect the innocent. You're a detective sergeant. You're assigned to forgery detail. A check forger has been hitting the merchants in your city. From the M.O. she uses, you know she's an expert. You've got a description. Your job, get her. There's only one premium quality cigarette in America, available in both regular and king size, and that is Chesterfield. Premium quality in a cigarette means the world's best tobaccos, the best ingredients, the best cigarette paper. Only Chesterfield gives you this premium quality in both popular sizes. King size Chesterfield contains tobaccos of better quality and higher price than any other king size cigarette. That's certainly important to every king-size smoker. Of course, it's the same fine tobacco as in regular Chesterfield. There is absolutely no difference, except that king-size Chesterfield is larger, contains so much more of these premium-quality tobaccos that you get more than a fifth longer smoke from king-size Chesterfield. Yes, the modern way to sell cigarettes is the Chesterfield way. Premium quality. Both regular and king size. And either way you like them, Chesterfields are much milder. Chesterfield is best for you. Dragnet, the documented drama of an actual crime. For the next 30 minutes, in cooperation with the Los Angeles Police Department, you will travel step by step on the side of the law through an actual case transcribed from official police files. From beginning to end, from crime to punishment, Dragnet is the story of your police force in action. It was Wednesday, February 6th. It was cool in Los Angeles. We were working the day watch out of forgery detail. My partner's Frank Smith. The boss is Captain Welsh. My name's Friday. I was on my way back from the forgery office, and it was 10.22 a.m. when I got to the mug room. I'm sure about it, officer. If I ever see that woman again, I'll know her. Don't you have any doubt about it? I'll know her. Yes, ma'am. Now, if you'll just look through this book, please. Have you seen anyone who might be the woman, Miss Parkinson? No, not yet, Sergeant. But if she's got her picture in here, I'll find it for you. Never forget that face. So sweet and kind. They sort of reminded me of my mother, rest her soul. I think that's why I cashed the check for her. I never would have done it if there hadn't been something like that. Yes, ma'am. I wonder if you'd mind running over it again for us. Might have been something you forgot, maybe. No, no, no. I wouldn't forget anything about her, but I can tell you about it if you'd like. All right, fine, Miss Parkinson. If you just start at the beginning again. Fine. Would you mind calling me Ethel? I don't much care for formality. Feel better when people call me by my given name. Yes, ma'am. If you go right ahead, please. Well, this morning's when I found out about it. Like to keeled right over when the check came back from the bank. Opened up the other mail, mostly from people who want to sell me things for the store, and there it was. Letter from the bank with a check inside. Stapled to one of those forms. You know, the kind they just checked with a pencil. Uh-huh. Well, like I said, there it was. Place that was checked said the account was unknown. Well, you can just bet I got on the phone and called the bank people. Yes, ma'am, I understand. I told them they'd made some sort of mistake, that they'd better set it right. I was so sure that she wouldn't do a thing like this. Well, you know how banks are. They said they'd check it for me, and I waited on the phone while they did. And they said it wasn't any mistake. Well, you can just bet that I was hopping mad. Yeah, well, what kind of identification did the woman use to get you to cash the check? Well, she had several letters from her son. At least that's who she said they were from. I just bet she hasn't even got a son. Well, sir, I'll bet she hasn't. Well, do you usually cash checks with that little identification? No, I don't as a rule. I usually ask for a driver's license and a social security card. I figure that if a person's got one of those, that means that he's working. I figures that the check is good. Mm-hmm. Well, that's not always true, you know, ma'am. You don't I know it now? You just bet I do. Last time I'll cash a check for anyone that I haven't known for ten years. Mm-hmm. Had you seen this woman around your store before this time? I've been trying to think about that. The shop isn't very big, but we do a pretty good business. Sometimes there are several people waiting. Get in a hurry, you know, and you aren't sure who you talk to. Yes, ma'am. Seems to me I've seen her in the store before, but when I stop and really think about it, I'm not too sure. You know how that is? Yes, ma'am, I do. But when you boil it right down, I don't think I have seen her before. She just had one of those faces that you figure sure you know. Looked like such a lovely person. I see. About how old do you figure she was, ma'am? Well, like I said, I guess about 62, maybe a little older. Uh-huh. Might have been 65. Not much over that, though. Such pretty hair. Pure white had it fixed in a real soft wave over her forehead. Old-fashioned kind of. Wore it in a bun, you know. Ma'am? Bun. Had the hair all rolled up and then pinned up back. Here. 
Back of her neck. And it was so white, you say? The hair was white. Yes. L looks so nice to see a woman act and look her age. So many of them try to look younger, you know. Yes, ma'am. How about her clothes? Oh, she was well-dressed. Had a sort of uh, teal blue suit on, a black coat. Looked kind of like it might have been cashmere. Looked real nice. Little string gloves and all. You say she was a small woman. Is that right? Yes, yeah, she was little. Stood mm -hmm. real straight, you know, shoulders back. But she was a little one, not more than five foot one or maybe two. Mm -hmm. Would she be slight or heavy? Big pardon? Well, how much would you say she weighed? Well, maybe a hundred pounds. Say she wasn't much heavier than that. No, sir, a hundred pounds. Was there anything unusual about her, anything that might make her stand out? No, no, I don't think so, except maybe it was the perfume. Ma'am? Perfume, you know, how you kind of expect a little old lady to wear something kind of mild like violet, maybe. Some light. Yes, ma'am. Well, she had a real heavy perfume on. Smelled kind of like a French scent. Real heavy, like I said. It was one thing I couldn't figure out. What's that, ma'am? Well, she did have nice clothes and all, but all in all, she didn't look like she had a lot of money. Just moderate, you know? Mm-hmm. Well, that perfume must have been expensive. Must have cost a lot. Well, I guess she's making enough to afford it, ma'am. 10.34 a.m. Mrs. Parkinson continued to look through the mug books. She was unable to identify the woman who had passed the bad check. The merchants of the city had been victimized for the past three weeks by a forger. All of them described her as a kindly old lady using letters from her son in the east as identification. Frank and I had run the description we'd gotten through R&I with no result. The stats office had made several runs on the M.O., and all leads furnished by them had been checked out, but they let us nowhere. We'd obtained copies of the forged checks, and they'd been processed by Don Meyer in handwriting, but he'd been unable to offer us any new information. The names on each of the checks were different. We checked each of them out, but the leads went nowhere. All of the stores in the central area had been alerted. Descriptions had been distributed to the neighborhood merchants, but the check passing continued. We checked with our informants, but they failed to come up with any information. Two weeks passed. The woman hit 12 more times. Her take was estimated to be over $2,500. The checks she passed were always for the same amount, $50. When it seemed necessary, she would purchase merchandise in order to cash the check. The articles she chose were in a price range so that the store owner would often cash the check rather than lose the sale. Thursday, February 21st, 8.34 a.m. Frank and I got back to the office. I'll get it. Forgery, Friday. Yeah. All right, where? How soon? All right. No, we'll see you there. What is it? Harry Allenson. Informant? Yeah, says he wants to see us right away. Yeah. Says he knows the woman we're looking for. The working detective knows that he's usually only as good as his informants. Quite often, when all other means of bringing a case to a successful conclusion have failed, the only thing that'll break it is information supplied by an informant. A detective will protect his informant. For as long as the informant can operate, the detective is assured of a steady flow of information. 9.45 a.m., Frank and I drove over to the coffee shop at the corner of Crawford and Spring Streets. Harry Allenson wasn't there when we arrived. We sat down and ordered a cup of coffee. Oh, that's good and hot. Yeah, it is. Hey, pass the sugar, will you, Joe? Yeah. There you go. Thanks. Okay. I wonder where Allenson is. What time did he say he'd be here? 9.45. Well, it's only a couple of minutes after that now. He'll be here. Yeah. I wonder how right his story is. What did he tell you on the phone? Well, nothing, just that he knew what we were looking for. Said if we'd meet him here, he'd fill us in. There he is. Oh, yeah. All righty, Smith. Harry? Sit down. Yeah. Sorry, I'm late. Got hung up in traffic. Oh, you got a car now, Harry? No, I missed my street car. Had to wait for another. Mm -hmm. Say, uh, you guys had breakfast yet? Yeah, we did a little earlier. You mind if I have something to eat? No, go ahead. Where's the waitress? Well, she was here a minute ago. I don't see her now. I'll go get her myself. Sure you guys don't want anything to eat? No, no, thanks. Just the same, Harry. Okay, be right back. Well, here we go again, Joe. Yep. Last time we met him, his meal cost two fifty. How much dough you got on you? Oh, I got a couple of bucks. How are you fixed? Well, not much better. Let's hope he doesn't order too much, though. How about some more coffee for you guys? No, no thanks, Harry. Uh, Chow will be up in a minute. All right, how about this information, Harry, about the paper hanger? Oh, yeah. Funny the way I got it. That right? Yeah, I was up in Jack's bar last night. You know, just having a beer, shooting the breeze. All of a sudden, this old girl comes into place. Kind of set everybody back on their heels. Looks so nice. Yeah, go ahead. Well, she slides up on one of the stools and orders a drink. Even Jack was taken in. Changed his apron and all. Anyway, she climbs up on the stool and orders some sherry. Made a big thing of it. What do you mean? Well, Jack started to pour some of it for her, and she stopped him. Said that she wanted California sherry. Said she didn't want any of that imported stuff. Said her family was one of the first ones in the state and that she believed in using homegrown products. She was kind of cute about it. Real little woman perched up on that stool. Looked a little like a cartoon. 
You know, the ones with the little old lady guzzling martini. Yeah. Uh -huh. Oh, say, hold on a minute, will you? My food's ready. Be right back. Okay, here. How do you like that guy? Takes him five hours to get a point over. Well, there's nothing you can do about it, Frank. He's got to tell it his way. Well, I suppose so. Uh, nothing like a big breakfast. I always say, if you stoke up in the morning, you got it made for the day. Yeah, that's right, Harry. Farm breakfast, they call this. I tell you, that's eating. Oh, look at that sausage. Fried real good. I like it when it's like a rock. Can't stand pork that hasn't been cooked enough. Yeah. You want to go on with the story? Oh, yeah. Uh, don't mind if I eat, do you? Got a big day today. A lot of things to do. No, you go right ahead, Harry. All right. Well, like I said, this old broad ordered the sherry. Uh-huh. Well, time went on. She must have had three or four of them. Yeah. A couple other guys came in, and I moved over to make room for them. I ended up sitting right next to the woman. Oh. Say, pass the ketchup, will you? Oh, yeah. There you go. Eggs aren't much good without a lot of ketchup. Gives them real flavor. Yeah. Harry, could you get the point maybe a little sooner? Oh. Well... First off, I noticed this perfume this broad's wearing. Well, now I tell you, it's been a long time since I smelled anything like that. Real heavy. Like the stuff they sell in France. Yeah. Didn't fit the woman. No, sir, didn't seem to go with the rest of her. I tried to strike up a conversation, you know, talked about the weather, stuff like that, but she wouldn't have none of it. She didn't actually tell me, but I could tell the way she answered me, you know, kind of cool. What makes you think she might be the one we're looking for? The way she looked. The way she worked. What do you mean, the way she worked? Well, huh? I'm getting to it. Anyway, after she's had the sherry, she reached into her purse to pay for him. Almost around in it for a while. Well, I couldn't help seeing what was in it, you know, what was sitting right next to her and all. Yeah, sure. Well, she don't come up with any money. And she starts going through her pockets. Still can't find any money. Finally, she asked Jack. Who's that, the bartender? Yeah, yeah, Jack. He owns the place. She asked him if he'll cash a check. Yeah. Well, now I asked you. Either one of you guys know Jack? No, I don't think we do, Harry. No, I don't. Well, Jack wouldn't cash a check for the treasurer of the country. Not even if he had the president to vouch for him. Been stung too many times. Yeah. Well, this old gal gets to him, see? I can see him start to go. He kind of hems and haws around all the time. He's trying to figure out a nice way to say no to her. Mm -hmm. Finally, he just ups and says it. Well, right after he kind of waits and expects her to tell him off for being so mean to somebody like her, but she doesn't. Just kind of hunches her shoulders and then starts digging in her purse again. Takes everything out, puts it on the bar. Yeah. Well... It happens that her driver's license is lying right there on the bar in front of me. Couldn't help but read it, you know. Yeah, we know. Well, I saw her name. And I asked her if she let me buy the wine for it. Mm-hmm. What'd she say to that? Well, when I called her by name, she acted kind of startled like she didn't expect it. And then she kind of smiled and said she was financially embarrassed at the moment. Something about coming away from the house without any money. But she said she thought it'd be very sweet of me if I'd take care of the tab. So I paid Jack the money and, and I asked her if she'd like another one. Uh, she said she didn't think so, and then she got all her stuff together and put it back into her purse and thanks me. Then she got up and left. Yeah, well, what was the name on the driver's license? Do you remember that? Yeah, yeah. Got it written down here someplace. After she left, Jack and me got to talking about her, and then it hit me that she might be the one you're looking for. So I jotted down the name. You ever see this woman before, Harry? No, never laid eyes on her before she walked into Jack's last night. Now, here it is. Mm -hmm, thanks. Yeah, that's the name at the top of the paper. Right under, that's her address. The name on the piece of paper was Lillian Halstead. It was a new name in the case. It gave an address out near Bel Air. Frank and I called the name into R&I, but they had no record on anyone answering that description. We paid the check and thanked Harry Allenson for the information, and then we drove out to the address. It was a large house just off Sunset Boulevard. Mrs. Halstead wasn't in, but the maid told us that we'd find her husband at the Halstead School of Dramatic Arts. She gave us the address, and Frank and I drove out to the school. It was located in a large modern building out on Wilshire Boulevard. When we got there, Mr. Halstead was working with the advanced class in the drama section. We took a seat at the rear of the auditorium and waited for him to finish. Uh, you gentlemen wish to see me? Uh, yes, sir. You're Mr. Halstead, are you? That's correct. Police officer, sir. This is my partner, Frank Smith. My name's Friday. Uh, how do you do? I do. Uh, uh, what is it that you'd like to see me about? Well, can you tell us where your wife is, sir? Lillian? Yes. Well, she's out of town. Why? What do you want with her? I wonder if you could describe her for us. Why, well, certainly, I... Uh... I don't understand what this is all about, though. Well, it's just a routine investigation. Routine? What's that mean? Well, just that we're conducting an investigation and a woman with the same name as your wife came up. We're just checking it out. Now, if you could give us a description of your wife, please. Yes, well, let me see. Um, Lillian's 36. Yes, I, I would say she's um, uh, five feet six and one half inches. Uh, weighs perhaps uh, 130 pounds. Mm-hmm. What color is her hair, Mr. Halstead? Well, before she left, it was sort of an auburn. 
Lillian said something about dying at red. Uh, might have done it since she's been gone. Where's your wife now? She's back in Washington. They're holding a drama festival, and she's back there looking it over. Do you have a picture of your wife here, Mr. Halstead? Yes, sir. I have one on my desk in the office. What if we take a look at it? Why, certainly. Uh, you can go out this way. Fine, thank you. Uh, here, down this way, please. Thank you. Uh, you tell me what this investigation is that you're working on. Well, no, sir, not right now. We can't. Oh, you can. Uh, cloak and dagger stuff, eh? No, sir, it's not exactly that. Oh, here, I'll get the door for you. Thank you. Yes, sir, right this way. Excuse me a moment. All right, here. Here's the picture. Lovely woman. Been a great help here at the school. Yes, sir. How long ago was this picture taken? Mm, several months ago, I believe. Now, Mr. Halstead, how long has your wife been out of town? Mm, perhaps a week. Ten days, perhaps. Or something like that. Mm -hmm. Does your wife drive a car, Mr. Halstead? Yes, sir, she does. Oh, I understand. The license. Sir? Lillian's driver's license. That's what you hear about, isn't it? Well, I don't understand, sir. <laughs> oh, you don't have to be cagey with me. Lillian lost her driver's license some time ago, asked me to get her a new one. I didn't quite get a chance to do it. You found it. Uh, that's it, isn't it? No, sir, that's not. We think your wife's license has been used as identification by some check forger. Do you happen to know where your wife might have lost the license? Why, no, we, we don't know exactly. It must have been about uh, three months ago. Uh, she says that she dropped it here at the school, but I've looked all over for it, haven't been able to find it. I, I think she just left it someplace. She's terribly careless about things like that. Yes, sir. Uh, is this about the old woman that's been forging the checks? Well, why do you ask that, sir? Well, that's another thing that I've been meaning to call you about. I was reading the paper one night, and all of a sudden it hit me. Sir? Well, I could be wrong, but I think I know the girl who's doing this. You are listening to Dragnet, the authentic story of your police force in action. The modern way to sell cigarettes is the Chesterfield way. Premium quality in both regular and king size. And we're the only one that does it. We tell you what Chesterfields are made of to give you that premium quality in both popular sizes. Our scientists select the best materials. They select for Chesterfield the world's best tobaccos. Blend them just right. And they keep Chesterfields tasty and fresh with the best of moistening agents. Now here's something else that's completely modern about Chesterfields. People smoke Chesterfield, and we tell you what happens. Scientifically, but simply. A medical specialist is making regular bi-monthly examinations of a group of people from various walks of life. Forty-five percent of this group have smoked Chesterfield for an average of over ten years. After eight months, the medical specialist reports that he observed no adverse effects on the nose, throat, and sinuses of the group from smoking Chesterfield. Well, I'd say that means real mildness. And finally, we ask you to try Chesterfield and prove what we say. Chesterfield is best for you. They're much milder to give you all the pleasure that the modern cigarette can give. Two thirty-seven p.m. We ran the name Bert Halstead through R and I, but we got no make on anyone answering his description. Halstead told us that he thought we might be looking for a girl he identified as Peggy Small. He told us that the small girl had enrolled in the dramatic school over a year before. We asked him if he had a picture of her that we could have. And he told us that he thought there was one in the files. He took us down the hall to the registration office and checked his files. He located a picture of the girl and handed it to Frank. Well, just why do you think this might be the girl we're looking for, Mr. Halstead? Well, it's the oddest thing, officer. Peggy. Oh, that's Miss Small. Yes, sir. Well, Peggy came to us about a year ago, as I said. She came out here to the coast from some little town in Idaho, I think it was. I'd have to check her entrance application to be sure, but I think it was Idaho. Yes, sir. Well, instantly I knew that this girl had talent, real talent, deep down, talent. Right off the bat, she had the feel. Would have been a fine character actress. Well, why do you say would have? She didn't want to work wasn't interested in anything but learning how to be an old woman. Sir? All she was interested in was learning to act like a little old woman. Huh. Now, we have a theory here at Halstead. Don't act, live. She did just that. Learned the makeup problems, dress, walk, everything. 
She even used to practice writing like a woman of 60 or so. I used to see her practicing by the hour. Did she ever give you any reason for all this? No. I asked her once, but she said that this was the way she wanted it. Now, I thought that she was trying to tell me to keep my nose out of her affairs in a nice way, so I didn't ask her again. Mm -hmm. Now, we have presentations here, you know, each term the class presents a play that's been written and produced by the students themselves. Yes, sir. Uh, Peggy would always do the oldest female part in them. Never was interested in anything else. She had several good offers, but for some reason she did not take them. What do you mean by that, sir? Well, one night a talent scout from one of the majors came out to see our play. Well, he was quite... Majors, oh, the studio. Uh, he was quite impressed with Peggy, offered her a term contract, good money. She'd have done well, but she just was not interested. I just can't understand it. Well, do you know where she is now? No, officer, I haven't seen Peggy since she left here. That was about um, four months ago. I wonder if you could tell us where she lived when she was enrolled here. Certainly. I have the address on her enrollment card. Well, that's fine. We'd like to have the names and addresses of any of her close friends, too, if we could. Oh, certainly glad to help. You think it could be her, Peggy, the woman you're looking for? Well, it could be, yes, sir. Odd. Now, I got to thinking about it when I read about it in the papers. Right away, it made me think of Peggy. How she used to talk about acting. Well, how's that, sir? Well, she used to always say there was only one reason for doing anything, and that was to come out on it. That was the trouble with most people. <laughs> they just didn't know where they wanted to end up. But she knew where she was going. Well, maybe she was right. I beg your pardon? She's the one we're looking for. We know, too. Three twelve p.m. We got Peggy Small's address from Mr. Halstead, and then we went back to the office. We ran the name through R&I, but there was no record on the girl. 4.02 p.m. Frank and I drove out to the last known address of the small girl. It was a boarding house on 92nd Street. Peggy Small wasn't in, but the landlady told us that she usually didn't get back from work until 7 or 7.30. We asked if she knew where the girl worked, but she told us that she didn't. We arranged for a stakeout on the house, and at 4.37 p.m., we checked back into the office. You want to check the book? Right. Anything? I don't think so. There's a call from Faye. She wants to know if I'll be home for dinner. I better give her a call, Joe. Mm-hmm. Faye's getting a little hacked at me. Oh, is that so? Yeah. Last three nights she's waited dinner for me and I didn't make it. Mm-hmm. Hello, honey. Yeah. Well, I don't know yet. Uh, yeah. I don't I think so. I know, I know. Well, maybe another hour or so I'll know. Yeah. Okay, honey. Bye. If I don't make it tonight, she's going to scout me. I get it. Forgery Friday. Yes, ma'am. What's that address again? All right. Yes, ma'am. We'll be right there. Well, your dinner's going to have to wait again. Why? Dry goods store out on Main. Forger's there now. In the process of the investigation, the police department had alerted the merchants throughout the city to the method of operation of the woman forger. Thousands of printed circulars had been distributed bearing her description. An artist's conception of the woman had been published in the daily papers, and the drawing had also been broadcast over the local television stations. The clerk in the store we'd gotten the call from had noticed a similarity between a woman waiting to cash a check and the description. From the information we'd gotten on the hot shot, the woman was waiting for an authorization for the check. When Frank and I got to the store, we met a small elderly woman. She produced identification in the form of a driver's license bearing the name Lillian Halstead. Frank and I asked her to go with us to the city hall for questioning. A policewoman was called and the interrogation started. One look at her and you could see that she was covered with a heavy makeup. I want you gentlemen to know that I resent the implication you're making. The idea of trying to make me out a vicious criminal. Ma'am, we're not trying to embarrass you. We just want to get to the truth here. I'm giving you that. I'm telling you what you want to know. All right, now let's get it over with. What's your name? Lillian Halstead. Is this your driver's license? Yes, it is. Then the thumbprint on it should be yours too, is that right? I'd imagine so, yes. Well, then suppose we go down the hall and take your fingerprints and compare it, huh? Now you look here, young man. I know my rights. You're not dealing with some little schoolgirl this time. I lived a long time, and I know just exactly what you can do and what you can't do. I know, for instance, that you can't take my fingerprints unless you want to arrest me for something. 
If you want to make a fool out of yourself to that extent, then you go right ahead and do it. And mark this well, young man. I'll sue you for every nickel you own. I'll let the papers know about this. They'd love to know how you treat old women. They'd just love to know. You ever been mistreated in any way, ma'am? No, and I don't intend to be. There's a man on the way down here, a man by the name of Halstead. Wife's name is Lillian Halstead. That driver's license we found in your purse, the one you claim is yours, that's registered to his wife. He's coming down here to tell us that you aren't his wife, that you stole that license, that you were a student in his dramatic school. Now, why don't you save us all a lot of trouble here? Why don't you admit that you're the woman we're looking for, that you're Peggy Small, you're no old woman? Come on, how about it, Miss Small? All right, I lose. Guess I should have known. Mind if I take this wig off? It's kind of warm in here. Well, we've been kind of waiting for it. Go right ahead. It was a good rack while it lasted. Crummy driver's license. I was doing all right as long as I used the letters. They should have been good enough for me. I should have known. What'd you do with the money? I've got it all. Every last nickel of it. I almost had enough, too. Enough for what? Leave this lousy town. Get out of here. Go back east, New York. A couple more pieces of paper and I'd had it made. Could have left. Almost showed them. Showed them good. Ma'am? Phony town. Months I pounded on doors, talking to agents, casting directors, talking to anybody who'd listen to me, trying to get a job, trying to get a break in pictures. None of them would talk to me. Wouldn't even see me. This phony town. Yes, ma'am. They wanted character women. Didn't want any young women, character women. That's what they wanted. But I got to be the best of them. They didn't want me the way I am. I didn't want to work any other way, none. Had you fooled, didn't I? Had the whole town fooled. All of them. The phony place. I was going back east, back to New York. They know talent back there. They recognize it. They know whether you're real there or whether you're just a phony. They know it there. Yes, ma'am. We know it here, too. <laughs> The story you have just heard was true. The names were changed to protect the innocent. On June 19th, trial was held in Department 89, Superior Court of the State of California, in and for the County of Los Angeles. In a moment, the results of that trial. Now, here is our star, Jack Webb. Thank you, George Fenneman. Friends, only the modern cigarette, Chesterfield, gives you this scientific evidence on the effects of smoking. No adverse effects on the nose, throat, and sinuses of the group from smoking Chesterfields. And only the modern cigarette, Chesterfield, gives you premium quality in both regular and king size. Now, I know Chesterfield is best for me and best for you. Buy them, regular or king size. Either way, they're much milder to give you all the pleasure the modern cigarette can give. Peggy Janice Small was tried and convicted of forgery ten counts. She was sentenced to the California Institution for Women at Corona, California, for the term prescribed by law. Forgery is punishable by imprisonment for a period of from 1 to 14 years in the state penitentiary. You have just heard Dragnet, a series of authentic cases from official files. Technical advice comes from the office of Chief of Police, W.H. Parker, Los Angeles Police Department. Technical advisors, Captain Jack Donahoe, Sergeant Marty Wynn, Sergeant Vance Brasher. Heard tonight were Ben Alexander, June Whitley, Jack Crucian, Gene Tatum. Script by John Robinson. Music by Walter Schumann. Hal Gibney speaking. Sound off for Chesterfield. Either way you like them, regular or king size you'll find premium quality Chesterfields much milder. Chesterfield has brought you Dragnet transcribed from Los Angeles. Tonight it's Adventure with Barry Craig, Confidential Investigator on NBC. For Chesterfield. Chesterfield, the only cigarette in America to give you premium quality in both regular and king size, brings you Dragnet. Ladies and gentlemen, the story you are about to hear is true. 
The names have been changed to protect the innocent. You're a detective sergeant. You're assigned a homicide detail. A man walks into your office and tells you he returned to his home to find that his wife was gone. She left no indication where she was going. Foul play is suspected. Your job, find her. The modern way to sell cigarettes is the Chesterfield way. Premium quality in both regular and king size. And we're the only one that does it. Premium quality in a cigarette means the world's best tobaccos, the best ingredients, the best cigarette paper. Only Chesterfield gives you this premium quality in both popular sizes. King size Chesterfield contains tobaccos of better quality and higher price than any other king size cigarette. That's certainly important to every king size smoker. Of course, it's the same fine tobacco as in regular Chesterfield. There is absolutely no difference except that king size Chesterfield gives you more than a fifth longer smoke. Yes, the modern way to sell cigarettes is the Chesterfield way. Premium quality, both regular and king size. Chesterfield is much milder. Chesterfield is best for you. Dragnet, the documented drama of an actual crime. For the next 30 minutes, in cooperation with the Los Angeles Police Department... You will travel step by step on the side of the law through an actual case transcribed from official police files. From beginning to end, from crime to punishment, Dragnet is the story of your police force in action. It was Tuesday, July 7th. It was hot in Los Angeles. We were working the night watch out of homicide detail. My partner's Frank Smith. The boss is Thad Brown, chief of detectives. My name's Friday. I was on my way into work, and it was 4.58 p.m. when I got to room 42. Homicide. Joe, is that you? Yeah. Been here long? No, I just got in. Sure a beautiful day, isn't it? Yeah, summer's really here, isn't it? This daylight saving time makes a difference. Got a lot more time, seems like. Made me think about my vacation. Well, you're doing a couple of weeks, aren't you? Yeah, first part of August. Mm-hmm. Figured out where you're going yet? Yeah, Faye and I talked it out. You know, Joe? Oh, what's that? I think maybe I had Armin figured wrong. Armin? That's your brother-in-law? Yeah. Mm-hmm. This year, Faye and I got to talking where we're going to spend the vacation. Faye wants to go up to Big Bear. I'm saying Mexico. Yeah. You know, I figure a little fishing. I hear the yellows are hitting pretty good. The what? Yellowtails. Oh, yeah. You don't fish much. No, do you, I don't yellow. fish at all. You know. Well, they're supposed to be hitting pretty good, but Faye can't see Mexico. And oh. darn if old Armin doesn't chime in and say he thinks Mexico's a great idea. Well, that's swell. Yeah. Tells Faye all about the beaches down there and how good the food is, all about the air, healthy. You know, really sells her. So that's where you're going, huh? No, Faye didn't buy it going to the mountains. Well, fishing's supposed to be pretty good up there, too, isn't it? That's what I read, I guess. I, I suppose so, but... Oh, Larman, how do you like that guy? He sure surprised me. Yeah, maybe he's going to work out, huh? <laughs> yeah. I'll get it. Okay. Homicide Friday. Yes, sir, it is. I beg your pardon. Could you talk a little louder? Yes, sir. Uh-huh. Yes, sir. Well, when was that? I see. When? Yes, sir. What was that address again? All right, I have it. Yes. Yes, sir, that's right. We'll be right out. Right. Bye. Well, we got one to roll on. Kidnapping out in Hollywood. The man on the phone gave his name as Henry Wagner. He said that he'd come home from work and found that his wife was gone. He said on the phone that he'd found a note demanding ransom and cautioning him against calling the police. 5.22 p.m. Frank and I arrived at the house on Temple Hill Avenue. We parked the car down the street from the house and went up to the front door. Frank would remain in the car for a few minutes and then follow. In that way, if the kidnappers were watching the house, they wouldn't be as likely to know that we were working on the case. I rang the bell and waited. Yes, you're the police? Yes, sir, that's right. My name's Friday. Oh, hello. Come in, please, quickly. I don't want them to see you. Who's them, sir? The kidnappers. They might be watching. I don't know what I'm going to do. Terrible thing to have happen. Just doesn't make sense. All right, now, sir, if you just try to calm down and tell me what happened here, we're going to start right from the beginning. All right. I got home from school about 4.30. Myra wasn't here. I looked for the house for her, figured, like you said on the phone, that she might have gone to the store. Uh When I couldn't find her, I started looking for a note. That's when I found the ransom demand right there on the coffee table. And you said you got home from school, is that it? Yes, I teach political science at the university. Well, when did you last see your wife? When I left this morning, about 7.30. I have a class at 8. Have you talked to her since? 
Yes, I called her about 1.15. Did everything seem all right then? I mean, did she seem to be upset, anything like that? No, no, everything seemed to be normal. Did she say if there was anyone with her when you talked to her? No, if there was, she didn't give any indication of it. I see. I know that this isn't a hoax, if that's what you're thinking. I know that Myra wouldn't do a thing like this. She's a serious woman. I guess you might say that she had a rather dull sense of humor. No, I know that she wouldn't do a thing like this as a joke. Well, no, sir, it's not that. I'm just trying to get all the facts here. I wonder if I could see the note. Yes, I left it over here on the desk. That'll be my partner. I'll let him in if it's all right. Uh, Mr. Wagner, it's my partner, Frank Smith. How do you Hello, do, Mr. sir? Wagner. How do you do? I'll get the note. Well, I'd rather you wouldn't handle it anymore, sir. Oh, all right. You going to try to get some fingerprints from it? Is that right? Well, that's the idea, yes, sir. You read it, Joe? Yeah, it's made up of newsprint. It's been cut out of the paper. Looks like one of the morning papers. Yeah. I'll read it to you. It says, put $10,000 in fives, tens, and twenties in the shoebox. Make sure the bills are unmarked. On July 8th, drive up Deer Canyon Drive at 10.30 p.m., five miles past the turnoff. You'll see a white string across the road. Drop the shoebox out of the car, go on back home. Your wife will be returned. Don't tell the cops. If you tell anybody, we'll kill your wife. Deer Canyon Drive. Yeah, you know, that's up above Laurel. Oh, yeah. $10,000. Do you have that kind of money, Mr. Wagner? No, sir. I don't know how I'm going to raise it. I have to, but I don't know how I'm going to do it. Have you noticed anyone lately that's been in the neighborhood here? I mean, anybody loitering around without any reason to be here? No, I haven't. Of course, you must understand I'm not home a great deal. But Myra didn't say anything about it. I'm sure she would have if she'd seen anybody like that. You and your wife have any enemies that do a thing like this, would you know? None that I can think of. Do you have any household help? I beg pardon? Household help. Anyone that comes in to help your wife with the housework. You know, a day maid, something like that. Well, there's Betty Jo. She comes in once a week to clean up the house. When was she last here? Let me see. That was Saturday. That's her usual day. Saturday, I I guess it was then. Didn't you see her last week? No. You see, I had to go out by Pomona this last weekend. Series of lectures I wanted to catch. I left early Saturday morning, didn't get back until late that night. Did your wife go with you? No, she stayed at home. She had a little touch of the virus and figured she'd better stay at home and take care of it. Are you sure this is the right thing to do? Maybe I should have handled this myself. No, sir, you did the right thing. I wonder if you could give us a description of your wife, Mr. Wagner. Why? You aren't going to tell anyone else about this, are you? No, sir. The information will be handled in the usual confidential manner. Oh. Well, I guess you men know what you're doing. All right, sir, if you'd just give us a description, if you could... Well, Myra is about five feet three. I guess she weighs about 130 pounds. Mm-hmm. How old is she, sir? 42. Just turned 42. Birthday last month, June 14th. How about the color of her hair? Sort of an auburn, I guess you'd call it. A little, little gray up in here, along the sides. Mm-hmm. Would you know what she was wearing? No, I wouldn't have the slightest idea. I don't know her clothes well enough to be able to look at what's in her closet and tell you what she had on. Mm-hmm. How about Mark's? I don't think I understand. I'm sorry. I mean, any visible birthmarks or scars, anything that might make it easier to identify her? No, I don't think so. Oh, wait a minute. There's a very small scar just under her ear right here. Mm -hmm. A couple of years ago, Myra and I went fishing up in the Sierras. Myra got a trout fly caught there. When they took it out, it left just a very small scar. But I don't think you'd be able to see it unless you were really looking for it. Mm -hmm. Anything else outstanding about her? No, there isn't. I wonder if we could have a photo of her. Do you have one? Of course. Why don't you give us the address of this Betty Joe? Surely. I think Myra kept it in the phone book. I'll look for you. Do you think they'll really do it, officer? Kill Myra? Well, we're going to try to stop him, sir. I don't think so. Well, how about the money? Should I get it together? Not a lot of time if I have to meet them tomorrow night. We'll take care of that. Here's the address. Thank you, sir. I don't know what I'll do if they hurt Myra. I just don't know. It's odd, isn't it, Sergeant? What's that? Myra and I have been married for 22 years. I guess I always just took her for granted. Haven't been separated at all during that time. Just took her for granted. Yes, sir. I guess you have to lose something before you know what it's worth. 5.43 p.m. We asked Mr. Wagner not to touch anything in the house. We told him that after his wife had been returned and our men could move safely about the neighborhood, the house would be gone over for physical evidence. Two men came out from the office and a stakeout was placed on the house. The note was taken downtown and photographed. Dean Bergman lifted several clean prints from it. However, comparison with those taken from Mr. Wagner eliminated them. The maid, Betty Jo, was contacted, but she could tell us nothing. In the meantime, Sergeant J. Allen of the crime lab prepared a shoebox as directed by the abductors. Dummy packages of money were placed in the box, and the container was wiped clean of all fingerprints. The area where the meat was to take place was staked out. The following morning, Wednesday, July 8th, Henry Wagner went to teach his classes at the university as usual. Late in the afternoon, he returned home. And at 9.45 p.m., he got into his car and left the house. 
I'd gotten into the back seat of the car earlier, and I kept out of sight. In an undercover unit behind us, Frank, Lieutenant Gorham, and Gillen Sinus kept us under observation in the event that we missed contact with the kidnappers. 10.26 p.m., we turned off Benedict Canyon onto Deer Canyon Drive. I hope I'm doing the right thing. I can't help thinking of what they might do to Myra. Well, try to take it easy, Mr. Wagner. We know how you feel. Everything that can be done has been taken care of here. That's what you've been telling me for the past hour. It doesn't make me feel any better about what's happening. Can you still see that car behind us? No. I think they dropped back when we turned off Benedict. Uh -huh. How's it look up ahead? Can't see much. Dark. How far off the canyon have we come? About four and a half miles. You got your box right there ready to throw it out? Uh, yes, sir. Right here on the seat. All right, now remember, when you toss it out, try to lift it by the strings. Right, I'll remember. I just hope we're doing the right thing. I'll never forgive myself if anything happens to Myra. $10,000 just isn't worth it. Wait a minute. Mm -hmm. There it is. String across the road. See anybody around it? No, it's so dark. I can't see anything but what's in front of the car. How close are we to the place here? About 50 or 60 feet. All right, now take it slow. Don't give any indication that you aren't doing exactly what they told you to. And remember, don't handle that box. Hold it for the string. All right. We're here. I'm throwing the box out. All right, now close your door. What now? Go up the road a little, and then turn around and drive back. Act like everything is just the way they told you to handle it. All right. Take it easy now. We can turn around here. All right. You see anyone move for the money? No, not yet. Maybe when I get turned around. Just a second. There's a driveway here. Oh, it's pretty dark back there. All right, can you see anything at all? Nothing there. I don't see anyone. All right, now just keep driving. If there's anybody to pick up the money, it'll look better if you don't cause any trouble. I don't know about all of this, Sergeant. Somehow I still can't get the idea out of my mind that we've done the wrong thing. That they know all about it, and that they're going to kill Myra. Now, there's no reason that they should know that there's anything wrong, Mr. Wagner. From what they can see, you're doing just what they told you. They got nothing to tell them any different here. But what if they found out? What if they know that you're working on the case? What if they know about it? They might kill Myra. I'd never forgive myself. I never should have told you about it. I should have taken care of it myself. They'll kill her. I know they will. They'll kill her because you're working on it. The way it is now, she hasn't got a chance. No, you're wrong there, Wagner. Hmm? The odds are on her side now. 10.45 p.m. Henry Wagner and I left the meeting place. About a mile down Deer Canyon Drive, Wagner dropped me off, and then he started down Benedict Canyon Drive and continued on home. I met with Frank, Lieutenant Gorham, and Sergeant Gil Encinas, and we started back on foot. We cut off the road and waited on the hill overlooking the meeting place. Frank told me that they'd seen no activity on the road while Wagner and I were making the meet. We moved in closer. 11.30 p.m., no sign of the kidnappers. The moon came up and we could see the white string across the road. In a patch of manzanita, we could see the shoebox containing the dummy packages of money. We waited. Midnight, 1.30 a.m., Still no sign of the kidnappers. 2.30. 4. At 4.45 a.m., the sun came up and Frank and I left the area. Lieutenant Gorham and Sergeant Gil Encinas continued to stake the meeting place. If the kidnappers had been in the vicinity, we'd miss them. Our only course now was to wait for them to contact Henry Wagner again. 8.15 a.m., Frank and I checked out and went on home to take a shower and get something to eat. At 11.12 a.m. Thursday morning, we checked back into the office. Rough night, huh? Yeah, there's nothing to show for it. Anything from Gorman and Encinas? No, I don't see anything. There's one thing I found out. What's that? I need a heavier coat for nights. Yeah. So on ad in the magazine, advertise those English duffel coats. Look real good. What? Duffel coats. Wore them in the North Atlantic during the war. You know, Joe, they're real heavy. Got a hood that comes up. Should be real warm. A hood? Yeah, you know, like a monk wears. When you aren't wearing it, look just like a collar. And when it gets cold, you raise up the little gimmick, and there you are, warm as anything. You know, Frank, somehow I just can't see you in there. Yeah? Well, I noticed you weren't any too warm last night. Next time we do duty like that, I'm going to be ready for it. Yeah. Just like a monk. I'll get it. Homicide Friday. Yes. Oh, yes, Mr. When was that? Uh-huh. Yes, sir, right away. Well, that's it. Huh? The Wagner woman. She's home. <laughs> You are listening to Dragnet, 
the authentic story of your police force in action. Friends, you'll remember some months ago we read you our first report, the six months report on the effects of smoking. Then more recently, we read you the eight months report. Now, here is the latest one. The full ten months report confirms again no adverse effects on the nose, throat, and sinuses of the group from smoking Chesterfields. This from a medical specialist who is making regular bi-monthly examinations of a group of people from various walks of life. Forty-five percent of them have smoked Chesterfield for an average of over ten years. After ten full months, the specialist reports he observed no adverse effects on the nose, throat, and sinuses of the group from smoking Chesterfield. That's the report. Buy much milder Chesterfield, regular or king size. The cigarette that's best for you. Eleven thirty a.m. Frank and I drove out to the Wagner home. The officers on stakeout told us that Mrs. Wagner had walked into the house at about eleven o'clock that morning. As soon as she'd gotten inside the house, she collapsed. The family doctor had been called, and she was treated for shock. Other than some scratches on her arms and around her face, she was unharmed. The officers told us that they'd been unable to interrogate her so far. We talked to the doctor, and he told us that we could talk to her until the sedative took effect. Honey, these are policemen. They want to ask you a few questions. What? Police officers, honey. There's Mr. Friday and there's Mr. Smith. Oh, yes. They want to ask you some questions, dear, about the people who took you. Oh, all right. It won't take very long, Miss Wagner. That's all right. I, I want to help you get them. All right, now, if you just tell us how it happened... How it happened? Yes, ma'am. Sergeant, you have to do this now. Maybe later when she's rested. Oh, I'm sorry, Mr. Wagner. We haven't got much choice here. We'd like to get to the people who did this. If we wait until later, we might not be able to get them. Yes, I didn't think of that. Well, if the doctor says it's all right, go ahead. Ms. Wagner? Yes? Do you know the people who did it? The people who took you? No. you never seen them before? No, never. All right, now, could you just tell us what happened? I guess so. They came to the door about 2.30. Who were they, ma'am? Well, I just saw a man. Later, when we got into the car, there was a woman, too. All right, go ahead. They told me that Henry had been in an accident, that he'd been hurt, that he was at the hospital. Said they wanted to take me to him. Yes, ma'am? I didn't know any different. I went with them. I thought that Henry was hurt. I didn't know any different. You have to do this, officers. She's home, safe. That's all I care about. That's all that's important. Why don't you let her get some rest? Then you can talk to her. Talk as much as you want to, but... But please, you can see what this is doing to her. Yes, sir. Now, look, this isn't any easier on us. We've got a job to do here, like we had when she was gone. We know how you feel, but we'd like to get to those people. It's all right, Henry. I'm all right, dear. Where'd they take you, ma'am? First, I think they were going to take me to a house near here. I, I didn't notice the street, but it was near here. I'm sure of that. Then when we got near there, I, I knew that something was wrong, that they weren't going to take me to Henry like they said. I knew it then. Mm-hmm. Go ahead. I told them to let me out of the car. Said that they'd better let me go. Mm -hmm. The woman, she was in the back seat with me, said for me to keep my mouth closed. I tried to get out the door and she hit me. Then the two of them got into an argument. The man started to yell at the woman that it wasn't any good, that they'd better forget the whole thing. And the woman said that they'd gone too far for that now, that they, they had to go through with it. Uh-huh. Well, then they put a blindfold on me. Tied my hands and blindfolded me, and then they started to drive. Well, at any time, did either of them use a name, you know, in talking to each other? No, I don't think so. At least if they did, I don't remember it. Mm -hmm. Go ahead, Miss Wagner. Well, I, then they started to drive. I couldn't see where they were going, but I know that they headed out the Arroyo Seco toward Pasadena. I could tell from the way we went. Then I heard the woman talk about the turnoff to get on the Seco. Right then, the man told her to shut up. Yes, ma'am. We drove for quite a while and then stopped. They made me get out and took me into a house. Did you have any idea where you were at the time, ma'am? No, I didn't. Mm -hmm. Go ahead, ma'am. Well, they took me into the house and put me in a room. Tied me up. I couldn't move, couldn't do anything. They locked the door and I could hear them arguing in the next room. The man was really telling the woman off. Said that she was a fool, that she'd really botched the whole thing up. I see. That night, they brought in a plate of food told me it was time to eat. All there was were some prunes. That's what they fed me all the time I was there, prunes. Never did take the blindfold off. Was there anything at all that would let you know where you were? Oh, a couple of things. They're probably kind of silly, but maybe you can make something out of them. What's that, ma'am? Well, there was a clock that was in the room where they had me, one of those chime clocks, told every 15 minutes, like Westminster chime. Yes, ma'am. 
I don't think it was a very big clock. Chimes sounded small. Mm -hmm. Then there were the trains. Trains? Yes, every once in a while I'd hear trains going past. Sounded like they were near, maybe a couple blocks away, not much more than that. But do you think that you could give us a description of the man and woman, Ms. Wagner? Yes, I think so. First, I was so upset with thinking that Henry was hurt that I didn't notice, but I think I can describe them for you. All right, ma'am, that'll be fine. There's one thing, though. What's that? I'd be positive if I saw them. 12 noon, we continued to talk to the Wagner woman. She gave us a description of the man and woman who had kidnapped her and a description of the car they'd used. We called the information into the office and a local and an APB were gotten out. We ran the description through R&I, but we got no make. 2.45 p.m. As one of the possibilities for identifying the locality described by Mrs. Wagner, Frank and I left the house and drove to the office of one of the milk companies in the city. We talked to the driver that handled the area in which Mrs. Wagner said the kidnappers were going to stop. He couldn't identify the man and the woman from the description. We checked two more milk companies, and on the third, we got a tentative identification. The driver of the route told us that we could be asking about a Mr. and Mrs. Thomas Harper, he thought. He gave us their address, and Frank and I drove out there. On the way, we called the names into R&I and had them make a check for us. They said they had a record on a Thomas Harper who answered the description. He'd served time in San Quentin and in Folsom penitentiaries. He'd been sentenced both times for armed robbery and ADW. There was no record on Mrs. Harper and no wants at the present time for her husband. 5.57 p.m. Well, we better try it again, huh? All right. Probably aren't in. Mm -hmm. There's a car park down the street here. Could be theirs. Checks on that description we got from the Wagner woman. Wait a minute. I think somebody's coming. Yeah, what do you want? You Thomas Harper? Yeah, that's right. Police officers would like to talk to you. What about? Just like to talk to you. All right, come on in. Who is it, Tom? Cops. What do they want? Say they want to talk. I don't know what about. It's just a routine investigation. Who are you trying to kid? What do you mean by that, Harper? Somebody's done something, you need a pigeon. I got a record, so I'm right for you guys to lean What's on. What's the matter? You got something to worry about? Not a thing in the world, but I know you guys, you're going to try. What do you want, anyway? You people tell us your activities for the past four days? What for? Just tell us, will you? Yeah, tell us. You got an angle where you wouldn't be here. You're trying to pin something on us, and you know it. You want to tell us what you've been doing? We haven't left the house at all. Can you prove that? Prove it to who? You? You got no right to come in here and ask a lot of questions. She's right. You haven't got any right to do that. Now, either you pull us in or you get out of here. All right, Harper. We're getting ready to leave anyway. We'll see you later. Yeah, let's go, Frank. All right. We better call the office and have the house staked. As soon as Ms. Wagner feels better, we'll have her see if she can make an identification here, huh? I don't think that'll be too hard, Joe. Hmm? Found this bill from the gas company on the table in there. Yeah? House in Pasadena. Harper's mugshot had been pulled and sent to the Wagner home for identification. Mrs. Wagner was still under sedatives. 7.15 p.m., Frank and I drove out to Pasadena. We got in touch with the police department out there, and two officers were assigned to accompany us to the address on the gas bill. The house was unoccupied, and there were advertising papers strewn all about on the lawn. With the officers, we entered the house and went through it. In some of the rooms, there were pieces of furniture, and in the living room of the house, we found a mantel clock that chimed on the quarter hour. On an end table, we found a ball of white string that looked like the same type that had been used to mark the meeting place up on Deer Canyon Drive. In one of the back bedrooms, we found prune seeds scattered around on the floor. A stakeout was arranged on the house. We contacted the men watching the Harper residence and found that the suspects were still there. 9.56 p.m., Frank and I arrived back at the Harper home in Hollywood. The lights were out and the house was dark. Frank went around to the back of the house. Yeah? What do you want this time of the night? Did you guys ever give up? All right, Harper, let's get dressed. We want to talk to you downtown. You tying a pinch to me? You called it. For what? Kidnapping. You're out of your mind. Come on, get dressed. Who is it, honey? Cops say we kidnapped somebody. What? Fuzz has an idea we kidnapped somebody. You're kidding. Afraid not, Ms. Harper. You better get dressed, too. Anybody else in the house? Yeah, we take in board. Don't get smart. Where's that door go? Bedroom. Just the one bedroom here? That's right. We're roughing it. Just the kitchen over here? Yeah. All right, come on. How about the bath? In there. All right, we'll all go. Come on. All right. Let's go back to the kitchen. This door go out the backyard. You're a cop. You figure it out. Okay, Frank. Everything all right in there, Joe? Yeah, fine. You ain't kidding about this kidnap thing, are you? No, nope, let's go. 
It makes you figure it might be us. You got a house in Pasadena? Why do you ask that? Have you got one? No. You're lying. Property records in Pasadena say you have. We checked the house. Matches the one we're looking for. That right? That's right. We got the woman you kidnapped. She's identified your picture, you and your wife. She couldn't identify me. I haven't got a record. You ain't taking me no place. Frank, get out of my way. Come Hold on. it. Hold it right there. All right, come on. On your feet. Yeah. Now, I'll shake it. He's clean. Hands behind you. I told you what had happened. I told you we should let her go right away. I told you. Oh, shut up. You and your bright ideas. Ten grand, easy. You and your bright ideas. Well, look what it got us. Look, Buster. You didn't yell when you thought of getting your hot little hands on that dough. You were all for it then. Well, we lost. What do you want me to do about it? Break down and ball? Should have known. Should have known from the beginning. I had nothing but trouble with you from the start. Always wanting something easy. Always wanting big money. Never satisfied. That's the trouble with kids. Bad losers. Great winners, but bad losers. Well, you're a big boy now. You lost. That's all there is to it. Stop whining. Easy for you to say. If they get through with me, I'll be in for life. You got no record. She has now. Let's go. The story you have just heard was true. The names were changed to protect the innocent. On November 10th, trial was held in Department 98, Superior Court of the State of California, in and for the County of Los Angeles. In a moment, the results of that trial. Now, here is our star, Jack Webb. Thank you, George Fenneman. Friends, only the modern cigarette, Chesterfield, gives you this scientific evidence on the effects of smoking. No adverse effects on the nose, throat, and sinuses of the group from smoking Chesterfields. And only the modern cigarette, Chesterfield, gives you premium quality in both regular and king size. Now, I know Chesterfield is best for me and best for you. Buy them, regular or king size. Either way, they're much milder to give you all the pleasure the modern cigarette can give. Thomas Fenton Harper was tried and found guilty of kidnapping. He was sentenced to life imprisonment in the state penitentiary, Folsom, California, without possibility of parole. His wife, Alice Mabel Harper, received a like sentence and is now in the California Institution for Women, Corona, California. Ladies and gentlemen, would you give a few dimes to help a child out of the smallest prison in the world, an iron lung? Well, that's what you're doing when you join the 1953 March of Dimes. Remember, crippled children are depending on your help. So give your dimes and your dollars to the 1953 March of Dimes. You have just heard Dragnet, a series of authentic cases from official files. Technical advice comes from the office of Chief of Police, W.H. Parker, Los Angeles Police Department. Technical advisors, Captain Jack Donahoe, Sergeant Marty Wynn, Sergeant Vance Brasher. Heard tonight were Ben Alexander, Virginia Gregg, Jonathan Hull. Script by John Robinson. Music by Walter Schumann. Hal Gibney speaking. Sound off for Chesterfield. Either way you like them, regular or king size. You'll find premium quality Chesterfields much milder. Chesterfield has brought you Dragnet transcribed from Los Angeles. Chesterfield. Chesterfield, the only cigarette in America to give you premium quality in both regular and king size, brings you Dragnet. Ladies and gentlemen, the story you are about to hear is true. The names have been changed to protect the innocent. You're a detective sergeant. You're assigned a narcotics detail. A steady flow of heroin has been making its way into your city. Most of it has fallen into the hands of teenagers. You don't know the source or the head man of the operation. Your job? Stop it. 
The modern way to sell cigarettes is the Chesterfield way. Premium quality in both regular and king size. And we're the only one that gives it to you. Premium quality in a cigarette means the world's best tobaccos, the best ingredients, the best cigarette paper. Only Chesterfield gives you this premium quality in both popular sizes. King size Chesterfield contains tobaccos of better quality and higher price than any other king size cigarette. Well, that's certainly important to every king size smoker. Of course, it's the same fine tobacco as in regular Chesterfield. There is absolutely no difference, except that king size Chesterfield gives you more than a fifth longer smoke. Yes, the modern way to sell cigarettes is the Chesterfield way. Premium quality, both regular and king size. Chesterfield is much milder. Chesterfield is best for you. Dragnet, the documented drama of an actual crime. For the next 30 minutes, in cooperation with the Los Angeles Police Department, you will travel step by step on the side of the law through an actual case transcribed from official police files. From beginning to end, from crime to punishment, Dragnet is the story of your police force in action. It was Tuesday, April 6th. It was warm in Los Angeles. We were working the day watch out on narcotics detail. My partner's Frank Smith. The boss is Captain Kearney. My name's Friday. I'd just gotten off work, and I'd gotten a call from a friend who wanted to see me. It was 5.46 p.m. when I got to my apartment house. Apartment 12. Hi, Joe. Oh, Ed. Just getting ready to go in. Come on, Ed. Right, got you. Go ahead. Thanks. Sit down. You got a date or something? No, no, it's all right. I just thought I'd get something to eat and then maybe take in the show. What do you want to see me about? It's about Gary, Joe. Your boy? Yeah, I... I don't know quite how to say it. Yeah, well, you sounded pretty upset on the phone, Ed. I was, Joe. I still am. I don't know what I'm going to do. Well, come on. What's it all about? It was all I could do to keep my hands off him. I never felt like that with anybody before, but I did with Gary. I wanted to strangle him. All right, now, what's he done, Ed? He's a dope addict, Joe. Well, that's a pretty serious thing to say, Ed. Are you sure about that? I am now. First, I couldn't believe it, but tonight, Ellen and I went through his room. We found this. Here. Uh-huh. Open it. See? Yeah. Looks like a layout. I couldn't find any drugs in it. I know that he's using them, though. Spoon, eyedropper, needle. Yeah, everything's here. What'd you find, this, Ed? In his room. Had it hidden up on the shelf in his closet. I found it tonight. I didn't know what to do, Joe. Helen's been crying all day. She's almost out of her mind. You were the only one I could think of coming to. Who do you talk to when you find out your son's an addict? Well, now, Ed, are you sure this is his in the first place, that he's been using it? Yeah, I'm it? sure. I never would have believed it. Not Gary. There's no reason for it. We've given the kid everything he wanted. There's nothing he didn't have. At home, Helen and I have always tried to understand his problems. Always looked at them like they were important. Everything. We gave him everything. Now this. I don't know what to do, Joe. I got no place to turn. There's nothing I can do. Maybe you can figure a way. Maybe you can't. I don't much care anymore. I, I, I just know that I can't see him again. Not for a while. I'm afraid, Joe. I'm real afraid. All right, now, let's take it easy, Ed. We'll work this out some way. You don't know what it's like, Joe. You can't uh, to feel like this and, and to know you'll do it. What? I see him again, Joe. I'm going to kill him. I'd known Ed Field for the past seven years. I'd met him when we were conducting an investigation while I was assigned to Bunko Division. His testimony had been instrumental in breaking up a gang of shoplifters. Since then, we'd become very good friends. He lived just down the street from my apartment, and on occasion, we got together for an evening. I knew his wife, and I'd met his 18-year-old son, Gary. The boy was a senior in high school, and as Ed had told me many times, his grades were well above average. The Field family was moderately well-to-do. Their home wasn't luxurious, but it was good-sized. To look at the boy, there was nothing that would cause anybody to think that he might be a user. 6.12 p.m., Field and I arrived at his home. Helen Field was waiting for us. She was a nice-looking woman in her early 40s. She let us in the house and showed us to the living room. It was obvious that she'd been crying. I don't know how to thank you for coming over, Joe. I guess Ed told you what it's all about. Yes, Helen, you did. Gary home yet? 
No, I haven't heard a word from him since he left. I didn't tell Joe what happened this afternoon. Thought it'd be better if he got it from you. Oh, all right. You want to sit down, Joe? Sure. I'll tell you. Thank you. Well, Gary came home this afternoon about 2.30. Mm -hmm. Walked into the house and went right to his room. He didn't say a thing to me. First, I thought that maybe he might be sick. I went to the room and he'd locked the door. I knocked, asked him if he was all right. Yeah. He called through the door that he was okay and for me to leave him alone. I asked him if there was anything I could do. You know, if he was sick, he might need something. I understand. What did he say? Told me to get away. To leave him alone and get off his back. Those were his exact words. Leave him alone and get off his back. Mm -hmm. About 20 minutes later, he unlocked the door and came out. He seemed to feel fine. He came over and kissed me and said he was sorry about what he'd said. Said that he hadn't been feeling well and that he'd said those things without meaning them. Hmm? I told him that he ought to wait until I could take his temperature. He said there was nothing wrong for me to get out of his way. That he had some business to take care of and be home for dinner. I tried to stop him from leaving. And he pushed me aside. He knocked me down. Get my hands on him. I'll teach him. He stood there for a minute, and I thought he was going to cry. But he just turned around and walked out. Well, you any idea where he might have gone? What this business was that he was going to take care of? No, no, not the slightest idea. You can see what we're up against, Joe. I'm afraid to even see the boy. Yeah. When did you first figure that he might be using narcotics? When I came home, Helen told me what had happened. I thought about what would make the kid do a thing like this. The more I thought about it, the more there had to be only one reason. That's when Helen and I went through his room and found that kit. Mm -hmm. Has the boy been ill at all lately? Under a doctor's care? Something that you might not know about? No. No. I'm sure that if he was, we'd know about it. I want to see you, Gary. Yeah, I'll be right with you. I want to see you right now. We'll have to wait. Maybe there's something wrong with your ears, son. I'm not going to take that from you. Please, Ed, don't do something you're going to regret. Now listen, Helen, that boy's 18 years old. For all that time, we've done everything we could for him. We've given him a lot more than most boys his age have. I'm not going to stand by and see it all blow up just because he's a kid. That's no excuse. I want an answer for all this. What he's been doing, what happened this afternoon. I want those answers, and I want them now. Remember, he's only a boy. And I'm getting sick of that, too. Where is it? Now, listen, boy, I know what's been going on. I want to talk to you about it. I don't want you to lecture me. All I want to know is where's the kit. Take it easy, son. What are you doing here? I asked him to come over. You didn't turn me in, huh? Your dad asked me to come over to see if I could help here. I don't need nothing from you, cop. I want the layout. Where is it? You aren't going to use that anymore. I want the layout. i got to have it. Where is it? Please, Gary, don't get your father any more mad than he is. I don't care how sore he is or how sore he gets. I want the layout. I want it now. I can't think of any more simple way to say it. If I have to take it away from you, then I'll do it your way. You lousy bum. I'll teach you to talk to me. All right, take it easy, Gary. This isn't going to get you anywhere now. Come on, settle down, both of you. Get out of here. Get him out of here. Joe, I swear I'll break him in two. Please, then. Joe, do something. Let him go. Let him go. It's about time he found out I'm old enough to call things my way. Go on. Let him go. I'm not afraid of him. I'm not afraid of you either, cop. I'm not worried about anybody. All I want is that kit. I got to have it. I got it. I'll give it to me and we can talk then. I got to have it fixed. I got it. Joe. Do something, please. All right. Come on. Sit down. Sit down, boy. It's gone far enough here. Let's get a few things straight. You're not going to have any more of that. We'll see that a doctor looks at you. He'll do what he can, but you've had it. No more narcotics for you, and I'll face it. You want me to tell you where you stand? You're a user. Any way you slice it, this had to happen. I don't want anything from you. Why don't you just leave me alone? I can't do that. Let me see your arm. Come on, roll up your sleeve. Do what he says, Gary. Yeah. Both arms, huh? I'd take a joy pop once in a while. Now, don't con me, Gary. You got it bad, and it's going to get worse. You didn't get that arm from Chippy in with the stuff. The kit we found, you don't need to lay out that big to joy pop. You've been mainlining it for quite a while. I know it, and so do you. You holding now? Come on, boy, answer me. You holding now? Yeah. Well, let's have it. I'm not going to give it to you. You got no choice, son. Either give it to me or I'll take it. All right, here it is. 
How big a habit you got? Not big. How big? A couple of bucks. Now, come on, boy. Let's have a straight answer. Twenty-five a day? Twenty-five dollars a day. That's a lot of narcotics, isn't it? It's what it takes. Where's it come from? Come on. Who's your connection? You maybe got me, but I'm not going to be a fink. You got to let me go at that. I can't do that. Now, where'd you get this stuff? How about that doctor? You going to do something about we'll that? We'll talk to him. You're talking to him ain't going to do any good. I got to have a fix. I'm going to fall apart. Come on, now. Be a pal. Let me have a fix. I'll tell you all about it then. You got the kit? You got the stuff? Come on, be a sport, No huh? go. You can't do it. Come on, let's go downtown. You're going to take him to jail, Joe? I'll take him down to Georgia Street Receiving Hospital. The doctor can look at him there. We're going to have to hold him for a while, Miss Field. Why'd you do it, Gary? Why? Can't you tell me? Is it something your father and I have done? There's got to be a reason. What is it? Oh, please, Gary, tell me. Come on, let's get out of here. <laughs> Can we see him after he gets there, Joe? Yeah, I'll call the Ed. Don't you want to say goodbye to your mother, son? Why? It wouldn't prove anything. Yeah, I guess that's the way you'd look at it. I broke the law. Now they're going to make a convict out of me. I didn't call him. You did. How are you going to explain that to her? You turn your own son in. How are you going to tell her about it? I hope you're real happy now. I'm not proud of it, son. There's one thing I'd like to ask. Yeah. What have you done to her? 8.30 p.m. I called Frank Smith and filled him in on what had happened. He said that he'd meet me at Georgia Street Receiving Hospital. I took young Gary Field down with me and had a doctor check him over. After that, the boy was taken to the narcotics division, and Frank and I talked to him. I don't know how to tell you any better. There's any other way to say it. I'm not going to give you any names. That's not going to help you any, son. So it won't help me. It won't get any of my friends in trouble. Well, you've got great friends, haven't you? Now, where'd you get the money to take care of your habit? I you? earned it. Where? I worked. Where'd you work? Look, it's getting late. That stuff the doctor gave me didn't do any good. I still need a fix. Now, I'm getting sick. Do what you got to do. Let's get this over with. Now, look, this is going to be the same in the morning, son. We're going to keep asking questions till you come up with the right answers. Look, cop, I don't want any favors from you. Now, leave me alone. We're only trying to help you, boy. Oh, get off my side. Now, I need nothing from you. You saw your duty and you did it. That makes you a big man, huh? I know you'll both make lieutenant. Now, beat it, All huh? right, that's enough of that. Now, there's a couple of things we'd like to set you straight on. Maybe help you to figure where you stand in this. Oh, here it comes. What do they do? Give you a license to preach when they hand you the badge? That's enough of that, youngster. Come on, get off my back, cop. If my old man hadn't turned fink, you'd never have got me. Where are you going? I'm getting out of now here. Now, sit down. Sit down. All right, young fellow, you want to be a big man? That's the way it's going to be. I'm going to tell you that you get no special treatment here because I know your parents. You'll be treated just like any other user. You're getting a little of the edge because you're a youngster. There's not a pound of honesty or integrity in your distorted mind. The simple way would be to drop you in a cellar, let you sweat out the cure, let you fall apart if you had to. Let me tell you this. We're going to get the connection that's been supplying you, and then we're going to get the man behind him. I don't much care about them, but I do care about the kids around you. You've got a big habit. It takes a lot of money to keep up a habit like that. I've seen kids like you before, and there's only so many ways to get that money. You steal it or you start pushing narcotics yourself. I don't think you're stealing, so you've got to be pushing it. That means that you've probably got other kids hooked on it. Other youngsters that have got trouble because of you. Mules that are dragging your wagon for you. Your folks will maybe forgive you for what you've done to them, but they'll never be able to buy what you did to the other kids. You had a chance to help yourself and help the rest of them. You had a chance to do something good for somebody else and you wouldn't take it. Well, you're playing it smart, big boy. Keep playing it that way when you end up in a jail cell, will you? You through, cop? Yeah, I'm through. Fine, let me get some sleep, huh? Let's go, Frank. <laughs> You are listening to Dragnet, the authentic story of your police force in action. Friends, you'll remember some months ago we read you our first report, the six months report on the effects of smoking. Then more recently, we read you the eight months report. Now, here is the latest one. The full ten months report confirms again. The group examined showed no adverse effects on the nose, throat, and sinuses from smoking Chesterfields. This from a medical specialist who is making regular, bi-monthly examinations of a group of people from various walks of life. Forty-five percent of them have smoked Chesterfield for an average of over ten years. After ten full months, the specialist reports he observed no adverse effects on the nose, throat, and sinuses of the group from smoking Chesterfield. That's the report. By much milder Chesterfield, regular or king size. The cigarette that's best for you. Get 
Gary Field was taken to the main jail and booked. Frank and I went back to the office to fill out the arrest reports. The next day, Wednesday, April 7th, we began to talk to Gary's friends and teachers. From all of them, we got the same story. Until six months before, the boy had been a model student. He was always at the top scholastically in each of his classes. He was a member of several honorary student organizations and had twice been nominated for president of his class. Then, apparently without reason, the boy's personality had changed. He stopped taking an interest in his schoolwork. Several of his teachers told us that he wouldn't have gotten passing grades at the end of the semester. He dropped out of the service organizations at school. From some of his teachers, we got the names of his close friends. Talks with them netted us little. They told us that Gary had dropped out of the crowd of youngsters that he'd been running with and had taken up with new friends. They told us that they didn't see much of him after school, that he'd gotten into fights with other students on several occasions, and that after a period of time, they'd stopped asking him to their functions. None of them were able to give us the names of his new friends. We checked with the neighborhood merchants. Most of them knew Gary. They said that he'd worked for them after school, but they hadn't seen him for several months. We asked them if they could help us locate his friends. They told us that they had seen him in the company of one particular man on several occasions, but they couldn't identify him for us. We got a description of the man, but it meant nothing to us or to the other members of the narcotics division. Photographs of known narcotic suspects were shown to the parents of Gary Field and to the storekeepers around the school. They couldn't identify any of them. Two days passed. Friday, April 8th. We got a call from the field boy. Frank and I went over to see him. What do you want to see us about, Gary? I wanted to tell you I've had it. What's that mean? That I want to tell you about it. What's the matter? You been sick? A little. That's not why I called you, though. They treated me all right here, but I got to thinking. All right, go ahead. I used to read in the papers where the kids would turn themselves in or get caught and cop out. All about how they realized what they'd done. Always seemed like a lot of phony sob sister stuff. I ain't no different now. I know what I've done. I know I got to stand for it. I'm not. I'm not asking any favors because I. I know that I've done nothing to call for. I'm not trying to be a hero or a martyr. I just want to help get this thing cleaned up. One thing I'd like to know, Gary. What's that? What made you get started on this stuff? You seem like a kid that has everything you want. You don't look like a kid who'd fall for it. Who knows? I'd give you a thousand reasons they still wouldn't add. I guess I just wanted to be top man all the way around. How'd you get on it? Started lushing it up, then the tea, then the heroin. That's the way it runs, isn't it? Most of the time. I didn't figure I'd ever be hooked. Thought it couldn't happen to me. <laughs> How wrong you can be. How long you had the big habit? About six months. Chippied with it about the same time before then. Where'd you get the money? Mm, guess we had to get to that. Huh? That's right. Where'd you get it? Well, I got some kids pushing this stuff for me. Worked for a while. It wasn't enough. By that time, the kids were hooked themselves. I was the only connection they had. They had to do business with me or do without it. Yeah. I told them that if they couldn't pay me in cash, I'd take merchandise. They'd bring it. I'd sell it. That way we both came out all right. They got their H. I got mine. You mean you got them to steal, that it? Yeah, I guess so. I never asked where they got the stuff. I just took it and sold it. With that and the stuff they sold for me, I made out. These kids pushing H for you? No. Well, they're shoving tea. I sell it to them for four bits a stick. They get up to a buck and a half for it. Do you know where they peddle it? No, I never asked. All I was interested in was if I got mine. All right, give us their names, will you? Guess that's the only way, huh? That's the only way. Okay, I'll give them to you. How about your connection? Who's he? Guy named Jack. Jack who? I don't know. Honest, I really don't. Where'd you meet him? Drive in downtown. Where? Drive in at the corner of Reno and Vernon. How do you set up the meet? I just go in there between 10 and midnight, park the car and order coffee. He comes over to the car. You mean that he's always there at that time, huh? Usually is. So your only source? Yeah. Anyone else pushing it around there? No, as far as I know. I think he's the only one in the operation. All right, you'd be willing to arrange a meet with him so we can pick him up? Yeah, I'll do it. All right, fine. But you want to see the folks. I got so much to make up for. That's right, you have. Don't think I'll live long enough to do it all. <laughs> 9.32 a.m., we got a description of the suspect known as Jack and also the names and addresses of the teenagers involved. Frank and I contacted the juvenile authorities and gave them the information. We went back to our office and had Gary Field check our files of known narcotic suspects. He was unable to give us an identification on Jack. 11.56 a.m., we took the boy to his home and talked with his parents. 12.30 p.m., Frank, Gary Field, and I drove to the corner of Vernon and Reno to check over the drive-in restaurant. It was set up in the usual way with a parking area around the main building for car service. In the rear of the lot was a building housing a cocktail bar, and there were parking spaces in front of that for the bar customers. 
As we drove past the place, Gary told us that he usually parked around the side of the main building and that this jack came from the direction of the bar. He was unable to tell us whether the suspect drove a car or not. The plan was for Gary to introduce me as a narcotics buyer who was trying to get a local connection. It was agreed that because of the size of the buy I was to make, it would be necessary for me to deal with the head of the organization. 11.05 p.m., Gary and I got into my car and we drove to the drive-in. Frank followed us in a police unit. We arrived at the meet at 11.14 p.m. Frank stayed in the background and we waited. The suspect failed to make an appearance. The next night, the plan was repeated. Again, nothing. Sunday, April 10th, 10.05 p.m. We arrived at the drive-in. We waited. 11.05 p.m., 11.15, 11.30. No sign of the suspect. Midnight, 12.04 p.m. Looks like he isn't going to be here. I thought you said he usually showed up, didn't you? I don't know what happened. He was always here before. You sure you got the right drive-in? Look, Mr. Friday, I know what you're thinking, but I'm telling the truth. Yeah, you know, all this is kind of tough to buy, don't you? Three nights and he isn't here. I don't understand. He was always here before. Wait a minute. Yeah? Hold it. Yeah, that's him coming over from the bar. All right, which one? There's a couple of people coming out the there. The big one. See in the gray suit? The hat? Yeah. You sure that's this Jack? Positive, Mr. Friday. All right, now you look. You know what you're going to do. Don't let on that anything's wrong here. Remember that nothing's going to happen to you. I'll remember. All right, now hold on. He's coming over. Hi, kid. Hi, Jack. Been looking for you. Where you been? All right. Who's a friend? Oh, yeah. I want to talk to you about him. He wants to do business with you. What are you talking about? What business? Look, Jack, he's all right. I know it. You think I'd have brought him here if I didn't know it? Oh, he's all right. He's a friend of yours. You know the bit. Any friend of yours? I don't know what to talk about businesses. I don't know what you're doing here, but I'm here for a cup of coffee. Better let me talk to him alone. trying to prove bringing the guy here. Who is he? Friend of mine. I told you once. I told you a thousand times. Don't ever bring nobody with you. Haven't I told you, huh? Oh, yeah, but he's okay. He wants to make a buy, a big one. Crazy kid. You told him about it? Look, he's okay. I know it. Look, Jack, we both stand to do all right from this. I kind of figured if he bought from you, you might give me a little piece of it. You know, sort of say thanks for the business. How long you known this guy? Long time. How long? A couple of years. How come I never seen him before? He doesn't hang around this part of town. What's he doing here now? Like I said, trying to make a buy. Where'd you meet him? Before I met you, I used to buy stuff from him. He moved out of town, went up north, does business up there. Last couple of days, I couldn't get in touch with you. I ran into him. He fixed me up. Then he told me he wanted to buy. Right away, I thought of you. All right, I'll talk to him. But I ain't making no deal. You just talk to him. You'll find out everything's okay. All right. You let me do the talking. Joe, this is Jack, the fellow I was telling you about. Hi. Hi. Kidder tells me you're down on business, eh, right? Yeah, I'm looking around. Nice place, L.A. A lot of business to do here. What line you? Whatever pays me. Where you from? Up north. Mm Mm-hmm. How long you known Gary here? Now, you listen to me. I haven't got all night to stand around here and guzzle his stale coffee with you. The kid told you what I want. Now, it boils down to one simple question. You want to do business or don't you? Going kind of fast, aren't you? I haven't got a lot of time. I don't like to deal that way. All right, kid, let's get out of here. Should have known better than to figure on dealing with a small-time operator. I told you that before. What do you mean by that? You read it any way you want. Well, let's go, son. See you around, mister. Hey, uh, hold on. No need to get sore about it. Just have to be careful. You know how it is. Now, you listen. I was shoving horse when you were playing with marbles. I've outgrown the kid games. I thought I could make a buy. I see I was wrong. Maybe not. What? I said maybe we could do business. I gotta have it tonight. How much you need? I need an ounce. It's gotta be good. Mm-hmm. I haven't got that much with me. How much have you got? I only got 12 bindles with me. How much? You gotta understand, this is good stuff. How much? Now, look, this is better than you can find any place else. All right, let's quit playing, huh? What's the tab on it? Ten bucks a bindle. All right, I'll take the 12. How soon can you have the rest of it? When do you want it? I told you I was in a hurry. Don't you hear good? Yeah. Maybe tomorrow night. All right, that'll have to do. If it's good quality, I may want some more. How much can you supply? How much do you need? Oh, I'll go maybe another ounce. Mm-hmm. You got the cash for this? I don't do business any other way. Uh-huh. Wait here. I'll be back. It's 
It's all right, isn't it, Mr. Frank? Yeah, Gary, everything's fine. You see where he's going? No, it's too dark. Don't you worry about it. Frank will see where he goes. I'll be glad when this is over. All right, hold it. Okay, mister, let's see the money. I got it right here. Let's see the horse. You got it? All right, looks all right. Here. You don't mind if I count this? No, go right ahead. It's all there. 120 bucks, isn't mm. what you said? Just to make sure. Yeah. 50, 70, 90, 110, 120. Yeah, right, it's all here. Mm-hmm. Well, I'll see you tomorrow night, huh? Yeah, sure. I'll tell you, it's nice to do business with you. It's been a real pleasure, a real pleasure. Well, that works both ways, mister. Mm-hmm. Well, I hope to see a lot more of you. You will. You're under arrest. The story you have just heard was true. The names were changed to protect the innocent. On July 29th, trial was held in Department 89, Superior Court of the State of California, in and for the County of Los Angeles. In a moment, the results of that trial. Now, here is our star, Jack Webb. Thank you, George Fenneman. In 1952, American smokers bought more Chesterfields than ever before in the history of the industry. Today, sales continue to mount for two big reasons. Chesterfield is the first and only cigarette to give you premium quality in both regular and king size. Only Chesterfield gives you this scientific evidence on the effects of smoking. As we told you earlier, after ten months, the group examined showed no adverse effects on the nose, throat, and sinuses from smoking Chesterfields. Change to Chesterfield yourself. Regular or king size. Chesterfield is much milder. Chesterfield is best for you. Richard Field, because of his cooperation, was placed in a hospital for rehabilitation and at the conclusion of his treatment was placed on three years probation. The other juveniles involved were handled through the juvenile court and received sentences comparable with his. Jack Alexander Williams was tried and found guilty of violation of the State Narcotic Act, a felony, and was sentenced to the state penitentiary for the term as prescribed by law. Violation of the State Narcotic Act, a felony, is punishable by imprisonment for a period of not more than six years in a state prison. You have just heard Dragnet, a series of authentic cases from official files. Technical advice comes from the office of Chief of Police W.H. Parker, Los Angeles Police Department. Technical advisors, Captain Jack Donahoe, Sergeant Marty Wynn, Sergeant Vance Frazier. Heard tonight were Ben Alexander, Harry Bartell, Virginia Gregg, Eddie Firestone. Script by John Robinson. Music by Walter Schumann. Hal Gibney speaking. For a million laughs, tune in Chesterfield's Martin and Lewis show Tuesday night on this same NBC station. And sound off for Chesterfield, either regular or king size. You'll find premium quality Chesterfields much milder. Chesterfield is best for you. Chesterfield has brought you Dragnet transcribed from Los Angeles. Tonight, it's Adventure with Barry Craig, confidential investigator on NBC. Chesterfield. Chesterfield, the first and only cigarette in America to give you premium quality in both regular and king size, brings you Dragnet. Ladies and gentlemen, the story you are about to hear is true. The names have been changed to protect the innocent. You're a detective sergeant. You're assigned to auto theft detail. A gang of car strippers has been operating in your city. From their M.O., you know they're professionals. They move fast. Your job? Get them. Friends, you'll remember some months ago, we read you our first report. The six months report on the effects of smoking. Then more recently, we read you the eight months report. Now, here is the latest one. The full 10 months report confirms again 
The group examined showed no adverse effects on the nose, throat, and sinuses from smoking Chesterfields. This from a medical specialist who is making regular bi-monthly examinations of a group of people from various walks of life. Forty-five percent of them have smoked Chesterfield for an average of over ten years. After ten full months, the specialist reports he observed no adverse effects on the nose, throat, and sinuses of the group from smoking Chesterfield. That's the report. Buy much milder Chesterfield, regular or king size. The cigarette that's best for you. Dragnet, the documented drama of an actual crime. For the next 30 minutes, in cooperation with the Los Angeles Police Department, you will travel step by step on the side of the law through an actual case transcribed from official police files. From beginning to end, from crime to punishment, Dragnet is the story of your police force in action. It was Tuesday, August 5th. It was warm in Los Angeles. We were working the day watch out of auto theft detail. My partner's Frank Smith. The boss is Captain Nelson. My name's Friday. I was on my way back from the telephone booth, and it was 10.23 p.m. when I got to the parking lot. Our car. You called in? Yeah. They haven't hit tonight so far. What's the time now? A little after 10.30. Parking lot's about empty. Yeah. The attendant left a few minutes ago. Frank? Yeah, I see him. Over there going for that Cadillac. Yeah. You got a good look at him? No, it's too dark. He's forcing the door. Come on. All right. All right, hold it up there. He's in the car, Joe. All right, hold it up. He's heading for that intersection. He'll never get through. Come on. That looks pretty bad, Joe. Yeah, he really cracked into that dodge, didn't he? All right, let us through, please. Come on, please let us through. I'll check the Cadillac. Right, I'll get the other car. Okay. The three people in that Dodge are lucky. Doesn't look too bad. I'll call the ambulance. Yeah, we'll tell them to hurry. I don't think this one's going to wait. 10.46 p.m. The ambulance arrived, and after emergency treatment at the scene, the victims were removed to Georgia Street Receiving Hospital. A traffic car had been dispatched to investigate the accident. Upon arrival at the emergency hospital, we were informed that the suspect had died on the way. The dead body was identified by his personal effects as Charles Roxford, age 16. The Juvenile Bureau was contacted, and they requested that in the course of our investigation, we notify the boy's family. 11.27 p.m. Frank and I drove out to the address listed on the victim's identification. It was a house above the Sunset Strip. We rang the bell and waited. I'll try it again. Yeah. Somebody's coming. Mm -hmm. Yes? Mrs. Roxford? That's right. What is it? Police officers, ma'am. We'd like to talk to you. Police? Well, come in. I don't know what you want with us, but come in. Thank you. Come into the living room. Thank you very much. Now, sit down. What is it? There's been an accident, Mrs. Roxford. An accident? Yes, ma'am. Pretty bad one. What's this got to do with me? Well, you see, ma'am, your boy was... Joe... Well, we're sorry to have to tell you this, ma'am, but your boy was in an accident tonight. Charles? Yes, ma'am. You said it was a bad accident. Yes, ma'am, we did. How bad? How bad? Your son's dead, ma'am. Charles? Charles Roxford? Uh, uh, you're sure you have the right house? Yes, ma'am. We're sorry, Ms. Roxford. Oh. Charlie, oh, he was only a baby. Just a baby. Oh, you're sure there's no mistake? You're sure? Afraid not, ma'am. How did it happen? Well, it was an automobile accident, ma'am. In an automobile? Yes, ma'am. Your boy was driving a car. Oh, but Charlie doesn't have a car. He doesn't drive. Your boy was driving a stolen car, Mrs. Roxford. What? Your son had a stolen car, ma'am. He was trying to get away. Well, that's not true. Afraid it is, ma'am. Why, no. You're lying to me. Charles would do a thing like that. I'm afraid that's the way it is, ma'am. Oh, that's terrible. 
I can't believe that Charlie would do something like that. I thought I knew him. I, I didn't think he'd do anything like that. Well, did you see it? The accident? Were, were you there? Yes, ma'am, we were. How did it happen? Well, he'd stolen the car, ma'am. He tried to escape. He ran the car out into a crowded street. One of the cars in the traffic didn't have time to stop. Your boy ran right into it. Wasn't there something you could do to stop him? Well, we tried, ma'am. Yelled at him. He almost ran us down. You know where your boy was tonight, Mrs. Roxford? No. No, he had dinner and then said he was going out. I, I thought he was going to a show or something. Mm -hmm. No, I didn't know where he was going. Did he leave the house alone? Yes. Left right after dinner, about eight. Said he'd be back later. Said he'd see me later. Then he left. Is there anything we can get for you, Mrs. Roxford? No. No, nothing. Where's your husband, ma'am? I guess he's at his office. He sells insurance. Said he had to meet a client tonight. I don't know what he's going to do when he hears about this. Going to hit him awfully hard. Awfully hard. Yes, ma'am. He and the boy were very close. I don't know what he's going to do when he hears about it. Did the boy give you any idea during dinner as to what he was going to do after he left? No. No, he didn't. I didn't talk much to him. Ma'am. Well, you see, I wasn't here. I was out most of the afternoon. I, I didn't get home until just before he left. He just finished dinner and then he left. I see. I was at the bridge club. I always go on Tuesdays. Oh, if I'd known, if I'd only known what was going to happen. Am I going to see him? Well, we want either you or your husband to identify him, ma'am. Charlie, he's dead. Just a baby, just a little boy. You were there. You could have done something. You're police officers. Isn't that your job? Beg your pardon? Well, isn't it your job to help people to do something when they're in trouble? Well, yes, ma'am, I suppose it is, but it was a little late for that, wasn't it? What does that mean? Well, he was 16 when we met him, Miss Roxby. What has that got to do with it? Somebody should have tried a long time ago. Most car thefts fall into three basic categories, well known by all police officers. First, the cars that are stolen by professionals who change the motor numbers, forge owner certificates, repaint the bodies, and sell them throughout the country. The second group consists of joy riders, thieves who steal the cars for a few hours merely to ride around in them and then leave them on the streets. The third category, and the one we've been working on for the past six weeks, dealt with the activities of car strippers. Their M.O. followed the usual pattern for this type of crime. The car would be stolen and then driven to some lonely part of the city. There, all usable accessories would be removed. Radios, tires, air horns, side mirrors, anything that could be resold would be taken. In certain cases, the articles would be stolen while the car remained parked where the owner had left it. We found that the gang had become so proficient that they could break into a car and remove the radio, as well as other accessories, in under ten minutes. Avenues of sale for the stolen merchandise had been checked. Known dealers and stolen property had been questioned. As the days went on, the total of thefts went up. By the 5th of August, the gang had stolen over $12,000 in automobile accessories. In the instances where we'd been able to get a description of men loitering in the vicinity of the stripped cars, we'd had the witnesses check mug books in the hope of identifying the thieves. We'd gotten no new leads. Physical evidence at the scene of the abandoned cars had been checked and rechecked. It netted us nothing. A week passed. August 14th, 8.15 a.m. Frank and I got back to the office. The captain's really boiling, isn't he? Yeah, you can't blame him, though. They gotta stop cold. Well, we're gonna get a break in it sometime. All the luck can't stay on their side. I don't know. It looks like it could happen that way. Anything on the steakhouse last night? No, nothing that we got so far. Maybe something later. I get it. Auto theft Friday. I beg your pardon, ma'am? Well, no. Well, yeah. What was that again? Oh, yeah. Yeah, well, yes, ma'am. All right, what was that address again? Yes, I... I... Yeah, all right. Well, we'll send a unit out. I'm sure they can help you. No, I suggest you get in touch with the SPCA. No, SPCA. Yes, that's... All right. Bye. Well, there's a dandy one. What's that? Woman lost a cat from her car. I want to know if we can get it back for her. Yeah? Says it's real easy to recognize. He has a collar on him. He answers the name of Tabby. Oh, that makes it easier. Yeah. Auto theft, Smith. Yes, sir. That's right. Uh-huh. Where are you calling from, sir? Yeah, so that's on Wilshire, right? All right, so we'll be right there. Anything? Yeah, a doctor out on Wilshire parked his car out in front of his office. Yeah. Came back in ten minutes, his car radio was gone. Yeah. 
8.56 a.m., Frank and I got to the doctor's office. It was in a large medical building out on Wilshire Boulevard. We went up to the second floor and talked to the man who placed the call, a Dr. Alex Halsey. He told us that he'd stopped at his office on the way to a hospital call. He'd parked his car immediately in front of the building. When he returned ten minutes later, he found that the radio had been stolen. From his office, we called the crime lab and latent fingerprints detail. Crews of men were sent from both divisions. They went over the car for possible physical evidence. Frank and I, along with Dr. Halsey, went down to the street. We talked to him while the officers worked. Darnest thing I ever saw. I tell you, I wasn't in the building more than ten minutes. Ten minutes outside. Yes, sir. Came back and I could see right away that the door had been opened. Uh Uh-huh. First I thought maybe I'd left it open. Then when I got in the car, I knew right away. As soon as I saw the radio was gone. Yes, sir. Did you notice anyone loitering around your car when you parked it? Anybody suspicious, maybe? No, no, I didn't. Of course, I might not have noticed anyone. Had my mind on Julie. Julie? Yes, I'm operating on her this afternoon. Poor little kid has an intestinal disorder. Only three months old. Gee, that's too bad. Yes, she'll be fine, though. Of course, the parents are worried. They always are. Can't convince them there's nothing to worry about. Yes, sir. Then you didn't notice anyone, huh? No, like I said, I didn't. You sure you locked your car, sir, when you left it? Oh, yes, I'm sure about that. Always make it a practice to lock it when I leave it. Lots of times I leave instruments in it. Always have to be careful about the instruments. Oh, yes, sir, I always lock it. How about the windows? What? The windows. Did you roll them all the way up? Roll them up. Well, now, once in a while I don't. Try to think of that. I'm not sure about this morning. No, come to think of it, I guess I didn't close them this morning. Such a wonderful day. Yes, sir. Well, that's probably how they got into your car. You happen to have the serial number of the radio, Dr. Halsey? No, no, I don't think I have. Might be on the papers. I just got the car a couple of months ago. Might be on the papers. I can check them for you. All right, sir. That'll help. I'll have my secretary look them up for you right away. Anyone else drive the car, Dr. Halsey? Oh, no, sir. Don't believe in that. I'm the only one. Been the only one to drive it. Don't believe in lending the car to somebody else. Never have believed in it. Mm Mm-hmm. Joe? Excuse me a minute, Dr. Halsey. Surely. Yeah, Leonard. Got a couple of clean prints on the dashboard. Might belong to the thief. Yeah. I'd like to check the doctor. It might be his. Okay. Wait a minute. I'll get the kit. I know. Hey, Dr. Halsey. Yes, Sergeant. Okay. Uh, this is Sergeant Tankersley of the fingerprint department. He'd like to check your prints. How do you do, sir? All right, doctor. wonder if I could look at your fingers, please. Surely. Can you tell just from looking at them what you want to know? No, sir, but you see the prints we found are whorl. If your prints were loops, there'd be no reason to take them. Oh, oh, yes. Uh-huh, I see. How about it, Link? Better roll them up for comparison. Hmm? We're going to take your prints, doctor, if you have no objection. Oh, no, no, of course not. Glad to help. All right, sir. You want to step over here? We can take them in the officer's car. Yes, glad to. Here, I'll get the door. Yeah, I'll get the pad. Now, doctor, if you let me have your hand. Surely, here. No, sir, if you let me do it, it'd be a little easier. Uh, oh, yes. Just trying to help. I will put them on the card. Never knew my fingers were so big. Just that we're taking the print of the whole tip of the finger, sir. Makes it look that way. Oh, oh I see. Uh-huh. All right, doctor, you can get the ink off with this, I think. Here, I'll pour a little on this cloth. Here you go. Uh, yeah, yes, thank you. What do you think, Leonard? I'll check them now. Sure be a break if they were the thieves. Mm-hmm. Well, there must be. Couldn't be anyone else's. Well, how about your family, Doctor? Possible the prince could be theirs, maybe? Oh, no, no, no chance. Jenny, that's my wife. She has her own car. Kids always use that one. Like I said, I'm the only one who uses this. Uh-huh. How about it, Lynn? Make them? Yeah. They belong to the Doctor. 10.02 a.m., the crime lab crew gathered what physical evidence they could find and returned to check over their findings. Frank and I took a report from Dr. Halsey, and then we talked to his secretary. She was unable to find the ownership papers on the car. We drove over to the dealer who had sold him the car and got the serial number of the stolen radio. We notified pawn shop detail and gave them the information. For the next three weeks, stakeouts on the parking lots in the central area continued. Arrests were made, but the thieves apparently had no connection with the gang we were after. They kept hitting, but the speed with which they operated made apprehending them difficult. On Friday, September 5th, we got a call that a stolen car had been recovered out in Topanga Canyon. We drove out to check on it. The tires, radio, horns, heater, spotlights, fog lights, and the side view mirrors had been taken. The seat covers had been removed and the hubcaps were missing. Again, there was no physical evidence that gave us a lead to the thieves. That night at 10.52 p.m., Frank and I checked back into the office. Another long day. Yeah, I'm kind of tired myself. Kind of hate the call, Faye. Why is that? Oh, this morning when I left, I told her I'd be home for dinner, sure. Well, didn't you call her? No, I forgot all about it. She's really going to be sore. Yeah, well, she'll get over it. 
I don't know, Joe. It's going to be a couple of days of quiet around the house, I think. Why, just because you missed a meal? No, it ain't that. She had tamale pie for dinner. Boy, she sure makes it good, too. A lot of cheese, you know? Yeah, well, she can warm it up for you when you get home. Here, go ahead. All right. If you want to sign us out, I'll check the book. Yeah, I'll get it. Anything? Yeah, a call from Brennan out in Wilshire. I'll call him. Hello, Brennan around? Yeah, all right. Say what it was about? No, I'm calling him now. Yeah, hi, Brennan. It's Friday. Yeah, you did, huh? Where'd that happen? No kidding. Well, where's the brakes, I think? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, thanks, Brennan. Picked up a kid for running a red light driving a hot rod. Yeah? Car was fixed up with a lot of new stuff. Guys out of Wilshire checked it over. Uh Uh-huh. According to the serial number on the radio, it was stolen from Dr. Halsey. You are listening to Dragnet, the authentic story of your police force in action. In 1952... American smokers bought more Chesterfields than ever before in the history of the industry. Today, sales are still going up. Smokers everywhere are changing to Chesterfield. Chesterfield, the first and only cigarette to give you premium quality in both regular and king size. Premium quality in a cigarette means the world's best tobaccos, the best ingredients, the best cigarette paper. Only Chesterfield gives you this premium quality in both popular sizes. King Size Chesterfield contains tobaccos of better quality and higher price than any other King Size cigarette. Well, that's certainly important to every King Size smoker. Of course, it's the same fine tobacco as in regular Chesterfield. There is absolutely no difference except that King Size Chesterfield gives you more than a fifth longer smoke. Remember... The modern way to sell cigarettes is the Chesterfield way. Premium quality, both regular and king size. Chesterfield is much milder. Chesterfield is best for you. Eleven twenty-seven p.m. Frank and I drove out to Wilshire Division. We checked with Sergeant Brennan, and he told us how the boy had been picked up. He'd run a red light at the corner of Pico and La Brea. He'd been stopped by two officers in a cruiser car. He was driving a cut-down 49 Ford that was equipped with Cadillac hubcaps, white sidewall tires, Chrysler horns, and a Cadillac radio. The officers had started to question him, and he'd attempted to escape. He'd been apprehended and brought to the station to be interrogated. In checking the serial number of the radio, the men from Wilshire Division had discovered that it was stolen and had left word for us. 11.45 p.m. We went to an interview room to talk to the boy. What's your name, son? Martin. First name? Herb. Herb Martin. You know why you're here, don't you? Yeah. You want to tell us where you got that stuff? I bought it. Where? Different places. You remember where? Not right off. How old are you? Nineteen. Where do you live? It's on the report. We're asking you. Come on, Herb. 8297 Mary Ann Drive. Where were you going when they stopped you? Home. Where'd you been? Around. Same place you bought that stuff on your car, huh? Yeah, that's right. Now, look, you better come off this young fella. You might think you're a big man, but you got things a little mixed up here. You got caught with a carload of stolen accessories. There's been a lot of stealing going on around town. The way your car looks, you could be responsible for it. Yeah, well, I'm not. You look good for it. Look, maybe I lifted the radio and stuff, but that don't mean I'm in on the other. Sure, I got no choice. You got me nailed for the stuff you found, but I'm not going to take it for the others. Maybe I stole that stuff, but that was for me. I didn't sell it like the others. Now, leave me alone, huh? What do you mean, others? I don't know what you mean. You said the others. Well, I didn't mean others like that. Well, how did you mean it? Well, like the guys you're looking for. That's not the way it sounded. No, you said it like you knew who you were talking about. I didn't say it like that. That's the way it sounded. That's right, son. Now, why don't you tell us who you meant? Look, Herb, we haven't got all day. Come on, boy. We're going to get them sometime. Who'd you mean? All right, I'll tell you. We continued to talk to Herb Martin. He told us of the activities of a gang of car strippers who were working on order. He went on to say that from what he'd heard, if someone wanted to pick up some fast money, a connection could be made with a man on the corner of Sunset and Western. The man would give the order for the stolen merchandise and say where and at what time it was to be delivered. 
Herb told us that he had the opportunity to do business with the man, but that he turned it down. He was unable to identify the man who made the contact and said that he'd never heard him referred to by name. He gave us the names and addresses of two of the men who were working for him. 12.45 a.m., Frank and I left and drove back downtown. With the assistance of officers from Wilshire Division, the two young men were brought in for questioning. They identified their contact as a Richard R. Ogden. We ran the name through R&I and found that Ogden had a previous record of petty theft. From the 510 in his package, we obtained his last known address, but the landlady told us that he'd moved and left no forwarding address. She told us, however, that she thought we could find him at the Meyer Garage on South Hoover. We drove over and found that it was a small place on the corner of Hoover and Mariposa. The owner, Alan Meyer, told us that Ogden did work for him, but that he was out. He said that the suspect was expected back almost any time. While we talked to him, Meyer worked on a small foreign car. Great little cars. Get a real kick out of working on them. Yeah, sure nice looking. You sell them, do you? No, I just service them. Mm -hmm. Oh, now and then I get accessories for them. You know, I order them up, install them. Cost too much to keep a regular stock of them. Yeah. When did you say that Ogden would be back? We should be here now. Probably got hung up someplace. Yeah, latest thing is a hard top. Made out of laminated fiberglass. Is that right? Yeah, fits right over them. Kind of makes them look like a small roll, you know? Then with wire wheel caps, baggage racks, wind wings, you can put a lot of money in them. Yeah, I guess so. What about all this other stuff here? Is that for these foreign cars, too? No, what do you mean? Oh, the tires and hubcaps here? No, no, that's where I make most of my money. I go out and buy them from Rex, bring them back here, straighten them out, resell them to the independent stations around town. They can sell them a lot cheaper than new ones run. We both make a little money out of it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Say, you guys like some peanuts? No. No, no, thanks. Okay, you don't mind if I have some, huh? Sure you don't want any? No, thanks very much. I guess I'm hungry in the morning. I'll keep these things around and munch on. Yeah. Go through a whole can of these a day. <laughs> They'll kill me. Now, get started on the things you can't stop. You sure you don't want some? Huh? No, no, thanks. How long have you known this Ogden, Meyer? Oh, I see. Uh, I guess it's been ten years, anyway. He went to work for me a year ago. Mm -hmm. Good man. Brought a lot of business in. Say, what is it you want to see him about? Oh, we'd like to talk to him. You don't want to tell me, huh? be better if we talk to him, Mr. Meyer. Yeah. Well, here he is now. Hey, Dick. Yeah? A couple of fellas here want to see you. Yeah, what is it? You Richard Ogden? Yeah, that's right. Police officers. I'm Frank Smith. This is my partner, Joe Friday. What is it you guys want me for? I'd like to talk to you, Ogden. Well, go ahead. Might be better if we went outside. Well, look, you can talk to him here. I got some work I can do in the office. Don't want to bother you, Mr. Meyer. No, no trouble at all. Well, now, what's this all about? You know a couple of kids named Jerry Z. Swanson and uh, Harry T. Benson? Swanson and Benson? No, I don't think I do. They say they know you. They say they do some work for you. Sorry to bother you. I forgot my peanuts. It's all right, sir. I'll be in the office if you need anything. Thank you, sir. No, anything at all. Yes, sir. What about it, Ivan? What about what? You know the kids? It's Benson and Swanson. No, I told you what. All right, mister, let's go downtown. We'll talk it over there, huh? What for? Why are you pulling me in? I want you to meet the two boys if you don't know them. Well, what's that going to prove? We want to know why they named you. Why they said you were responsible for the car stripping that's been going on. You mean you believe them? We've got no reason not to. I don't think they'd stage a thing like this. they got a lot to lose. So have I. You get me down there and those two kids point me out and I haven't got a chance. Even if I'm not the one and they say I am, you won't give me a break. No, if you haven't done anything, you got nothing to worry about. I'm not going. Alan? Hey, Alan. Yeah, what is it, Dick? Come here, will you? Yeah, right away. What's the matter? Something wrong? Well, these guys are going to take me to jail. Well, what for? What's he done? We want to talk to him, Meyer. We think he's involved in some car thefts. Well, I know that's not true. Dick wouldn't do a thing like that. I know. I've known him a long time. No, I'm sorry, sir, but the information we've got says he did. Why, Dick? Why'd you do a thing like that? Hmm? If what these officers say is true, well... Gee, that's awful. Why would you do a thing like that? What are you talking about? All right, come on, Ogden, let's go. No, I'm not going. I think you better do what the officers say, Dick. It'll be better if you don't cause any trouble. Well, wait a minute. What are you trying to prove with this? I don't know what you mean. Next thing you'll be trying to involve me in this. Yeah, well, that's just what I'm going to do. You see, officers, that's terrible. Well, don't you listen to him. He's the guy behind the whole thing. Look over there, the tires, all this stuff. Sure, I stole them. I had the kids go out and pick them up, but he set it up. He sold them to the stations. He took most of the money, the whole... The whole thing was his idea. Well, Dick, how can you say that? Well, I but... can say it because it's true. I'll tell you all about it. You take him downtown, I'll tell you all about it. You're not going to let me stand for this alone. And to think that he'd do a thing like this to me after we've been friends for so long. Bring me stolen merchandise to sell. You got anything to back up what you're saying, Ogden? Sure, I have. You just bet I can back it up. Go ahead. 
Well, you look at his books, not the ones he's got out in the open, but you look at the ones in the safe. It's all there. All the deals he's made with the owners of the stations, all the orders, what he paid the kids for them, and what he got for them. Didn't think I knew about it, did you? A whole lousy year I've been doing the dirty work for him. Well, I've had it. I'm through. I've had it. Let me take the beef. What a crumb. I'll show you. I don't understand it. Friends for so long. I'd have gotten you out. Ten years we've been friends. I trusted you all that time. Then you sold me out. Why? Well, that shouldn't be too tough for you to figure. Huh? You showed him how. The story you have just heard was true. The names were changed to protect the innocent. On January 21st, trial was held in Department 87, Superior Court of the State of California, in and for the County of Los Angeles. In a moment, the results of that trial. Now, here is our star, Jack Webb. Thank you, George Fenneman. Remember, only Chesterfield gives you this scientific evidence on the effects of smoking. After ten full months, the group examined showed no adverse effects on the nose, throat, and sinuses from smoking Chesterfield. Now, speaking personally as a Chesterfield smoker, I know they're best for me. Either way you like them, you'll find Chesterfield is best for you. Richard R. Ogden and Alan Y. Meyer were tried and convicted of receiving stolen property. They received sentences as prescribed by law. Receiving stolen property is punishable by imprisonment in the state penitentiary for a period of not more than ten years or in the county jail for not more than one year. The investigation of the records of Alan Y. Meyer uncovered the names of the other men involved in the thefts. They, along with Herbert S. Martin, Jerry Z. Swanson, and Harold T. Benson, were tried on a charge of grand theft auto and convicted. They were sentenced to the state penitentiary at San Quentin, California, for the term as prescribed by law. Grand theft auto is punishable by imprisonment in the state penitentiary for a period of not less than one, nor more than ten years. Ladies and gentlemen, ten million Americans have diseases of the heart and blood vessels. What are the causes and the cures? Well, it'll take research to find out. Send what you can to heart. Care of your local post office. Help your heart fund. Help your heart. You have just heard Dragnet, a series of authentic cases from official files. Technical advice comes from the office of Chief of Police W.H. Parker, Los Angeles Police Department. Technical advisors Captain Jack Donahoe, Sergeant Marty Wynn, Sergeant Vance Brasher. Heard tonight were Ben Alexander, Sarah Selby, Art Gilmore. Script by John Robinson. Music by Walter Schumann. Hal Gibney speaking. For a million laughs, tune in Chesterfield's Martin and Lewis show Tuesday night on this same NBC station. And sound off for Chesterfield, either regular or king size. You'll find premium quality Chesterfield's much milder. Chesterfield is best for you. Chesterfield has brought you Dragnet transcribed from Los Angeles. Tonight, it's Adventure with Barry Craig, Confidential Investigator on NBC. Sound off for Chesterfield. Chesterfield. The first and only cigarette in America to give you premium quality in both regular and king size brings you Dragnet. Ladies and gentlemen, the story you are about to hear is true. The names have been changed to protect the innocent. You're a detective sergeant. You're assigned a forgery detail. Two men have been passing bad checks in your city. You have descriptions of both of them. You know the names on the checks. Your job, get them. First, we read you the six months report. Then, the eight months report. Now, here is ten full months of scientific evidence on smoking Chesterfields. A medical specialist is making regular bi-monthly examinations of a group of people from various walks of life. Forty-five percent of this group have smoked Chesterfields for an average of over ten years. 
After ten full months, almost a year now, the specialist reports he observed no adverse effects on the nose, throat, and sinuses of the group from smoking Chesterfield. That's the report. And Chesterfield is the first and only premium quality cigarette throughout, in both regular and king size. Fine tobaccos, the world's best, kept tasty and fresh, wrapped in the finest cigarette paper money can buy. Yes, everything that goes into your Chesterfield makes it the premium quality cigarette. And it's the only cigarette that gives you scientific evidence of real smoking pleasure. Try much milder Chesterfield today. They're best for you. Dragnet, the documented drama of an actual crime. For the next 30 minutes, in cooperation with the Los Angeles Police Department, you will travel step by step on the side of the law through an actual case transcribed from official police files. From beginning to end, from crime to punishment, Dragnet is the story of your police force in action. It was Thursday, April 8th. It was windy in Los Angeles. We were working the day watch out of forgery detail. My partner's Frank Smith. The boss is Captain Welsh. My name's Friday. We were on the way back from the main jail, and it was 9.46 a.m. when we got to room 29. Forgery. Well, that wraps that one up. Yeah. When are we going to rain him? Oh, will figure day after tomorrow. Okay. Well, let's get started on these other crime reports, huh? Yeah. Friday? Smith? Yeah, Skipper. Huh. See you a minute? Sure. Sit down. What's up, Skipper? How's the Clements thing going? Well, we just talked to him. Says he'll plead guilty. Mm-hmm. Well, I want you to take a look at this. Okay. Oh, border checks, huh? Yeah. I want you two to go to work on it. Are we going to work with Saunders and Bowie on it? I want you to take it over. Well, is there a case in it? Yeah, but we got a call from San Francisco last night. They got Richards up there. Oh? At least they know he's operating in the Bay Area. Saunders and Bowie left last night. They've been on that one for the last year. Looks like they can clean it up. They get back for you, bust this, they'll give you a hand. Well, what's the pitch on it, Skipper? It's all there. Let's take a look, huh, Joe? Mm-hmm. Sure, a bunch of paper. Near as we can figure, they've been working a little over a year. Yeah. All the checks are drawn on big companies here. You any idea where they're getting them? No, not yet. How far we got on it? Saunders and Bowman have been working on it. They got about halfway through the list of print shops in the city. Then this thing up north came up. Mm-hmm. Let me see some of the checks. Oh, yeah, sure, here. We got rubber companies, oil companies, department stores, aircraft. Plants. How about the ID when they pass them? It works. Driver's licenses, social security cards, lodge cards. Looks legit enough. Been a lot of people taken. Descriptions always match, do they? Close enough, yeah. Now and then there's a little difference, but they all match up close enough. Still using the same bad border. Uh-huh. You notice that even though they change the name of the company on the check, change the heading all around, they use the same border on all of them. Yeah, I see. Look, there in the lower left-hand corner. See? Yeah. Plate's broken. Little break in the border. Mm-hmm. All the checks they pass have the same thing. Yeah, well, you wouldn't notice it unless you're really looking for it, would you? Well, that's it. All the reports are there. Everything that's been done, it's in your lap now. Need anything, let me know. Right. Okay, Skipper, we'll get right on it. Well, from the package here, sure looks like they're scoring good, doesn't it? How much they gotten? Well, let's see. Figures about $70,000. Huh. All the bulletins we put out. Know the people you cash checks for. Yeah. 70000 It's a lot of money, isn't it? Sure is. If people would just read those bulletins, they never learn, huh? 10.02 a.m. We started through the package. The check forgers had been working for over a year. They'd passed phony checks all over the southern part of the state. The amounts on the checks varied from $50 to $275. They carried 10 different endorsements. The names and signatures had been run through our files, but we'd gotten no identification. The writing had been checked by Don Meyer, but there were no examples in the files that matched. During the next two days, we finished canvassing the print shops in the area in an attempt to find where the bad checks were being printed. We came up with no new information. Additional circulars were gotten out to all stores and check cashing agencies in the area, giving the description of the two men and lists of the companies the checks had been drawn upon. Photographs of the checks pointing out the border defect were also distributed. Two weeks went by. No results. Informants had been checked and rechecked. Known forgers had been questioned. The victims of the forgers had been shown the mug books. They failed to make any identification. From what they'd told us, we had the artist in the crime lab draw up a composite picture of the two men. Copies of these were distributed to the people and organizations most likely to cash the phony checks. Lieutenant Saunders and Sergeant Bomey finished their investigation up in San Francisco and joined us in the search for the forgers. Tuesday, April 27th, 10.14 a.m., Frank and I checked back into the office. 
lousy thing. Yeah. Clutch was out. You know, I thought it was a pin. Sure felt like it. Funny feeling when you press down, there's nothing there. Yeah, did he say when it would be ready? I thought he could have it for us in the morning. I'll check the business office and get another car. I mean, we'll try to get a good one, huh? The last one we drew was about to fall apart. Yeah. I'll get it. Forgery, Friday. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am, that's right. What? Uh-huh. What was that address again? Yes, ma'am, I have it. Yeah. Yeah, well, do everything you can. Yes, ma'am. Right away. We'll get your coat. What is it? Check cashing agency out on Pico. The guy's there now. Frank and I left the office and checked out another car. We drove out to the check cashing agency on Pico. It was located near a large tool and dye plant, and they advertised that they cashed payroll checks. 10.33 a.m. We parked the car and went into the store. Are you the police? Yes, ma'am. Are you the one that placed the call? I sure am. I stalled him like you said. That's him back there. Uh-huh. I told him that he'd have to wait for the manager to get back and open the safe. He got pretty huffy about it at first. Then he said he'd wait. I think he's been drinking. Yes, ma'am. All right, we'll talk to him. He's the one. You'll see. I spotted him right away. Took one look at him, and I knew he was the one you've been looking for. All right, ma'am. Let's go. Sure fits the description. Now he's the one. Excuse me. Yeah? You wanted to cash a check, did you? Yeah, that's right. What if we could see your identification? A young lady has it. Here it is. His driver's license and his social security card. All right, thank you. Leslie P. Bergen, is that right? That's what it says. Yeah, we've seen it before. Hmm? What if we could see that check? Please? You bet. I'll get it for you. Well, look, there's no reason to make a federal case out of this. Give me the check and I'll go someplace else. I tell you, though, you act like this to everybody who comes in here, you ain't going to stay in business long. Yeah. Here you are, officer. Here's the check. What's she talking about? What? Officer. She called him officer. What are you, cops? You called him. How about it, Joe? Yeah, broken border. Mm. Where'd you get this check, mister? Well, what do you mean, where did I get it? They gave it to me at the plant. Gave you this check, huh? Yeah, that's why. Say, what's this all about, anyway? How come you guys are so interested? I wonder if we can see what you got in your pockets. No, I don't have to show you. It's none of your business. You have been drinking, mister? None of your business. You got no call to act like this? All right, this? come on, let's see what's in your pockets. Well, what's that going to prove? Now, look, Bergen, if you haven't done anything wrong, then you got no reason not to show us, have you? Yeah. Oh, all right. Put the things here on the counter. Huh? All right, here. You guys can regret this, you know. Is that right? You just bet. I've got a lot of friends in pretty high places, and they're going to hear about this. You guys be sorry you ever started this. Uh huh. All right, come on. You can go a little faster than that, can't you? All right, here. Here's some keys, chains, money clip. All right, pick up the money and keep that with you. Now, just the money. Now, the back pockets. Back pockets? That's right. We want to see what's in them, too. Mm-hmm. Well, uh, all righty. I'm glad to cooperate with the law. Nice to know you guys are this alert. I'm glad to know you're doing your duty. Yeah, come on. Let's get to those back pockets, shall we? Say, what's your name? Friday. Cop, huh? That's right. Friday, huh? Yeah, what's your first name? Joe. Joe Friday. That's right. Now, come on. Get the stuff out of your back pockets. Will you stall long I enough? I bet you think I'm trying to hide something in there, huh? Well, you're wrong. I got nothing to hide. There's my wallet. Comb. That's all. This key here? Yeah. Keys to your car? No, I don't have a car. Oh, that's not true, officer. I saw him drive up. That's his car out in front, the red Ford. Is that right, Bergen? Well, now, maybe it is, and then maybe again it isn't. You want to check on it, Frank? Yeah. Here's the keys. Uh, I hate to think of it. I really do. What's that? Trouble you guys are going to get into when my friends in high places hear about this. Yeah, sure. Let's look at your wallet, huh? Why, you bet. Always glad to cooperate with the law. No, you hold it. Just open it up. Any money in it? I told you the money's in the money clip. Right here. You told me to keep it. You don't remember very well, do well, these you? these your cards here? Business cards? Uh, let me see. Uh, here. Yeah, certainly. They're mine. Leslie Paul Bergen, business advisor. I thought you said you worked at the plant. Part-time job. What's your name? Friday. What's your first name? Joe, I told you. Joe Friday, huh? I'd remember that and tell my friends in high places. How about your coat pockets? Anything in them? Well, cigarettes, maybe handkerchiefs, matches. That's about all. All right, let's see them. All righty. Sure nice to know that we got officers like you, always doing your duty. Yeah, see? Nothing. Mm-hmm. Where'd you say you got this check? What check? This one here, the one you tried to cash. Oh, yeah, that check. Yeah, that check. That's the one. Well, I got it from a friend. Uh, he asked me to cash it for him. Just so happened I had the money, so I did. Anything wrong with cashing a check for a friend? How come the check's made out to you? They always make checks out to me. Always do down the plant. Now, look, mister, you got your stories all mixed up here. Let's go downtown and get this thing straightened out, shall we? Joe. Yeah. We hit it. 
23 checks all made out to him. Found them in the glove compartment of the car. The car's registered to a Leslie R. Doyle. What's his name? Smith. First name? Frank. Frank Smith. What is this? No, he's a happy drunk. Oh. He's checked yours, Doyle? Well, let me see. Never saw those in my life. Well, we found them in your car. Oh, I certainly don't understand that. In my car? Yes, huh? that's right. Now, come on, let's go downtown. Where are we going? Downtown. What's your name? Smith. Frank Smith. Phony name. You wait till my friends hear about this policeman using an alias. My friends are going to hear about this, you know. Yeah, sure. Ah, in high places. 10.57 a.m. The suspect admitted that his true name was Leslie Doyle and that the car belonged to him. We took him to the city hall. Frank ran the name through R&I, but we got no make on him. His prints were rolled, but there was no record on him. A communication was gotten off to George Brereton, CII Sacramento, and one was sent to Washington. 11.30 a.m., we took him to the interrogation room to question him. I told you, I don't know where the checks came from. They were found in your car. So they were found in my car. That means they're mine. Looks like you had something to do with it. They all were made out to you, the phony ID you got there. Well, maybe it's a joke. Maybe it's some of the idea of a gag. Well, that's huh? not very funny, is it, Doyle? Well, you don't have to tell me. Say, you got another aspirin. My head's coming apart. Frank, you got yeah. it. Here. Yeah, thanks. Got some water? I'll get some for you. Oh, never mind. I'll take it without. I thought you might have a tap here. What? Sure. You turn it on and let it drip, and then you don't give people none until they answer your questions. Yeah, sure. You take pills like I do, you get to the point where the only important thing is to get them in your stomach. All right. Now, how about the checks, huh? I told you a hundred times I know anything about them. Then maybe we better fill you in, huh? Yeah, go ahead. I like to hear. We got you for trying to pass a check this morning, didn't we? You want to cop out to that? So maybe one check. Like I said, that's no crime. I cashed it for a guy. Maybe it was the same guy who applied in the other ones. Oh, why don't you come off it, Doyle? Let's stop playing games here. We made you for the forgeries, and you know it. Your description matches the one we got. You turn up with 23 checks made out to you, all drawn on different companies. The border on the checks matches the ones we're looking for. We got witnesses who identify you. Now, why not save a lot of time and admit it? Come on, Doyle. Doyle? Don't look like there's any other way, does it? Not from here. Hmm. Well, if I cop out, will it help any? What do you mean? Like you said, now let's stop playing games. Will it help me out any? You're liable for one to 14 on each count. If I help? All we can do is see that it's marked down that way. That's all? That's all. Well, then I got nothing to lose by not talking. That's the wrong way to look at it. You guys haven't come up with any other way. We don't make deals, Doyle. You know that. Well, all right. I'll play it that way, too. Now, let's get this 510, huh? Your true name, Leslie Richard Doyle? Yeah. Charge, suspicion, 470 PC, forgery, April 27. Where do you live, Doyle? I told you once. Well, tell us again, would you? 19,540 North Edge Hill Avenue. Is that a private home? No, it's an apartment. What's the number? Say, you got another aspirin. This headache's the worst one I ever had. Don't worry, they're going to get worse. We continued to talk to Doyle. He told us that he'd come from back east about a year and a half ago. He said that he'd never been arrested and he had no record. He refused to tell us who his confederate was in the forgery operation, and he told us that we'd get no help from him in proving that he was mixed up in it. We booked him at the main jail, and then we got in touch with Lieutenant Saunders and Sergeant Bomey. Together with them, we arranged a special show-up. The victims of the forgers were asked to be present, and 12 of them gave us a positive identification of Doyle as the man who'd victimized them. The others said that he was not the man. When confronted with this information, Doyle confessed to being one of the men involved, but he still refused to name his accomplice. A week went by. Each day, we questioned Doyle. Gradually, we pieced together a picture of their operation. Doyle still refused to tell us where we could find his partner. The kickback from Washington and Sacramento arrived, but gave us no new information. All known friends and associates of Doyle were checked out. From them, we found out that Doyle did work with another man, but that none of the witnesses could identify him. The rumble was that the two men had split up because of Doyle's drinking. We were able to get little other information on the missing partner. Wednesday, May 5th, 11.40 a.m., Frank and I checked into Captain Welsh's office. How about it? No, nothing, Skipper. He says that he knew Doyle, but he doesn't know the other man. Any of the other leads pan out? No, none of them. Hmm. Where do you go from here? Well, talking to Doyle's friend, we found out they used to hang out down around Wilshire and Olympic. You know the area down there? Yeah. Well, Frank and I have been talking it over. Looks like about the only way to bring him out is to go looking for him. Well, so you guys go down there, eh? Well, we checked on that. The bunch down there aren't too chummy. They don't talk to strangers much, so we figured that maybe the best idea would be for one of us to go undercover. 
Maybe pose as a thief, buy our stolen goods, something like that. We might get a line on them that way. Yeah, might work. Well, not much choice now. We've tried about everything else. Well, which one of you is going to do it? Well, I thought maybe I'd be the one. No, I don't know if that's such a good idea. Why not, Skipper? Joe took the last one. Yeah, but didn't you work that area when you were in Vice? Yeah, but that was a couple of years ago. Still might be some people down there who remember you. You better take this one on Friday. All right. When do you figure to start? I thought in the morning. Okay, work out the way you're going to keep in contact. All the details will give you the help you need to swing it. Right, Skipper. I don't know, Joe. Seems like you're always the one to draw this duty. Ought to be my turn sometime. I'll trade with you. You are listening to Dragnet, the authentic story of your police force in action. Smokers all over America are changing to Chesterfield because Chesterfields are premium quality throughout in both regular and king size. King size Chesterfield contains tobaccos of better quality and higher price than any other king size cigarette. That's certainly important to every king size smoker. Of course, it's the same fine tobacco as in regular Chesterfield. There's absolutely no difference except that king-size Chesterfield gives you more than a fifth longer smoke. So remember, the modern way to sell cigarettes is the Chesterfield way. First and only cigarette with premium quality in both regular and king-size. Chesterfield is much milder. Chesterfield is best for you. Thursday, May 6th, 9.30 a.m. I left my apartment and went down to the vicinity of Wilshire and Olympic. I spent an hour wandering around the bars in the area, and then I checked into a small hotel down on South Hill. I registered as Joe Kelvin from Phoenix, Arizona. I told the clerk that I was in town on business and that I'd be there as long as it took me to conclude the deal I was working on. I spent the afternoon in a bar on 4th Street, and I got friendly with a bartender. I asked him if he knew Leslie Doyle, and he told me that he'd seen him around, but that he didn't know him very well. I asked if he'd ever seen Doyle with another man. He said that he had, but he didn't know who he was. The bartender went on to say that the two men had frequent arguments and that they usually ended up with the other man walking out and Doyle going on a drunk. He told me that I might be able to get some additional information on the man in a cafe over on 5th Street. I spent the next three days wandering around that area eating my meals in the restaurant. At the end of that time, I had no new leads. Frank, Saunders, and Bomey were still working on the case, and Frank told me that the bad border check passing was still going on. Further conversations with Doyle netted them nothing. At the end of a week, I'd gotten to know one of the waitresses at the restaurant, and she indicated that she knew Doyle's partner, that she knew him merely as Mac. She was unable to tell me where I could find him. I got in touch with Frank Smith, and he ran the name through the moniker file on R&I, but he got no make. Friday, May 14th, 10.56 a.m., I stopped for breakfast. Morning, Joe. Hi, Agnes. What'll it be this morning? Well, let's see. Orange juice, a couple of eggs, toast, and coffee. Right. Eggs sunny side up? Yeah. How's the bacon? Great, just like always. All right, a couple of pieces. Yeah. Want to bring the coffee right away? Yeah. Is that the morning paper? Here. Yeah. Thank you. What happened to the sports page? Here. You don't look good this morning, bad and I? Yeah. I had trouble getting to sleep last night. Mm-hmm. How's the deal coming? Oh, all right. I should wind it up in a couple of days. What business are you in, anyway? Oh, you could call me kind of a broker, I guess. That right? Yeah. Coffee's good or hot. Yeah. Just what does that mean? What, the coffee? Being a broker. Oh, I buy things for a price, and I resell them for more. Things you buy, they hot? Well, why do you ask that? Just wondered. Rumbles around that you're in town buying stolen stuff. Is that right? That's what they say. Is it true? I don't know. I haven't been talking to the same people as you. Is that the reason you want to get in touch with Mac? Well, look, if I answer that, I've answered the first question, haven't I? Yeah. Is that the reason, Joe? Oh, it might be. Where's the sports page? Is it around? Why, do you know where I can get in touch with them? I like you, Joe. Yeah, well, I think you're nice, too. I'd like to have the sports page if you could find it for me. No, I mean it. 
I think you're all right. Well, thanks, Agnes. That's nice of you to say that. You've never tried to get fresh. Different from most of the guys that come in here. Is that right? Sure. Guys all the time getting fresh asking me out. Not you, Joe. You got a girl in Phoenix? Oh, I might have, yeah. I haven't been back for a while, you know. Mm-hmm. Lucky girl. What's she like, Joe? Who's that? Girl in Phoenix. Oh, I guess she's a little like you. She's a nice girl. You want to get married? Well, I don't know. It kind of depends on this deal here I'm working on. It'd be nice if you got married. I'm going to get married someday. That'll be nice. It'd be real nice if you got married. Depends on this deal, huh? Yeah, that's right. Okay. I'll tell you how to get in touch with Mac. 11.14 a.m., I continued to talk to Agnes. She told me that she didn't know where Mac lived, but that she could put me in touch with a man who might. She gave me the address, and I drove over to the place. It was a rooming house on South Vermont. I talked to the man. He told me that he'd seen Mac during the past week, and that as far as he knew, the suspect was still living in an apartment house on 7th Street. 1.15 p.m. I called the office and Frank Smith came out to meet me. We arrived at the apartment house and talked to the manager, a Mrs. Nancy Holmes. She told us that she had a tenant named McLean who answered the description we gave her. She told us that McLean had lived in the apartment for the past eight months. She went on to say that she didn't know what business he was in, but that up until a few weeks ago, he was in the company of a man called Doyle. Her description of the man matched that of the suspect. 2.46 p.m. In the company of the manager, we went through McLean's apartment. We found 14 checks made out to him, and all of them drawn on large companies. All of them had the same broken printed border. Frank and I waited for him to return. 5.32 p.m. What are you doing here? Your name Gene McLean? Yeah, who are you? Police officers. These checks here. Where'd you get those? On the desk over there. You got no right to go through my things. We'll talk about that downtown. Come on, let's go. Now, look, maybe you guys made a mistake, huh? Maybe you got the wrong fella. Can't we work something out? This is a pretty good thing. There's enough for everybody. I'm sure we can make a deal, huh? No reason to act like this. Where's the press, mister? Huh? The press you print these up on, where is it? I don't know what you're talking about. I don't know anything about a press. I don't even know what you're talking about. It won't work, McLean. We got Doyle. What's he told you? All we need. Well, then he's told you where the press is, too. We're asking you about that, mister. Well, like I said, I don't know what you're talking about. You drive a car, McLean? Yeah. Where'd you park it? On the street. No garages in this crummy place. No, that's not true, Mr. McLean. Oh, keep your nose out of this. You've been spotting off too much already. That's not true, Mr. McLean. I heard everything from the hall. These officers asked me some questions, and I answered them. Police have never given me any trouble. Ten years I've been managing this place, never had no trouble before. Now you come in here and louse things oh, up. turn that off. Come on, let's get out of here. Now you just wait a minute. Come in here and call this a crummy place. You did not hurt you, did you? Well, I did. Listen, officer, he's lying when he says he doesn't have a garage. He may keep his car out on the street. Maybe that part's true, but he's got a garage you just bet he has. Come on, let's get out of here. Stick around here and listen to this loony old bag. She's cracking up. Where is the garage, ma'am? I'll show you. It's just down the street. It's an old place. They rent it from the Pearsons just down the street. I'll show you. Crummy old bat. Real harpy. Sticking her nose in where it don't belong. Don't you talk to me like that. I don't know what it is that these officers are looking for. Yeah. But I'll just bet they'll find it there. 6.27 p.m. Mrs. Holmes showed us down the street to a garage set behind a large house. The door was locked, but McLean produced the key. We went over the place, but we found nothing. 6.55 p.m. Satisfied now? Told you there wasn't anything wrong. I told you you wouldn't find anything here. It's got to be here someplace, Joe. Yeah. How long you had this place, McLean? A couple of months. Now, we can check the owner on that. Aren't you guys ever going to give up? You maybe got me in custody, but that don't mean you're ever going to be able to prove anything. I think maybe we'll be able to. Joe. Yeah? Take a look here. On the floor. Mm-hmm. Look here. See the old wooden floor, and most of the nails are all rusted over. And right here, they look pretty new. Looks like the wood's been moved. Mm-hmm. How about this, McLean? I don't know what you're talking about. Grab that hammer, will you, Frank, over there? Yeah, sure. Here you go. All right. Tell me we can take a look. Guys, you're wasting your time. You know that, don't you? Yeah, well, it's our time. Don't you worry about it. You want to give me a hand here, Frank? Yeah. All right. You got it? I got it. All right. It's all dug out down there. Yeah. Let's take a look. There's something down there. How about this, McLean? I don't know what you're talking about. The press, huh? Yeah. Wait a minute. 
Little package over here. Let's see what's in it. Look, you got no right to come in here and tear up the place. I'm going to see a lawyer about this. How about it, Joe? Yeah. Printing press. Take a look. Huh. Engraver's plates. Look, here's the broken border. Yep. All right, McLean, let's go. You just wait. My lawyer's going to hear about this. Is that right? Yeah, you bet it's right. Come in here, tear up the floor. You got no warrant, you got no right. Sick of being shoved around by you guys. You haven't got any beef, McLean. I'll decide that. No, you're wrong. Huh? Somebody else is going to do that. The story you have just heard was true. The names were changed to protect the innocent. On August 25th, trial was held in Department 89, Superior Court of the State of California, in and for the County of Los Angeles. In a moment, the results of that trial. Now, here is our star, Jack Webb. Thank you, George Fenneman. Friends, here are two important things to remember. Everything that goes into your Chesterfield makes it the premium quality cigarette, and it's the only cigarette that gives scientific evidence of real smoking pleasure. Try much milder Chesterfields today. They're best for you. Leslie Paul Doyle and Jean Raoul McLean were tried and convicted of ten counts of forgery. They received their sentences as prescribed by law and are now serving their term in the state penitentiary, San Quentin, California. Forgery is punishable by imprisonment in the state penitentiary for a period of not less than one, nor more than 14 years. Ladies and gentlemen, with long-range aircraft and atomic bombs, the enemy is only hours away from where you live. Our Air Defense Command relies on radar to detect enemy aircraft. But it is possible for low-flying planes to remain undetected. You can help defend America by volunteering for the Ground Observer Corps, a group of civilian men, women, and teenagers who report the presence and activity of aircraft. For information, write or phone your nearest Civil Defense Center. You have just heard Dragnet, a series of authentic cases from official files. Technical advice comes from the office of Chief of Police W.H. Parker, Los Angeles Police Department. Technical advisors, Captain Jack Donahoe, Sergeant Marty Wynn, Sergeant Vance Brasher. Heard tonight were Ben Alexander, Art Gilmore, Whit Connor. Script by John Robinson. Music by Walter Schumann. Hal Gibney speaking. For a million laughs, tune in Chesterfield's Martin and Lewis show Tuesday night on this same NBC station. And sound off for Chesterfield, regular or king size. You'll find premium quality Chesterfields much milder. Chesterfield is best for you. Chesterfield has brought you Dragnet transcribed from Los Angeles. Tonight, it's Adventure with Barry Craig, Confidential Investigator on NBC. Sound off for Chesterfield. Chesterfield, the first and only cigarette in America to give you premium quality in both regular and king size brings you Dragnet. Ladies and gentlemen, the story you are about to hear is true. The names have been changed to protect the innocent. You're a detective sergeant. You're assigned a homicide detail. A young woman tells you that her mother has disappeared. There's no trace of her whereabouts. Foul play is suspected. Your job, investigate. First, we read you the six months report. Then the eight months report. Now, here is ten full months of scientific evidence on smoking Chesterfields. A medical specialist is making regular bi-monthly examinations of a group of people from various walks of life. 45% of this group have smoked Chesterfields for an average of over 10 years. After 10 full months, almost a year now, the specialist reports he observed no adverse effects on the nose, throat, and sinuses of the group from smoking Chesterfield. That's the report. 
And Chesterfield is the first and only cigarette with premium quality throughout, in both regular and king size. Fine tobaccos, the world's best. Costly moistening agents to keep them always tasty, always fresh. And the finest cigarette paper money can buy. Yes, everything that goes into your Chesterfield makes it the premium quality cigarette. And it's the only cigarette that gives you this scientific evidence of real smoking pleasure. Try much milder Chesterfield today. They're best for you. Dragnet, the documented drama of an actual crime. For the next 30 minutes, in cooperation with the Los Angeles Police Department, you will travel step by step on the side of the law through an actual case transcribed from official police files. From beginning to end, from crime to punishment, Dragnet is the story of your police force in action. It was Tuesday, August 5th. It was hot in Los Angeles. We were working the day watch out of homicide detail. My partner's Frank Smith. The boss is Thad Brown, chief of detectives. My name's Friday. We were on the way out from the office, and it was 10.46 a.m. when we got to 4298 North Estrella Street. The front door. Hot. Yeah, it sure is. Yes, Mrs. Uh, what's her name? Randall, Ella Randall. Mm-hmm. Did she say what this was about? I just said that her mother disappeared. She wanted to talk to us about it. Uh-huh. Yes? Ms. Randall? Yes, that's right. Police officers, ma'am. Oh, yes, come in, won't you? Thank you. Thanks, it's ma'am. warm out. I, I think I'll leave the door open. Hope the flies don't come in. My name's Friday, Mrs. Randall. This is my partner, Frank Smith. Uh, how do you do? How do you do, ma'am? Could you tell us just what it is you want to see us about? Well, of course. Sit down, won't you? Oh, thank you, Miss Randall. Would you like some tea or something? I have some ready in the kitchen. No, thanks. Just what was it about your mother, Mrs. Randall? <laughs> now that you're here, I guess maybe I could be wrong about it. I was so sure. Well, just what is it, ma'am? Well, Mama's gone. I don't know how long it's been, but she isn't with Papa. Well, what's your mother's name, Miss Randall? Bertha. Bertha Schroeder, my father's Henry. Uh-huh. Well, what makes you think that there might be something wrong? You said in the phone that you were pretty sure that something had happened to her. Well, yes, I guess I ought to start at the beginning. It's kind of a dull story, but maybe it's the best way. All right, ma'am. You sure you wouldn't like a glass of iced tea? No, thanks, ma'am. Thanks, just the same. <laughs> Mind if I get some? Just take a minute. All right. Hey, it's a nice place, huh? Yeah, it is. Sure decorated nice. Hey, look at those trivets. What? Trivets. Those little things over the fireplace, those brass Oh, yeah, yeah. Faith's been wanting some of those. I used to use them to hold irons, you know, they get hot, and you put them on the ironing board so they won't burn the cloth. Put them on those things. Yeah. I brought a couple extra glasses in case you decided you wanted some. Well, if you just go ahead with the story, Miss Randall. Yes, well, to understand it, really, you'd have to know Papa. Mm-hmm. He came over to this country when he was just a boy, only about 16 or so. Landed here and couldn't speak more than a dozen words of English. Went to work in New York. Worked as a construction man. Worked hard. Met Mama there, and they got married. Right after that, they moved out here, bought a house, and Papa went into business for himself. Yes, ma'am. Well, maybe it was the life he'd had when he got here. I don't know, but he always treated Mama like she was so much dirt. Mean. Time went on, he got meaner to her. Remember when us kids were in school, he used to yell at her all the time. He'd get in the mood, and he wouldn't talk to any of us for days at a time. Is that so? I never knew how Mama took it. She never said anything, just stand there and let him scream at her. And when he was finished, she'd just kind of shrug her shoulders and take his kids out of the house, walk around for a while, and then go back to the house. By that time, Papa was so mad he wouldn't talk to anyone. Uh-huh. Go ahead. Well, all of us kids married young. I got married when I was 16. The rest of the kids weren't much older than that. Papa didn't want us around after that. He said for us to get out and make our own way. He said that we had to. So there's no reason that we shouldn't. <clears throat> you, you sure you don't want some of this? No, thank you, ma'am. Thank you very much, ma'am. Would well, you mind going ahead, Ms. Ryan? Yeah, yes. A couple of months ago, I tried to call Mama. The operator told me that the phone had been disconnected. Beg your pardon? I, uh, the operator told me that the phone had been disconnected when I tried to get hold of Mama. I see. Now, I waited a couple of days. You know, I figured that maybe she'd call me. Yes, ma'am. Well, she didn't. You see, once we were out of the house, none of us went back. Papa's retired, and none of us wanted to see him. It's a terrible thing to say, Mr. Friday, but it's true. Ma'am? We all hated him, all of us kids, for what he'd done to us, the beatings and all, but most for what he'd done to Mama. She was only 52, and she looked like she was 92 terrible the way he treated her. I see. And like I said, we'd never go over there, but Mama'd come to see us whenever she could. She'd come over, visit for a little bit, you know, talk about the kids and things. Yes, ma'am. Well, I didn't hear from her, and I got a little worried that maybe she was sick. If she was, I, I know that Papa wouldn't tell us, so I went over to the old house, and I rang the bell. I was kind of braced because I thought I'd see Papa, and there'd be an argument, but there wasn't. Ma'am? No argument. Oh. Papa didn't answer the door. 
Some young woman answered it, and I asked if I could see Mrs. Schroeder. And right away, I knew there was something wrong. Well, how was that, ma'am? Well, I could see inside the front door. The living room had all been changed around. There was new furniture. It looked like the walls had been painted, too. Mm-hmm. What did the woman say when you asked for your mother? She said they didn't live there anymore. Said that they'd, they'd rented the house, you know, and that they'd been living there for the past month. Mm-hmm. Well, at first, I, I don't think I believed her. I asked her who rented the house to her, and she said Papa did. Then I asked her where he was. What'd she say to that? Well, she gave me his address. I went over there to talk to him. It was a little tiny apartment just off La Brea. He said that Mama was gone. I asked him where she'd gone, and he said that she was on a vacation. Mm-hmm. Well, I know him well enough to know that he'd never let her go away. You know, one to darn his socks and keep the house clean. Yeah. I wanted to know where she'd gone in this vacation. He said back to the old country. Said she wanted to see her family. He said that they'd gotten a letter from her sister that she was sick and, and wanted to see Mama. Mm-hmm. Uh-huh. Well, right then I called him a liar. I told him right to his face that he was lying. I kind of thought that he'd hit the ceiling, but he didn't. He just smiled and said that I had no call to say anything like that. He asked me why I said it. Well, what was that? You thought that he'd hit what? Well, I thought that he'd hit the ceiling when I oh, said I that see. to him. Yes, when right. I called him a liar, I mean, you know? Mm-hmm. I told him that if Mama had left, she'd have written, maybe not to me, but to one of the kids. I, I called around, and when I didn't hear from her, none of the kids had either. They were all worried about her, too. I see. Well, what did he say to that? He said he couldn't understand it, so that he'd gotten a letter, that he'd gotten it not more than a day or so before, that she'd arrived safe and was having a wonderful time. This was a letter? Huh? Yes, this was a letter he got from Mama. Well, I told him I thought he was lying. Then he said that he'd show me the letter. Well, did he? Well, yeah, he showed, he showed me the letter, but he wouldn't show me the envelope, just the letter. He said he'd thrown the envelope away. Well, was the letter from your mother, ma'am? Well, sort of from the words it was. Told all about her trip and how she was enjoying herself. Said that she was with her sister and that she was getting better. And then she went on to tell how much she missed Papa and all. Uh-huh. And right away, I could tell that it wasn't Mama's handwriting. She never wrote that letter. Beg your pardon? I said that I knew it wasn't Mama's writing on that letter. Yeah, well... Well, that's when I thought about calling you. Then later I remembered something and... Then I made up my mind about calling you. Well, what was that, Ms. Randall? Well, Mama only had one sister living. She died three years ago. Eleven thirteen a.m., we continued to talk to Ella Randall. She told us that she was sure that her mother would not have gone off of her own free will. She said that when she last saw Mrs. Schroeder, she appeared to be in good health and in good spirits. We got the names and addresses of the other children in the Schroeder family. We also got the address of the Schroeder relatives in Europe. Ellen Randall told us that we could find her father at the apartment, and she gave us the address. 12.15 p.m. Frank and I drove over to see him. This is ridiculous, utterly ridiculous. Well, maybe so, sir, but we'd like to see the letter that came from your wife. We could. Uh, Officer, I'd like very much to show it to you. Really, I would, but I can't. Why not, sir? For the reasons that I haven't got it anymore. I destroyed it, burned it a couple of days ago. Who's your wife staying with, sir? It was her sister. Uh Uh-huh. Well, from what we can find out, sir, your wife's sister died three years ago. How could your wife be staying with her? Oh, all right, I suppose I might as well tell you about it. It doesn't seem to be any other way. All right, sir. Go right ahead. First off, my wife is not in the old country. She's not with her sister, but you heard is true. Uh-huh. Officer, what I have to tell you is very hard to say. I find it hard to find the right words. That's all right, sir. You just go ahead. We've been married for 30 years. 30 years, man and wife, and, and then she did this. Almost broke my heart, officers. Is one of you married? Oh, yes, sir. My partner here is. Then you'd know what I mean. You'd know how it is. Sir? She left me. Packed her things and left. It didn't give me any reason. Just said she didn't want to be my wife anymore. It said she didn't want to share my roof. Just left. 30 years. All that time and she left. Well, what kind of terms were you and your wife on, sir? Uh, what do you mean, this, this term? Well, did you and your wife get along all right? Were you happy? Uh, certainly. As I said, we were married 30 years. Yes, sir, I understand that. But did you ever have any quarrels? Sergeant, all married people have quarrels. Maybe the house isn't clean. Maybe dinner isn't big enough. Maybe the children get too loud. All married couples have quarrels. It's part of living together. Well, from what we understand, sir, some of the arguments you and your wife had were pretty serious. The people who said that are liars. They seem pretty sure. Liars, that's what they are. Oh, sometimes maybe I'd forget myself, get a little loud, but serious never. How'd you get along with your children, Mr. Schroeder? My children? Yes, sir, that's right. How'd you get along with them? All right, they were a little wild. All the children over here are like that, wild. They don't respect their elders, but I got along good. There seems to be a difference of opinion on that, too, sir. We've heard that you and your children weren't on too friendly terms. And you believe this? You think that this is true? Mr. Friday, Mr. Smith, 
These were my own flesh and blood. I loved them. Still do. Maybe that sounds hard to believe. I can imagine what you've heard. I know. I, I've heard about this before. I know who told you. You didn't think I'd know, but I do. It was Ella, wasn't it? Wasn't it? Who told us isn't important, sir? But it is. You see, this is very hard for me to say. Thirty years married, and it is all a mistake. I knew it from the start. She was a shrew, Mr. Friday. I, I knew it right away, a shrew. Sir? My wife, Bertha, almost from the day we were married, she was a nag. All I wanted in life was to do a day's work and come home and read the paper, maybe have a pipe of tobacco, rest, work, and have my home. Maybe someday when the children were grown, they'd say, Papa was good. He gave us a good house, and he was good. That's all I wanted. Yes, sir? Bertha didn't want that. Always wanted more. For the children, she said. When I wouldn't kill myself at work, she'd get angry, talk loud to me. All I wanted was peace. When the children came along, she taught them just like her. Now, how do you mean, sir? She taught them what a mean man I was, turned them against me. My own children taught them to hate their father, their own father. Yes, sir. Well, why didn't you tell your children that your wife left you? No, Mr. Friday, I couldn't. This would break their hearts. They might hate me, but I don't want them to hate their mother. I couldn't do that. The Lord would never forgive me for that. Have you heard from your wife at all since she left? Not a word. I, I made up that letter so the children wouldn't find out. I couldn't have that. Did she take any money with her? Would you know that? Yes, yeah, she did. We have a joint account as a bank two blocks over. She made a large withdrawal the day she left. Well, Mr. Schroeder, why'd you rent your house? It was sold by myself. The house was full of Bertha. All the things were hers. Everywhere I looked, I saw her. It hurt me, Mr. Smith. I had to get out, so I came here. It's not much, but I can read the paper and I'll send him a pipe of tobacco. It, it, it's peaceful. It's all I need. Mm -hmm. What'd you do with your wife's personal effects? I don't think I understand, Sergeant. Her clothes, the furniture from the house, things like that. They're in storage. I had some men come out and take all of it away, stored it away. I thought that maybe someday Bertha would come back and we could take up where we left off. Yes, sir. Could you give us the name of the storage company where you left the furniture? Mm, certainly. It's out on Pico. I can give you the address. Is that important? No, sir, not really. It's just something we ought to check. Don't you think it might be better if you told your daughter about all this or about what's happened? No, Mr. Smith, it wouldn't prove anything. Nothing at all. Well, that's the way you want it, sir. There's nothing we can do about it. It's better, Mr. Friday. Believe me, I know. If they hate me, there's not much I can do about it. But I don't want to bring them any unhappiness. I couldn't do that. Yes, sir. I'm 65 years old, Mr. Friday. I worked hard all that time, harder than most men. Had four children. They're all grown. They have families of their own. All this, and I've got nothing. Nothing but lonely days and empty nights. Yes. It's an awful thing. Just awful. Sir? To work all your life and have nothing to show for it. <laughs> One thirty-seven p.m. We got the address of the storage company from Henry Schroeder, and then Frank and I left to go back to the office. At this point, we had two stories. Both of them could be true. Both of them could be lies. There was no way of knowing. In the meantime, it was merely a matter of checking. Until it could be proved one way or the other, there was little action we could take. 2.15 p.m. Frank and I checked back into the office, and I put in a call to the storage house. Yes, sir. I'll wait while you're checking, huh? I don't know, Joe. Sure seems like the old guy is telling the truth. Oh, well, we check this out, we'll know one way or the other. Such a nice little guy. Seems hard to believe that he'd do anything wrong. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. What was that? Uh-huh. Could you tell me when? What was the name? Mm-hmm. That's right. Yes, sir. All right. Uh-huh. Thanks very much. No, it's Joe Friday. F-R-I-D. Yeah. That's right. Michigan 5211, extension 2521. Right. All right. Thanks again. How about it? He stored the furniture, all right. Yeah. They remembered him. Talked to him a couple of weeks ago. Uh-huh. Told him to sell everything. We drove out to the storage house and talked to the owner. He said that Schroeder had called them out to pack the furniture, and then he ordered it stored. A week later, he called back and told them to dispose of all the furnishings and personal effects. We called Schroeder's bank, and they told us that there'd been no large withdrawals on the date of her disappearance. Also, she'd drawn no checks since. We got in touch with the other children, and they verified their sister's story. They all said that the father was hard to live with and had on several occasions struck Mrs. Schroeder. They told us that it was possible that she had left her husband, but that she would certainly have gotten in touch with one of them if she had. They said that as far as they knew, Mrs. Schroeder was in good health, and she was in good condition mentally. One of the daughters said that they were planning on a shopping trip to buy school clothes for one of the grandchildren. 
The woman went on to say that as far as she knew, Mrs. Schroeder would not have left without saying something to her about not being able to keep the appointment. We got in touch with Ella Randall. She said that she would like to accompany us when we talked to the neighbors of the Schroeder woman. She said that she could point out her mother's friends and that she would be able to trace her mother's movements about the neighborhood for us. 4.15 p.m. We picked her up. We talked to the neighbors and they told us of hearing loud voices coming from the house. They said that Mr. Schroeder was always angry at his wife and he made no attempt to hide it. 7.30 p.m. We went on to talk to the people who had rented the Schroeder home. Come on in. Thank you very much, Mr. Armstrong. It's my partner, Frank Smith. This is Mrs. Randall. Yes, Mrs. Randall, I've met before. How are you, Mrs. Randall? How are you, Mr. Armstrong? Well, what's this all about? We'd like to ask you some questions about the Schroeders, if we could. Well, Mrs. Randall here would be able to answer them better for you. They're her parents. Well, yes, sir. We'd like some information from you, if we could. All right. Go ahead. Don't think there's much I can tell you. Did you see Mrs. Schroeder when you rented the house? No. Come to think about it, I didn't. Mr. Schroeder talked about her, but I didn't see her when we took the house. Uh Uh-huh. How did Mr. Schroeder act when you rented the place? I don't think I understand. Well, did he seem upset? Anything at all unusual about him? As a matter of fact, there was. What was that, sir? Well, the house was kind of old. You know, paint missing from some of the woodwork. Some of the paper was a little faded, and we asked him if he planned to fix it up before we moved it. You know, if he'd foot the bill. Yes, sir, we understand. Well, right away, I kind of expected an argument. He just seemed like that kind of a guy. You know, who wouldn't spend a nickel. He didn't have to. Mm Mm-hmm. It wasn't like that. The smile and say anything that we wanted, he'd have done. Real nice. Sure hasn't caused any trouble. Of course, there's no reason for him to. We'd pay the rent on time, take care of the lawn and the flowers. I think we're pretty good tenants. Sure is a difference. Never looked like this when we lived here. I remember that Mama would ask him to paint the place a little. Always raised the roof. Said there wasn't any reason to do it. Said to wait until the kids were grown and, and appreciated a house. Not like that with us. Well, he was with his own family. Even when we were gone, after we left the house, he said that there wasn't any reason to fix the place up. Said that Mama and him were the only people who ever saw the inside of it, and it didn't matter to them. Like I said, couldn't ask for a better landlord. Well, I, I kind of hate to ask this. Yeah? Well, I, I wondered if, if I could see the rest of the house. I'd, I'd kind of like to see what he did to it. Well, I guess it's okay. If it won't take too long, i got to eat pretty quick. Got a bowl tonight. The team's playing the league championship tonight. Well, just a look. I won't keep you. Okay, well, you know the house? Yes. This is the living room. Bedrooms are down the hall. This dining room. Oh, pretty paper. It made Mama so happy to have this. Here's a bath. All new tile, just beautiful. Yeah, it makes it nice. Mm. It's a master bedroom. This was Papa's room. Sure is nice. Oh, look at the pretty curtains. Those are ours. We said he'd put drapes in every one of them. But oh. Sally, it's a wife. She likes curtains. Uh-huh. I do, too. Use this for the oldest boy. This was Mom's room. Oh, it's just beautiful. That's a beautiful carpet. Yeah, he put that in, too. Didn't even have to ask for that. It's own idea. Wall-to-wall carpeting. Mama always wanted it. The only room in the house that has it. Do you have a cellar in this house, Mr. Armstrong? Yeah. We use it for the freezer. Sally puts up canned goods in the summer. Keep them down there. I wonder if we could see it, please. Uh, sure, but there isn't any change down there. He didn't do anything with the cellar. Yes, yeah, sir. It's all right, though. We'd like to see it. Oh, sure. like to make it fast, though. i got to eat, you know. Yes, sir, we understand. It won't take very long here. Sure, it's down this way. Had to run electricity down there for the freezer. I guess he'd have done it, but it was just an extension cord. Thought about having it done permanently, but no real reason to. I understand. I'll go ahead and get the light. Yes, sir. You want to wait here, Ms. Randall? Why? Well, no reason, ma'am. We just thought it might be better. Well, all right. I'll wait in the living room. All right, thank you. Come on, Frank. Yeah. Not very big, just room enough for the freezer and a few shelves. Uh huh. Cement floor, huh? Yeah. Frank? Yeah? You want to swing that light up here? I want to check something here. Oh, sure. What's this room under, Mr. Armstrong? I mean, what's above it? Let's see. That'd be the master bedroom about to there. Uh huh. The room next would begin there. Uh-huh. That'd be Mrs. Schroeder's room, wouldn't it? Mm, from what Mrs. Randall said, yeah. Uh-huh. You got a piece of paper, sir? I'd like to get up on the freezer. I don't want to scratch it here. Why, something you want? Well, I'd just like to look. I have a piece of paper, cardboard, anything, cloth. Or... I don't see any. Go ahead. Just don't scrunch your feet around. It'll be all right. All right, sir. All right, Frank. Swing the light around, will you? Yeah. What is it, John? I'm not sure. You got your flash? Yeah. Here you go. All right. Okay. 
What is it? What do you see up there? They better call the crime lab and get him out here. What is it? Seep through the flooring up there. Yeah? Looks like blood. You are listening to Dragnet, the authentic story of your police force in action. All over America, smokers are changing to Chesterfield. Because Chesterfield is the first and only cigarette with premium quality throughout, in both regular and king size. King size Chesterfield contains tobaccos of better quality and higher price than any other king size cigarette. Well, that's certainly important to every king size smoker. Of course, it's the same fine tobacco as in regular Chesterfield. So remember, the modern way to sell cigarettes is the Chesterfield way. First and only cigarette with premium quality throughout, in both regular and king size. Chesterfield is much milder. Chesterfield is best for you. Eight fourteen p.m. The crime lab was called, and they came out to go over the place. A benzidine test was run on the stains, and it was proved that they were blood stains. The carpet in the bedroom was removed, and additional stains were uncovered. Frank and I checked the cellar floor, but it was solid, and there was no evidence that any part of it had been torn up. A preliminary check was made of the yard, but we found nothing. The next morning at 7.58 a.m., we called the crime lab. They'd finished their investigation and told us that the stains were made by human blood. 8.10 a.m., Frank and I drove out to the house to continue our investigation. Boy, it's going to be a scorcher. Yeah, it looks that way. Did you check that corner of the yard over there? Yeah, doesn't look like anything's been disturbed. Well, let's talk to the neighbors again. There's got to be an answer someplace. Okay. You know, I'm going to tell Faye to get me some of those shirts with the holes in them. What do you mean, holes in them? You know, like they wear back east. Little bitty holes between the material. That way you don't get so hot. Yeah. Hey, wait a minute, Joe. What? There's something on the grass over there by the rose bed. Oh, it's probably a locket or something one of the kids dropped. A toy, maybe. Yeah, I'll get it. Give it back to Armstrong. What do you got? Piece of dental bridge work. Looks like it's been in a fire. The crime lab was called and they went over the backyard. They checked the incinerator and under a large heap of ashes they found several pieces of bone. They took a sample of the ash back to the lab to examine it. We got in touch with the daughter, Mrs. Randall. We got the address of Mrs. Schroeder's dentist. Frank and I drove out to talk to him. We showed him the piece of dental bridge work that we'd found and he identified it as positively belonging to Mrs. Schroeder. He showed us the card from his files, which gave the date that he'd installed the bridge. 11.56 a.m., we called the crime lab, and Lieutenant Lee Jones told us that the ash and the particles of bone that he'd recovered could be of human origin. 12.15 p.m., we drove out to the apartment and took Henry Schroeder into custody. We talked to him in the interrogation room. I don't understand all this. None of it makes any sense. Well, it's pretty simple, Schroeder. Simple? You say that I killed Bertha, and you say it's simple. How can you say that? Why do you say that? You must have a reason. I have told you all I know. A couple of things you didn't tell the truth about, sir. What? You said that just before your wife left you, she made a large withdrawal from your account, didn't you? That's right, she did. She did take the money. Well, in checking your bank account, we found no record of any such withdrawal. You've got no right to go through my bank account. You've got no right. This is a murder investigation, Schroeder. We've got a right to clear it up. But she did take the money. She did. You've got to believe me. It's a little hard to do, Schroeder. Since your wife disappeared, she hasn't drawn any money out of your account. Before that, she drew checks to pay the local store bills. Now, how do you explain that? I can't. I can't. I, I, I don't know what you're trying to say. I, I, I don't know what you're trying to get me to say. We're trying to get you to say the truth, that's all. But I am. I am. You said you put all the furniture from your house in storage. Now, is that right? Yes, I said that. Mm -hmm. You said you wanted to keep it in case your wife came back and you two started all over again? Yes, that's the truth. We checked the storage company. They told us you called them and ordered everything sold. Told him to sell it as soon as possible. Now, how do you explain that? You're getting me so confused, I can't think. And we checked the house, the one where you and your wife lived. We found blood stains, lots of them. They're human blood. I, I don't know. I don't know. People who live there now said that you put a carpet over the floor. Only room in the house that has a carpet. They say it was your idea. I can't think. I, I, I don't know what you're saying. Well, here's a report here. Take a look at it. It's a list of the things we found in your incinerator. Things that were burned. Now, do you want to read it, or do you want me to read it to you? How about it, Schroeder? 
Schroeder? I didn't mean it. Thirty years. Thirty years married. I didn't mean to do it. I, I came home late. Real late. I'd, I'd been drinking. We had words. I hit her. I don't know what happened. I, I, I knew what I was doing. I kept hitting her. That, then she was dead. I didn't mean to do it. I didn't mean to. I, she turns the kids against me. Turned everybody against me. Thirty years, Mary. She turned everybody against me. I'm afraid you got it wrong, mister. Huh? You did that yourself. The story you have just heard was true. The names were changed to protect the innocent. On December 10th, trial was held in Department 87, Superior Court of the State of California, in and for the County of Los Angeles. In a moment, the results of that trial. Now, here is our star, Jack Webb. Thank you, George Fenneman. Friends, remember this. Chesterfield is the first and only cigarette with premium quality throughout, in both regular and king size. And Chesterfield is the cigarette that gives scientific evidence of real smoking pleasure. So try Chesterfield's today. Either way, regular or king size. Chesterfield is much milder. Chesterfield is best for you. Henry Rudolph Schroeder was tried and convicted of murder in the first degree. He was executed in the lethal gas chamber at the State Penitentiary, San Quentin, California. You have just heard Dragnet, a series of authentic cases from official files. Technical advice comes from the office of Chief of Police W.H. Parker, Los Angeles Police Department. Technical advisors, Captain Jack Donahoe, Sergeant Marty Wynn, Sergeant Vance Brasher. Heard tonight were Ben Alexander, June Whitley, Harry Bartell. Script by John Robinson. Music by Walter Schumann. Hal Gibney speaking. For a million laughs, tune in Chesterfield's Martin and Lewis show Tuesday night on the same NBC station. And sound off for Chesterfield, regular or king size. You'll find premium quality Chesterfields much milder. Chesterfield is best for you. Chesterfield has brought you Dragnet transcribed from Los Angeles. Chesterfield. Chesterfield. First cigarette with premium quality throughout in both regular and king size brings you Dragnet. Ladies and gentlemen, the story you are about to hear is true. The names have been changed to protect the innocent. You're a detective sergeant. You're assigned a homicide detail. You get a call that a 72-year-old man has been murdered. His invalid wife has been brutally beaten. There's no lead to the assailants. Your job, get him. When you're asked to try a cigarette, you want to know, and you ought to know, what that cigarette has meant to people who smoke it and who smoke it all the time. For almost a year now... A medical specialist has given a group of Chesterfield smokers thorough examinations every two months. He reports no adverse effects to their noses, their throats, or sinuses from smoking Chesterfields. More and more men and women all over the country are finding out every day that Chesterfield is best for them. Enjoy your smoking. Try Chesterfields today. You'll find Chesterfield much milder, with an extraordinarily good taste. Dragnet, the documented drama of an actual crime. For the next 30 minutes, in cooperation with the Los Angeles Police Department, 
You will travel step by step on the side of the law through an actual case transcribed from official police files. From beginning to end, from crime to punishment, Dragnet is the story of your police force in action. It was Tuesday, August 12th. It was warm in Los Angeles. We were working the day watch out of homicide detail. My partner's Frank Smith. The boss is Thad Brown, chief of detectives. My name's Friday. We were on the way out from the office, and it was 8, 12 a.m. when we got to 8469 North Brighton Avenue. The front door. Yes? Mrs. Hurley? Yes, who are you? Police officers. It's my partner, Frank Smith. My name's Friday. Oh, well, it's about time you got here. Yes, ma'am. I wonder if we could see Mrs. Stone. I don't think so. The ambulance man's with her now, giving her some kind of pill, something to calm her down. Lord knows the poor thing certainly needs something. Yes, ma'am. We'd like to see her, please. Like I said, I don't know if you can. I'll have to ask the ambulance man. Well, I'm sure it's all right, ma'am, if you just let us talk to the attendant. You just wait here. I'll talk to him. Now, look, I don't like to be rude, ma'am, but this is a murder investigation. If you'll open the door, please. How do I know you're what you say you are? How do I know you're cops? Well, here's our identification. Well, looks enough like you, I guess. All right, come on. Thank you. Where is Mrs. Stone? Back there, in the back bedroom. I'll check with the attendant, Jack. Right, Frank. I wonder if you could tell us what you know about this, Mrs. Hurley. You just bet I can. You just bet. That poor woman back there. She's lying at death's door because you didn't do your job, you know that? Ma'am? At death's door. It's your job to see that things like this don't happen. That's what you're paid for. And look, just look. Her poor husband dead and herself all beaten. Poor thing. I just don't understand what the world's coming to when things like this can happen. Well, first, ma'am, there was no way we could stop this. I think you understand that. We're trying to clean it up now. We're going to need your help to do it. Now, if you just tell me what happened, please. Yeah. That's what you say. I know different. All right, Mrs. Hurley. The faster we can get started on this thing, the better chance we have of getting the people responsible for it. I suppose so. Well, what do you want to know? Well, if you'd please start at the beginning and tell me what you know about it. Yeah. Well, it started this morning. About 7 or 7.15, I think. I heard this noise at the back door, kind of a scratching kind of noise. And a moan, a little tiny moan. Sounded like it was way off, kind of uh, in the distance. Yes, ma'am. First, I wasn't sure that I wasn't dreaming the whole thing. You know how it is when you're awakened out of a sound sleep. Yes, I understand. Well, it was like that. It took me about ten minutes before I knew that there really was something there. Well, I got up and went to the door. And that's when I found her, right there at the back door, kind of laying on the porch. I could see right away that someone had beaten her. That's when I called the ambulance. And then she told me about how her husband had been killed, and then I called you. The other car, the one with the men in uniform, come out. Mm -hmm. They looked around, and then they went over to the house. That would be the Stones' house? That's right. Next door. I see. How about it, Frank? Well, it's pretty bad, Joe. They're treating her now. Can we see her? Well, the attendant says it'll be all right for a couple of minutes. Not much more than that. They're going to take her to Georgia Street. Okay. He said he'd let us know when we could talk to her. All right, fine. Did she tell you what happened, Mrs. Hurley, anything at all? Just that there was two men. They come in and beat up on her, killed her husband. That was enough. One look at her, and I could tell she was hurt bad. And her an invalid. I just don't understand how anybody in their right mind could do a thing like this. I just don't understand it. Yes, ma'am. Now, you say that she's an invalid, is that right? Yes, they were involved in an auto accident a couple of years ago. Some drunk ran right into him, smashed the car all up. Laid Mr. Stone up for a couple of months and put Patricia in a wheelchair for the rest of her life. Can't walk at all. She crawled over here. Don't know how she did it. It's great courage. Yes, ma'am. Did you hear anything at all last night? Any disturbance aside from what thing, you told not me? Not a thing. Went to bed about ten. Slept like a rock. Didn't hear a thing until this morning. That was about seven. Seven fifteen, maybe, like I said. Nope. I didn't hear a thing. Well, do you know if there was anyone that the Stones were afraid of? Anyone who might have done a thing like this? Nope. I can't think of a soul. How about money, ma'am? Did Mr. Stone keep large sums of money around the house? Well, now, I don't know. He might have. Joe? Well, yeah, Hal. You want to see her now? Yeah. Come on, Frank. All right. You going to want to talk to me some more? Yes, ma'am. We'll be back. <laughs> Mrs. Stone? <laughs> Mrs. Stone? Yes, who is it? Police officers, ma'am. We know you don't feel well, but there are a few questions we'd like to ask, if you don't mind. You got them in yet? The ones who did this? No, ma'am, not yet. I tried to tell them. I tried. They just wouldn't listen. Ma'am. I told them to take whatever they wanted and leave us alone. Just leave us alone. I tried to tell them. 
They wouldn't listen. They killed Henry. They tried to kill me. Do you know who they were, Mrs. Stone? What? I say, do you know who they were? The men who did this, do you know who they were? Had you ever seen them before? No, I don't think so. It was dark. Then I heard them argue with Henry. I tried to get up. I tried to help him, but I couldn't. I screamed, but they didn't pay attention. Then they killed him. Ma'am, can you describe them for us? Tell us how tall they were, how they were dressed, maybe? They didn't know that I was there. Then they came into my room and they said they'd kill the other one, so they might as well kill me, too. I tried to tell them to go away, and they wouldn't listen. They just hit me and hit me and hit me. There wasn't anything I could do. Did they drive a car, ma'am? Is there anything you can tell us that might help us in identifying them? Did one of them use a name, maybe? They locked me in the closet. They put that pillow over my head. I don't know why. I told them they could take what they wanted. Take it, they just leave us alone, but they didn't. They killed Henry. They tried to kill me. All right, Mrs. Stone, everything's going to be all right here. Don't worry, now. Just try and get some rest. It doesn't matter much now. is isn't anything that matters anymore. Nothing now that they killed Henry. All right, ma'am. Please try not to get upset. Joe. Yeah. Better get her downtown. Well, how's it look for her, Hal? What are her chances? Depends. Yeah. How hard she wants to try. Eight forty six AM. The ambulance removed Mrs. Stone to Georgia Street Receiving Hospital. We put in a call to the crime lab and then we talked to the neighbor, Mrs. Hurley. She could add little to what she'd already told us. She said that she'd heard no loud noises during the night and that she'd seen no one in the neighborhood acting suspicious. She told us, however, that Mr. Stone was known to have kept large sums of money in the house. She went on to say that he made no attempt to hide his distrust of banks and that he had often said that all of his money was on the premises. 9.02 a.m., Frank and I went next door to the Stone home. The crime lab and latent fingerprint crews had arrived and were going over the place for physical evidence. We talked to Ray Pinker of the crime lab. This is how they got in. Yeah, I tore the screen, huh? Must have done it with their hands. Couldn't find any tool marks. You figured the door was open then, huh, Ray? Yeah, it looks that way. One of those old-fashioned locks, no indication that they forced it. Mm-hmm. Did you find anything else? Take a look back here in the closet. Mm-hmm. Well, they sure tore the place up, didn't they? Yeah, went through everything. Even took the pictures off the walls. Yeah. Ripped up the bedding. There's in the drawer they didn't go through. Any prints at all? Bergman's checking it. Haven't found anything yet that I know of. Pretty bad. Here. Look at the mattress on the husband's bed. <laughs> tore it all up. Stuffing scattered around the room. Looks like a tornado went through the place. The closet's back here. Mm-hmm. This was Mrs. Stone's room. You see where they dragged her? Yeah. Must have hit her the first time about here, and then they dragged her over to this closet, dropped her in here. Mm-hmm. You can see where she stacked those suitcases up there to pull herself out the window. Yeah. I don't know how she did it. Mm. Bad office she was. Looks like robbery was the motive then, huh, Ray? Can't agree with that, Joe. Why? Come on back in Stone's room. We found the murder weapon. Checked around. It looks like they picked him up in the backyard. Here, take a look. A couple of wooden clubs. Looks like they came from a walnut tree just outside the back door. Kind of blows the robbery angle. Yeah. They were ready to kill the Stones when they came in. <laughs> a.m. The crime lab finished their investigation of the house. The backyard and the surrounding ground were gone over. In the soft earth at the foot of one of the walnut trees, a pair of footprints was found and plaster casts were made of them. On the lower limbs of the trees, we found the place where the two clubs could have been taken. The rest of the yard and the immediate vicinity were combed, but we found nothing. 12.15 p.m. Frank put in a call to Georgia Street Receiving Hospital. They told him that Mrs. Stone had been given emergency treatment and then had been removed to the county hospital. Her condition was listed as critical. They said that it would be some time before we'd be able to talk to her. 1.30 p.m. We began to canvass the neighborhood. From the people in the surrounding houses, we found that Mr. Stone had retired from the wholesale grocery business about ten years ago. He devoted himself to the cultivation of prize roses and the care of Mrs. Stone. The neighbors told us that the Stones were quiet and that they seldom entertained. 3.15 3.15 p.m. We went back to talk to Mrs. Hurley. I knew you'd be back. Ma'am? I knew you'd come back to talk to me again. Could have told you a lot, but I thought I'd just let you try and find out for yourself. Didn't do too well, did you? Hmm? Did you? I don't think I understand, Miss Hurley. Simple. 
Anything you want to know about this neighborhood, you come to the source. That's me. Anybody knows what's going on here, I do. Yeah, well, if you had information that you thought we should have had, why didn't you tell us before, ma'am? I didn't want to. Ma'am? I said I didn't want to. I still say that you were responsible for this whole thing, done your job, and it wouldn't have happened. Oh, I still haven't forgot. Oh, no, sir. Now, look, Miss Hurley, this is a murder investigation. I've told you that before. A man has been killed, a woman's been badly beaten. We're going to need all the cooperation from you that we can get. I'm ready now. What? I'll cooperate. I'll tell you what you want to know. All right, Miss Hurley. First, do you have any idea who might have done this? You just bet I have. Who, ma'am? Their boy. Only one that's mean enough to do it. Only one. Their boy? Sure. Herman Jr., he's the one. You just bet. Why do you say that? Because I know that's why. Mean kid. Always had trouble with him. Because the only trouble ever was between Patricia and me. Troublemaker. What he was, pure and simple, a troublemaker. How old is this boy, Miss Hurley? Thirty-six. A real monster. You know where the boy is now? No, and I'm not interested. Happiest day of my life when he moved out of the house. Oh, he and I used to get in some arguments. Little brat. Stand there and think he was so big. Finally, Mr. Stone saw it. Told him to get out. Moved right out of the house, bag and parcel, right out. You mean that Mr. Stone and the boy had arguments? See? That's what I mean. No wonder people don't cooperate with you. I beg your pardon? I say something, then you ask me if I mean it. Of course I mean it. I wouldn't say it otherwise. Like people who ask, what time is it? You tell them, and then they ask if you're sure. If they don't want to believe you, why do they ask you in the first place? Yes, ma'am. Were you there at the time, ma'am? No. No, I wasn't. It was a warm night. Just a couple of months ago, all the windows was open, and I just couldn't help seeing into their house. You know, houses being so close together, you can understand it. Yes, ma'am, we can understand. I don't like the way you said that, young man. Well, I didn't mean anything by it, Mrs. Hurley. Oh, uh, well, I suppose not. But I don't want you to get the idea that I'm the nosy type. Oh, no, ma'am, not at all. Well, anyway... Mr. Stone told Herman to get his things and get out. Right out. That night. Uh-huh. Well, did the boy leave that night? Oh, oh, yes, yes. Went right into his room and packed. Said he'd never come back. That he didn't want anything more to do with the old man. Mm-hmm. And his father said that was the way he wanted it. He was going to cut him out of his will. Well, you can just believe that's when the trouble really started. Well, now, where was Mrs. Stone all this time? Well, she was in her room, but she'd come out. Wheeled herself right out told them to stop this foolishness. She always was kind of pampering the boy. I think myself, that's what caused him to be like he was. You know, tied to his mother's apron strings all the time. Yes, ma'am. That's when Herman said that about doing something. Said that the old man was senile. Said that he was crazy. And that the money was his, and he was going to see that he got it. Mm-hmm. Said he meant to have it if he had to kill somebody. 4.10 p.m. We got the full name and description of the Stone Boy from Mrs. Hurley. We went back to the office and ran the name through R&I. We found a Herman Stone Jr. with a record listing three arrests on charges of 4127A LAMC. We checked out his last known address, a hotel on South Hill, and found that he'd moved several weeks before. The manager gave us a forwarding address, and at 6.10 p.m., Frank and I drove out to see him. It was a large apartment hotel on Wilshire Boulevard. We talked to the desk clerk. Sure, I know Herman. Nice guy. Once in a while he gets a little loud, but most of the time he's a real nice guy. Is he here now? I don't think so. Let me look. No, oh, Key's here. I think I saw him go out about an hour ago. He wasn't feeling too well. Bad hangover. Any idea where he might be? No, like I said, I didn't talk to him. Just saw him go out. You know what he does for a living? Herman? Yes, sir. I don't think he does nothing. Plays the horses a little bit. Picks up a buck that way. Good player. Sure knows the dogs. Giving me a couple of tips. Didn't do any good. He sure does all right. Made a real killing yesterday. Must have hit it for about four or five thousand. That right? Yeah. Showed me the money this morning. Real big roll. At least four or five grand. Tips he gave me never did that good. You got any idea where he was last night? So what's this all about anyway? Herm done something? Well, it'd be better if we talked to him. Oh, yeah. Well, yeah, I guess you guys know what you're doing, huh? Well, yes, sir. You asked me if I knew what he was doing last night? Uh-huh. I sure do. He really tied one on. Of course, with his luck, I don't wonder. He really tied one on. Sir? Loaded. He got in here. He had a bottle. So you won't say anything about this to the management, will you? No, sir, we won't. Couldn't have that happen. They don't approve of drinking while I'm on duty. You understand. Kind of stuffy, but that's the way they look at it. Uh-huh. Like I said, old Herm rolls in here, and he's got this bottle. He asked me to have one with him. Well, I don't like to get him sore, so I do. And we have a couple of more. 
Old Herm, that boy can really put it away. Yes, sir. What time was that? Well, let's see. I guess about 7, maybe 7.15. Mm-hmm. Did he go out after that? Sure didn't. Killed the bottle, and then he passed right out, cold. Slept there on that couch. Uh-huh. No, sir. Old Herm didn't go anyplace. You are listening to Dragnet, the authentic story of your police force in action. Chesterfield is the first cigarette to offer smokers premium quality in both regular and king size. King size Chesterfield contains tobaccos of better quality and higher price than any other king size cigarette. Chesterfield is first to name all its ingredients, ingredients that make the best possible smoke. And Chesterfield gives you this scientific report. No adverse effects to the nose and throat of a group smoking only Chesterfields. So enjoy your smoking. Change to Chesterfield today. Much milder. With an extraordinarily good taste. Eight twelve p.m. Herman Stone returned to the hotel. Frank and I talked to him for about an hour. He appeared quite shaken when we told him of his father's death. We questioned him about the money that he'd suddenly come up with. He explained that he'd won it at the races. He gave us the name of the man who accompanied him to the track. Frank and I checked with him and found that Stone's story was true. We checked his shoe size and found that it was not the same as the print found at the scene of the murder. 10.46 p.m. We called the office and they told us that we'd gotten a message from the county hospital. Mrs. Stone was able to talk. She wasn't completely out of danger, but barring a relapse, she was expected to recover. Frank and I drove out to the hospital and talked to her. I wish I could help you more than I have, but there just isn't anything else. Well, could you give us any idea of about how tall they were? That would be pretty hard to do, Mr. Friday. I was lying down when they came into my room. I could only guess, but I'd say maybe as tall as you. I don't think much taller. I see. Now, how about their build, ma'am? Was it heavy or slight? I can't be sure. I guess if I must say one or the other, I have to say they're about medium. One was very strong, though. Ma'am? The one that carried me to the closet. He was strong. Just lifted me out of bed and carried me over to the closet and threw me on the floor. Did your husband have any large amounts of money in the house? Yes. Yes, he did. Herman never believed in banks, not since the crash. Always said that he could take care of the money as well as they could. Yes, ma'am. He had all of his savings in the house. Kept them in the mattress on on his bed. Do you know about how much that might be, Mrs. Stone? I'd only be guessing, but I'd say maybe twelve or thirteen thousand dollars. Herman didn't discuss finances with me. He always thought it was a man's business and that I shouldn't have to worry about it. I tried to tell him. Tried all the time. What's that, ma'am? That he should put the money in a bank. He used to talk about it, too. I know that didn't help any. Well, who did he talk to, Mrs. Stone? People in the neighborhood. He used to tell them that he didn't get the interest, but that he always knew just where his money was. He used to ask them if they could say the same. Mm-hmm. Can you think of anybody in the neighborhood who might do a thing like this? Oh, no. We've lived there for a long time. No, none of them would even think about it. I see. Did you or your husband have any enemies? Anyone that you had any arguments with? Maybe? No, there wasn't anyone. Mr. Friday? Yes, ma'am? Does my son know about this? Does he know that his father's... Does he know about it? Yes, ma'am, he does. He's outside in the hall right now. He said he'd like to see you. Poor boy. Never did get along with his father. I tried to make them understand each other. I tried so hard. Didn't seem to do any good. Mm-hmm. Well, if there's nothing else that you can tell us, ma'am. There's one thing... I hate to mention it. It seems so silly. What's that, Mrs. Stone? Well, when they were arguing with Herman in the next room, they got very loud. I thought that I recognized one of the voices, and I can't be sure, but at the time I thought it. Yes, ma'am. Then when they came into my room, I was pretty sure. But I could be wrong, and I... Well, I wouldn't want to cause anybody any trouble. I wouldn't want to make a mistake. Well, who do you think it might have been? Whose voice do you think it was? It sounded like Smokey's. Who? Smokey. He used to do some work around the yard for Herman. That was a year or so ago. I haven't seen him since then. Well, do you know where we can get in touch with him, ma'am? 
No, I don't. As I said, I haven't seen him in over a year. What's his full name, Mrs. Stone? I don't know, but that, that's why I thought it might be a little silly. I don't even know his right name. Just told us his name was Smokey. The young man always had a cigarette in his mouth. Chain smoker, I think you'd call. Uh-huh. Herman used to kid him about it, you know, smoking all the time. I don't think Smokey liked it. He was a pretty serious young man. He used to get a little angry at Herman. I see. Can you give us a description of the man? Oh, yes. Nice-looking boy. I hope I haven't made a mistake. I hope I haven't done the wrong thing. Well, don't you worry about it, Miss Stone. What? That's his worry now. We continued to talk to Mrs. Stone. We got the description of the handyman who'd worked for her husband. 11.28 p.m., we went back to the city hall and ran the name and description through the moniker files in R&I. We came up with one good possible. In checking his record, we found that his full name was Charles P. Roxford. His age was listed as 37 years. The rest of his description matched the one we'd gotten from Mrs. Stone. He had an arrest record listing several charges of forgery, and at that time there was an outstanding warrant on him for check passing. We went back to the office and called forgery division. Yeah, Roxford. Yeah, that's right, Charles R. Huh? Well, we want to talk to him about a killing out on Brighton. Yeah. What? When was that? Yeah. Okay, we'll be right then. Well, that's a break. What do you mean? They know where he is? They got him. Charles Roxford had been picked up a few minutes before by officers in forgery division while he was trying to pass a bad check. Frank and I went down the hall and took the prisoner to the interrogation room. We talked to him for two hours. During that time, he'd admit nothing except his name and that he'd been trying to pass a phony check. Hey, you're off your rocker, and you know it. You got me for one thing, hanging paper. That's it, and you can't make anything more out of it. How about this money we found on you? Yeah, how about it? Where'd it come from? I won it. Where? In a crap game. Where was the game? I forgot. It was a floating game. Moved around a lot. You worked for the Stone family a year or so ago? Mm, I don't know. I might have. I worked for a lot of people. You worked for them? I might have, like I said. They seem to think you did. All right, so I did. What's that mean? You ever have any arguments with Stone? No. Got along good. Never had no trouble. His wife thinks different. Oh, that's so? That's right. Then she's off a rocket, too. Now, look, maybe you guys got all night, but I haven't. You aren't going anyplace. Well, how about booking me and let's talk in the morning, then, huh? All right, fine, Roxford, as soon as you answer a few more questions I for I told us. you all I know. Maybe you forgot something. Let's go over it again. What do you say? All right, all right. Where do you want to start? Well, can you tell us what you've been doing the last few days? Uh, any day in particular, or do you want to run down minute by minute? You just tell us what you've been doing, will you? Uh, let's see. Uh, this is Tuesday, isn't it? Yeah, it's Tuesday. All right, let's start with Monday. Is that all right with you? Come on, get on with it. Well, I got up yesterday morning about, uh, I think it was 11.30, lit a cigarette, got dressed, went downstairs and had some breakfast. Interesting? Go ahead. Oh, I can spice it up for you, you know, if you want. It's kind of dull when you tell a story. Well, you just tell a story. Man. Oh, what are you guys trying to prove? What are you trying to tell? What'd you do last night? I had dinner and went to a show. Where'd you eat dinner? Place down on the spring. Did you eat alone? Yeah. What'd you do then? Like I said, I went to a show. Who went with you? Nobody. I, I didn't say anybody went with me. Oh, I must have thought you said that. Yeah. I went alone. All right. Where'd you go after that? I walked around, had a couple of drinks. Where? A bar down on 5th. What time was that? About 12.30 or so. Anybody with you? No. You know the bartender? No, I never went in a place before. Then you got no way of proving you were there, is No. It? Do I have to? Did it help? Well, why? I'm a big boy now. I don't have to explain anything to you guys. Now, get off my back, will you? I'm getting sick of playing footsie. Where'd you go after you left that bar? I went home. Where's that? It's a place over on 4th. What time did you get in? I don't know. Maybe 1.30, 2. Mm-hmm. Desk clerk see you come in? No, he's asleep. How long ago did you say you worked for the Stones? I didn't. You said I worked for him a year ago. Is that right? I guess so. I forgot. What, what's this bit about the stones? You got any way of proving where you were last night? Like I said, I don't have to. That's the way you look at it, mister. You're in trouble if you can't come up with an alibi we can't break. Isn't that right? Yep. Why? Because Mrs. Stone got a good look at you. She couldn't have. The lights were out. Yeah, no, that's clever, Roxford. Do you want to tell us about it now? Come on, Roxford. <laughs> All right, I should have known. I should have known. I never should have done it, but I didn't have any choice. You... you... You can't figure that, can you? What do you mean? Well, I, I owed this money. The guys are getting tired of waiting. They said I had to come up with it. I, I didn't have any choice. Is that right? Sure. Well, you can see it, can't you? I had to come up with the money. I tried to win it back. The more I played, the more I owed them. There just wasn't any other way. I knew old man Stone had it. Wasn't doing him any good, and I needed it, and I knew where he kept the money. Who was with you? Jackie Forbes. You know where we can find him? Yeah, yeah, I'll tell you. All right, you want to get the stenographer, Frank? Yeah. I should have known. Should have known, but there just wasn't any choice. There wasn't any other way. 
Why'd you kill him? He knew who I was. There's no choice. I had to. Is that right? Well, sure. You can see that yourself, can't you? I, I couldn't find any other way. You didn't look very hard, did you? The story you have just heard was true. The names were changed to protect the innocent. On December 10th, trial was held in Department 89, Superior Court of the State of California, in and for the County of Los Angeles. In a moment, the results of that trial. Now, here is our star, Jack Webb. Thank you, George Fenneman. Friends, as I've told you before, Chesterfield is the first cigarette to give you premium quality throughout in both regular and king size. And Chesterfield is the cigarette that gives you this scientific report. No adverse effects to the nose and throat of a group smoking only Chesterfields. Now, as a two-pack-a-day Chesterfield smoker, I know it's the cigarette that's best for me. They really are much milder, and I'm sure when you try them, regular or king size, you'll agree Chesterfield is best for you. Charles Richard Roxford and Jack Allen Forbes were tried and convicted of murder in the first degree. They were executed in the lethal gas chamber at the state penitentiary, San Quentin, California. You have just heard Dragnet, a series of authentic cases from official files. Technical advice comes from the office of Chief of Police W.H. Parker, Los Angeles Police Department. Technical advisors, Captain Jack Donahoe, Sergeant Marty Wynn, Sergeant Vance Brasher. Heard tonight were Ben Alexander, Virginia Gregg, Stacey Harris. Script by John Robinson. Music by Walter Schumann. Hal Gibney speaking. For a million laughs, tune in Chesterfield's Martin and Lewis show Tuesday on this same NBC station. And sound off for Chesterfield's. Either regular or king size, you'll find premium quality Chesterfield's much milder. Chesterfield is best for you. Chesterfield has brought you Dragnet transcribed from Los Angeles. Tonight, it's Adventure with Barry Craig, confidential investigator on NBC. For Chesterfield. Chesterfield, first cigarette with premium quality throughout in both regular and king size, brings you Dragnet. Ladies and gentlemen, the story you're about to hear is true. The names have been changed to protect the innocent. You're a detective sergeant. You're assigned to Bunko Fugitive Detail. You get a call from another city to pick up a burglary suspect. You know the name he's using. You know where he's living. Your job, pick him up. When you're asked to try a cigarette, you want to know, and you ought to know, what that cigarette is meant to people who smoke it and who smoke it all the time. For almost a year now... A medical specialist has given a group of Chesterfield smokers thorough examinations every two months. He reports no adverse effects to their noses, their throats, or sinuses from smoking Chesterfields. More and more men and women all over the country are finding out every day that Chesterfield is best for them. Enjoy your smoking. Try Chesterfields today. You'll find Chesterfield much milder with an extraordinarily good taste. Dragnet, the documented drama of an actual crime. For the next 30 minutes, in cooperation with the Los Angeles Police Department, you will travel step by step on the side of the law through an actual case transcribed from official police files. From beginning to end, from crime to punishment, Dragnet is the story of your police force in action. (laughs) 
It was Tuesday, June 4th. It was hot in Los Angeles. We were working the day watch out of Bunko Fugitive Detail. My partner's Frank Smith. The boss is Captain Steed. My name's Friday. We were on our way out from the office, and it was 9.42 a.m. when we got to the corner of Selman Fountain. The Arizona Carlton Hotel. Guess we check over there, huh? Yeah. You got the mugs? Yeah, right here. I'm awfully sorry, Mrs. Hartfield. Yes, I know we say each room is air-conditioned. Well, yes, ma'am, but it is true. I... I know, ma'am, but the air conditioning is on full now. All right, ma'am. Yes, I'll send some right up. I'll be with you right away. Front. Here, boy. Get some ice water up to Mrs. Hartfield in 502 right away. Well, sorry to keep you waiting. It's all right, sir. What is it you wanted? We're police officers, sir. Here's our identification. Uh, uh, there's nothing wrong, is there? Don't know what I'd do if anything else went wrong. The air conditioning unit went out this morning, making excuses. I don't know how much longer the ice water's going to hold out. W- what is it? What's wrong now? Do you have a Mr. George Richmond registered here? Probably gives his home address as Modesto. Uh, Richmond. Let's right. see here. Uh, wait a minute. Sir? How do I know you're what you say? Police department's always sending out circulars saying to be careful about this sort of thing. Respectable hotel, you know. How do I know? Well, here's our identification again, sir. I showed it to you before. Oh, mm-hmm. Friday. How about yours? Yeah, here you are, sir. Uh-huh. All right. Can't be too careful. Your own office says that, you know. Careful. Anybody can come in here with a badge. Yes, sir. And if you just check the register for us, please. Yeah, sure thing. Oh, yes, sir. Mm-hmm. Here he is. Richmond George, Modesto, California. So you here now? No, checked out day before yesterday. Oh, excuse me. Yes, sir. Registration desk. Uh, yes, Mrs. Hartfield. Yes, ma'am, I know that's what we advertise. Well, yes, ma'am, but it's on the way up. No, ma'am, I sent the boy myself. Uh, yes, ma'am. I'm sure he'll be there. All right, Mrs. Hartfield. Yes, ma'am. I may quit. Now, what was it you wanted with Mr. Richmond? Well, you said that he moved out, huh? Yes, bag and baggage day before yesterday. Did you leave any forwarding address? No, I talked to him when he left. Didn't say a word about where he was going. Uh-huh. Was there anyone in the hotel he was especially friendly with? Anybody who might know where we can reach him? No. He kind of kept to himself a nice fella. Sure tipped good. Kept to himself, though. Uh-huh. Is there anyone around the place who might know where he was going? Bellboys? Maybe the waitress in the coffee shop? Oh, no, no, I hardly think so. He didn't eat here. Don't blame him. Well, thank you very much, sir. Here's our card. If you hear anything from Mr. Richmond, we'd sure appreciate a call. You bet. I'll give you a ring. You got any mail while he was staying here? No, no, nothing. Not even a phone call. Didn't use the room for anything but to sleep. Real quiet. Good tipper, though. Did he drive a car, do you know? No. No, not that I know of. Say, you know, come to think of it, you might check with Ernie. Ernie? Yeah, he yeah, drives a cab, usually right out in front. He picked up Mr. Richmond one night. He might be able to tell you something. All right, sir, thank you very much. If anything comes up, appreciate that call. Okay, hope you get what you're looking for. Registration desk. Yes, Mrs. Hartfield. Let's go, Frank. All right. I know, ma'am, but the ice water's on the way up. I can't understand why it isn't there, but I am the manager. Mr. Fell out there might be him. Yes, Yeah. Excuse me a minute. Yeah? Your name, Ernie? That's right. What can I do for you? Police officers. We'd like some information. Well, I got a permit to park here. No, it's not that. We'd like to know if you remember picking up a George Richmond here. Oh. Richmond, huh? Yeah, that's right. Richmond. Well, name doesn't make any bells ring. What's the guy look like? You got those mug shots, Frank. Oh, yeah. There you go. You a cop, too? Yes, sir. I'm an officer. Yeah. You kind of look like one. Is this the guy? Yes, yeah, sir, that's him. You remember picking him up? Yeah, seems I've seen him before. Yeah, yeah, good tipper. Yeah, I picked him up, let's see, uh, a couple days ago. Drove him downtown. Sure, downtown. Remember where you took him? Gee, it was a couple days ago, like I said. Yes, yeah, sir. I haven't got the slightest idea. <laughs> a.m. We continued to talk to the cab driver. He was sure that he'd picked up George Richmond on Sunday night, but he was unable to tell us where he'd taken the suspect. We drove back downtown and checked with the cab company. On the driver's way bill, we found that he'd made three pickups that night from the hotel on Fountain Avenue. The first stop listed was a large cafeteria in downtown Los Angeles. We checked with the cashier. She was unable to identify the mugshots of Richmond. The second stop was a large apartment out on Wilshire Boulevard. 
We checked the manager of the place, and she told us that she didn't recognize the name. We showed her the mug shots of Richmond, and she said that she thought she'd seen the man two weeks before. When she asked him what he wanted, he said that he was looking for a Miss Norman. Because of the way he'd acted, the landlady hadn't told him that there was a tenant by that name living in the place. She gave us the apartment number of the Norman woman, and Frank and I went up to see her. Want to try it again? Yeah. Who is this? Police officers. What? Police officers. We'd like to talk to you. Just a minute. And what's this all about? Miss Margaret Norman. Yeah, that's right. What do you want with me? What if we come in, please? Be a little better than talking out here in the hall. Yeah, I guess so. Come in. Thank you. My name's Friday. This is my partner, Frank Smith. Pleased to meet you, ma'am. Yeah. Hi. You alone here, Miss Norman? Yeah, I just got up. Have to excuse the way the place looks. Kind of messy. Yes, ma'am. Mind if I put on some coffee? I'm not going to be able to answer any questions before I have a cup of coffee. Let me go right ahead, ma'am. What is it you want to see me about? You know a man named Richmond? Richmond? Yes, ma'am. George Richmond. Why'd you ask that? What's he done? We'd just like to know if you know him, do you? Yeah, I know him. What do you guys want him for? Well, we'd like to talk to him, Miss Norman. Uh-huh. Don't want to tell me what it's about, huh? Well, it'd be better if we talk to him. Yeah. Either one of you got a cigarette? Yes, ma'am. Here you go. Match? Thanks. Thanks. You know, there's no love lost between me and George. Is that right? You bet there isn't, lousy bum. Regular right? drugstore cowboy. He's a girl out for dinner one lousy night and a cheap dinner. Figures he owns her. You know where he is now? No, I haven't got the slightest idea. If I did know, I'd sure tell you. Bet I would. I'd like to see him get his way he treated me. You know any of his friends? Anyone who might know where he is? I don't think he's got a friend. At least I never met any of them. Does he drive a car, do you know? No, not him. Always took a cab. Used to kill me. Anywhere we went, he'd take a cab. One lousy block and he took a cab. Like to be a sport. Always tipping big. Regular drugstore cowboy. Mm-hmm. When did you see him last? It must have been a couple of weeks ago. That much anyway. Last time I saw him. Don't care if I never see him again where he acted. I thought he was going to kill me. Ma'am? Went out to dinner when we got back here. He'd been drinking a lot. Got real nasty. I told him he better be going. You know, it was late and all. Yes, ma'am. Well, like I said, it was late and... He got real nasty. He started yelling at me. Called me all sorts of things. I'm not going to let any man say things like that to me, so I told him to get out. I never want to see him again. One lousy dinner, and he thought he owned me. Mm-hmm. Will you go ahead, Miss Norman? He hauled off and hit me. Right, right there in the hall. Hit me as hard as he could. Almost broke my jaw. Well, you know, I let out a scream, and he beat it. Caused such a commotion, I had to move. Then this didn't happen here, is it? No, a place over on Vermont. I moved the next day. Mm-hmm. Where'd you meet Richmond? At the club. So, you got another cigarette? Yeah. There you are. Match? Thanks. What club's that, ma'am? Where I work. Green Lantern, downtown. I'm the cigarette girl. I met him there. He came in one night. Acted real big. Asked me if I'd have dinner with him. As it happened, I didn't have an engagement that night, so I said yes. Well, we kind of went together for a while. I see. Sure hope you get him. A real bad guy. The way he treats women. Terrible. He say, wait a minute. Yes, ma'am. I know someone who might be able to tell you where he is. Who's that, ma'am? A fellow named Hank. He used to hang around the club. I saw George talk to him at the bar once in a while. Well, do you know where we can find this fellow Hank? No, but I can tell you where his girlfriend lives. That help? Yes, ma'am, it will. Place over on 3rd, out near Fairfax. Do you know his full name, ma'am? Gee, I gotta think about that. Let's see. Jeanette, that's the girl. Jeanette introduced him as Palmer. That, that's it, Hank Palmer. I don't know about him, though. What's that, Miss Storm? He's a real mean one. Kind of, kind of quiet, not like George. George likes to shoot his mouth off, but Hank is quiet. He's trouble, though. Ma'am? Well, one night we went up to Jeanette's for a couple of drinks. Hank took off his coat. That's why I say he's rough. Yeah. Sure, carries a gun. <laughs> One forty-five p.m. We got the description of Hank Palmer, and then Frank and I drove back to the city hall. We ran the name and description through R&I, but we got no make. We sent the name to George Brereton, CII, up at Sacramento. We got communication off to Washington, asking them for information on Palmer. We also checked the name of Palmer's girlfriend through our records, but we got no information. 
We contacted Captain Steed and arranged for a stakeout to be placed on the apartment of Palmer's girlfriend, Jeanette Allen. Two days went by. Palmer and Richmond failed to make an appearance. We talked to Jeanette Allen, but she couldn't supply us with any information as to the whereabouts of the two men. Descriptions of the men were broadcast. Informants were questioned. We contacted the Modesto Police Department, and they sent us all information on the places Richmond was known to frequent while he was in Los Angeles. The kickback from Sacramento and Washington gave us no new information on Richmond, but Washington had him listed as having two arrests for armed robbery and ADW in the East. Another week passed. The stakeouts on Jeanette Allen's apartment continued. No sign of either of the men. Sergeant Al Panogis of the Bunko Fugitive Detail worked with us in trying to trace their movements. On Saturday, June 15th, we got word from an informant that Bitchman and Palmer had been seen in town. We checked with the stakeout at the apartment, but they'd seen nothing of the two men. Frank, Al Panogis, and I drove out to relieve the stakeout. Hey, Panogis. Yeah, Frank. Sure hot in this room, isn't it? Air just laying there. Yeah. Paper says this is the hottest June 15th on record. Is that Miss Allen? Yes, Sergeant. Now, you haven't heard from Palmer at all since he got back, is that it? No, not a word. I don't really believe he's in town. I'm, I'm sure if he was, he'd look me up. Never done this before. Uh-huh. Say, would it be all right if I got a glass of water, miss? Sure, help yourself right out in the kitchen. Thanks. How about you, Joe, one, son? No, no, thanks. Al? Yeah. Joe? Yeah? Cab stopping out in the front. Man getting out. Might be one of them. Guy's wearing an overcoat. On a day like this? You come in here, Al? Yeah. Yeah, cab's pulling away. Okay. You want to take that side of the door, Frank? Right. You better go into the bedroom, Miss Allen. You think there's going to be some trouble? Well, it depends on the way he wants it. Oh, well, I guess you know best. I hope not. All I need is to have to move again. Somebody in the hall. He's stopping. All set? Right. Who are you? You Hank Palmer? Yeah, so what? Police officers. Lousy right. cow! That's Joe. He's got a gun. I'll get him. All right, hold it up, Palmer. Stop or I'll fire. Get away from me, cop! Hold it up, Palmer! All right, Come on, pull out of here! Get in the call, Frank. Gray Mercury. License number is 1S69105. Right. Better call an ambulance, too. What? Panogis. He's hurt bad. June 15th, 8.40 p.m. Sergeant Al Panogis was removed to Georgia Street Receiving Hospital. His condition was listed as critical. The bullet had entered his chest and was still embedded below the left lung. His family was notified... And after Frank and I got out the APB on Palmer, we drove by to pick up Mrs. Panogis. We dropped her off at the hospital, and Frank stayed with her. Palmer's description was put out, as was the description of the car he'd commandeered to get away. I ran the number through our DMV and found that it was registered to a William Evans, 1627 East Point Setting, Hollywood. Along with Sergeant Ullery, I checked out the address. Mrs. Evans told us that she hadn't seen her husband for several hours, but when he left the house, he had told her that he was going to a lodge meeting. We got a description of him and got out a local and an APB on him. I called the hospital and found that they'd operated on Panogis, but that they were unable to remove the bullet. His wife collapsed. Frank had her taken home where she was cared for by their family doctor. 12.46 a.m. A radio car out in Chatsworth picked up Evans. He told him that Palmer had forced him at gunpoint to drive him to the valley. There he'd forced Evans from the car and driven off. Evans couldn't give the officers any idea of where the suspect might have been headed. Two hours later, the car was found abandoned on Spring Street. It was placed under surveillance, and a dragnet of the downtown area was started. Metro Division assigned 20 teams of men to make a block-by-block -block search of the vicinity. The details at the bus stations and at the airports were alerted. 4.12 a.m., I got a call from Frank, and I drove over to Georgia Street Receiving Hospital. Hi. How's it going? I'm good. Just saw the doctor. Well, how's Al? He just died. <laughs> You are listening to Dragnet, the authentic story of your police force in action. Chesterfield is the first cigarette to offer smokers premium quality in both regular and king size. King size Chesterfield contains tobaccos of better quality and higher price than any other king size cigarette. Chesterfield is first to name all its ingredients. 
Ingredients that make the best possible smoke. And Chesterfield gives you this scientific report. No adverse effects to the nose and throat of a group smoking only Chesterfields. So enjoy your smoking. Change to Chesterfield today. Much milder. With an extraordinarily good taste. When an officer is first accepted by the police force, he spends 13 weeks at the police academy. In that period, he learns the basic fundamentals of being a peace officer. On graduation from the academy, he is assigned either to traffic or to a tour of duty in one of the city jails. Then, depending on his aptitude and the way he conducts himself in the field, he's checked on for possible transfer to one of the detective divisions as an investigator. By the time a police officer gets his assignment to the detective bureau, he's become a professional troubleshooter. He knows how to handle himself, and he knows how to treat the lawbreaker. He's on call 24 hours a day, seven days a week, and he wears a gun. When a hoodlum shoots a police officer, he's showing society that he has no regard for the law, and at the same time, he is announcing that he will not hesitate to kill an unarmed citizen. Sergeant Alfred Panogis had been a policeman 14 years. He'd begun in traffic, and then had been transferred to the juvenile division. From there, he went to homicide detail, and then to Bunko Fugitive Division. He was a professional peace officer, and he'd been murdered. He gave his life to protect the people who paid his salary, the taxpayers. His killer was still at large, and we had to find him. The search of the downtown area was intensified, but it netted us nothing. Frank and I checked the immediate area around the abandoned car. In talking to the people in the vicinity, we found a newsboy who had seen Palmer park the car. He said he was unable to tell us where the man had gone, but he said that he thought he might have gone into a bar near the corner. We checked the place, but the bartender was unable to give us any information. Two days passed. We rechecked the known hangouts of the two men. Neither of them had been seen. Tuesday, June 18th, we got word that Palmer had been seen entering an apartment house on South Alvarado. 10.14 a.m., Frank and I drove over to talk to the landlady. Palmer and Richmond. No, no, I don't think I know them. What if you take a look at these pictures, Mrs. Holbrook, see if you recognize them? Sure. There you are. He's a mean one. Haven't seen him, though. This one. Ma'am? This one. I know him. Which one's he? Well, that's Richmond. No, that's not his name. Told me it was Reichman. Said it was John Reichman. Lives up in 206. That's in front. Is he in now, ma'am? No, he went out this morning early. First time in a couple of days he went out early. You expect him back soon? Oh, I don't know right off. Might be. I don't generally know when they're coming back. Don't keep tabs on him, you know. Them? Yeah, attendants. A nice bunch, most of them quiet. Had a full place last two years. Uh-huh. How long is this, uh, Reichman? Yeah, that's it, John Reichman. Uh, how long has he been here? Oh, he's kind of new. He took over the room from a friend of his. Yes, ma'am. Does he have any friends in the building, anyone that he sees quite a bit of? Well, now, there's a girl in 306. He sees quite a bit of her. Well, who's that, Miss Holbrook? That'd be Barbara McIntyre. Nice girl. Dancer. Works downtown at one of the clubs. She in now, would you know? Oh, she should be, yes. Hardly ever gets up much before noon. Hardly ever. He works late, you know. Yes, ma'am. Does uh, Richmond drive a car? Richmond? Oh, dear, now. Well, I don't know. I don't think so. Seems like he's always coming home in a cab. Comes in at all hours. I don't think he's going to last here. Why do you say that, ma'am? Because I don't think he will, that's all. Plays the radio late, makes noise, you know. Then there was a fight. The girl didn't want to do anything about it, but I certainly think she should have. Oh, well, what's that about, ma'am? Oh, one night, let's see, it must have been about uh, a week ago... Reichman or, or Richmond or whatever his name is came home and he was... Well, he'd been drinking quite a bit, you know. Yes, ma'am. Well, he went up to the girl's apartment and they had an awful brawl. Screaming and yelling an awful brawl. I went up and asked her if there was something I could do, but she yelled through the door and said no, that everything was all right. Of course it wasn't. Ma'am? Well, the next day the poor thing had a black eye that just wouldn't stop, all bruised up. Had a bandage right here on her forehead. Must have hit her awful hard. No, sir, I don't think he's going to last. Uh -huh. And you're pretty sure that you haven't seen this other man, though, are you? Well, let me see that picture again. Mm -hmm. This one? No, 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 I'm positive. I never saw him. Of course, that don't mean he wasn't here. Ma'am? Well, like I said, I don't pay much attention to them. They pay their rent, and I don't bother them. They come and go as they please. Say, what do you want them for? Is it about that, Mr.? Richmond? Yeah, is it about him beating up that poor girl? No, ma'am. I should have known about him. No, sir, he ain't going to last long around here. I wonder if we could see his room, Mrs. Holbrook. Well, I guess it's all right. 
I'll get the key. All right, ma'am. Thank you. Here you are. It's right up the stairs and then to the front of the hall. It's on the right at the far end of the hall. Well, we'd rather you'd come up with us, ma'am. Oh, well, all right. Glad to help. The way he must have beat that girl, a fiend, that's what he is. He sure isn't going to last long around here. No, oh, ma'am, he sure isn't. Before we looked at Richmond's apartment, we tried to check with his girlfriend. We found that she wasn't in. The manager let us into her apartment, but we found no indication where she might have gone. Then we went downstairs and searched Richmond's place. He wasn't there. The landlady stood by when we searched the place. In a closet, we found a small arsenal, a gas grenade, a sawed-off shotgun, and two boxes of shells. There were also several revolvers, along with over 150 rounds of ammunition. We called the office and arranged for a stakeout on the building. Sergeants Ulrey, Gerard, Gilmore, and Miller came out. Gerard and Gilmore covered the front entrance. Ulrey and Miller were stationed at the back of the building, and Frank and I covered Richmond's room. The residents of the apartment were warned to stay inside their rooms and to keep their doors locked. 10.30 p.m., there was still no sign of the suspects. We waited. 11 o'clock, 11.15, midnight. Joe? Yeah? Looks like it might be them. Cab pulling up in front. How about Gerard and Gilmore? No, I can't see them from here. Yeah. Looks like Palmer and Richmond. They got the girl with them. Where is she? She's walking between them. Makes yeah. it tough, huh? Yeah. Well, they won't try to take them on the street this way. They're coming in the building. Uh-huh. They should be here pretty quick. I have figures if they're coming here. Upstairs. Girl's apartment, huh? Sounds like it. Wonder if they went in with her. I'll just have to wait. Wait a minute. Somebody outside there in the hall. Yeah. Hold it. I don't feel right, I tell you. It's too quiet. Something's up. All right, mister. Let's hold it. Come, George, read it! Oh, yeah. I'd give it up, Palmer. Well, they made the street. No more drive should get him. Get that car, Joe. Let's go. Looks like they're in that store. You want to cover me while I try to get over there? All right, take it easy. All right. You all right, Frank? Right. All right, I'm coming over. I'll cover you. You see Gilmore and Gerard? Yeah, they're behind the Buick over there. Come on out of there. Richmond, Palmer, come on. Throw the guns out. You come in and take us, cop. Give it up, Richmond. You're at a dead end. There's no way out of there. And we'll make one. They're coming out, Joe. Okay, okay, I quit. You got Richmond, I quit. Now don't shoot anymore. Please don't shoot anymore. You won't shoot anymore, will you please? Throw that gun out here. Come on. All right. Here it is. I'm throwing it out. Now don't shoot anymore, please. Got it. All right, I'll check Richmond. All right. I have a gun. The gun, I gave it to you. I'm hurt. Can't you see that? I'm hurt bad. I told Gilmore to call the ambulance. Richmond's dead. How about this one? Well, he's hit. I don't know how bad. I should have known not to kill a cop. I would have been like this if I didn't kill that cop. I didn't mean to. I got scared. That's all scared. You can understand that, can't you? Yeah, you want to shake him, Frank? Yeah. Watch it, Frank. He's got another gun. You all right? Yeah. Palmer? Palmer? I'll check him. Where about it? He's dead. Look here, John. What's that? Have these in his pockets. Must be 50 or 60 rounds of ammunition there. Yeah. Doesn't look like he was ready to quit. He was ready. The story you have just heard was true. The names were changed to protect the innocent. On July 26th, an inquest was held in the coroner's office in and for the county of Los Angeles. In a moment, the results of that inquest. Now, here is our star, Jack Webb. Thank you, George Fenneman. Friends, every day, more and more people are changing to Chesterfield, and finding Chesterfield is best for them. One reason for this is premium quality. Chesterfield is first to give you premium quality in both regular and king size. 
Another reason, Chesterfield gives you this scientific report. No adverse effects to the nose and throat of a group smoking only Chesterfield. I smoke an average of two packs a day, and I'm convinced Chesterfield is best for me. Try them. Regular or king size. I think you'll find Chesterfield is best for you. At the coroner's inquest, it was found that the deaths of George Thomas Richmond and Henry Donald Palmer were justifiable homicide. It was found that they were armed and were killed while resisting arrest. You have just heard Dragnet, a series of authentic cases from official files. Technical advice comes from the office of Chief of Police W.H. Parker, Los Angeles Police Department. Technical advisors, Captain Jack Donahoe, Sergeant Marty Wynn, Sergeant Vance Brasher. Heard tonight were Ben Alexander, Joyce McCluskey, Paul Richards. Script by John Robinson. Music by Walter Schumann. Hal Gibney speaking. For a million laughs, tune in Chesterfield's Martin and Lewis show, Tuesday on this same NBC station. And sound off for Chesterfield's, either regular or king size. You'll find premium quality Chesterfield much milder. Chesterfield is best for you. Chesterfield has brought you Dragnet, transcribed from Los Angeles. Ladies and gentlemen, wherever and whenever people need help, the Red Cross answers the call. When a flood-stricken family needs shelter, when a crippled child must learn to walk and play, and when a wounded soldier needs blood, the Red Cross is always there. Now the Red Cross needs your help. To keep up their many services this year, $93 million is needed. So when the Red Cross volunteer calls on you, please answer the call and give generously. For Chesterfield. Chesterfield is best for you. First cigarette with premium quality in both regular and king size. Chesterfield brings you Dragnet. Ladies and gentlemen, the story you're about to hear is true. The names have been changed to protect the innocent. You're a detective sergeant. You're assigned a bunco detail. For the past year, a confidence man has been cheating women in your city. You finally get a lead on him. Your job? Get him. Tonight, I have a new report for you. A most important one, too. Because when you're asked to try a cigarette, you want to know, and you ought to know, what that cigarette is meant to people who smoke it all the time. After a full year of observation, a medical specialist who has given a group of Chesterfield smokers thorough examinations every two months for the full year reports no adverse effects to their nose, throat, or sinuses from smoking Chesterfields. More and more men and women all over the country are finding out every day that Chesterfield is best for them. Enjoy your smoking. Try Chesterfields today. They're best for you. Much milder, with an extraordinarily good taste. Dragnet, the documented drama of an actual crime. For the next 30 minutes, in cooperation with the Los Angeles Police Department, you will travel step by step on the side of the law through an actual case transcribed from official police files. From beginning to end, from crime to punishment, Dragnet is the story of your police force in action. It was Wednesday, February 12th. It was cold in Los Angeles. We were working the day watch out of bunco detail. My partner's Frank Smith. The boss is Captain Steed. My name's Friday. We were at the Armstrong Thomas Department Store cafeteria, and it was 3.14 p.m. when I got back to the table. Hey, Joe. Let me give you a hand. Oh, thanks. Here you are, Miss Terrence. Thank you. I wonder if you'd tell us what this is all about now, ma'am. Surely. 
sorry you had to wait, but I thought it might be better if we talked up here. Yes, ma'am. Would you pass the sugar, please? Oh, yes, ma'am. Here you are. Well, it's not a pretty thing. I don't know how I could have been so foolish. But I guess when you get to be my age and you haven't got anything, almost any attention makes you forget. Yes, ma'am. How'd you first meet this man, Ben? I saw him first at a musicale. I met him very briefly that night. He called me the next day, said that he wanted to see me again. Well, I told him that I didn't think it'd be proper, but he insisted, so that night we had dinner together. He seems so nice, I still can't believe it. Yes, ma'am. Such a wonderful time. I didn't think anybody could be so happy. We ate at a wonderful little place down at the beach. Then we went for a long drive and listened to the music on the radio. Just beautiful. The way the ocean looked, all the moonlight and all. Mm-hmm. When did you see him again, ma'am? Not until he left. He'd call a couple of times a day. It got a little embarrassing. The girls at the store here got to kidding me about it, but I didn't care. Then... He told me he wanted to marry me. I couldn't believe it. So wonderful. Yes, ma'am. Then one day he told me that he was going to have to take a business trip up north. When was that? Do you remember, ma'am? I guess it was about three weeks ago, something like that. Mm -hmm. Go ahead, please. Well, he left. I went down to the station and saw him off. He kissed me and said that when he got back, we'd be married. We were going over to Las Vegas on our honeymoon. Wonderful plans. Wonderful. And then I heard from him, and he got to San Francisco. He called me from the hotel and said that he'd lost his wallet on the train. He told me he'd lost everything. All his money, identification, everything. Mm-hmm. That's when he asked me for the hundred dollars. I didn't think that anything was wrong, so I sent it to him. Where'd you send it, ma'am? To his hotel. Did you hear from him at all after that, ma'am? Not a word. At first, I thought that maybe he was just busy. I did think it was kind of funny that he wouldn't say something about getting the money I sent, but not a word. Then I got worried. Yes, ma'am, I understand. Finally, I called the hotel, and they told me that he'd checked out. I figured that maybe he was back in town and wanted to surprise me. So I called his apartment... The landlady told me that he had left a couple of weeks before, that he didn't leave any forwarding address. Yes, ma'am. I didn't know what to think. I didn't want to believe that he'd just used me, but there didn't seem to be anything else to think. Yes, ma'am. Then, of course, it was only a hundred dollars. Seems that if he'd wanted to rob me, he could have asked for more. I... Still don't believe it, even when I know it's true. Yes, ma'am. Now, I wonder if you could give us a description of the man. Yes, I can do that. Let's see. He was tall. About how tall, ma'am? Over six feet, maybe six feet two. Uh, He had blonde hair, Mm -hmm. kind of wavy. About how much would you say he weighed, Miss Terrence? I'd just be guessing, but I'd say about 190 or so. I see. I wonder if you'd be kind enough to come down to the city hall and look at some pictures for us. You think you might have one of him? It's possible, ma'am. Maybe it'd make you feel a little better to know that you're not the only woman that this Benton has taken. There have been quite a few. I guess I knew that. Even if I didn't want to believe it, I guess I knew it was just a confidence game. Such a cruel thing, though, to use a person's loneliness to rob them. Yes, ma'am, it is. When you get along in years and you haven't got anything to hold on to little attention and affection makes you forget everything else. Nothing else seems to matter. Yes, ma'am. I guess that's the way they figure it. Frank and I had been looking for Jonathan Benton for the past year. During that time, he'd taken approximately $37,000 from women in the Los Angeles area. His method of operation was to answer the ads in the personal columns of the daily papers. He'd give the woman a whirlwind courtship, then under the pretext of having to clean up some business before marriage, he'd leave town. He'd call the next day and give them the story about losing his wallet and identification. He'd ask them for $100. This in itself was to throw off the suspicions of the victims. 
In the event that they suspected that they were being taken in a racket, a hundred dollars was small enough so that their fears were quieted. Benton would answer about 20 to 30 of these ads at a time, and the request for money would hit all of the suspects at once. We'd had several complaints lately, and there was no way of knowing how many women were being taken and were too embarrassed to report it to the authorities. 4.30 p.m. We drove Miss Terrence back to the city hall and had her check the mug books. She was unable to give us an identification, however. Another month passed. During that time, we received 14 more complaints. In all instances, the description of the suspect matched that of Jonathan Benton. All available sources of information were checked. Bulletins had been gotten out carrying his description and the name he used. No results. On Wednesday, March 25th, we got a call that a man answering Benton's description had placed an ad in the personal columns of one of the daily papers. He'd used the name of Thomas Conan. The clerk at the ad counter gave us his address, and at 5.32 p.m., Frank and I went out to talk to him. Yeah? You Thomas Conan? Yeah, that's right. What can I do for you? Police officers would like to talk to you. Well, sure, come on in. Always glad to talk to the law. This is my partner, Frank Smith. How do you do, Mr. Smith? How do you do, sir? If you boys will come on in, I'll shut the door. Thank you. And uh, now, what's this all about? Well, sir, did you put this ad in the paper? Now, let me see. Uh, Texas cowman desires to meet petite young lady object companionship. Spelled everything right to dead. Yes, sir, that's mine. I wrote it all myself. How long have you been in Los Angeles? Well, now, let's see. Got in on the bus last Tuesday. That'd make a week and a day. Uh-huh. What brings you out here? Well, I guess you could say it's kind of a business trip. Got a little tired of the same faces back home, so I thought I'd just see what the rest of the country looked like. What little A's of it. I'm from Texas, you know. Amarillo. Yeah, what's all this about, anyway? Some law I broke? No, it's about that ad. Oh, you found out, huh? Beg your pardon? Oh, you found out about me saying I was a cattleman. That's it, ain't it? What do you mean? Well, now, I didn't mean to harm. I do have a couple milk cows on the place. A Holstein and a Guernsey. Uh, they're real nice, too. It's just that I was so darn lonesome, I kind of thought this might be a way to meet some nice gal. I didn't mean to harm. You can see that, can't you? Yes, yeah, sir, I guess so. wonder if you'd mind taking a ride with us, sir. Well, I should say not. Always happy to go along with the law. Uh, where do you figure to go to? We'd like you to meet somebody. Well, now that's right. Nice of you. Got some gal you'd like me to meet, huh? Well, it's not exactly that, sir. Well, it don't matter none. I got nothing to do anyhow. Just sitting here wondering if I get any replies to the ad. All right, sir. If you wouldn't mind, let's go. Not at all. I'll get my hat. Don't hardly feel conspicuous in this hat at all. Is that right? Yep. Kind of thought people might make something of it, but they hardly even notice it. Had two little kids come up today, ask for my autograph. <laughs> Guess they figured I was a movie star. Made me feel real good, too. Then I wrote my name for them. They didn't know who I was. But that didn't make no mind to them. They just thanked me and went on about the business. Right nice little folks they was. Yeah, well, let's go. Sure. Real nice people here in L.A. Real nice. Haven't met a bad one yet. Well, you haven't been here long. We got them. p.m., we drove Thomas Conant downtown and had a car go out and pick up Miss Terrence. While we talked to Conant in the interrogation room, she walked by the open door and looked in at the suspect. She told us that he was not the man who'd victimized her. She was returned to her home, and after Conant had been checked through R&I, he was released. The next morning, Frank and I ran down a tip from an informant, but it led us nowhere. 10.18 a.m., we checked back into the office. You get the latest bulletin from San Francisco, Joe? Yeah, I looked it over this morning. They checked out the hotel Benton was staying at. He checked out of there. They haven't seen him since. Well, that means he's probably back here in town, huh? Well, if he is, we should start hearing about him again pretty soon. I'll get it. Bunko, Friday. Who? Oh, yes, ma'am. Yes, Miss Terrence, I remember. Yes, ma'am. Where was that? Uh, would you give me that again? Yes, ma'am. Four eight Vine. Uh huh. Yes, that's right, ma'am. We'll get in touch with you. Right. Thank you very much. Bye. Grace Terrence. Yeah, she just saw Benton. Where? Went into an apartment out on Vine Street. Ten forty one AM. Frank and I got to the apartment house on Vine Street. We talked to the landlord and he told us that a man answering the suspect's description was registered in apartment four B. He was registered under the name Jonathan Benson. He told us that this Benson had just moved in and paid his first month's rent in advance. He'd said that he was just going to be in town for a short time and that in the event that he moved out before his month was up, he expected no refund. 
Frank and I went up to the fourth floor and knocked on the door. Yeah? You Jonathan Benson? Who are you? Police officers want to talk to you. What about? Might be better if we talked inside. Maybe I don't want you in my... All right, now, mister, you get your hat. We want to talk to you downtown. What for? Come on, get your hat. Just a minute. I think maybe there's been some kind of mistake here. Just tell me exactly what it is you're looking for. I'm sure we can work... Come on, mister. Quit stalling. Get your hat, will you? Come on in. I'll get my hat. I'll get it for you. In this closet? Yeah, the gray one. You sure you got the right man? Looks that way. Mm Mm-hmm. No way to work this out. What do you mean by that? Well, I don't even know why you want me to go with you. Seems you could fill me in on that. Got some people we'd like to have you meet. Who? You'll see when we get there. Here's your hat. Come on, let's go. You guys sure think you're the Gestapo coming in here dragging a private citizen out of his house. You haven't done anything wrong. You got nothing to worry about then, have you? That's not the point. I don't like it. Coming in here and take me downtown so a lot of stupid old broads can look at me. Who said we wanted women to look at you? You did. No, we said we wanted you to meet some people. Must have misunderstood, huh? Yeah, I guess you did. Um, no way we can work this out, huh? There's no way. Now, come on. Oh, just a minute. I want to be sure I got my key. I don't want to be locked out. Don't worry about it. What do you mean? You might not be coming back. Frank and I took Jonathan Benson downtown. We ran him through R&I, but we got no identification. His fingerprints were rolled and checked, but they didn't make him. Miss Terrence was called and asked to come down to the city hall to try to identify the suspect. 2.30 p.m., we took him to the interrogation room. You ever use the name Benton? No. You sure? Yeah. You ever use any other alias? Why should I? You tell us. Now, look, why don't you come off it? Tell me what this is all about. You told us you just got into town, is that right? Yeah, I've been here about a week. Where'd you come from? Up north. Where up north? San Francisco. You live up there, do you? Most of the time, yeah. Most of the time? What's that mean? Just that. Most of the time I live in San Francisco. That hard for you guys to understand? What line of work are you in? I'm a salesman. Yeah, what do you sell? Whatever people want to buy. What are you selling now? Nothing right now. That's why I'm here. I'm looking for a deal. You know a woman named Terrence, Grace Terrence? I don't think so. Might. Why? We'd like to know. Hey, maybe I'm wrong about all of this, but it seems to me that when they taught me civics in school, they said that I had to be booked, that you had to let me go. They changed that law? No, that law's still good. Then let's stop horsing around. I got a lot of things I want to do. Fill me in on this and then let me out of here. All right. There's been a confidence man working in the L.A. area. I've been taking money from women. Gives him a big pitch about wanting to marry him, and then he hits him up for a hundred bucks and leaves him. Sounds like a good wreck. He's taking a lot of money from people who haven't got it to spare. Offhand, I'd say that's a tough luck. Offhand, we'd say you're wrong. The way you look at it. Where do I fit into this little fantasy? You look good for the guy who's been pulling the deal. Me? That's right. You guys are flipping. Description matches. So I look like another guy. Everything else about you checks out. So you figure you've made me for the jobs, huh? That's what we figure. Which way's the gas chamber? Oh, come off it, fellas. You guys know you're trying to hang a bad rap on me. You know it, and so do I. Now, let's call the whole thing off. I can get out of here, and you can get to the Pinoch. I'll get it. Hello, Jonathan. What? Why'd you do it, Jonathan? Why? If you wanted the money, you could have asked for it. I'd have given it to you. You didn't have to lie about what you thought. The place is full of amelonies. Is this the man, Miss Terrence? Yes, Sergeant, that's him. All right, how about it, Benson? I don't know what she's talking about. What's this bit with that's him? Looney's jumping with All right, now, Benson, I've had enough of that. Now, come off it. You've just been identified. We've got a lot more of them that we can have here. I think they'll identify you, too. Why, John? Why? Oh, get her out of here. One thing I can't stand is a woman bawling. Something comes along, I can't figure out right away they got a ball. Anything comes along, they got to cry. I'm sick of it. All right, ma'am, maybe it'd be better if you waited in our office. Yes, Sergeant. Still don't know why he did it. Why he took this way to get the money. I took this way because it was the easy way. You broads are all alike, every last one of you. Let me get a few things straight first. You say I took $100 from you, is that right? Yes. All right. I want you to think about this and think real careful. Didn't I say that I wanted to borrow the money? Isn't that what I said, borrow? Yes, that's what you said. Did I say that I'd pay the money back in any certain time? I don't know. Well, you think real good. You'll remember that I didn't. I just said that I'd pay you back. That's all. I didn't say when. I guess so. I don't... I, I don't care. There you are. Is it any crime to borrow money from a friend? I borrowed the money from her. I'll pay it back. You said you wanted to marry me. You said you loved me. Oh, come off it, Sarah. You got no beef. You got the soft light and the romantic music. You got it all. Look at you. Take a good look. Who'd want to marry you? Here, just a minute. Here. Here's a hundred bucks I borrowed. I want to pay you back. I got $100 worth of laughs from you. That much easy. Here's your dough. Now go home and have a good cry. I wouldn't marry you if you were the last woman on earth. All right, earth. that's enough of that, Benson. You're not just kidding. This old harpy with romantic ideas. What a laugh. 
She thinks anybody want to marry her, and she's a loony, too. I didn't think anybody could be this mean. I didn't think anyone could be this cruel. I don't believe it. You got no choice. You know it all along. Thanks for the laughs. Come on, Miss Terrence, please. Imagine that, that old bag really thinking I'd marry him. Yeah. Real laugh. Well, anyway, she got her dough back. I said I'd pay her back. I did. You check with the rest of them. I'll tell you the same thing. I borrowed the money, that's all. I can't help it if they thought something else. I can't help it, can I? Come on, let's get this over with. I want to get out of here. Yeah. You look upset, cop. Don't be. It won't prove anything. That's the way I it got is. something for you, Benson. Is that right? Yeah. Someplace, sometime, you're going to make a mistake. Is that right? Yeah, and when you do, we're going to lean on you, and we're going to lean hard. You are listening to Dragnet, the authentic story of your police force in action. Chesterfield regular, Chesterfield king size. The first cigarette to give you premium quality either way you like them. This means that king size Chesterfield contains tobaccos of better quality and higher price than any other king size cigarette. Chesterfield is first to name all its ingredients. Ingredients that make the best possible smoke. And Chesterfield gives you this full year scientific report. No adverse effects to the nose and throat of a group smoking only Chesterfields. So enjoy your smoking. Change to Chesterfield today. Much milder, with an extraordinarily good taste. We had 12 of the victims of the confidence man look at Benson. All of them gave a positive identification, but verified his story that he'd borrowed the money from them. 4.25 p.m., Frank and I got in touch with the district attorney's office and talked with them. What Benson had said was true. In borrowing the money, or in saying he was borrowing it, he'd committed no violation of the law. We had to release him from custody. A month passed. During that time, we'd heard nothing more from the suspect. He'd stopped working the Dodge in the Los Angeles area. We contacted the San Francisco authorities and informed them of what had happened. They said that they'd be on the lookout for Benson. During the next two weeks, Frank and I worked on a ring of bunco artists that were working the obituary columns. On June 16th, we got a call from burglary division that they'd gotten a report of a theft. And talking to the victim, they'd gotten the name Jack Bentley. They checked the files on him and found that it could be Jonathan Benson. The victim, a Miss Betty Lindsay, came to our office to talk to us. I don't know why they thought that I should see you. It's just a plain theft. The officers in burglary said that they thought we might be interested in the thief, Miss Lindsay. I wonder if you'd tell us about him. Lousy crumb. This guy's a real schnook. Schnook of the first water. Yes, ma'am. What's his name, please? He called himself Bentley. Jack Bentley. What a bum. What do he look like, Miss Lindsay? Mm, tall and blonde. Kind of nice looking guy if he went for the type. I did. Now I got troubles. Oh, what a no good bum. I wonder if you'd take a look at some of the pictures we've got here and see if he's in these. Sure. I'd like to see you get him. Where are the pictures? Frank, would you get him, please? Yeah. Where'd you meet this Bentley? Do you remember? Well, I'm sort of the hostess at a place downtown over on Fifth. Anyway, about two, three weeks ago, this schnook comes in, orders a couple of drinks, and he leaves. Next night, he's back again. Oh, he was a cagey one. Didn't work too fast. Took about a week to make the pitch, then he asked me out to dinner. Well, he always seemed kind of nice, so I told him I'd go. Mm-hmm. Here are the pictures, ma'am. If you just take a look through them and see if there's one of Bentley in oh, there. Sure. Let me see. No. Mm-mm. It's not him. Hey, this one's kind of cute. What's he wanted for? Oh, he works the casualty racket. What's that? Gets the names of people that have died, tells their families that they ordered some stuff. What kind of stuff? Oh, pen and pencil sets, watches, cheap things. Charges a lot of money for them. Most of the people figure that it's one of the last things their loved ones wanted, so they pay the prices. The stuff's worthless. <laughs> Lousy racket. Such a nice-looking guy, too. So honest. Well, that's why it works. Yeah, I suppose so. Well, let me see. No, this one's not him. Hey, wait a minute. Yeah. That's him. Ooh, what a nudnik. Ma'am? A nudnik, a real bum. But that's him, I'm sure of it. Benson. Yeah. You mean you know this guy? Yes, ma'am. What if you tell us exactly what happened? Well, sure, like I was telling you. This guy... Benson? Yes, ma'am, that's right. Jonathan Benson. Yeah, well... Anyway, he asked me out to dinner... I told him I'd go. It looked like he was pretty well fixed. I figured it wouldn't do no harm. Well, see, I don't get off till 12.30, and there ain't many places, nice places, open after that. 
But I said, yeah, so he told me he'd pick me up. He got to the club about 10 o'clock. Said that he'd gotten through with whatever it was he was doing, that he came by to see if he could use my apartment to freshen up a bit. Freshen up a bit. Boy, what a way to heist the place. Oh, what a bum. Go ahead, man. Well, I gave him the key of the place. He said that he'd stop at a drugstore and pick up a razor and shave and wash his face, and then he'd be back to pick me up. It's the last I ever saw of him. Mm-hmm. Walked off with a fur coat I had. Saved for three years for that coat. Cost me 900 bucks. Then he took a ring worth about 150. Diamonds. Belonged to my mother. Sure hope you get him. Nail him good. Yes, ma'am. Ooh, what a nutnik. We continued to question Betty Lindsay. She gave us the name of one of Benson's friends. We checked on him, and he gave us the name of a girl who knew the suspect. We talked to her, and she was able to give us Benson's address. It was a rooming house on Franklin Avenue in the Hollywood area. 6.47 p.m., Frank and I went up to his room. Yeah, come on in. Should have kept my mouth shut. What do you guys want? We want to talk to you downtown, Benson. We aren't going to get on that merry-go-round again, are we? I'm getting tired of this whole deal. What are you guys trying to tell me this time? We didn't have to do it, Benson. You took care of that yourself. Is that right? Yep, you made a mistake. What is it this time? You figure I took some candy away from a blind newsboy? All right, boy? come on, Benson. Let's go. You're going to arrest me this time, or am I going as a favor? This time it's on us. You mean we're playing for keeps now? Yeah. What's the charge? Grand theft. You kidding? Nope. I really believe you're serious. That's right. You call it. Well, this is going to be interesting. If you can't prove this, I'm going to own City Hall, and the first thing I'm going to do is fire you two. You know that, don't you? Well, we'll take that chance. All right, but don't say I didn't warn you. You know, someday I'm going to write a book. Call it Some of My Best Friends Are Cops. Yeah, you do that. I will. You'll have the time. We took the suspect downtown. We talked to him for over an hour, but he'd admit nothing. Without being able to produce the stolen articles, the case would be difficult to prosecute. We had Benson take everything out of his pockets. Among his personal effects, we found a key to a locker in the subway terminal. Two men from Bunko Division took the key and went down to the terminal. They recovered a locked suitcase and brought it back to the squad room where we were questioning Benson. How about it, Benson? This yours? Never saw it before in my life. It's locked. You got a key to this, Benson? I told you it wasn't mine. What more can I say? See those keys there, aren't they? Yeah. Here. All right. I don't know what this is all going to prove. I told you the suitcase isn't mine. Yeah, that figures. That's how come the keys fit, huh? Cheap suitcase. A lot of the keys double. Is that right? Sure. Lots of times I lost the key for one suitcase, used the key from another one to open it. You ever find one of these in the case? I never saw that fur coat in my life. I haven't got the slightest idea how it got there. I want to talk to a lawyer. You're getting kind of jumpy, aren't you, Benson? Sure. I don't mind admitting it. I told you I got no idea where that coat came from, but I know you guys aren't going to believe it. You're out to get me. You said so. You're going to try everything you can do with it. You want to tell us about it now? There ain't nothing to tell. I don't know nothing about it. You don't ever give up, do you? I don't know what you're talking about. I want to see a lawyer. All right. We'll fix it so you can put that call in. We got the owner of this coat on the way down here. She's going to identify him, and that's all we need. Now, you just sit there and keep your mouth shut, will you? I'll get it. Bunko, Smith. What's that? Oh, yeah, sure. Sure, I remember you did, huh? Well, that's swell. Glad to hear it. Well, I wouldn't know. I'm not much of an authority, I guess. I see. Her name's what? Yeah. It's a nice name. Well, I'll be glad to tell him. I'm sure he'll be pleased. Thanks very much for calling. When are you leaving? I see. Okay. Thanks a lot. Bye. Anything? Yes, that kid from Texas, you know, that uh, Thomas Conant? Oh, yeah. You mean the cattle man? Yeah. Got an answer to his ad. Is that right? Yeah. Somebody called him up. He said that he made a real good deal for himself, and he's shipping her back to Texas. Well, you mean he found a girl? No. Bought himself another Holstein. The story you've just heard was true. The names were changed to protect the innocent. On October 17th, trial was held in Department 87, Superior Court of the State of California, in and for the County of Los Angeles. In a moment, the results of that trial. Now, here is our star, Jack Webb. Thank you, George Fenneman. Quality throughout is what we try to put in every dragnet show, and it's what Chesterfield gives you in every cigarette. It's the first premium quality cigarette in both regular and king size. And smoking two packs a day myself, I can tell you that they're milder with a real good taste. Chesterfield.
Jonathan Arthur Benson, alias Jack Bentley, was tried and convicted of grand theft. He received sentence as prescribed by law. Grand theft is punishable by imprisonment in the state penitentiary for not less than one, nor more than ten years. You have just heard Dragnet, a series of authentic cases from official files. Technical advice comes from the office of Chief of Police, W.H. Parker, Los Angeles Police Department. Technical advisors, Captain Jack Donahoe, Sergeant Marty Wynn, Sergeant Vance Brasher. Heard tonight were Ben Alexander, Peggy Weber, Harry Bartell. Script by John Robinson. Music by Walter Schumann. Hal Gibney speaking. For a million laughs, tune in Chesterfield's Martin and Lewis show, Tuesday on this same NBC station. And sound off for Chesterfield. Either regular or king size, you'll find premium quality Chesterfield much milder. Chesterfield is best for you. Chesterfield has brought you Dragnet transcribed from Los Angeles. Ladies and gentlemen, make tomorrow your D-Day. Get an extra bond for defense. Step into any bank or post office and buy yourself a profitable share in America's future. As an investment, bonds are better than ever. They can help you save safely, conveniently, and profitably. So whether you already buy on the payroll savings plan where you work or the bond-a-month plan where you bank, get an extra bond for defense tomorrow. Sound off for Chesterfield. Chesterfield is best for you. First cigarette with premium quality in both regular and king size. Chesterfield brings you Dragnet. Ladies and gentlemen, the story you are about to hear is true. The names have been changed to protect the innocent. You're a detective sergeant. You're assigned a robbery detail. A holdup man has been hitting large supermarkets in your city. He's fast and he's experienced. Your job? Get him. Tonight, I have a new report for you. A most important one, too. Because when you're asked to try a cigarette, you want to know and you ought to know what that cigarette is meant to people who smoke it all the time. After a full year of observation, a medical specialist who has given a group of Chesterfield smokers thorough examinations every two months for the full year reports no adverse effects to their nose, throat, or sinuses from smoking Chesterfields. More and more men and women all over the country are finding out every day that Chesterfield is best for them. Enjoy your smoking. Try Chesterfields today. They're best for you much milder, with an extraordinarily good taste. Dragnet, the documented drama of an actual crime. For the next 30 minutes, in cooperation with the Los Angeles Police Department, you will travel step by step on the side of the law through an actual case transcribed from official police files. From beginning to end, from crime to punishment... Dragnet is the story of your police force in action. It was Monday, July 7th. It was warm in Los Angeles. We were working the day watch out of robbery detail. My partner's Frank Smith. The boss is Captain Didion. My name's Friday. We were on the way out from the office, and it was 10.22 a.m. when we got to the corner of 67th Street and Jefferson Boulevard, Lamont Brothers Market. Oh, I guess I should have been scared the way they came in with those guns, but I wasn't. That one came back into the office and said he wanted the money. I gave it to him. I wasn't going to mess with him. Mr. Haskins? Yes, I'm Haskins. Who are you? Police officer, sir. My name's Friday. This is my partner, Frank Smith. Friday and Smith. Oh, oh yeah. You're the fellows that was talking about, huh? Sir? Well, the other ones, the cops in the car. They said there'd be a couple of detectives here. Have you seen the other cops yet? Yes, sir. We talked to them. They've already put out a call. I wonder if we get some information from you. Sure. You want to come back here to the office? Yes, sir. 
Back this way. We can talk there. Just sit down. Mr. Haskins, if you'd just tell us what happened, please. Well, it's pretty simple. I was sitting here getting the money ready for the bank, and this guy came in. He said he wanted the money and a gun, so I gave it to him. I said, none the more. He just took the money and left. Mm-hmm. What time was it, sir? Oh, around 8.30, quarter to nine. How many men were there, sir? Well, there was two. Two is all I saw. I, I don't think there was any more of them. All right, sir, if you could just tell us exactly what happened. Well, I told you they came in and they took the money. I know, sir, but if you'd go into more detail... Well, I came in about 7.30 this morning, like always, check things over the store to make sure that everything was okay. Then I started checking out the week's receipts. Uh-huh. Well, then, like I said, it must have been 8.45 or so, and heard this knock on the door. I thought there must be something wrong. The employees know not to bother me when I'm making up the deposit slips. Yes, sir. That's when I knew that something was wrong. Right away, I said to myself, Larry, there's something up. Something isn't good. Yes, sir. Well, it was right. Went over to the door and unlocked it. There he was, this big fellow. Stood there with a gun. The way his eyes lit up when he saw all that money laying on the desk. You got any idea of how much money was taken, sir? Well, it was about 6000 cash. I guess another 1500 checks, more or less. Uh-huh. I wonder if you'd give us a description of this man, could you? Well, like I said, he was a big one, real mountain of a man, well over six feet. Had this gun, you know. Uh-huh. He stood there and said, this is a stick-up. I want that money. And he pointed at the money with his gun. Oh, what kind of a gun was it? Could you tell? That's a great question. Of course I could tell. He had it right under my nose. Shotgun. Sawed off. Had the stock cut down, too. Looked like a horse pistol. Well, he handles that thing. I wasn't going to mess with him. Uh-huh. I told him, take the money. Take it and get out. Not to shoot that thing off. He did. Walked right over to the desk and scooped up the money. He had a paper bag. He put it down by the table and he scooped the money into it. Then he said to me to stay put. Not to try to yell or be brave. <laughs> Didn't have to tell me that. I wouldn't have tried anything. He said there was another man, is that right? Yes, I, I saw him when they left. He was a little fellow. Mm-hmm. About how tall, would you say? Well, it would be kind of hard to tell. I didn't get very close to him. Well, was he armed, too? Yeah, he was carrying a revolver. they drive a car, would you know? Well, if they did, I didn't see it. You went out after them, then? <laughs> I should say not. With that one fellow waved that gun around, I stayed right here. He said to stay put, and that's just what I did. What did this big man look like? Oh, a real mountain. He was 6'2", anyway. He must have weighed, weighed in at about 215. Mm-hmm. How about his coloring? It was dark. He had black hair. His eyes were dark. Not not a brown, it was almost black. Real real dark. Mm-hmm. And when he spoke, did he have an accent, anything like that that you might have noticed? No. No, I don't think so. At least there was one. I didn't notice it. Mm-mm. Did he have any scars or marks? What? Any scars or marks? Anything that might make it easier for us to identify him? Yes, yes, there was a little scar right, right here. Right over the bridge of his nose. Across here. How about his clothes? What was he wearing? Had a brown hat on, a brown jacket. Short kind, kind of what you'd call that uh, the real slick material, you know. Satin, like uh, bowling teams wear. Yes, yeah, sir. Had on a pair of brown pants, brown shoes. How was the other one dressed? I couldn't tell you for sure. Like I said, I only saw him for a minute when I opened the door. He was out there telling the people to just mind their own business. Do that and they wouldn't get hurt. I didn't get a good look at him, but that big one, he was a real mountain. Do you usually have this much money around in the store? No, not usually. See, this was a long weekend. You know, the 4th was Friday, and whenever we have a long weekend, we usually have ten or $12,000 in cash here. That's uh, where the guys really goof. Sir? Really missed the boat. You know, if they'd known what they were doing, they'd have gotten a lot more. Well, how's that, sir? The safe out in front. Another $7,000 out there. Guys missed it completely. Yes, sir. Yeah, I sure hope they, they don't come back for it. a.m., Frank and I checked with the officers in the radio unit that had answered the call. They'd gotten out a broadcast on the bandits and then started the canvas of the neighborhood, but they didn't find anyone who could give them any information. One of the clerks was able to describe the smaller of the two suspects, and we got out a local and an APB on them, and we took the market manager downtown to look at the mug books. He told us that the larger man had worn gloves all the time he was in the store, so there was no need to look for fingerprints. The market bandits had been operating for the past eight months. In that time, they'd held up 17 stores. Their method of operation was always the same. They'd hit only after a weekend or on the Monday following a holiday weekend. They'd hit only the larger supermarkets of the ranch type. 
Their operations had taken them all over the Southland. We tried to stake the markets that might be hit, but their field of operations had been so wide that it was impossible. 2.15 p.m. The market manager, Larry Haskins, started on the sixth mug book. Sure a lot of them. Yes, sir. All these fellas all committed some crime, huh? Yes, sir, that's right. That one there looks like my brother-in-law. He's got a weak chin. Uh-huh, yeah, just like him. No? Mm-mm. Go through a few of these, and they all begin to look alike. Did you ever notice that? Yes, sir. Hey, wait a minute. Yes, sir? This fellow here. This one right here, you see? Mm-hmm. That's the fellow, no doubt about it. That's the one. The market manager had identified Bernard R. Hansen as one of the hold-up men. The other employees of the store were called in, and they identified the same picture as being the man who'd held them up. We checked on his record and found that he'd been convicted for armed robbery and had been sentenced to the state penitentiary. He'd also served six and a half years and had been released. We got the last known address of the suspect. Frank and I checked it out and found that Hansen had moved some months before, but had left a phone number where he might be contacted. 6.30 p.m. Frank put in the call. Yes, sir. That's right, sir. You sure about that, are you? I see. Well, if there's anything more you can think of, I'd appreciate a call. That's right, Michigan 5211. Extension 2511. Smith, that's right. Or if I'm not in, ask for Joe Friday. No, sir, Friday, like the day in the week. That's right. All right, thank you very much, Doctor. Goodbye. Anything? Yeah, I talked to Dr. Corby. The place is a rest home. Hanson's there as a patient. Been there for the past four months. Mm-hmm. Doctor says he's bedridden. <laughs> We checked on the rest home. It was a private sanitarium in the valley. We got in touch with the medical authorities and found that the head of the hospital was listed as Dr. James Corby. Frank and I drove out and talked to Dr. Corby and the rest of the staff. From them, we got the story that Hanson had been a resident of the home for the past four months. We found that he had a lung ailment and was confined to his bed 24 hours a day. The doctor showed us his records and charts. From what we could tell, it would have been impossible for Hanson to have been the bandit. Three weeks passed. On August 4th, the market thieves hit again, this time out in East Los Angeles. They got away with a little over $9,000. The manager of the market came downtown and checked the mug books. They again identified Hanson as the thief. We had the stats office make another run on the M.O. used. The result came back, and out of the thousands of cards checked, only one fitted the way the robbery had been carried out. Hanson's. We called the rest home and found that on the day of the holdup, the suspect hadn't left his bed. Another month passed. During that time, we ran down all leads. Informants were questioned, but they could tell us nothing. Apparently, the hold-up men were hitting and then dropping completely out of sight until they hit again. Monday, October 27th, 8.05 a.m. I checked in for work. Joe? Yeah. Did you just get in? Yeah, a couple of minutes ago. Sure is a beautiful day, isn't it? Yeah. Did you see Didion yet? No. Well, he talked yesterday. I don't want to. He's pretty hacked. I can't blame him too much. The guy sure seemed to have it stopped. The thing I can't understand is that everybody's positive it's Hanson. Doesn't seem to be any doubt in their minds. That doesn't make any sense. Did you get the kickback on the doctor? Yeah, I came in late yesterday. How about it? I well, can't find anything on him. Family man, lives out in the valley, a couple of blocks from the hospital. Checked his bank account, he does pretty well, not great, no big deposits lately. Mm-hmm. Did you check the AMA on him? Yeah, he's not a member. They haven't got anything on him. How about the rest of the staff out there? Well, seems to be okay. Two of the nurses have been there for over two years, and the male nurse was hired about five months ago. That'll be just before Hanson got there. Yeah. Well, what's his record? There isn't any. Not a thing on him in the files, nothing from Washington. Well, I don't know. They seem to come up out of the ground, pull the jobs, and then drop back in. Nothing on the partner? No, I thought I had something. Talked to an informant this morning while I had coffee. He thought at first that he knew who the little guy was, but... And he remembered that the fellow he was thinking about died two years ago. A hot shot, I'll get it. Let's go. I hit again. At 8.01 a.m. that morning, a pair of hold-up men had walked into a market out on Adams Boulevard and robbed the place of a little under $11,000. The manager gave us a description of the hold-up men. One was large, dark, and had a small scar over the bridge of his nose. The other was small, sandy-haired, and had no visible marks or scars. We showed the manager mug shots of Hanson, and he positively identified him as the larger of the two men. A local and an APB was gotten out on the pair, and then Frank and I drove out to the hospital to see Hanson. 8.46 a.m. We talked with Dr. Corby. 
I know you men are trying to do your duty, but I've told you before, it couldn't possibly be Mr. Hanson. I know for a fact that he hasn't been out of his bed this morning. Was it possible for him to get out of his room without you knowing it? No. I wonder if we could see him, Doctor. No, I don't think that'd be possible. He's still asleep and I can't have him disturbed. Now, you're sure, though, that he couldn't have left the hospital without you knowing it? Absolutely. No chance of it. What time does Hanson generally wake up, Doctor? Depends. Usually, though, I'd say he's awake by 9.30 or so. I wonder if we could wait and talk to him. If you like. I'll tell one of the nurses to call you when he's awake. All right, sir. That'd be fine. One thing, though, I must insist on. What's that, Doctor? He mustn't be excited. I don't think you gentlemen really know how ill Mr. Hanson is. If you had any idea, you wouldn't be out here with this ridiculous questioning. Yes, sir, we understand. We're just trying to get this thing straightened out as soon as we can. Fine. I'll go along with you part of the way, but I'll not have my patient disturbed. Any excitement would be very bad for him. Well, don't worry, Doctor. We'll be as brief as possible. Fine. If you'll excuse me now, I've got some things to do. I'll tell the nurse to call you when he wakes up. And remember, no excitement. What do you figure, Joe? Well, it's got me. The way he talks, every one of those witnesses are wrong. Yeah, this happened before. Get a positive identification and end up with the wrong guy. Yeah, but all of them are so positive, it just doesn't make any sense. Yeah. You the police officer? Yeah, that's right. Why? I'm Bob Jameson. I work here. Oh, yeah, you're the male nurse, that right? Yeah. You're out here about Barney Hanson, aren't you? We want to see him, yeah. What can we do for you? It's about Barney. What about him? I don't think things are the way they look. What do you mean by that? I wouldn't want the doctor to know I've been talking to you. He'd raise the roof, probably fire me. Well, what's it about, Jameson? Like I said, it's about Barney. Yeah? Well, when I came here, they told me that Barney was pretty sick. Said they didn't expect him to live. Yeah. One day the buzzer rang in his room. You know, he wanted something? Mm-hmm. Uh-huh. Well, the doctor was on the phone. The other nurses were busy. So I started down the hall to see what Barney wanted. Got to the door of the room, and the doctor stopped me. Uh-huh. Really read me off. Said that I wasn't to go into the room at all. That he was taking care of Barney personally. That he'd see what he wanted. Yeah. No, that was just the first time. Same things happened a couple more times. And he told us about you. Told us what to say if you asked any questions. Well, what did he tell you? Said that we wasn't to tell you anything. That we didn't know anything. Well, why didn't you tell us all this before? Well, you see, this isn't a regular hospital. I don't think that he's even a regular doctor. I've worked around hospitals for a long time, and I never saw no doctor act like he does. He doesn't even know how to write out a diet, feed some of the people here all the wrong things. Is that right? Yeah, and I'll tell you something else, too. What's that? I don't think there's anything wrong with Barney. I think the whole reason for him being here is phony. Bob? Oh, yes, Doctor. What are you doing here? Came to see if these gentlemen needed anything. Oh. Mm-hmm. Well, I'll take care of it now. Will you check on Mr. Hardy, please? See if he's awake yet. Yeah, sure. Just a minute. What? I'd like you to stay here for a minute. I'm afraid we're going to have to see Mr. Hanson right now, Doctor. I'm afraid that's impossible. I told you before, I'm not going to have him disturbed. I'm afraid we're going to have to disturb him. It won't take very long. Jameson, where's his room? I'll show you. It's down this way. I'm going to speak to your superiors about this, coming into a hospital and disturbing patients. I'm sure the fact that your officers doesn't give you the right to do this. Now, this is his room. You want to open the door? Well, how about it, Doctor? Well, I don't understand it. He's got to be here. He can't get out of bed. I'm sure there's some explanation for his disappearance. Yeah, maybe you can explain this, too. There's stuff here in his bed. What is it, John? A gun and some money. You are listening to Dragnet, the authentic story of your police force in action. Chesterfield regular, Chesterfield king size. The first cigarette to give you premium quality either way you like them. This means that King Size Chesterfield contains tobaccos of better quality and higher price than any other King Size cigarette. Chesterfield is first to name all its ingredients, ingredients that make the best possible smoke. And Chesterfield gives you this full year scientific report. No adverse effects to the nose and throat of a group smoking only Chesterfields. So enjoy your smoking. Change to Chesterfield today. Much milder, with an extraordinarily good taste. Nine thirty a.m. We called the office, and two more teams of men came out to help us search the place. Hanson was not on the grounds of the hospital. In his room, we found several floor plan drawings of markets that had been robbed. The drawings showed the location of the manager's office and of the safe. 
Along with the drawings, we found several maps with roads marked on them leading back to the hospital. A stakeout was placed on the rest home in the event that the suspect returned, and Frank and I drove the doctor back downtown. We talked to him for an hour before he finally told us the story. He said that Hanson had come to him and offered him money to say that he was ill and to give him a room. The doctor went on to say that after he got started, he tried to get out of the deal, but that Hanson said he'd get his family if the doctor said anything about his activities to the police. Dr. Corby gave us the name of Hanson's accomplice, Marty Peterson. He said that he didn't know where Peterson lived, but that he usually came out a couple of times a week to see Hanson. We notified the stakeout to be on the lookout for Peterson, and then we booked Dr. Corby at the main jail. We ran the name Marty Peterson through R&I, but we got no make. We sent the name to George Brereton up at CII in Sacramento, and also to Washington. The kickback gave Peterson a record of two arrests of robbery and one for ADW in the East. It also gave the name of a sister who lived in Los Angeles. We checked with her, and she was able to tell us where Peterson lived. Thursday, October 30th, Frank and I drove out to his apartment. Who is it? The manager. Just a minute. Yeah, what is it? You Marty Peterson? Yeah, what do you want? Police officers, you're under arrest. Come on, cop. Come on. Come on. Come get out of here, you lousy fun. All right, come on, get up. You got no right to come in here and bother me. What's all this about? Want to shake him? Yeah, come on, get your hands up on that wall. And he's carrying a gun, Joe, here. I got it. What are you guys trying to prove? I didn't do nothing. You guys lean on everybody like this. Fellow's got a record, and right away he's fair game for every crummy cop in the country. Yeah, you bet. Come on, let's go. Well, you still haven't told me what this is all about. What are you putting the pinch on me for? Robbery. Robbery? You're off your rocker. I'm out here on a vacation. I haven't done anything. You're an ex-con with a gun. That's a felony. Then where's Barney Hanson? Who? Barney Hanson. Where is he? I don't know no Barney Hanson. Don't know what you're talking about. Now, let's come off it, Peterson. Now, where is he? Barney Hanson? Well, I might know who you're talking about. I know a fellow by that name, but he's out in the hospital in the valley. I haven't seen him for a long time in a hospital out in the valley. Nice try, Peterson. Hanson checked out of the hospital. We got the doctor. He told us all about it. Now, where's Hanson? I don't know. Last I heard of him, he's out at that hospital. If he ain't there now, I don't know where he is. All right, let's go downtown. That doctor copped out, huh? Yeah. Told us him in the whole setup. Well, how about the money? Hmm? You find the money? No, we didn't find anything. You didn't find any dough at all? Not a bit. The crumb, the lousy crumb. He told him to be safe out there. They'd never shake a hospital. Not a dime, huh? No. Looks like he left you to stand for this. He probably took off with all the money. Probably never see him again. Yeah, we ain't gonna get away with it. No, sir, he ain't. Looks like he will. Oh, yeah, I'll tell you where he is. We took Marty Hansen down to the city hall, and he was booked at the main jail. Before he was booked, he gave us the name and address of Hansen's girlfriend. Frank and I drove over and talked to her. She told us that she hadn't seen the suspect for several weeks. She said that she'd heard that Hanson had been running around with another girl. She also told us that she'd heard Hanson had bought a new car and was running around with a new bunch of friends. She said that she hadn't seen him since he got the new car, but that she'd heard it was a new Oldsmobile and it was painted a fire engine red. We called the office and arranged for a stakeout on her apartment, and then we began to check out the Oldsmobile dealers in the Los Angeles area. Two teams of men were assigned to help us in running down the list. It took us two days to talk to the dealers in town. Each of the dealers was shown a mugshot of Hanson. Two days went by. Finally, we got an identification. A dealer out on Franklin in Hollywood reported that he'd sold a car to Hanson. However, when we checked the address he gave us, we found that Hanson had moved a week before and left no forwarding address. We got in touch with the Department of Motor Vehicles, and from them, we got the address where they'd sent the pink slip. It was an apartment house out on Highland Avenue. Frank and I went out to check it out. Yes? Bernard Hanson in? No, he isn't. Something you wanted? You're expecting him? I don't know. I haven't seen him this morning. I just got here myself. What if we could talk to you? Who are you? Police officers. My name's Friday. This is my partner, Frank Smith. How do you do? I'm Lily Edwards. Come on in. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Get you anything? A cup of coffee? Anything? No, no thanks. When'd you last see Hanson? Last night. We got a date at 2.30 this afternoon. What time is it now? Well, it's 2.37, ma'am. Late. He'll be along in a minute. What do you want to see him about? Done something? Better if we could talk to him. Personal, huh? Yes, ma'am. He's a wild one, old Barney. Him and that red car. Real wild. Ma'am? 
That car he drives. You know, it's a Red Olds. He's like a kid with it, always wiping it off, taking care of it. I think he'd bring it up here at night if he could. Never seen anything like it. Mm -hmm. How long you known Hanson, Miss Edwards? Not long. A couple of weeks, I guess. Not much more than that. Where'd you meet him? Well, I hope you won't get the wrong idea, but... Ma'am? Well, I live down on Vine Street, below Fountain, you know? Yeah. Well, I usually have morning coffee at the drugstore, the big one on Vine. Well, one morning Barney comes in. I guess it's about nine, somewhere around there. He plunks down on a stool next to mine. Then he takes out a package of cigarettes and starts to light one. He's shaking so much he can hardly hold the match up to the cigarette. Oh, well, I got to laughing because I thought he was hung over. Anyways, we got to talking, and the next thing I knew, he asked me out to lunch. Uh-huh. Well, I knew it wasn't proper, but I figured, well, he seemed like a nice guy, so I told him that I'd meet him. We had lunch that day, and we started been going together since. I see. Hanson ever told you what he did for a living? No. I asked him a couple of times, but he wouldn't say anything right to the point. He, you know, kind of hedged around the bush. So I figured that he didn't want to tell me, and I stopped asking. He was always nice to me. No need for me to pry into his personal affairs. What time you got now? It's 2.40, ma'am. Can't understand it. He's usually so prompt. I hope nothing happened to him. He said sure to meet him at 2.30. Or was it 3.30? I don't remember too well. Never sure about times or dates, things like that, you know. Yes, ma'am. You ever met a man named Peterson, Marty Peterson? Marty Peterson? Yeah, I've met him, little guy. Yes, ma'am. Yeah, he's a friend of Barney's. They're in some sort of business together. I don't know just what it is, but I know that they're associated in some way. Hanson's never said anything about this business to you, has he? No. Like I said, he's very close mouthed about what he does. You ever mention a Dr. Corby to you? Corby? No, I don't think I've ever heard that name before. Would well, you know how long Hanson's lived here? No, I think he moved in just before I met him. I don't think he's been here very long. Say, what are all these questions about? I hope I haven't said anything to get Barney in trouble. He's such a nice guy. I sure wouldn't want to do that. No, ma'am. You haven't done that. Hi, Lily. Who are you? What are you doing here? Police officers. You're under arrest, Hanson. For what? Suspicion of robbery. I'll shake him, Joe. Now, wait a minute. What is this? A shakedown? What are you guys trying to prove? You got nothing on me. I fell once. I did my time. I owe you nothing. He's clean, Joe. Why'd you do that? I'm not giving you any trouble. I got no reason. You got nothing on me. I got nothing to worry about. I'll go with you. There's no reason not to. You mean what these guys say is true? You've been mixed up in some robberies? Oh, knock it off. What do you mean, knock it off? Don't you talk to me like that. I'm not going to take talk like that from like you. Like I said, knock it off. All right, come on. Let's go. And you really figure you got me for a 211, huh? Yeah, we got the rest of them, too. Peterson and the doc? That's right. I suppose they talked, huh? Yeah, they told us all about it. Sweet racket. Should have known it could only last so long. Should have figured that the longer I played against the house, the shorter my chances were. It is true, and you never told me all this time, and you never told me you were a crook. Of all the rotten oh, deals... Oh, shut up, will you? Always shooting off your big mouth. Listen, Barney Hanson, I told you before, don't you talk to me like that. I won't take it. You haven't got much choice now, have you, Lily? You know something, cop? What's that? Might be kind of pleasure to get into a nice, quiet jail. Get away from this dumb broad. She's the dumbest broad in the entire United States and Canada. Real pretty, but boy, she's stupid. Now, I told you, Barney Hanson, I'm not going to have you talk to me like that. Kids are real shrew. Young, and she's a real shrew. Let's go. Glad to get away from you. All right, Barney Hanson, that does it. I'm through with you. I've had it. It's going to be a long time before I even talk to you. A long time. Yeah, and well, you're right about that. Let's go. <laughs> The story you have just heard was true. The names were changed to protect the innocent. On February 4th, trial was held in Department 89, Superior Court of the State of California, in and for the County of Los Angeles. In a moment, the results of that trial. Now, here is our star, Jack Webb. Thank you, George Fenneman. Earlier tonight, George Fenneman gave you what I consider pretty strong evidence that Chesterfield is the cigarette you ought to be smoking. That's why I'd like you to try a pack of Chesterfields. I think you'll find they give you everything you want. A real good taste and Chesterfield mildness. Bernard R. Hansen and Martin S. Peterson were tried and convicted of robbery in the first degree. They were filed on for ten counts and received sentences as prescribed by law. Robbery in the first degree is punishable by imprisonment in the state penitentiary for a period of from five years to life. Dr. James Corby was allowed to plead guilty to a lesser charge and was sentenced to one year in the county jail and placed on probation for ten years. One of the terms of his probation being that he is not permitted to operate a rest home.
just heard Dragnet, a series of authentic cases from official files. Technical advice comes from the office of Chief of Police W.H. Parker, Los Angeles Police Department. Technical advisors, Captain Jack Donahoe, Sergeant Marty Wynn, Sergeant Vance Brasher. Heard tonight were Ben Alexander, Vic Rodman, Herb Ellis. Script by John Robinson. Music by Walter Schumann. Hal Gibney speaking. For a million laughs, tune in Chesterfield's Martin and Lewis show, Tuesday on the same NBC station. And sound off for Chesterfields. Either regular or king size, you'll find premium quality Chesterfields much milder. Chesterfield is best for you. Chesterfield has brought you Dragnet transcribed from Los Angeles. Ladies and gentlemen, in the fight against an old enemy, polio, medical research has armed us with a powerful new weapon, gamma globulin. Used soon enough, it can prevent the paralyzing effects of polio. But first, you must furnish the raw material, blood. Doctors urgently need your donation of blood to make gamma globulin. So call the Red Cross. Please don't put it off. It's too important. Call the Red Cross tomorrow and make an appointment to give blood. Sound off for Chesterfield. Chesterfield is best for you. First cigarette with premium quality in both regular and king size. Chesterfield brings you Dragnet. Ladies and gentlemen, the story you are about to hear is true. The names have been changed to protect the innocent. You're a detective sergeant. You're assigned to burglary detail. For the past two months, a gang of safe burglars have been operating in your city. In that time, they've hit a dozen places. You've got no lead to their identity. Your job? Get them. Here's a report never before made about a cigarette. Smoked day after day by a group of people smoking from 10 to 40 cigarettes a day for a full year. Here's Chesterfield's record. A medical specialist giving this group thorough examinations every two months for a full year reports no adverse effects to their nose, throat, and sinuses from smoking Chesterfields. Don't you want to try a cigarette with a record like that? You'll find Chesterfields best for you. They're much milder, with an extraordinarily good taste. And for your pocketbook, Chesterfield is America's best cigarette buy. Dragnet, the documented drama of an actual crime. For the next 30 minutes, in cooperation with the Los Angeles Police Department, you will travel step by step on the side of the law through an actual case transcribed from official police files. From beginning to end, from crime to punishment, Dragnet is the story of your police force in action. It was Tuesday, August 10th. It was warm in Los Angeles. We were working the day watch out of burglary detail. My partner's Frank Smith. The boss is Captain Wisdom. My name's Friday. We were on the way back from lunch, and it was 1.17 p.m. when we got to room 45. Burglary. Joe, you got any stomach pills? No, I haven't. You got trouble again? Yeah. I don't know why I always do when we have lunch at Sal's. Must be that cheesecake, Joe. It happens every time. Well, maybe if you just stick to one piece, huh? And the way Rosie makes it, you can't stop there. You know, that Sal could make a fortune if he'd realize it. What do you mean? Well, you know how in some places they have a little bowl of mints by the cash register? Yeah. Well, if Sal had put a bowl of stomach pills, he could clean up. Yeah, sure. Anything in the book? I'll take a look. How about it? Yeah. There's a call here from Ernie. Our informant? Yeah. Says he wants to see us this afternoon. Say what it's about? No, he just has to meet him at that coffee place over on 7. Sure hope he can come up with something we could use it. Yeah. We've taken a lot on this one, haven't we? Yeah. The way the papers talk, you'd think we were in with the thieves. Now, from where they sit, it probably looks that way. We sure haven't been able to stop them. Yeah. You hear anything more on that last run from the stats office? Yeah, nothing. They've run the M.O. over and over. We can't make it. 
I saw the skipper this morning. He's sore, too. Yeah, it figures they're leaning on him, too. Well, there's got to be a break somewhere along the line. Their luck can't hold out forever. Maybe they don't know that. Did you check the FI cards from last night? Yeah, they're doing it now. They might come up with something. How about rubles and toll? You heard from them yet? No, they're running down that report from the liquor store owner. Doesn't look like it's going anywhere, either. I'll get it. All right. Burglary Smith. Oh, yeah, did you find anything? Uh-huh. Where was that? Uh-huh. How do you spell that last name? S-O-N? Right. Okay, thanks. Well, we might have something. Yeah. The officer made a field interrogation report on an auto Bronson last night. Time was listed as 10.46 p.m., 4th and Central. Well, that's close. The last heist was at 7th and Central at approximately 11 p.m. Well, how's this Bronson fit in? Well, they checked him out. He's got a record. Yeah. Burglary. 1.35 p.m. Frank and I checked the name Otto Bronson through R&I. We found that he had an arrest record dating back 10 years. He'd been picked up three times on suspicion of violation of Section 459 P.C. He'd been convicted once and had served time at San Quentin. He'd been released four months before he served his full term and was not on parole. We got his last known address from his ex-convict registration and we drove out to see him. The address listed was a rooming house on Alexandria Street. We talked to the landlady, but she could tell us nothing about him. She said that he'd moved in about four months before, and in that time, she'd seen very little of him. He didn't eat at the house, but he took his meals outside. She was unable to tell us what time Bronson had come home the night before. He was registered in room 2B. Frank and I went up and knocked on the door. Yeah? You out of Bronson? Yeah, what about it? Police officers, we'd like to talk to you. Okay, go ahead. Might be better if we talked inside, huh? Well, maybe I don't want any cops in my place. Well, we can talk downtown. Come on in. All right, what's it all about? I wonder if you could tell us where you were last night. Why? We'd like to know. Well, let's see. I went downtown, had dinner, met some friends, had a few drinks, and came home. What time did you get home? Oh, maybe about 8, around in there. We got word you were seen downtown at 1046. How about it? Maybe my watch stopped. Were you downtown? Oh, you guys know all the answers. You tell me. All right, mister, get your hand. Why? Let's go downtown. All right, all right. So I was there. What's that prove? Why'd you lie about it? I didn't lie. I told you. My watch stopped. Yeah, according to the FI report, you were stopped in the corner of 4th and Central. Is that right? I don't know. I guess so. Why? What were you doing there? I was on my way home. From where? Like I told you, I had a couple of drinks with some friends of mine. I came right home. Mm -hmm. Where'd you meet these friends of yours? Bar down in Central. Which bar? I don't know the address. I can show you if you gotta know. Who were the friends? Look, I I don't like any of this. You guys come in here and asking all these questions? What's it all about? The liquor store safe was burglarized near 7th and Central last night. You look good for the job. Boy, it's sure true. What's that? Old well, saying up at the joint. Do a little time and you'll have every cop in the world on your back at one time or another. How long you lived here, Bronson? A couple of months. That's the closet over here. Now, you stay away from there. It isn't anything in there that matters to you. Then you shouldn't mind if we take a look. Now, just keep your hands off of my stuff, huh? If you haven't done anything, you got nothing to worry about, have you? It isn't what I've done. It's what you guys are going to say I did. How about this, Bronson? That's mine. Hey, now, look. you got no right to go... See what's in it, Frank. Yeah, How about this, Bronson? I never saw those before in my life. It's a frame you guys are trying to tie on to me. Well, it won't work, cops, and you know it won't. How do you explain these two? I don't have to. They belong to a friend. He asked me to take care of them. How about this, Bronson? Can't see, Joe. What is it? Cutting torch. Looks like it's been used lately. 2.15 p.m. We searched the suspect's room. We found nothing further that would tie him in with the burglaries. We talked to the other people in the boarding house, but they couldn't give us any further information. They were unable to tell us if Bronson had any friends, and the landlady told us that he hadn't gotten any mail since he'd been there. We called the office and arranged for a stakeout on the boarding house, and then we took the suspect downtown to the city hall. We talked to him for an hour, 4.16 p.m. That's where you stand on this thing, Bronson. Now you make up your mind. You want to take the beef by yourself, you're going to tell us where you got the tools. I've been telling you. I didn't know anything about the tools. I got them from a friend. He asked me to keep the suitcase for him as a favor. He asked me to keep them for him, and that's all I know. Well, what's the friend's name? Like I told you, it's a fellow named Shorty. What's his last name? I don't know. If I knew, I'd tell you. I got no reason to hold back on it. I didn't have nothing to do with the jobs. Otto, we were talking to you about one burglary. What do you mean by jobs? Well, just the way you guys talk, I figured there was more than one. You know what we're talking about. I don't. I'm telling you the truth. I don't. When would you last see this, Shorty? When he gave me the suitcase. When was that? 
week, maybe ten days ago. Where'd you see him? In a bar down on 7th. And he just gave you this suitcase, asked you to take care of it for him? Is that what you expect us to believe? That's the truth. Well, that's kind of hard to buy. I can't help that. That's the way it happened. Well, your friend sure left you in a good fix, didn't he? What do you mean? Well, it looks like you're going to have to go this route by yourself. How do you figure that? You got the tools, you got a record. You were in the vicinity just before the safe was burned. You look real good for it. Well, I ain't going to take it alone. Well, you haven't got much choice. Well, what happens if I help you get the rest of them? It'll be marked down that way. Is that all you can do? That's all. Mm, how much if I help you break the gang? That's all we can do. Well, one thing you got to understand. What's that? I had nothing to do with the jobs myself. I, I just heard a few rumbles. You got to know I wasn't in on it. What have you heard? Well, there's three guys. They're from the East. They've been working out here about um, six weeks. Real heavy fellas. Who are they? I don't know them. The only one I ever saw was Shorty, and I'm not too sure he's in on it. You know where we can pick them up? No, well, like I said, I, I just heard a few rumbles. All right, how about this Shorty? Has he got a record? I don't know. He might have. You ever say anything about doing time? Mm, no, not so I can hear. How long you known him? About three months. I met him right after I got out of Cuba. Where'd you meet him? A bar downtown. We got to talking one night, and after that, I'd see him around here and there. And I never got to know him real well. Just well enough for him to give you a suitcase full of burglar tools, huh? Yeah, that's right. And you didn't know what was in the case? Huh? No, I didn't look. I didn't figure it was any of my business. That's easy to buy, isn't it? Well, I can't help it. That's the way it is. How much do you know about how the gang works? Not much. Rumble is that they case a place for a couple of days, figure out when's the best time to hit it, and they walk in and burn the safe. They use a car? I don't know. I guess they do. Does Shorty have a car? I don't know. I never saw him with one. He never mentioned it. You ever mentioned where he lived? No, not to me. I I figure it's over on the east side, though. How do you figure that? Well, just the way he talked. Nothing definite, but just the idea. You look at some mugs and tell us if you see this Shorty? Well, sure. I'd like to see you get him, leaving me to stand for a thing like this all by myself. Anything else you can tell us about the game? No, that's about it. Okay, let's look at the mugs. Oh, how about it? I I still got to go to jail? Well, you still haven't convinced us you're clean. Well, I told you everything I know. Yeah, let's go. Oh, no, no, wait a minute. Look, I go nuts in a cell. You should have thought of that before. Well, I can give you guys a lot of help if I'm on the outside. You haven't given us much here. Well, maybe I can. All right, go ahead. I can tell you when you're going to pull the next job. <laughs> We continued to talk to Otto Bronson. He told us that he'd heard the gang was planning to rob the safe of a large chain grocery store in the southern part of the city. He gave us the date and the time that the operation was expected to take place, but he was unable to give us the exact details of how the burglary would be committed. The suspect couldn't tell us whether a car would be used or how the store would be approached. He was unable to give us a description of the other two men in the operation, but he did give us a description of Shorty. We ran the name through the moniker file in r and We got back 285 possibles and had the mug shots on the suspects pulled. These were shown to Bronson, but he failed to make an identification. We showed him our mug files on known burglary suspects, but he again failed to come up with an identification. The burglary tools were booked as evidence, and then Frank and I talked with Captain Wisdom. It was agreed that it might be better to release Bronson and have him followed. 8.31 p.m. The suspect was released and placed under constant surveillance. The date Bronson had given us for the next burglary was the following Saturday, August 14th. Frank and I made arrangements to place a stakeout on the store. We checked the store and found that there were two entrances, one off the parking lot to one side of the building and one on the street. We took up our position so that both doors could be seen. The area was placed under a Code 5 call so that the stakeout would not be burned. Frank and I waited. 10 p.m., 11, no sign of the burglars. Midnight came and went. At 5.30 a.m., the stakeout was called off and Frank got to a phone. Yeah, uh-huh. When was that? Yeah? Okay, we'll be right in. Joe. Yeah, anything? Yeah, they lost the tail on Bronson. At approximately 10.30 Saturday night, Otto Bronson had gone into a theater on South Spring Street. The officer following had entered, but had lost the suspect in the darkness. The next morning, Sunday, August 15th, we got a report that Bronson had turned up at his rooming house at 7.45 a.m., I got a call from the business office with this information, and at 8.20, I picked up Frank, and we drove over to see Bronson. Who's there? It's Friday. Oh, just a minute. Hi. Come on in. Well, you guys are up early this morning. How'd it turn out last night? What are you trying to pull, Bronson? What do you mean? You know what we're talking about. Nothing happened last night. Hey, you, you mean they didn't break into the place? That's it. 
I understand that. From what I heard, they had it all cased. Where were you last night? Well, you figure I had something to do with it, huh? We just asked you where you were. Oh, what's the matter? Hey, the tale you had on me get lost? We're waiting for an answer, Bronson. Well, we went to a movie and then came on home. You came right home after the picture, huh? Yeah, that's right. Right home. How come it took you so long? Now, what's that mean? You didn't get home until this morning, did you? You guys are pretty thorough, aren't you? Where were you? All right, I stopped and saw a friend. We got to drinking. Forgot all about time. That makes me a pigeon for you. Come on, Bronson. Let's go down to it. What for? I haven't done anything. You gave us wrong information about last night. Well, that's not my fault. I'm not running with the guys. I told you what I heard. Now, it's not my beef that it didn't work out. From what I knew, that was the way it was going to be. All right, let's go. Well, now, just a minute. Look, we can work this out, huh? I'm afraid not. Well, I leveled with you guys. I'm not giving you a snow job. That's the way it is. Now, look, you got nothing on me. If you had, you wouldn't have let me go before. Now that I think about it, I don't like the idea of a tail on me. What are you guys going to prove with that? The way you act, it's no wonder you get no cooperation from anybody. It's no wonder at all. All right, now you've made your point. Let's go downtown. Yeah, who is it? Mr. Bronson, it's me, Kelly. It's a landlord. Yeah, what is it? Is Mr. Friday here? Yeah, I'm Friday. Phone call for you. You can get it here in the hall. Thanks. You can get it here. Thank you. This Friday. Yeah. Mm Mm-hmm. When? Right. We'll be right there. Thanks a lot. Frank? Yeah? It's a business office. We gotta leave. Yeah? You called it, Bronson. They worked last night, all right? See, I told you. Yeah, we staked out in South L.A. So? They hit in West L.A. You are listening to Dragnet, the authentic story of your police force in action. Chesterfield is best for you. Chesterfield regular or Chesterfield king size, which contains tobaccos of better quality and higher price than any other king-size cigarette. And always remember this. Chesterfield is first to give you premium quality in both regular and king-size. Just as Chesterfield has been first to name its ingredients, the ingredients that make the best possible smoke. Enjoy your smoking. Change to Chesterfield. Much milder with an extraordinarily good taste. The best for you. Fifteen a.m. Frank and I contacted the West Los Angeles detectives and drove out to the scene of the latest burglary. It was a large chain grocery store. The thieves had burned into the safe, and the M.O. was the same as in the other burglaries. All the contents of the safe worth anything had been removed. The crews from the crime lab and latent prints had already finished their investigation and had gone back to go over their findings. Frank and I talked to the manager of the store, Mr. Charles Gleason. Well, let me see, Sergeant. Uh... The first I knew about it was when they called me to say that the safe had been robbed. Mm-hmm. Any idea how much was taken? Well, I'd just be guessing with the officers working around here. I didn't get a chance to check it yet, but I'd say about uh, five or six thousand dollars. The weekend and all, we'd done a pretty good business, and I didn't get a chance to get to the bank. I had all that money in the safe. Of course, I'll have to check the books to tell you exactly how much they took. But like I said, it was probably five or six thousand dollars. Do you have a burglar alarm system in the store, Mr. Cleason? I beg your pardon? I said, do you have a burglar alarm system in the store? Yes, and uh, that's a funny thing. I can't understand why it didn't work. The officers uh, who are here from your crime lab, is that it? Yeah, that's right, sir. Well, they said that evidently it had been turned off somehow. I don't understand it, but that's what they said. I see. I wonder if you could give us a list of your employees. Well, yes, yeah, certainly, but... Uh... You don't think that any of them had anything to do with this, do you? Well, they've all got to be checked out, sir. Can you give us the list? Oh. Well, yes, I can. I guess that's right, but I'm sure that none of them were involved. Well, Mr. Gleason, have you noticed anyone hanging around the store? Anyone that might have looked suspicious to you that you can remember? (laughs) It'd be awfully hard to say. We do a lot of business with all the people who come in and out. It's kind of hard to say. Yes, sir, we understand. Could you remember, was there anyone who attracted your attention? Maybe someone unusual, somebody loitering in the neighborhood, maybe around the store. No, sir. Not that I can think of. Mm-hmm. Was there anything that was taken from the safe that might give us a lead, something that might not ordinarily be in there, something that uh, you could identify easily? No, I don't think so. Just the money. Uh, of course, there were several checks. Oh, you know, once... What did you say? Uh, checks that we cashed for the customers they might have totaled up. 
$500. I can give you a list of them. We have them photographed if you want copies of them. Yes, sir, that'll be a big help. Oh, officer, there was one more thing. Yes, sir, what was that? Well, you know how people lose things. Yes, sir. A couple of days ago, we found a watch. It looked expensive. We found it in the back of the store. Uh, that was in the safe, too. Everything's gone. Must have taken that to it, isn't there now? Well, can you give us a description of the watch? Yes, I can. I noticed it because, <laughs> well, to be honest, I was kind of hoping that nobody would claim it. You keep things like that around here for a couple of days and then turn them into you. I'd like to have had that one myself. Certina, it was a gold case with a white face. Only had a few numbers. You know, uh, some of the spots were just the little gold spots. Yeah, I mean the spots were... The, the numbers, the oh, numbers, the little gold spots. I know what you mean, sir. Well, this one had a gold band, and uh, it was one that was a kind of a, a chain thing, not an expansion band, you know, the, the chain, the gold chain. Yes, yeah, sir, would you know the watch if you saw it again? Oh, sure, I looked at it enough, and then there was that scratch on the crystal, too. Sir? We're right over the number, two. there was a scratch. I can show you right here on my watch. You see right, right there, a little scratch? Mm -hmm. It kind of went off at an angle. It was real easy to spot. Yes, sir, I understand. You know, it's a funny thing, you officers being here... There's a friend of mine once, well, <laughs> i just soon not mention his name if you don't mind, because he was innocent, you know, but he, he, it looked bad. I was kind of worried about it myself. Mm -hmm. And uh, th these officers came out to his house, just took the place apart. It was all right. It was perfectly legal. They had a search warrant. What did they come out for? Well, they thought he was mixed up in a robbery. Oh. I don't know how they ever thought it, but it, it, it looked suspicious, I guess. He was seen with some characters that were, well, you know, not very nice. And they came out to his house, took the whole place apart. You never saw such a mess in your life. Ripped up the mattresses, took down a pit, ruined the picture. A beautiful picture. End of the trail. You know the one with the Indian? Yes, sir. The spear going down like that? Yes, sir. Took that apart. The whole picture just fell apart. They never could get it back together hmm. again. I don't know whether they can get another one or not. Mm -hmm. they the darndest mess you ever saw, huh? I say, did they find anything? Yeah, yeah, they did. They found a fountain pen his wife had lost two years ago. Had her initials on it. Yes, sir. Well, is there anything else you can think of that would help us here? No, not that I can figure. Well, if you do remember anything, sir, here's our card. We'd certainly appreciate a call. Frank Smith, just as for you, huh? Yes, sir, and if we're not there, just leave a message and we'll get in touch with you. All right, I'll do that. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Gleason. You bet. I sure hope you catch the fellows that are doing that. Yes, sir, so do we. Yes, you've been after him quite a while now, huh? Yes, sir, we have. What the papers say, this makes number 13 for him. Bad number 13, kind of unlucky. No worse than number one. Frank and I went back to the city hall and completed our crime report. We contacted the crime lab and latent prints and found that they'd come up with no physical evidence at the scene. From the M.O., it could be definitely established that they were the same suspects we were after. We obtained a list of the employees of the store and checked them out. We came up with no new leads. A list of the checks that had been taken from the safe were given to forgery detail. Frank and I went to Otto Bronson's rooming house and brought him down to the city hall for questioning. You know, maybe if you guys had spent a little more time doing your job and less time bothering me, you'd end up catching those fellas. Don't worry about it, Bronson. We'll get them. We'd like to go over what you did last night again. Oh, I told you what. Well, tell us again, will you? All right. Like I said, I had dinner around 8. Maybe 8.30. Where'd you eat? A place over on Spring. Well, see anybody you knew? No, I don't think I did. Where'd you go then? I went to a movie, a place on 7th. See anybody you knew there? No. Well, then you'd have a tough time proving where you were, wouldn't Not you? Not all the way. You had a tail on me. Most of this you know already. All you know, right. What would you do after you left the movie? I, I told you that. I went over to see a friend. Yeah, where's he live? A hotel on 5th. What's his name? Oh, look, I don't want to see him dragged into this. If he's clean, he's got nothing to worry about, huh? Yeah, sure, but you guys go over and talk to him. It's a lot of embarrassment for him, and I, I just don't want it. All right, let's go. Oh, no. You gonna book me? That's it. I told you what being in a cell does to me. You should have thought about that before. All right, I'll tell you who he is. Well, go ahead. His name's Anderson, Mark Anderson. He ever fallen? No, he's clean. You sure about that? Yeah. No, I suppose you want to go over and talk to him, huh? Yeah, we'll get to it. You still going to book me? We haven't any choice. Look, I told you what I know, Sergeant. I told you everything. I can't help it if I was wrong. Look, it's no crime to make a mistake, is it? I never read about no law that says you can't make a mistake. Well, why don't you, know, you tell us the truth about what you know about these burglaries? I then. told you, I told you. What you told us we can't buy. Well, that's tough, fella, but that's the way it is. Now, I told you what I know. There isn't any more. Now, if you want, go on. Check with Mark Anderson. He'll, he'll tell you I was with him all night. He'll tell you. I, I don't want no trouble, you guys. He, he'll tell you, and that's the truth. Really, I, I'm telling you the truth. Yeah, we've heard that before. 
6.40 p.m., we booked Otto Bronson at the main jail on suspicion of burglary. Before he was put in his cell, we got the address of Mark Anderson. After we'd finished with the booking, Frank and I drove over to the hotel on 5th Street. Anderson was registered in room 812. The desk clerk told us that Anderson was in his room. He was unable to tell us much about Anderson because, as he explained, he'd only worked at the hotel for a week and hadn't seen much of him. We went upstairs and knocked at the door. Yeah? You Mark Anderson? That's right. Who are you? Police officers. I'd like to talk to you. Sure. Come on in. This is my partner, Frank Smith. Anderson. What do you want to see me about? You know a fellow named Bronson, Otto Bronson? Yeah, sure. I know Otto. Why don't you see him last? Hey, what's this all about, anyway? Otto done something? Just a routine investigation, Anderson. When was the last time you saw Bronson? Routine, huh? That's right. I saw him last night. Where'd you see him? Here. He came up, sat around, killed a bottle, talked it up. Mm -hmm. What time did he leave here? Must have been about 7.30 this morning, something like that. All right, sir. Thank you very much. Sure. Glad to help out whenever I can. Otto isn't in any trouble, is he? Like we said, it's just routine. Mm Mm-hmm. Well, anything more I can do to help out, you let me know. Yeah, we'll do that. You leaving right away? Yeah, that's right. We'll be getting back to the office. Well, I'll get my coat and walk down with you. I got a date in 15 minutes. Gonna have to romp on It's a nice watch you got there. Yeah, it's new. Let me take a look at it, will you? Well, it's just a watch. If you don't mind, I'd like to get going. Let me see the watch. Sure, no reason you can't. Here. Okay. You said this was new? Yeah, just got it a couple days ago. Mm Mm-hmm. Did you notice the scratch on the crystal here? Hmm. Yeah, I never saw that before. Guess I'll have to take it back and get another one. Let me see it, Joe. Yeah. Yeah. Did you buy this watch? Yeah. Where? Well, jewelers down the street. You got a receipt for it? No, I didn't. I know the guy. I didn't figure I'd need one. What if we could take a look through your room? Why? What are you looking for? Just like take a look. You got a search warrant? No, we can get one if we have to. Well, then you better go get one. I'm not having any cops looking through my stuff. Right. Yeah. I told you to get a warrant. You got no right to look in there. Something in the closet you don't figure we should see. No, right? it's not that. It just well, then there's no problem, is there? Joe, yeah. a couple of suitcases. You want to bring them out? Yeah. There they are. This one's kind of heavy. It feels like there's some sort of tools in it. And open it up. Wait a minute. You got the key for this one, Anderson? There's nothing in there for you. We'll figure that, huh? Joe, looks like this other one's open. Now, about this, Anderson. Money here and these checks. Watch, Joe. All right, Anderson. All right, come on, get up. Get up. I'll shake him, Joe. Yeah, he's clean. Stand still. All right, Anderson, let's go. Otto told you, didn't he? A lousy little sneak, he told you. I never did trust him. I kept telling Shorty, I kept telling him we shouldn't trust him. Who's Shorty? Shorty Miller. Want to tell us where we can find him? Sure, I got nothing to lose. Lousy little Otto. Just the three of you in on the job? Yeah, that's all. Otto, Shorty, and me, just the three of us. Him and his big ideas. How he had it all fixed up when you tagged him. How he was going to get us in the clear. Don't worry, he said. He'd take care of everything. Lousy liar. He'd fix it for us. That's real funny. Shouldn't be. What? He fixed it. The story you have just heard was true. The names were changed to protect the innocent. On December 14th, trial was held in Department 87, Superior Court of the State of California, in and for the County of Los Angeles. In a moment, the results of that trial. Now, here is our star, Jack Webb. Thank you, George Fenneman. I've been pleased to see how many of you king-size smokers have been changing to Chesterfield. It's just as I've been telling you, king-size Chesterfields contain tobaccos of better quality than any other king-size cigarette. Either way you like them, regular or king-size, Chesterfields have a better taste, and they're really milder. Otto N. Bronson, Mark A. Anderson, and Samuel R. Miller were tried and found guilty of nine counts of burglary with explosives. They received sentence as prescribed by law. Burglary with explosives is punishable by imprisonment in the state penitentiary for a period of not less than ten, nor more than forty years. You have 
just heard Dragnet, a series of authentic cases from official files. Technical advice comes from the office of Chief of Police W.H. Parker, Los Angeles Police Department. Technical advisors, Captain Jack Donahoe, Sergeant Marty Wynn, Sergeant Vance Brasher. Heard tonight were Ben Alexander, Vic Perrin, Stacey Harris. Script by John Robinson. Music by Walter Schumann. Hal Gibney speaking. For a million laughs, tune in Chesterfield's Martin and Lewis show Tuesday on this same NBC station. And sound off for Chesterfield's. Either regular or king size, you'll find premium quality Chesterfield's much milder. Chesterfield is best for you. Chesterfield has brought you Dragnet transcribed from Los Angeles. Ladies and gentlemen, wherever and whenever people need help, the Red Cross answers the call. When a flood-stricken family needs shelter, when a crippled child must learn to walk and play, and when a wounded soldier needs blood, the Red Cross is always there. And now the Red Cross needs your help. To keep up their many services this year, $93 million is needed. So when the Red Cross volunteer calls on you, please answer the call and give generously. Sound off for Chesterfield. Chesterfield is best for you. First cigarette with premium quality in both regular and king size. Chesterfield brings you Dragnet. Ladies and gentlemen, the story you are about to hear is true. The names have been changed to protect the innocent. You're a detective sergeant. You're assigned to robbery detail. You get a call that a large market has been held up. You have a good description of the thief. Your job, get him. Years ahead of them all. Chesterfield is years ahead of them all. The quality contrast between Chesterfield and other leading cigarettes is a revealing story. Recent chemical analyses give an index of good quality for the country's six leading cigarette brands. The index of good quality table, a ratio of high sugar to low nicotine, shows Chesterfield quality highest, 15% higher than its nearest competitor, and Chesterfield quality 31% higher than the average of the five other leading brands. Yes, Chesterfield is first with premium quality in both regular and king size. Don't you want to try a cigarette with a record like that? Dragnet, the documented drama of an actual crime. For the next 30 minutes, in cooperation with the Los Angeles Police Department, you will travel step by step on the side of the law through an actual case transcribed from official police files. From beginning to end, from crime to punishment... Dragnet is the story of your police force in action. It was Monday, March 10th. It was raining in Los Angeles. We were working the day watch out of robbery detail. My partner's Frank Smith. The boss is Captain Didion. My name's Friday. I was on my way into the office, and it was 8.02 a.m. when I got to room 27A. Robbery. Hello? Yeah, Frank. It's really coming down, isn't it? Yeah. Pouring out in the valley. That's so? Yeah. Keeps coming down like this, gonna cause a lot of trouble. Sure makes Faye mad. Yeah, how's that? Well, it gets to raining like this, and she begins to think about the house. You know, doing something about it. Changing stuff around. That so? Spent the whole day yesterday moving furniture. Finally got it all set just before dinner. Looked pretty good, too. What happened? Well, we got through dinner and all went in to look at television. Yeah. The way she had the furniture, none of us could see a thing. The chairs were either so close you couldn't see or else they were way across the room. No, well, you're not supposed to get too close, are you, anyway? Yeah, but, Joe, we only got a 10-inch screen. We got one of those big magnifiers on it, and if you get to one side, everybody looks like they got the mumps. Had to move all the stuff back the way it was. <laughs> it's a hot shot. I'll get it. 
All right, get your coat. We got one to roll on. What is it? Liquor store robbery. Eight twelve a.m. We arrived at the scene of the holdup. It was a large liquor grocery store at the corner of San Marino Avenue and Sixth Streets. A radio unit was already there. Frank and I checked with him, and then we talked with the victim, a Mr. Henry Alden. I was just standing there at the counter. This old guy came in, pulled a gun, told me he wanted the money. I gave it to him. Uh-huh. He said in the phone that he was elderly. Is that right? Yeah, old guy. Must have been about 65 or 70. Real bum. How do you mean? Well, the way he was dressed, you know. Old clothes, real seedy. Uh-huh. What if you tell us just what happened? Well, sure. Well, it was, it was about 8 this morning. I opened up, and I was there making out the deposit slip for the bank. I walked in the back door and pulled his gun. Told me he wanted the money. Uh-huh. Well, like I said, I, I gave it to him. He told me to get into the closet back there. Told me to lie down on the floor. Well, I did, and he had that gun pointed right at my head. I, I did like he told me. I see. What happened then? Well, he walked over to the door and flipped the lock on a couple of times, you know, to make sure it worked. Yeah. And then he figured it was okay, and he told me not to make any noise for five minutes. And he locked the door and left. That's it. Took all the money. How much money did he take, would you know? Yeah, to the penny. I just finished adding it up. Just a minute. All right. I got the figures on the machine. Tell you right away. That is $5,200.52. That's it exactly. You said the guy came in the back door. Is that right? Yeah, that's right. Well, were you open? I mean, was the store open for business? No, we weren't. You see, I, I usually don't open before 8.30. Leave the back door open, though, for deliveries. Bread, milk, stuff like that. Uh -huh. What if you could give us a description of the man? Well, sure. Like I said, he was old. Say around 70, around in there. Uh -huh. About how tall was he? Uh, I'd say maybe 5'7", uh, not much more than that. How much did he weigh, would you know? Not much. Maybe 125. How about his complexion? Real tan, like he'd been out in the sun a lot. Face was all wrinkled. How about the color of his eyes? Blue. Real blue. Mm-hmm. Now, what about his clothes? A real bum. Had on this old overcoat, brown, all frayed, ragged around the sleeves. Had a patch on the right elbow. Patch looked like it was kind of dark serge material. Was he wearing a hat? Yeah, yeah, blue. All beat up. You could see the dirt around the brim. Mm -hmm. How about his shirt and trousers? Blue striped shirt and old kind of brown pants. No press. Looked like he was getting ready to jump in them. Real seedy. Yes, sir. Did he wear glasses? No, no, he didn't. Was he clean shaven or did he wear a mustache? Well, he had about a four or five day old growth of beard. Uh, white. I see. Did he have any marks or scars that you could see? No, nothing like that. At least not that I could see. How about the gun? Was it a revolver or an automatic? Well, it looked like an automatic. Might have been a forty-five. I didn't look too close at that. Yeah. Do you have any sort of an accent when he talked to you? No, no, nothing like that. All right, Mr. Alden. Joe, I'll get the description out. Right, Frank, thanks. Mr. Alden, did the man say anything to you that might help identify him? No, not that I can think of. He kept telling me that he was real sorry he had to do this. He said, I'm really sorry, but I have to have the money. I have to. He kept asking me if I understood. I told him no. He said that someday I would. Real weird. He kept apologizing while he robbed me. I see. You the owner here, are you? No, no, I'm just a manager. The owner's Mr. Wood. He's going to be real mad when he hears about this. Second time in three months we've been held up. Getting a little tiring. A couple more times the insurance company isn't going to stand for it. Yes, sir. Do you usually have that much money in the store? Most of the weekends, yeah. You see, a lot of our stuff is pretty expensive. This is about the only store in the neighborhood that's open over Sunday. We get a lot of trade. Weekend business usually runs between three and 5000 Mm-hmm. About how many employees are there in the store? Three, all told. We stay open until 2.30 in the morning. Uh, I come in in the morning and work until noon. Hank comes in, then. and there's two of us until 6, and... And John comes in, he works on through. Once in a while, Mr. Wood comes in himself when we get busy. Uh-huh. What if I could have their names and addresses? Oh, sure. They weren't involved in it, I'm sure of that. Well, we have to check them out anyway, Mr. Alden. Yeah, I suppose so. But I tell you, he knew what he was doing, the way he moved. The way he knew just when to come in. This fellow's done that sort of thing before. Trying to say he was sorry about taking the money. He wasn't fooling anybody. No, sir, not a soul. Real bum, seedy, you know? Yes, sir. All that baloney about how he had to have the money wasn't any other way. He wasn't sorry, not at all. Yeah, well, he probably will be. 9.30 a.m., Frank and I started a canvas of the immediate vicinity. None of the store owners in the area had seen anyone answering the description of the holdup man. None of them had seen any suspicious cars in the area. We asked the liquor store manager to go with us to the city hall to look at the mug books. We called the store owner, and when he arrived, we drove downtown. 
The victim went through the mug books on known hold-up men, but failed to make an identification. A local and an APB were gotten out on the suspect. We asked the stats office to make a run on the M.O. used, and they came back with 14 possibles. It took us two days to check them out. They let us nowhere. The papers caught on to the story, and letters began to pour in with advice and tips. On Monday, March 17th, the full week after the robbery, Frank and I had lunch and checked back into the office. See the afternoon papers, Joe? Yeah, pretty funny, huh? Yeah, they sure taking up the story. Everybody got a different idea of who the old guy is and why he did it. Have you read some of the stories? Yeah, sure. The only thing is, a lot of people seem to think the old guy's a real Robin Hood. Now, that's all right, but they forget that he walked in that store with a gun. There wasn't anybody to say that he wouldn't have pulled the trigger if somebody got in his way. Yeah, I should be glad when we get him to find out what it's all about. Mm, I get it. Probably Friday. Yes, ma'am, it is. No, ma'am. No, ma'am, we haven't caught him yet. What was that? Yes, ma'am. Uh-huh. All right, would you give me that address again? Yes, I have it. Yes, ma'am. All right, thank you. Well, there's another one. What's that? Landlady runs a place out on Ninth Street. Yeah. Says she's got a tenant that she's sure is the old fellow we're looking for. How come? Says all the old guy does is stay up in his room. The other day, the landlady's daughter went upstairs for something. Tenant chased her down the stairs, yelling at her to stay away from his room, all that sort of thing. He was tired of people not respecting his rights, the rights of an old man, something like that. I couldn't get it all on the phone. Description she gave him pretty much matches the one we got. Hmm. What do you figure? Well, we got no choice. We'll check it out. 1.58 p.m. Frank and I got to the rooming house on 9th Street. It was a large four-story building. We talked to the landlady, and she gave us what information she could. She told us that the tenant's name was Roger Dietrich. She told us that he'd lived in the building for the past eight years. She went on to tell us that he had some sort of a private income and that he rarely left his room. The landlady explained that earlier the same morning, her 11-year-old daughter had gone to the attic to get some old newspapers and that on the way she'd run into Mr. Dietrich. The tenant had yelled at her and told her that as long as he was paying rent on the room, he wouldn't have anybody snooping around. We checked and found that he got no mail except the single letter a month with the income check. 2.30 p.m., Frank and I went up to the fourth floor and knocked at the door. Oh, you want to try it again? Yeah. Go away! I don't want him. Go away! Mr. Dietrich? Who is it? Police officers, we'd like to talk to you. Uh, just a minute. Who'd you say you were? Police officers, we'd like to talk to you. Oh. What are your names? My name's Friday. This is my partner, Frank Smith. Uh-huh. I guess it's all right. Uh, come in. Thank come you, in. sir. Well, I guess it's about that thing this morning, huh? Sir? Oh, you don't have to play cage with me. I know that she calls you the old busybody. That bad kid of hers is just like her. He's always snooping. Well, there wasn't anything to it. The kid come up here and was snooping around trying to find out what I was doing. I'm not ready yet. Well, what do you mean, sir, not ready? No, the book's not finished yet. It will be in another year. And the whole world can see it. Maybe mend their ways. Give them something to hope to avoid what's coming. Well, sir, that's not why we're here. I, don't, don't lie to me. I know all about you. I know that you'd be around. You're trying to stop me. I knew it. I, I knew it all the time. It... You see that stack of magazines over there? Yeah. Every copy of Life magazine ever printed, right from the first. I keep track, you know. I use it for research. Well, I don't quite understand, Mr. Dietrich. That's for my book. Oh, yeah. Going to be in five volumes called The Evils of the Machine Age and Its Effect on Mankind. Five volumes. That's the five volumes. Got the first four finished. Working on the last one now. That's how I, I knew you were coming. <laughs> I, I, I worked it out on the, on the charts. Mm -hmm. Well, we'd like to talk to you about what you were doing a week ago, sir. Oh, you would? Mm -hmm. Oh, well. Well, yes, I figured on that. I knew that you'd be checking me. I knew it. I, I saw it in the chart. I'm getting close now. Well, it's going to sit up and take notice. Sit right up. Yes, sir. Did you go out last Monday? Monday? Well... Yes, 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 I went out to get some supplies. I got them to come right back. Would you tell us what time of day that was? All night, dear sir. I always go out at night. Yes, sir. Where'd you get these? What are these supplies? Well, uh, that's a little place down the street. I always buy things there. Very nice, very nice. Yes, sir. And the man down there would be able to tell us if you were there, wouldn't he? Oh, sure, yes. Him and me had a talk about my book. That was really interesting. We we talk all the time. I, uh, I just finished volume four, you know, about... The, What's going to happen if the machine is allowed to continue? Ah, oh, it's going to be terrible. 
I beg your pardon? The way the world's going. All these atom bombs. Now the hydrogen bomb. Gonna blow the world right away. Even if they stop that, things aren't going to be the same. They're all going to be different. All right. You just betcha. You know what kids are going to look like a thousand years from now? Well, sir, I imagine pretty much the same way they do now, huh? Yes, sir, and that's just where you're wrong. So you got the picture right here. That's volume four. You know, it's volume four. I'll get it. There you are. See? I do it up myself. Yeah. Well, what is it? Well, you see, that's the way we're all going to look. You see there? See? Yeah. That large hair, all brains, little bitty legs. That's from that we, we won't be doing any walking, you see, just riding all the time. One great big eye right in the middle of the head, and the right arm fit only for eating breakfast food that makes noises and turning on the television set, you see? Oh. It's clever. Yes, sir. That's what the chart says we're going to look like if we all eat at a bomb. Yes, sir. I wonder if you'd mind coming downtown with us. In an automobile? Yes, sir. Well, I'm afraid not, you see. I don't believe in them. They're not going to last, you see. Well, I'm sorry, Mr. Dietrich, but we have to ask you to go with us. Police business, huh? Yes, sir. That's right. Well, I don't like it, but I guess I got no choice. That, that right? Yes, sir. That's right. Well, all right. That way. Might as well ride in an automobile. Won't be around long, you know. Then just fade right out of existence. Is that right? Yeah. Tell you how it's going to happen in my book. Uh huh. Volume five. Three oh one p.m. We drove Roger Dietrich down to the city hall and checked him through R and I. We found no record on him. We got in touch with a holdup victim, Henry Alden, and asked him to come down to the city hall to see if he could identify the suspect. He got to the robbery squad room at four fifteen p.m. No. No, I'm sure of it. That's not the guy. Now, what's all this about, anyway? What are you officers trying to do? Well, it's all right, Mr. Dietrich. We're just conducting a routine investigation. It's all right now. Oh, it is, huh? Yes, sir. We can take you home now, if you like. In that police car? Yes, sir. Well, how about this fellow? He going to? No, sir. Oh, well, now, maybe I'll do just that. Would you mind dropping me off at Pershing Square? I'd like to listen to a speech. A friend of mine's making it this afternoon. Brilliant, man. I, oh, my. He's already written 12 books. All on odds. Sir? O-D-D-S, odds. Like, um, what are the chances of a comet falling on your house? Uh, or, uh, what are the chances of a certain horse winning the Kentucky Derby? All things like that, you know. Brilliant man. Yes, sir. He's dead broke. Is that right? Yep. Spends all his money on research. I get it. Robbery Friday. Yeah, Barnes. Uh-huh. Yeah. When'd you pick him up? Yeah. All right. No, we'll be right over. Anything? Yeah. Barnes over at the main jail says they got a drunk over there who's doing a lot of bragging. What about? Heist in the liquor store for $5,200. 4.30 p.m. We had Roger Dietrich taken to his home, and then Frank and I went over to the main jail. We talked to Officer Phil Barnes. He told us that an Arnold Jefferson had been picked up and booked for LAMC 4127A on the previous day. Barnes went on to say that this was Jefferson's 42nd arrest on drunk charges. We had the suspect brought to the interview room, and we talked to him. All right, Jefferson, now what's all this about you holding up a liquor store? What do you know about it? You match the description of the man who committed the robbery. The clothes there that you're wearing are like the ones the victim described. Now, how about it? You figure you can prove it without me telling you? Yeah, if Alden identifies you, we can. Alden? He's the man who was robbed. He's outside now. We want him to take a look at you. That won't be necessary. You got the right man. You are listening to Dragnet, the authentic story of your police force in action. Chesterfield is best for you. Listen to this report. It's a report never before made about a cigarette. Smoke day after day by a group of people smoking from 10 to 40 cigarettes a day for a full year. Here's Chesterfield's record. A medical specialist giving this group thorough examinations every two months for a full year reports no adverse effects to their nose, throat, and sinuses from smoking Chesterfields. Don't you want to try a cigarette with a record like that? You'll find Chesterfields best for you. They're much milder, 
with an extraordinarily good taste. And for your pocketbook, Chesterfield is America's best cigarette buy. Chesterfield, years ahead of them all. We had the victim, Henry Alden, look at the suspect, Arnold Jefferson. He identified him positively as the man who had held up the liquor store. We took Jefferson back to the city hall and checked him through R&I. He had no felony record. 7.30 p.m., we took him to the interrogation room. I knew you'd get me. Knew it all the time. Is that right? Sure. I knew it even before I held up the store. You know, I didn't really want to do it. You know, I really meant it when I told him I was sorry about doing it. Really meant it. Mm Mm-hmm. Guess maybe you find that kind of hard to believe. I suppose you tell us about it, huh? Yeah. I guess the best way would be to start from the beginning, huh? Yeah. First thing you should understand is I think basically that I'm an honest man. All my life I've never cheated anyone or taken anything that didn't belong to me. I've tried to live pretty much by the golden rule. Yes, sir. Sometimes, maybe, lots of times, it'd be a little hard to do, but I did my best. Yes, sir. Go ahead. I was born in the Middle West. It's a tiny little town. You probably never heard of it. it. Isn't on most of the map. Went to school there through the eighth grade. Then I decided that I wanted to see the rest of the country. Worked my way through every one of the 48, every one of them. Uh-huh. Did a lot of things, met a lot of people. Is that right? Well, all that time, all my life, I never did anything real big. Nothing that I could ever tell anybody about and be proud. Nothing to tell people about. Yes, sir. I'm 72 years old now. Much a long time to live and never do anything big. Long time. Mm-hmm. Came downtown one day, sat in the plaza in the sun, met some real nice people. People like me, people without much reason. Got to coming down every day, sitting and talking, exchanging ideas. Found a lot of good friends. Most of them were alone. And I guess being alone made us members of the same club. Got to be sort of a lodge, 17 of us. Used to meet, talk about things, the way the world was going, how things look for the future, all things like that. Friends. Yes, yeah, sir. How'd you get along all this time? How'd you live? Oh, I get a little pension from the state, enough to get along on. I don't need much. Mm-hmm. Well, one day I got to thinking about how I didn't really have anything big to remember. That's when I decided. You mean on the robbery? Yep. Decided that if I could get my hands on a lot of money, a lot of it all at once, I could have something. Yeah. You know? So I started to figure. First off, I had to figure what kind of a store to rob. Had to be one where I could get enough money. Thought about it quite a while. When I had that figured, I picked out the store. And then I, uh, cased, is that right? Yeah, that's right. Well, I cased the store, figured how I'd do it. Then I figured that I'd have to have a gun. Yeah. Got one of those little plastic ones. Bought the dime store, fixed it up a shoe black. Couldn't hurt anybody, just plastic. Looked real, but couldn't hurt anyone. Of course, the victim wouldn't know that, would he? Yeah, I, th- I thought considerable about that. Worried about it a lot. About how, if there was any trouble, it'd make it hard with just a plastic gun. Oh, not that I wanted to hurt anybody. I didn't. But I got to thinking what would happen if somebody got scared and thought it was real. Could be trouble there. Mm-hmm. No, no, now, before I go any further, I want you to know that right at this point, I knew I was doing wrong. I knew it. Knew that I'd have to go to jail for what I did. Knew it, and it didn't matter. Had to be that way. Well, now, if you knew that, why'd you go ahead with the robbery? Well, wasn't any other way to get the money. At least none that I could think of. And believe me, I tried to think of one. All right, go ahead. And I held up the place, took the money, and then I made the man get in the closet. Did that so he wouldn't try to follow me. I was sorry about it. Tried to tell him, but I don't think he really believed it. Don't think he did. What'd you do then? I took a bus out the airport. Thought about taking a cab, but then I figured that I'd want to save as much money as I could so as to have it later. Yeah. I inquired around out there at the airport and found a place where I could rent an airplane. I paid for it in advance so there wouldn't be any trouble. Hired her to go to San Francisco. Round trip, both ways. You hired an airplane? Yep. Big one. Carried 18 people. That's what I needed. Real comfortable seats, two motors. Had a girl painted on the front. From the war, I guess. All right, go ahead. Well, I took the bus back to town, and I started walking around the plaza. Rounded up all 17 of my friends, whole bunch of them. Talked to them all. Guys who had been nice to me, even if there wasn't anything I could do for them. Told them to meet me at First and Main, right by the fountain in front of the city hall that night. Told them that I was going to throw a party. A party they'd never forget. Well, we got together that night and took a cab out the airport. Well, as a matter of fact, we took four cabs. Had to show the drivers that I had the money for the tickets. 
Guess they thought we was going to try to get a free ride. But anyway, when I showed them the money, they drove us out. Give them a good tip. Nice fellas. Mm-hmm. Got on the airplane, flew up to San Francisco. Wonderful. Got into the city, and then we started. Really had a time. Lasted three days. Wasn't anything we didn't see, nothing we didn't do. Three days of it. Real living. Everything was on me. Paid for it all. Went to the best places, ate the best food, drank the finest wines. Really lived. Where'd you stay when you were in San Francisco? Hotel down on Howard. Not the richest in town, but real nice. Clean rooms. All right, go ahead. Well, about the time that I thought we'd stayed long enough, we all got on the plane and come back. Got in Wednesday morning. Took cabs downtown, then we all went to breakfast. Had a real whopper. Kind of a farewell for the whole party. After I settled up with the waitress, I only had a dollar seventy-five left. Give it to her for a tip. Sure made her happy. I don't guess she makes much down there. Yeah. Well, did any of your friends know where you'd gotten the money for this party? No, oh, no, no. You see, when I first got the idea, I told him that I had a real rich brother. Told him that he died and that I was his only relative, that all the money would get to me. I figured that I could sort of set things up by doing that. Seemed to work all right. None of them said anything. Uh-huh. You remember the man you chartered the airplane from? Oh, sure. Real nice fella. I got his card. I kept it, sort of a souvenir. I can give it to you if you want it. Yeah, we'll have to have it. You ever done any big time? Me? Oh, no, no, no. Just a drunk arrest. Lots of them. Yeah. Big thing about this is that I wish there was some way to keep the boys from finding out so they wouldn't have to know. Of course, I know that I'm not going to see him again, but just the same, what are they going to think? How are they going to take this when they hear about it? I don't know. I sure was wrong. Real wrong. How long will they put me in jail for, you guys know? Well, it depends. Depends on what? What the court says. Oh. Still have to go to prison, though, huh? Yeah, I'm afraid so. Mm-hmm. Well, I haven't got much left. Guess no matter what to say, it's going to be life for me. Well, sir, we're not the ones to decide that. Yes, I know. You guys have been real nice. In a way, I'm glad it's over. Like I said before, I knew you'd get me. I knew it all the time right from the beginning. Tried to figure out how it'd be when you did get me. What I'd say, how I'd act. Wasn't as hard as I thought it was going to be. Not hard at all. One thing, though. Yeah, what's that? I kind of wish I hadn't done it. I really do. I keep thinking of my friends, how they're going to take it. Yeah. You want to go? You going to take me back now, huh? Yeah, I'm afraid we have to. Going to put me back in the tank? No, not this time. Upstairs? Yeah, upstairs. That means I'll have a cell all to myself. Be nice. I'd like to be alone. All right. You all set, Jefferson? Yeah. This way. Seventy-two years, nothing to show for it. Nothing. Only one thing I can really say I did with my life. What's that, Jefferson? Wasted seventy-two years. you have just heard was true. The names were changed to protect the innocent. On July 24th, trial was held in Department 89, Superior Court of the State of California, in and for the County of Los Angeles. In a moment, the results of that trial. Now, here is our star, Jack Webb. Thank you, George Fenneman. I hope you'll remember the facts George Fenneman reported to you earlier. Recent chemical analyses give an index of good quality for the country's six leading brands. The index of good quality table a ratio of high sugar to low nicotine, showed Chesterfield quality highest. 15% higher than its nearest competitor. And Chesterfield quality, 31% higher than the average of the five other leading brands. Now, I'd like you to try Chesterfields today. I know they're best for me. And I'm sure you'll find Chesterfields are best for you. <laughs> Arnold Peter Jefferson was tried and found guilty of one count of robbery in the second degree. He was sentenced to the state penitentiary for the term as prescribed by law. Robbery in the second degree is punishable by imprisonment for a period of not less than one year. Ladies and gentlemen, we wish to thank the editors of Real Magazine for their article, High Tension on TV. 
in the April issue now on sale. You have just heard Dragnet, a series of authentic cases from official files. Technical advice comes from the office of Chief of Police W.H. Parker, Los Angeles Police Department. Technical advisors, Captain Jack Donahoe, Sergeant Marty Wynn, Sergeant Vance Brasher. Heard tonight were Ben Alexander, Vic Rodman, Ralph Moody. Script by John Robinson. Music by Walter Schumann. Hal Gibney speaking. For a million laughs, tune in Chesterfield's Martin and Lewis show, Tuesday on this same NBC station. And sound off for Chesterfield's. Either regular or king size, you'll find premium quality Chesterfield's much milder. Chesterfield is best for you. Chesterfield has brought you Dragnet transcribed from Los Angeles. Tonight, it's Adventure with Barry Craig on NBC. Sound off for Chesterfield. Chesterfield is best for you. First cigarette with premium quality in both regular and king size. Chesterfield brings you Dragnet. Ladies and gentlemen, the story you are about to hear is true. The names have been changed to protect the innocent. You're a detective sergeant. You're assigned a robbery detail. A pair of hold-up men have been staging a series of robberies in your city. You have their description. You know their method of operation. Your job, get them. Years ahead of them all. Chesterfield is years ahead of them all. The quality contrast between Chesterfield and other leading brands is a revealing story. Recent chemical analyses give an index of good quality for the country's six leading cigarette brands. The index of good quality table, which is a ratio of high sugar to low nicotine, shows Chesterfield quality highest. Chesterfield quality highest. 15% higher than its nearest competitor. Chesterfield quality highest. 31% higher than the average of the five other leading brands. Yes, Chesterfield is first with premium quality in both regular and king size. Don't you want to try a cigarette with a record like this? Chesterfield. Dragnet, the documented drama of an actual crime. For the next 30 minutes, in cooperation with the Los Angeles Police Department... You will travel step by step on the side of the law through an actual case transcribed from official police files. From beginning to end, from crime to punishment, Dragnet is the story of your police force in action. It was Tuesday, September 6th. It was warm in Los Angeles. We were working the day watch out of robbery detail. My partner's Frank Smith. The boss is Captain Didion. My name's Friday. I was on my way into the office, and it was 8.02 a.m. when I got to room 27A. Robbery. Joe, is that you? Yeah. Did you just get in? Yeah, a couple of minutes ago. That last run from the stats office come in yet? No, I called them. They said it'd be about 10. Hey, you look kind of beat. Yeah, I had a little trouble sleeping last night. Huh? Went over this thing. Someplace the guys must have made a mistake. I can't figure it. Yeah. I've been trying to figure an angle, too. Saw the skipper this morning. What did he say about it? Nothing asked how we were doing. I told him we had a couple of things cooking. He didn't say anything. Guess he's getting plenty of heat from the front office. His pills are getting bigger. Stomach's giving him trouble again, I guess. Yeah, he had some this morning. Looked big enough for a horse. I never saw such big pills, Joe. He could hardly swallow them. Purple, too. Yeah. Eleven jobs in three months. All the same M.O., all the same descriptions. None of them add up to anything we can make. Yeah. Skipper said he had a call from the insurance company that underwrote the jewelry store they hit last Thursday. Yeah. Said the guy was real nasty. Said if we couldn't clean it up, he was going to the police commission to get some action that way. Robbery Friday. Who? Oh, yeah, Rod. Yeah, sure, I remember. How's it going? Oh, uh, that's good. What? Yeah. 
Yeah, I guess we can come right down. All right, sure. Okay, Rod, thanks. We'll be right there. You remember Rod Nealon, the guy we nailed for robbery five years ago? Nealon? Yeah, I know who you mean. He wants to see us, says he's got some information. Yeah? About the guys we're after. For the past three months, a pair of hold-up men had been victimizing the owners of large jewelry stores and supermarkets. In each case, the descriptions of the two suspects was the same. Suspect number one was described as WMA, 30 to 35 years old, red hair, tall and lean. Suspect number two was described as WMA, 25 to 30 years old, 5 foot 7, 120 pounds. Victims reported that the larger of the two bandits had a slight stutter, but neither of them had any visible marks or scars. In each instance, the method of operation the bandits used was the same. The two men would enter the store at about 10 a.m. The smaller of the two thieves would ask to use the telephone. He'd go to the rear of the store, and there he would produce a 32 caliber automatic. The other man would pull a sawed-off shotgun, and together, the two of them would tape the victim's hands and feet and lock them in a rear room. Then they'd rifle the safe and leave. None of the victims could tell us if the pair used a car. Everyone concerned had been shown mug books, but they were unable to make an identification. The M.O. had been run through the stats office, but after the possibles had been checked out, we had nothing. Communications had been gotten off to George Brereton up at CII Sacramento, but they were unable to help us in making an identification. For three months, the holdup men were able to hit where they wanted and when they wanted, and it seemed as if we were unable to stop them. All sources of information had been checked, but they netted us no new leads. 8.25 a.m., Frank and I drove over to see Rod Nealon. He worked in a small machine shop on South La Brea. He checked with the shop foreman and got permission to talk to us. He led us to a small lunch stand around the corner from the shop. We ordered a cup of coffee, and Rod told us why he'd called. I got to reading the papers, read about these hold-ups, and figured maybe I could give you guys a hand. Well, you can use it, Rod. You guys were pretty nice to me when I got picked up. I sort of figure I owe you a favor. Well, what's the information you got, Rod? Well, I was in the bar the other night. See, Friday night, place down on 3rd, you know, having a beer. Yeah. Well, I sat there for a little bit, chewing up a storm with a bartender, and these two guys come in. Got a girl with them. Uh-huh. Well... The three of them go over to a booth, sit down, and order drinks. I didn't pay much attention to them. You know, it's none of my business. Yeah, go ahead. Well, when they put in their order, bartender and me got kind of laughing about it. Why is that? Well, the two guys ordered bourbon, but the girl ordered one of those weird mixed things. You know, cream de menthe and cream de cocoa and chopped up ice. Real weird. When I looked over at her, usually the only people who ordered things like that are young kids. I asked the bartender about it. Yeah. He said that's all the girl ever ordered. Said they came in all the time, steady customers. Well, what makes you think they're the ones we're after, Rod? Well, the way they looked and acted. Two fellas were loaded with money, had a roll that choke a horse. Right then, I didn't think much about it. Figured maybe they were just trying to impress the girl, you know. Mm -hmm. Didn't really think much about it then. (laughs) On the way home, I stopped and picked up a morning paper. I read about the robberies. I noticed the descriptions you had on them. Fit the two guys in the bar to a T. Tall redhead, short, dark fella. Big one even had that stutter. You got any names on these two fellas? No, I didn't hear anything. Not from them, anyway. I, I asked the bartender. He said the big one was called Chet and the little guy's named Vince. He didn't know much about them. Just said they came in a lot and had a lot of money to spend. Any idea where they live? No, I don't think he knew. How about a car? Did you see one? Uh-uh. No, like I said, I was there when they came in, and I left before they did. If, if I'd known what the bit was, I'd have stuck around and tried to get some more information for you. I didn't even figure it until I got home and saw the papers. You heard anything around about the two men? Not a thing. That's straight, too. I'm carrying a lunch bucket now. I got a job, and I keep my nose out of trouble. I had enough jail. I don't want any more of it. Well, that's good to hear, Rod. I learned. No more. (laughs) Tough to learn it that way, but I guess there ain't no other. Now, sir, I'm clean. I'm going to stay that way. Like I said, though, you guys were nice to me. You gave me a break. I want to help you out. You know, sort of say thanks. Yeah, Rod, and we appreciate it, too. You know that. Listen, anything I can do, I'm with you, fellas. Where is this bar? It's a place on 3rd called Tad's. It's a little joint. Yeah, we know it. Most of the guys come in are there for contact, you know, trying to set something up. Mm-hmm. Well, that's just it, Rod. What do you mean? Well, I think that if Frank and I walk into the place, somebody will make us sure we're known there. We'll burn the place, lose the two men. Yeah, I guess so. Well, you want me to hang around there, keep you posted, let you know what the guys are doing? Well, that's kind of up to you, Rod. <laughs> They found out I was playing footsie with you. They nailed me sure. You know that. Well, you know we'll give you all the help we can if you want to do it. It's going to be a little expensive sitting in there. Can't just sit without ordering something, you know. Yeah. Well, here. Here's ten bucks. That ought to keep you going for a while. Yeah, well, for a while. What do you want me to find out? 
Well, get an address if you can. Find out where these guys work, what they do for a living, if they own a car. Get the license number if you can. Who the girl is, where she lives. Just as much as you can, you know. Okay, how'll I get back to you? Well, we'll be around. You won't have to look far. I hope not. Those two guys get out of me. I got big trouble, you know. Well, you don't have to do this if you don't want to, Rod. Well, I want to. You guys have helped me plenty of times. Maybe I can kind of pay you back this way. I know I don't have to do it, Joe. It was my idea. It's okay by me if you guys will stay close. We will, Rod. Well, let's put it this way. You guys just stay close by. I'm 37. I got 28 years to go. Yeah. I want to be around for that Social Security. We got the description of the girl who'd been seen with the two suspects, then Frank and I drove back to the office. We checked the names Chet and Vince through the moniker files in R&I. We came up with several possibles, but they were eliminated. For the next three days, we kept in constant contact with Rod Nealon. He would report for work at 8 a.m., finish up at 5, and then after a dinner downtown, he'd spend the evening in the bar down on 3rd Street. During that time, he had no contact with the two men. They'd failed to make an appearance at the bar. The kickbacks from up north arrived, but we got no new leads from them. Saturday, September 10th, Frank and I met with Nealon for lunch. He told us that he hadn't seen the suspects since the night he told us about. He said that the bartender told him that they hadn't been in the place on 3rd Street. 3.16 p.m., Frank and I checked back into the office. Well, that went no place. Yeah, I wonder where they are. I don't know, Joe. Nothing around town. Maybe they decided they were running their luck a little close, huh? Well, it could be, but they got no reason to quit. As far as they know, they're in the clear. There's nothing to scare them off. No. You think Rod is playing ball with us? I don't know. There's no reason not to. He came to us. We didn't go to him. Guess he learned his lesson. Takes a lot of nerve to do what he's doing. Glad to see he's playing it straight, though. Yeah. You want to check the book? Yeah. Anything there? No, nothing. It's a call from Faye. He wants me to call her before I leave the office. There are a couple of teletypes here. Joe? Yeah? Here's our answer. What? Teletype from San Francisco. Jewelry store was heisted for $150,000. Yeah. Two men, one with a sawed-off shotgun. We sent a teletype to San Francisco immediately, asking for full details on the holdup. The answer gave the M.O. that the two thieves had used and their descriptions. In every detail, the operation matched that of the two men we were looking for. We put in a call to Rod Nealon, but we found that he hadn't reported for work that day. Frank and I drove out to his apartment, but his landlady told us that she hadn't seen him since the day before. Frank and I checked the places where he ate and where he spent his time when he wasn't working. None of his friends had seen him. We spent the next two days looking for him. From a bartender on 7th, we heard that Rod had been in the place on Sunday the night before, and at that time he'd been pretty drunk. The bartender said that he appeared frightened and nervous. Monday, September 12th, 5.30 p.m., Frank and I checked into the office to sign out for the day. I'll sign us out. All right, I'll check the box. I got it. Robbery Friday. Yeah. Well, where you been? We've been looking all over for you. We thought something had happened. What? When? Yeah. Well, take it easy, Rod. Yeah, we'll get to you. Yeah, what model? You got the license number? Just a minute. All right, go ahead. 2N39291. Yeah. Okay, yeah. We'll see you there. All right, be careful. Rod? Yeah. Says he's been trying to get a hold of us all day. Says he didn't want to leave his name. Two suspects are back in town. Rod says they got a bankroll like Fort Knox, sporting a new car. He got the number. Better check it right away. Where's he been? Well, he said he was worried. He's been trying to stay out of sight. Said we better get the guys fast. Yeah. He thinks they're on to him. Our informant, Rod Nealon, told me on the phone that he'd been hiding for the last two days. He said that on the night the robbery suspects had gotten back into town, the bartender had let it drop to them that Rod had been asking questions. They'd started after him, and he'd been on a two-day drunk trying to hide from them. He said that he tried to call us at the office several times, but he'd found that we weren't in. He was reluctant to leave his name or a message for fear that the two hoodlums might in some way find out about it. Frank drove over to his apartment, but found that he wasn't there. When I'd spoken to him on the phone, he told me that he'd wait there until we could pick him up. The landlady at his place hadn't seen him and told Frank that she didn't even know that Rod was in the building. While Frank was gone, I checked the license number of the car through RDMV. They called us back to tell me that the car was registered to a Miss Dolly Keene at 18924 Elmwood Drive, Hollywood. Frank got back to the office and we drove out to see the girl. 
On the apartment register, she was listed as the tenant of apartment 406. We knocked at the door to the manager's apartment and waited. Yes? You the manager, ma'am? Yes, something I can do for you? We're police officers. We'd like to talk to you. Here's our identification. I see. Friday. Yes, ma'am. This is my partner, Frank Smith. How do you do, ma'am? How do you do? I'm Barbara Townsend. Would you like to come in and talk? Might be better than the hall. Thank you very much, Miss Townsend. It's Mrs. I'm a widow woman. Husband died seven years ago. I'm sorry to hear that, ma'am. It's all right, Mr. Friday. I'm used to being a widow now. Just sit down. We can have our talk. Thank you. Now then, what was it you want to talk about? Not something I've done, I hope. No, Miss Townsend. It's about one of your tenants, a Miss Dolly Keene. Oh, that one. Might have known it. Why did you say that, ma'am? Oh, just because. I always knew she was going to cause trouble here. I knew it. I told Sinbad about it. Told him a lot of times. Sinbad? Give us a description of the man. Tall man, over six feet, red hair, had a kind of stutter. I never talked to him. I just heard him when they came in. My door is right near the front, you know. Yes, ma'am. Does she have any other friends in the building, ma'am, do you know? Oh, no, no. Isn't anybody in the building likes her? Well, except that Mr. Newton on the second floor. He's kind of flighty, impressed with a pretty girl, you know. But she's not friendly with anybody. Does she have any visitors? Anyone who came to see her? Just her boyfriend, the red-headed one. And then there was the other one. I don't think he was a friend of hers, though. What other one's that, man? Uh, there's a little man, dark. I think he was a friend of the boyfriend. It seemed that way to me. Any of them drive a car, would you know? Well, I don't know about the others, but Miss Keene just got one. Brand new. 1953. Don't know where she got the money for it, but by golly, she's got the car. Uh-huh. She worked, ma'am. I don't know. When she signed the lease, she told me that she was a designer for a clothing company out here. That's a fact. She's got mighty cushy hours. Seems to come and go whenever she pleases. But when did she get the new car, do you know? It's a couple of days ago. She told me that she had to go out of town on some business. Wanted me to keep an eye on her apartment. She didn't have to tell me that. I'm the manager here. Of course, I'm going to watch the place. Yes, ma'am. Uh, about the car, please. Oh, yeah. Well, she had it when she came back. Just drove up in it, smart as please. Told me that she wanted a garage for it. Said she didn't want to leave it on the streets at night. I told her she'd just have to wait. We got 18 units here and only 10 garages. All of them are taken. I told her she'd just have to wait. She said she maybe would leave it over at her sister's for a few days. Her sister's? Yeah, she has a sister in the neighborhood someplace. You know where she lives? No, I don't. Pretty sure it's someplace in the neighborhood, though. Would you know her sister's name? No. Sorry, I can't help you out there either. She's married. Don't know her married name. Miss Keene never mentioned well, that. How about mail, Miss Townsend? Miss Keene get much mail? I couldn't tell you that. They got their own keys, open their own mailboxes. I got no way of telling what they get. I see. Of course, I could see in through the little slots in the mailbox. She got a few letters. I couldn't tell you where they were from, though. I see. She in now, would you know? No. I mean, I don't think she's in. I haven't heard her. Usually she comes in laughing and carrying on, so I'd know if she was in. What's all this about, anyway? What's she done? No, we'd just like to talk to her, Mrs. Townsend. Like that, is it? Ma'am? Got something secret to talk about. No, ma'am, it's not that. It'd be better if we talked to her, that's all. Ma'am? No. Well, I hope you get the chance to. Beg pardon? Well, last time I saw her, she talked about leaving town. You are listening to Dragnet, the authentic story of your police force in action. Chesterfield is best for you. Listen to this report. It's a report never before made about a cigarette. Smoked day after day by a group of people smoking from 10 to 40 cigarettes a day for a full year, here's Chesterfield's record. A medical specialist giving this group thorough examinations every two months for a full year reports no adverse effects to their nose, throat, and sinuses from smoking Chesterfields. Don't you want to try a cigarette with a record like that? 
you'll find Chesterfield's best for you. They're much milder, with an extraordinarily good taste. And for your pocketbook, Chesterfield is America's best cigarette buy. In the company of the manager, Frank and I went through the girl's apartment. In the closets, we found clothing that indicated that she'd returned to the place. We called the office and told them that we were setting up a stakeout on the building. Frank and I went downstairs and parked the car up the street. Frank was in the front seat of the car. I stayed in the back. 8.30 p.m. There was still no sign of the girl. Frank called the office and found that our informant, Rod Nealon, was still missing. We waited. 9.30 p.m. 10. 11.30 p.m. A car answering the description of the girls pulled up in front of the apartment building. Joe? Yeah, I see him. Car matches. Can you see the license? No, not from here. Two people in the car, a girl and a man. Yeah. Well, let's try it. All right. I'll cover the other side, huh? Right. Excuse me. Yeah? Well, what is it? I'd like to see your identification, please. Well, what for? I'm t- doing nothing. Police officers like to see your ID. I don't know what, what, what this is all about. All right, mister, get out of the car. I don't know what you guys are trying to prove with all this. Getting so a guy can't take his girl out anymore without cops rousing Joe, him. looks like the other one in the car that just pulled up. Yeah. Finch, get out of here. It's the cops. I'll get him, Joe. All right, get your hands in the back of it. Lousy cops, you'll never get him. Stand still. You'll never get him. He's probably got your partner by all now. All right, get back in the car. What's going on, Chief? Lousy cops, they think they got us. Vince is a good shot. All right, give me those ignition keys, lady. What for? Give them to me. Now, both of you, stay in the car. Joe, the apartment house. Over here. How about it? He's up there on the second floor. All right, come on, mister. Give it up. Get away from me, cop. Get away. Throw that gun down here. Come on, throw that gun down. What do you figure, Joe? I don't know. Cover me. I'll go up. All right. How about it? I don't see him. Stop it! Don't shoot! I give up! I give up! Don't shoot anymore, please! All right, mister, throw that gun out here. Come on! Throw it out here. All right! There it is, you got it. Now give me a break. I got it, Joe. All right, come on, put your hands against that wall. I'm hurt. He shot me. Now leave me alone. I'm hurt. Did you see that? I'll shake him. Come on. He's clean. Call a doctor. Give me a doctor. I'll bleed to death. Don't give me a doctor. You're not hurt that bad. Now, come on. Let's go. I'll give you a hand. Come on. All right, come on. What's all the shooting about? Oh. Shot him, huh? Yes, ma'am. I better call Georgia Street, Frank. Get the other ones in the car. Yeah, I'll stay here with this one. Frank? What's the matter? Something wrong? Yeah, I got to get out of broadcast. They're gone. When the number two suspect had started firing at Frank, I handcuffed the first suspect and I went to Frank's aid. On returning to the car, we found that both suspects had escaped. The man was still handcuffed, so moving around would be difficult for him. A broadcast was gotten out to all units in the area on the two escaped suspects. The car they'd driven was still parked out in front of the apartment. An ambulance arrived and removed the wounded suspect to the county hospital. Before he was taken away, he gave us the names of his two accomplices, a Chester Rayburn and Dolly Keene. We called the office and told him what had happened. Additional teams of men were sent out to help us canvass the area. Frank and I went through the personal effects of Dolly Keene. In a desk drawer, we found a telephone book, and one of the numbers in the book bore the name Sis. It gave a telephone number and an address three blocks from the apartment house. We got in touch with Captain Didion and informed him of the developments. Additional men from Metro Division were sent out to cover the address listed in the telephone book. Captain Didion also told us that our informant, Rod Nealon, had been found in a rooming house on 3rd Street where he'd been hiding since the two bandits had gotten back into town. He was placed in protective custody. Frank and I went over to the sister's apartment. Yeah, what do you want? Police officers. You Patricia Saxon? Yeah, so what? Want to look at your apartment. What for? There's nothing here that means anything to you. Has sister been here tonight? No. 
I haven't seen her last couple of days. Anyone here with you? No. We're going to have to look. Yeah, maybe I don't want you to. That's tough, lady. All right, let's shake it down, Frank. Yeah. There's no one here. Isn't anybody with me? Closet in the bedroom. Yeah. Better stay away from there. He's got a shotgun. Cover that side, Frank. Yeah. All right, Rayburn. Open the door slow and throw that gun out here. Rayburn, we'll tell you once more. We know you're in there. Now throw that gun out here. He's not coming out, Joe. All right, cop. Here it is. I don't want no trouble, you hear? No no trouble. You got the gun. All right, come on. Get up, Rayburn, on your feet. You too, Miss Keene. Come on out of there. Don't shoot. Please don't. We didn't mean nothing. Don't, don't shoot. We give up. Well, come on out of there. Keep your hands in your head there. I'll get him. Wasn't anything else I could do. Had to do what they tell me. Come in here with that gun and wanted something to cut those handcuffs off with. Had to do what they said. Yeah, sure. They'd have killed me if I didn't. I know it. They'd have killed me. A couple of more minutes and we'd have had it made. Just a couple more, more minutes, that's all. That's all we needed. Though we got up north, he never got us. We'd have had it made. One more big job. That's what you said. One more and we'd be through. Well, wise guy, where are we now? Right where he said you'd be. What? You're through. <laughs> The story you've just heard was true. The names were changed to protect the innocent. On January 18th, trial was held in Department 87, Superior Court of the State of California, in and for the County of Los Angeles. In a moment, the results of that trial. Now, here is our star, Jack Webb. Thank you, George Fenneman. Did you know that Chesterfield shows up year after year as first choice of young America? Now, that's based on a survey made in 274 colleges and universities. The reason is we're first with premium quality in both regular and king size. Chesterfield, it's a good mild smoke with a wonderful taste. Chester Lloyd Rayburn and Vincent Robert Parker were tried and found guilty on nine counts of robbery in the first degree. They were sentenced to the state penitentiary for the term prescribed by law. Robbery in the first degree is punishable by imprisonment for a period of not less than five years. Lillian Keene, alias Dolly Keene, was tried and convicted of being an accessory. She received sentence as prescribed by law. Aiding a principal in a felony is punishable by imprisonment in the state penitentiary for a period of not more than five years. Ladies and gentlemen, in the fight against an old enemy, polio, medical research has armed us with a powerful new weapon, gamma globulin. Used soon enough, it can prevent the paralyzing effects of polio. But first, you must furnish the raw material, blood. Doctors urgently need your donation of blood to make gamma globulin. So call the Red Cross. Please don't put it off. It's too important. Call the Red Cross tomorrow and make an appointment to give blood. Dragnet, a series of authentic cases from official files. Technical advice comes from the office of Chief of Police W.H. Parker, Los Angeles Police Department. Technical advisors Captain Jack Donahoe, Sergeant Marty Wynn, Sergeant Vance Brasher. Heard tonight were Ben Alexander, Peggy Weber, Peter Leeds. Script by John Robinson. Music by Walter Schumann. Hal Gibney speaking. For a million laughs, tune in Chesterfield's Martin and Lewis show Tuesday on this same NBC station. And sound off for Chesterfield's. Either regular or king size, you'll find premium quality Chesterfield's much milder. Chesterfield is best for you. Chesterfield has brought you Dragnet transcribed from Los Angeles. Now, new Fatima has the tip for your lips. Fatima tips of perfect cork. King size for natural filtering. Fatima quality for a much better flavor and aroma. So remember, new Fatima has the tip for your lips. Fatima. See how smooth they are. Remember, Fatima is made by the makers of Chesterfield. Liggett and Myers. 
one of tobacco's most respected names. Sound off for Chesterfield. Chesterfield is best for you. First cigarette with premium quality in both regular and king size. Chesterfield brings you Dragnet. Ladies and gentlemen, the story you are about to hear is true. The names have been changed to protect the innocent. You're a detective sergeant. You're assigned a robbery detail. Somewhere in your city, a man is endangering the lives of your fellow officers. His weapon, a ten-cent piece. Your job, get him. Years ahead of them all. Chesterfield is years ahead of them all. The quality contrast between Chesterfield and other leading brands is a revealing story. Recent chemical analyses give an index of good quality for the country's six leading cigarette brands. The index of good quality table, which is a ratio of high sugar to low nicotine, shows Chesterfield quality highest. Chesterfield quality highest. Fifteen percent higher than its nearest competitor. Chesterfield quality highest. Thirty-one percent higher than the average of the five other leading brands. Yes, Chesterfield is first with premium quality in both regular and king size. Don't you want to try a cigarette with a record like this? Chesterfield. Dragnet, the documented drama of an actual crime. For the next 30 minutes, in cooperation with the Los Angeles Police Department... You will travel step by step on the side of the law through an actual case transcribed from official police files. From beginning to end, from crime to punishment, Dragnet is the story of your police force in action. It was Wednesday, May 6th. It was warm in Los Angeles. We were working the day watch out of robbery detail. My partner's Frank Smith. The boss is Captain Didion. My name's Friday. We were on our way back from the drunk tank, and it was 8.34 a.m. when we got to the first floor, the interview room. Okay, you want to sit down here? Yeah. I want a head. Either one, you got an aspirin? No, I'm sorry. How about a cigarette? Yeah, here you go. Here, I'll get that for you. Yeah, thanks. Thanks. Boy, what a head. I feel like I'm going to fall off and roll around on the floor. Yeah. Last time I got this tank was in the South Pacific. Natives brewed up some stuff. Tasted like torpedo juice. Took me three days to get over that. Hey, what am I in here for? You don't remember? No, not good. A lot of fog. Seems like the last thing I remember is a lot of sirens, fire engines, cops. A lot of noise. After that, there's a big nothing. What'd I do? Well, he called the police department, told them an officer had been shot trying to stop a holdup. Then he called the fire department, told them the Times building was on fire. You're kidding. No, he's not. Well, I really got it this time, haven't I? Yes, sir, you got yourself a problem. Why'd you do it? I'm trying to think. Seems like the girl I was with made some remark about L.A. being a dull town. I told her she just didn't know the place. I think that's when I started calling. Hey, this in the morning papers? I don't think so. Why? I really got trouble if it is. You arrest the girl? No. Nope. Thanks for small favors. What? Either you married? Yeah, he is. Oh, he'll know what I mean. I don't think my wife would be crazy about who I was out with last night. No? Yeah. Wife thinks I was at a sales meeting. Hope she doesn't find out. Hey, where was I when you picked me up? Well, according to the arrest report, you were in a phone booth trying to have the National Guard called out. <sighs> I got to join something. This is the worst one I've ever pulled. Where do you live, Harris? Apartment over on 9th. Didn't they get that last night? No. All you tell the arresting officers was your name. I didn't give anybody any trouble, did I? I mean, I didn't start a fight, nothing like that, huh? No. You didn't cause any trouble until they got you down here. Down here? I didn't hit anybody, did I? 
Well, you tried, but you didn't make it. Uh, you guys are detectives, aren't you? That's right. How come they send you fellas down here? I caused that much trouble? How long have you been in town, Harris? Since I got out of the service. I think about six years. You said you were a salesman. Who do you work for? Connington and Michaels. How long have you been with them? Since I got out, went to work for them right after I was discharged. Ever been arrested before? No. Oh, a couple of traffic tickets. You know, nothing serious. Hey, what's all this about anyway? Well, you guys act, you're trying to prove something more than just a drunk rap. What's the pitch? Well, there's been some fellow around town who's been making calls like you made last night. He's been making a lot of them. They've all been phony, but we got to send out equipment. Well, you figure maybe it was me, huh? Looks like it might have been. We have to check it out. No, I guess I made the ones last night. You say I did, but that's it. Hey, you mind if I take another cigarette? Yeah, here. Help yourself. Thanks. Here's a match. Thanks. <sighs> Thanks. No, I'm sorry. You guys got the wrong fellow. No. Yeah. You can check me. You'll find out you got the wrong man. Uh-huh. How come this is so important? You must get a lot of phony calls. How come this is so big? A lot of reasons make it that way. Yeah? Don't see it myself. Lots of times I see fire engines go out and false alarms. Doesn't look like it does any harm. Do you remember how many units were with you last night? No. Must have been a lot of them. Well, 15 police cars answered the officer's need help call before they could get a code 4 out on it. There were five units of fire department equipment there. I suppose that equipment had been needed someplace else on a real call. Yeah, see what you mean. It's not just the equipment being out of service. Every time a unit rolls on a call, there's the chance that somebody's going to get hurt. That's what you built last night. Look, I said I was sorry. If there's anything more I can tell you. Any chance of me getting an aspirin around here? There's a doctor here. All he had to do was ask for it. We'll check on our way out. All right, come on, Harris. You can go back now. Yeah. Hey, just a minute. What's the name of the friend you were out with last night? You're going to have to drag her into this? We've got to check your story. I hate to have you do that. The story will stand. It isn't that. What is it, then? I told you I was married. Yeah. This gets in the papers. I'm going to have a bigger headache. Is that right? Yeah, my wife won't understand about last night. Well, that's too bad, Harris. She just won't understand, that's all. Well, how's that? Well, she's president of the Neighborhood Temperance Club. a.m. James Harris was returned to his cell to be held to answer charges of violation of Section 4127A Municipal Code. Frank and I called the woman he'd said he was with the night before. She verified the story that he'd given us. Further investigation of Harris proved that he couldn't possibly have been the suspect we were looking for. We drove back to the office to talk with Captain Didion. For the past three weeks, both the police and fire departments had been getting a number of false calls, apparently from the same person. The officers on the complaint board told us that they had gotten so that they almost recognized the voice of the caller. They told us that it sounded like a male voice and the caller could be middle-aged. The person had no noticeable accent or speech peculiarities. They tried to hold the suspect on the phone when they were certain that it was the same caller, but they'd been unable to do so. Most of the calls the suspect put through were of the emergency type. As a result, we had to send men and equipment to the reported scene, even though we might think that the call was a false one. The calls averaged six a week during the period that the suspect had been operating. In cooperation with the members of the fire department, Frank and I were assigned to try to apprehend the person making the calls. The operation was simple. The individual would call the board, give an address that we couldn't check out, and then describe what had happened. The address given was usually a corner, so that it was impossible for us to make verifying phone calls. In each instance, as soon as the suspect would report the disturbance, he would hang up. The operation was simple and untraceable. 11.17 11.17 a.m. We finished talking with Captain Didion and left his office. All right, Skipper. Check you later. Boy, he's in a great mood this morning, you know. Well, do you blame him? The way this thing's going, we're no nearer to breaking it. Yeah. George figures the guy who's doing this is going to be around to watch all the excitement. That's got to be the reason he's making the call, so he can get his kicks. Well, well he figures he's got to be in the crowd someplace. So? Well, let's try to get a hold of the newspaper pictures. Try to check them. Find one person who's at the scene. Might work. Well, it's someplace to start, isn't it? It's a hot shot. I get it. Gonna have to wait. Bank robbery in progress. Eleven twenty-six a.m. We took the call car and started for the bank. Before we arrived, Control One put out a code four on the call. No further assistance needed. It was another false alarm. We completed our investigation and on the way back to the office, we answered an ambulance follow-up call two blocks from the bank. A squad car had been on the way to answer the robbery call at the bank. It had been traveling north on Spring Street. An ambulance had been making an emergency trip to Georgia Street Receiving Hospital. It had been traveling west on 7th Street. Both had been rolling code 3. 
Neither one of them heard the siren of the other unit. Neither of them knew of the other's presence. Both had hit the intersection at the same time. The police car, in an attempt to avoid the ambulance, had swerved. It had caromed off the side of the larger vehicle and then plowed through traffic and hit a traffic signal pole head on. The car had hit the pole at the seam of the left front fender and the body. The police unit had been split wide open. The officer on the passenger side of the car had been thrown against the windshield. The other one had been thrown into the steering wheel and then out of the car onto the curb ten feet from the wrecked unit. The ambulance, after being hit, had spun across the intersection on two wheels, hit the curbing and tipped over. Only the fact that it had hit a streetlight pole had stopped it from going on through the pedestrian traffic on the sidewalk. It had come to rest laying on its side at the southeast corner of the intersection. The driver of the ambulance had been thrown clear of the truck. The patient in the rear and the attendant with him had been thrown about in the interior of the unit, and when we got there, they were lying in a mass of wreckage. The intersection was covered with gasoline and oil. A traffic officer was attempting to do what he could for the survivors. Let us through here. Please Police officers, back. please All right, through. sir, if you'll just step back there. I'm sorry, keep back, please. Friday and Smith, Central Robbery. Oh, I'm sorry, Jake's in traffic. They alive? I don't know, both unconscious, pretty bad. I didn't want to move them. How about an ambulance? I put the call in right away. Did you call in about this oil on the streets here? No, I didn't yet. Well, you better get a call in, don't you think? Have them warn all approaching units. Street slippery, have them approach with caution, huh? All right. Thank you. Sure is a mess, isn't it? Doesn't look like they got much of a chance, does it? How about that ambulance? A couple of officers there now. I guess they're looking after him. Let's check the driver. How about it, Joe? Well, that ambulance better get here quick. Yeah? He isn't going to last long. The ambulance arrived, and the injured men were removed to Georgia Street Receiving Hospital. The police garage sent out a wrecker, and the damaged vehicles were removed. The intersection was cleaned of the gasoline and oil, and inside of an hour and a half, the corner was handling traffic as usual. The only indication of the wreck left on the scene was a broken hubcap lying in a puddle of dirty water in the gutter. Two police officers had been seriously injured in the accident. Frank and I checked the immediate neighborhood for witnesses. We found a newspaper vendor who had a stand a block from the scene. He identified himself as George Kennedy. He told us what he knew of the wreck. I saw the whole thing, the whole thing. Yes, sir, if you tell us what you saw, please. Well, my stand is just up the street there. See, you can see it on the corner. Uh-huh. Well, I was checking stock. A lot of new magazines came in this morning. I was going through them, you know, marking them up, going through them. Yes, sir. I was just standing there fixing up the new magazines when all of a sudden I hear these sirens. Sound like it's coming from all directions. I see. Then I saw that their ambulance coming down 7th Street. I stopped what I was doing to see where the ambulance was going, and I heard the crash. Mm, terrible. Did you see the accident, Kennedy? Well, not at first, no. I saw it right after I heard the brakes. I, I didn't really see it at first, you know, just after I heard the brakes. And then, then I looked up and saw what was happening, and I started to run down there. Mm -hmm. Saw the cars all smashed up. Right after that, I saw you guys come up, and then the other ambulance. And that's about all. Nothing more, I tell you, I guess. Anything I can do to help? Anything at all? No, sir. How about the officers in the car? Are they all right? I heard one of them was dead. Any truth in that? No, sir. Both of them are in pretty bad shape. Awful thing to happen. Biggest crash I ever saw. Just awful. Uh-huh. Well, thanks, Kennedy, for your help. No, oh, it wasn't anything. Glad to do what I could. Anything else I can do if you guys just let me know. All right, Kennedy. Thanks very much. Oh, not at all. Glad to do it. Sure, terrible thing. No need for it. Such a waste. Yes, yeah, sir. If they die, it'll almost seem like they was murdered, won't it? Yes, sir. From here, it looks that way. Frank and I drove back to the office. We checked with the doctor at the PNF ward at Georgia Street Receiving Hospital. The doctor told us that the injured officers were still in critical condition and as yet had not regained consciousness. We checked with the complaint board, and the officer who'd answered the call about the supposed bank robbery told us that he thought that the caller was the same suspect we were looking for. With Captain Didion and Captain Hagenbaugh in communications, we worked out a plan to attempt to apprehend the caller. The next time he put in a call, the officer answering the complaint would attempt to keep him on the line with questions regarding the complaint until we could get to the vicinity and start a search for him. We would be notified by a hotshot call immediately. Two days passed without the caller making a move. On Saturday, May 8th, we got a call from Georgia Street Receiving Hospital. Yeah, Doc. Uh-huh. Well, how about the families? They've been told you? Uh-huh. Well, I imagine they're pretty happy about it, huh? Yeah, well, thanks for letting us know. Right, Doc. Bye. Doc Hall? Yeah. Both officers are going to be okay. They're doing what they can for him. Hot shot. Now, maybe we can do something for him. Suspect's on the phone now. The 
caller had told the officer on the complaint board that he wanted to report an attempted robbery at the corner of 6th and Spring Streets. He said there was a shooting as the operator of the store involved had tried to stop the holdup man. The man on the phone had requested police assistance and the dispatching of an ambulance to the scene. The officer so far had managed to keep the caller on the phone while he let us know of the call. Another officer had called the store and verified that there was no holdup as reported. Frank and I left the office and proceeded to the area code 2. We felt that if the suspect heard the siren of a unit, it might alarm him and we'd lose him. We arrived at the corner four minutes after we'd gotten the hot shot. Frank took one side of the street and I took the other. We worked our way down 6th Street, spotting all of the stores with public telephones. It took us a little over three minutes to cover the street for one block east. We met back at the corner and started down Spring Street. As time went on, our chances of the suspect staying on the phone dwindled. Twelve minutes had passed since the suspect had placed the call. I was covering the east side of Spring Street, and I was almost to the corner of 7th when I walked into a store to check the phone booth just inside the door. The voice was familiar. It was George Kennedy, the proprietor of the corner newsstand. Sure, I can see you. No, my name don't matter. All the town sees you get an ambulance here right away. You don't, this poor man's going to bleed you to death. Well, certainly, he's right here, right in the same room. All right, come on out of there. Hey, what's this all about? Come on out of that phone booth. What right you got to tell me what to do? No, don't hang up that phone, Kennedy. You got no business breaking into my phone call. All right, you come out of that booth, will you, right now? And I stand right there. Hello. Yeah, no, this is Friday. Yeah, we got him. Uh-huh. Yeah, well, as soon as I pick up Smith, we'll be right in. Hold it up, Kennedy. Stop that man. Hey, stop him. Hey, Mr. Watson. You all right, mister? Yeah, did you see where that old man went? No, sorry, mister. He ran into the crowd over there. I wasn't watching him. I thought sure you were going to get hit by that car. Hey, Joe, what are you doing out in the middle of the street? Well, I had him. It's George Kennedy, the guy with the newsstand. You mean the guy we talked to the other day? That's right. Well, at least we know who we're after. That's a help. Yeah, maybe. we got to get him fast now. Yeah? He knows we're after him. We went back to our unit and got out a broadcast on George Kennedy. After that, we checked the immediate neighborhood, but we were unable to find the suspect. We checked at his newsstand, but the people in the surrounding stores were unable to give us the exact address where he lived. We arranged for a stakeout on the newsstand, then we went back to the city hall and called the city clerk. We asked him to check the records for the license issued to Kennedy. The clerk's office told us they would check their files immediately and call us back. We ran the name George Kennedy through R&I, but he had no previous criminal record. We checked with Captain Didion while we waited for the call back from the city clerk's office. I get it. Robbie Friday. Yeah? Who? Well, wait a minute. Wait a minute. Hello. Well, that's all we need. What is it? That was Kennedy. Says he knows we want him, and he said we better forget all about it, that we'll never get him. Yeah? Says we might as well give up. You are listening to Dragnet. The authentic story of your police force in action. Don't you want to try a cigarette with a record like this? The first choice of young America, according to a recent survey made in 274 colleges. Chesterfield, the first cigarette with premium quality in both regular and king size. Chesterfield, the cigarette with highest quality, proven by chemical analyses to have higher quality than the five other leading brands. Chesterfield. And first, to give you this report. A doctor has been making thorough examinations of a group of Chesterfield smokers every two months for a full year. And he reports no adverse effects to the nose, throat, and sinuses from smoking Chesterfield. Try Chesterfield. Buy a carton. Much milder Chesterfield is America's best cigarette buy. local broadcast was gotten out on Kennedy. The city clerk called back and gave us the home address listed on his application for a vendor's license. We checked out the address, a rooming house on 9th Street, and the landlady told us that Kennedy was not at home, that she hadn't seen him all day. She was able to give us the address of his sister, and after Frank and I arranged for a stakeout on the rooming house, we drove over to see the sister. She lived in a small frame house in the Hollywood area. I suppose I knew that it had to happen. I guess there wasn't any way to avoid it. Ma'am? About George. He's sick. I guess you know that. Yes, ma'am. Has he ever spent any time in an institution of any sort, would you know? No. There were times when I thought about it. We used to talk, try to figure out what was the best thing. 
Somehow we just couldn't bring ourselves to do it, to commit him. You say we, ma'am. Who do you mean? Oh, me and Harold. Harold's my brother. He's the baby of the family. And what the doctor said, I guess, in a way, Harold's the cause of the whole thing. Way back, I mean. Ma'am? Well, I, I can't deny it. We talked to doctors about George, you know, psychologists. Yes, ma'am. He said that George had a compulsion complex. Came from when he was a little boy. That he resented the attention that the folks showed Harold. It's unfortunate Harold was sickly when he was little and he needed more attention. Guess George didn't understand. Mm-hmm. You any idea where he might be now, ma'am? No, you tried the place over on night? That's where he lives. Yes, Miss Carroll, we checked the place. Landlady said she hadn't seen your brother all day. Oh, well, if he's not there, I don't know where he could be. No, I wouldn't have the slightest idea. Could you tell us if your brother had any close friends in the city, anyone he might go to? None at all. I'm sorry I can't be of more help. Well, do you have a recent picture of your brother, ma'am? Well, yes, I think I can find one for you. Why do you want it? Well, we needed to find him, Miss Carroll. Oh, well, I have one that was taken this year at George's birthday party. I took it with one of those cameras that develop right away, you know. Yes, ma'am. What if you'd be kind enough to get it for us? Surely, I think it's in the desk. I'll get it for you. you. Oh, excuse me a minute. Surely. Hello? Oh, yes. What? Uh Uh-huh, they're here now. I don't know what to think. Yes. Yes, I know, but it's too late for that now. The important thing is to find him before he does something more. Yeah. Well, I'll call you back. I don't want to keep the officers waiting. All right, bye. That was Harold. He heard about George. Mm -hmm. It's possible your brother might go over to his place. No, that's the last place he'd go. What if you could give us his address, please? Well, sure, I can give it to you. I know that George wouldn't go there, though. Why are you so sure, ma'am? I told you about the birthday party. Well, George and Harold were there, just a family sort of thing. At least it started out that way. The way it finished was awful. George and Harold got into a big fight. They were always arguing. Uh, what if you get that picture for us now, Miss Carroll? Oh, yes, right away. It's here someplace. Harold just said that we should have put George in an institution a long time ago. Should have had him helped. I guess he's right. I guess it's all my fault. Why do you say that, ma'am? Well, it was me that didn't want George committed. I was the one who fought against it. I was so sure that everything would work out all right. Oh, here it is. Yes, ma'am. That's George. He's got a paper hat on. He's come out of one of those little snapper things. George liked things like that, kid things. I guess he never grew up. Yes, ma'am. Always lived in a dream world. Made it up himself. Thought that everybody was persecuting him, that people were after him. It's so silly it wasn't true. I'm afraid it is, ma'am. What? We're after him. We got the address of George Kennedy's brother, and Frank and I drove over to talk to him. He told us that he didn't have the slightest idea where his brother might be. We called the office and arranged for a stakeout on homes of the sister and the brother in the event that Kennedy might try to contact them. 6.30 p.m., we met with Captain Didion and a psychiatrist from Georgia Street Receiving Hospital. Psychiatrist said that after hearing our report on Kennedy's actions, that he might have a strong compulsion complex. And as a result of events that morning, he could have a violent resentment of any type of authority. Two days passed. We got more leads and we ran them down. They went no place. Tuesday, May 11th. 12.51 12.51 a.m. I get it. Robbery Friday. Yes, ma'am. Now, well, when was that? Yeah. All right, Miss Carroll. We'll take care of it. Yes, ma'am. By the way, thank you. It's Kennedy's sister. Says he just called her. Yeah? Said he was over by Westlake Park that he was going to commit suicide. a.m. We called the complaint board and told them what had happened. They contacted all available units and asked them to proceed to Westlake Park, Code 2. Frank and I drove to the area. By the time we got there, several units had responded to the call. As yet, none of them had seen Kennedy. From the bridge on Wilshire, two men had been watching the lake, and up to the time we got there, they'd seen no activity on the surface of the water. 1.30 a.m. Frank and I started to go through the park. A heavy fog had risen from the lake, and visibility was dropping fast. You see anything? No. Now let's head down toward the lake, huh? Yeah. This way. Gee, it's getting cold. 
I should have worn a heavier coat. Hold it a minute. See him? Yeah. Just sitting there. Doesn't see us, though. All right. You take him from that side. I'll go this way. Watch it, huh? Right. Who's there? Who is it? I know you're there. Who is it? I got a gun. Are you coming any closer now? I'm going to shoot. I can see you, you know. I can see you. You get away from here. You get away right now or I'm going to shoot. All right, I warned you. Put that gun down, Kennedy. Yeah, I knew you were there. I knew it. You thought you could sneak up on me and get me and I wouldn't know it, huh? That's what you thought, ain't it? Huh? Ain't it? Nobody's trying to sneak up on you, Kennedy. Nobody's trying to hurt you. Yeah, that's what you say, but I know different. I know. Who are you? Come on, I know anyway, so you might as well tell me. Who are you? You know who I am, George. Joe Friday. I'm your friend. Now, you know that, don't you? Ain't anybody that's my friend. Ain't anybody. Nobody I can trust. Why should I trust you? Come on, tell me. Why should I trust you? You're a cop, ain't you? Ain't you? You know that, George. We met before. You know I'm your friend, too, don't you? No, you ain't. You ain't my friend. You want to take me away and lock me up? It's not true, George. I just want to talk to you. Just sit and talk, that's all. You stay away from me. I'm not going to tell you again. I don't want you near me. Now, take it easy, George. No, you ain't going to get me. I'm going to get away from you. Away from all of you. All right, wait a minute. Yeah. I know all about you. I know you ain't going to get me. I can't swim. Somebody help me. Help. All right, Kennedy, take it easy. All right, come on now. You're all right. You're all right. Come on. Come on, get up here. Now, you're all right now. Anybody would understand. Ain't anybody. You okay, Joe? Yeah. I'll shake him. He's clean. I couldn't, couldn't even get a gun. Couldn't even get a gun. Never could do anything right. Just nothing ever went right. Wasn't anybody that understood. Nobody that knew what I wanted. Nobody cared about me. Nobody cared. You're wrong about that. Huh? We do. The story you've just heard was true. The names were changed to protect the innocent. On September 21st, trial was held in Department 97, Superior Court of the State of California, in and for the County of Los Angeles. In a moment, the results of that trial. Now, here is our star, Jack Webb. Thank you, George Fenneman. I sure hope you were listening real close to what George Fenneman had to say tonight, because it proves what I always tell you. You can't beat the premium quality you get in Chesterfield, regular or king size. I'd like you to try Chesterfield's. They're much milder, and they have a wonderful taste. The case of George Hoyt Kennedy was referred to the city attorney. Due to the mental condition of the suspect, the case was then referred to the psychopathic detail at Georgia Street Receiving Hospital. After due process in Superior Court, the suspect was committed to a mental institution for treatment. Ladies and gentlemen... We wish to thank the editors and readers of TV Radio Mirror Magazine for their awards to Dragnet, and their sixth annual award issue now on sale at your newsstand. You have just heard Dragnet, a series of authentic cases from official files. Technical advice comes from the office of Chief of Police W.H. Parker, Los Angeles Police Department. Technical advisors, Captain Jack Donahoe, Sergeant Marty Wynn, Sergeant Vance Brasher. Heard tonight were Ben Alexander, Herb Ellis, Ralph Moody. Script by John Robinson. Music by Walter Schumann. Hal Gibney speaking. For a million laughs, tune in Chesterfield's Martin and Lewis show Tuesday on this same NBC station. And sound off for Chesterfield's. Either regular or king size you'll find premium quality Chesterfield much milder. Chesterfield is best for you. Chesterfield has brought you Dragnet transcribed from Los Angeles. Now, new Fatima has the tip for your lips. Fatima tips of perfect cork. King size for natural filtering. Fatima quality for a much better flavor and aroma. So remember... New Fatima has the tip for your lips. Fatima, 
See how smooth they are. Remember, Fatima is made by the makers of Chesterfield, Liggett and Myers, one of tobacco's most respected names. Sound off for Chesterfield. Chesterfield is best for you. First cigarette with premium quality in both regular and king size. Chesterfield brings you Dragnet. Ladies and gentlemen, the story you are about to hear is true. The names have been changed to protect the innocent. You're a detective sergeant. You're assigned a burglary detail. A string of safe burglaries breaks out in your city. In the past two months, 35 safes have been broken into. You know there's more than one man in the operation. You've got no lead to the thieves' identity. Your job? Get them. Years ahead of them all. Chesterfield is years ahead of them all. The quality contrast between Chesterfield and other leading brands is a revealing story. Recent chemical analyses give an index of good quality for the country's six leading cigarette brands. The index of good quality table, which is a ratio of high sugar to low nicotine, shows Chesterfield quality highest. Chesterfield quality highest. Fifteen percent higher than its nearest competitor. Chesterfield quality highest. Thirty-one percent higher than the average of the five other leading brands. Yes, Chesterfield is first with premium quality in both regular and king size. Don't you want to try a cigarette with a record like this? Chesterfield. Dragnet, the documented drama of an actual crime. For the next 30 minutes, in cooperation with the Los Angeles Police Department, you will travel step by step on the side of the law through an actual case transcribed from official police files. From beginning to end, from crime to punishment, Dragnet is the story of your police force in action. It was Tuesday, August 18th. It was warm in Los Angeles. We were working the day watch out of burglary detail. My partner's Frank Smith. The boss is Thad Brown, chief of detectives. My name's Friday. It was 1.34 p.m. when we got to the second floor of the central jail building. The crime lab. Couldn't sleep last night. Faye and I had another beef. Oh, what about this time? Cards, you know. Can I ask them? Yeah? Folks next door came over after dinner and we got to playing. They play real good. Mm-hmm. And it wasn't long before we were really getting schlock. What? You know, schlock. Beaten. Oh, terrible. Yeah. Last hand, they go down right away, Joe. Seemed like everything I threw them, they could use. Picked up everything. I I couldn't do anything right. Just kept building up Mel's, they did. Big thing for us was to get out as quick as we could. You know, get the hand over with? Yeah. Faye wasn't doing any good. Finally, I still don't know how they let it happen. I got enough points to go down, so... I ask Faye if it's okay. Uh-huh. You have to do that, you know, ask your partner's permission yeah, to get uh-huh. the hand over. Yeah. You know that? Well, I've played it a couple of times. Yeah, with you, remember? Oh, that's right. Well, you might not believe it, but you know what she said? No. Just sat there and said she didn't think it was time. Is that right? Yeah. I know it's kind of picky, but there they were, the other kids just piling up points, schlocking us all over the place. Schlocking. Yeah, hand went around a couple of more times. Each time I ask Faye if she wants to get out, each time you know what she says? No. That's it? No. Well, what finally happened? Oh, the other folks ran out of cards. Wasn't any more play, so they got out. 3,600 points. And I found out why Faye didn't want to quit. Why? Had a deuce. What? A deuce, a two, you know? Yeah. Well, she said she didn't want to get caught with it. Yeah, well, we better get started, huh? Uh, wait a minute, that's not the worst of it, let me tell you. All right. All night we're playing, see? All night. I'm saving cards, you know. I'm like tens. Like to get tens. I save tens. Yeah, I guess everybody saves tens. Well, I save more than other guys. We get all through, and you know what? We find out there are only seven tens in the deck. One of them's missing. All night, there's seven tens. Well, that's dreadful. Well, 
I tell you. You're a schlock. Schlock. Didn't sleep a wink. <laughs> Friday? Yeah, Ray. Back here. Girls out to lunch. Come on back. Hi, how's it going, Ray? Mm, moving around, that's about all. Hot out, huh? Yeah, paper says it's going to go over 90 today. Too hot for me. Yep. Yeah. Well, how are you coming on the job this morning? Just finishing up. Looks like the rest of them. Yeah. Got some pictures here. Take a look. Mm-hmm. Here's pictures of the marks they left on the door this morning. Mm-hmm. See those two long scratches on the wood? Yeah, here? Yeah, now, over here, here's a picture from the Argosy Manufacturing Company's door. Mm-hmm. See? Yeah. Same two marks. Pretty safe bet to figure that both doors were open to the same pry bar. Yeah, same type of entrance made this time, huh? Yeah, just the one mark on the door. They know what they're doing. Insert the bar, hit it once, and the door opens. Mm-hmm. How about the safe? What do you got on that, right? Here. This is the picture we got of the room, same as the others. Standard rip job, nothing different there. How about marks? No, no help there. Here's the pictures. Looks like the same tool that was used on the other jobs. Did you find anything else, Ray? No. At least nothing that helps. Leighton Prince picked up a couple from the safe, along with the manager of the place. Nothing else would give us anything. Well, I'd say that was the same bunch. Yeah, either that or they're lending their tools to the boys in the neighborhood. Yeah, well, that isn't likely. Cigarette, Ray? Yeah, thanks. Ray? There's the light. Ray? Thanks. Really leaning on you guys for this one, huh? Yeah, Skipper's taking a lot of heat. What's this make for him? 34, 35? 35, six months. Any nearer to him? No, not much. Got anything to tell how many men there are? It'd be hard to say for sure. The way they work, figures about three or four, maybe. Yeah, that's the way it looks. Take that number to pull out the operation as smooth as they're doing it, though, Ray. You got anything at all to work on? Well, we checked around town. There aren't any rumbles. One of the tightest gangs that we've seen in a long time. Doesn't seem like anybody outside knows what's going on. We mm-hmm. checked the places around. Nobody's spending a lot of money they can't account for. How much did they take so far? Well, what they got this morning, let's see, it comes to a little under $36,000, on not it, Frank? Yeah. What about you, Ray? You turn up anything we can use? Nothing that points any place. We know how they got in, how they hit the safe. That isn't going to help much. Same M.O. as the others. You haven't got any idea who they are, huh? No, nothing. Had any idea who they are, we could maybe use the anthracene on their tools. Yeah, that's great. We've got to find the tools before we use that. we got no idea where they plant them. Mm-hmm. Seems that one of your informants would be able to come up with something on them. Yeah, you'd think so. We've checked them all, Ray. No leads to the gang. Doesn't seem there's anybody in town that knows who they are. Anybody new operating around? No, we checked that out, too. We've had the stats office make so many runs that they're wearing out the cards. M.O. isn't new. It's been used before, but all the possibles have been checked out. Stuff from Brereton up at CII, the other lead from the APBs, they've all been cleared. Now, we got just what we started with, the gang working when they want to, where they want to, and there's nothing we can do about it. Well, I wish there was more I could do to help out. Yeah. And i got to get back to work. Got some precipitant tests. Homicide wants this afternoon. Yeah, well, we'll see you later, Ray. Right. You want this stuff booked? Yeah, we'll take care of it. Okay. Excuse me a minute. Yeah. Crime lab, Pinker. Yeah? Yeah, they're both here. Which one? Yeah, hold on. Joe? Yeah? You, office. Thanks. Friday. Oh, yeah, Chandler. Uh-huh. Wendy call. Yeah, well, what's that number? Four, four? Right. Yeah, I'll call him right away. Right. Bye. Chandler, huh? Yeah, Don Jackson called. Said he wanted to get in touch with us. Jackson? Doesn't ring any bells. It's the guy we pinched last month. Remember? Looked like the guy who was in on the service station jobs. Oh, yeah, I remember. Guy with the wax mustache, huh? Mm-hmm. Hello, Don Jackson? Well, could I speak to him, please? Don, it's Joe Friday. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, well, it's 1.47 now. Take us about ten minutes. How about two? All right, fine. Yeah, we know where it is. Right. We'll see you there. All right, bye. What's he want? He wants to see us about the rip jobs. Yeah? Says he's got a rumble on him. Don Jackson had been a suspect in a series of service station burglaries we'd investigated. He'd been picked up and interrogated, but investigation showed that he couldn't have been involved in the thefts. Since he'd been released, we'd heard nothing from him, and as far as we knew, he'd gone back to his job in a downtown clothing store. From what he told me on the phone, he had some information about the current series of safe burglaries. 1.48 p.m., Frank and I left the crime lab and drove over to the store where Jackson worked. He managed to get relieved, and he took us to a small coffee shop near the store. We sat down and ordered some coffee, and Jackson told us what he knew about the burglaries. 
Now, I could be wrong about this. I don't think so. But outside, it could be. Uh-huh. Donnie, you got any one reason for figuring that the Scott fellow's tied in with the jobs? Oh, well, nothing I can put my finger on, you know. Just that the guy's never done a full day's work in his life. Don't think he knows what a callus is. Yet he's always loaded, always got a roll. It's real, too. Not like them you see sometimes with a big bill on the outside and ones in the middle. Now, this guy's loaded, you know? Yeah. Where'd you meet him? Well, I was sitting in a bar down the street one night, having a belt before dinner. We got to talking. Ended up eating together that night. You remember when this was, Don, when you first met him? Well, let me see. Uh, yeah, it was the day I got the trench coat from England. Now, let me see. Uh, that make it about uh, August 4th. Yeah. Yeah, it was the night I got the coat. Come to think of it, that's what got us to talk in the coat. Well, I don't understand. Well, you see, I got this here coat. I had it sent over from England. That's a real beauty. All kinds of linings and wind straps in the sleeves. It's great, you know? Uh-huh. Well, I had him send this coat to the store. Got down the 4th. I had it with me that night. And Scotty noticed it. We got to talking about clothes and went to dinner. He asked me how much coat cost. I told him run about 40, maybe 50 bucks. He asked me if I could get one for him, and I told him sure. It'd take a couple of weeks. Uh-huh. Well, he asked me to send a letter to my friend, Airmail Special, and ask him to send the coat over by Express. I told him I would, and then he asked me if I wanted to pay me then. Yeah. I told him, no, wait till I knew just how much a coat was going to run. You know, duty and postage and all that. Yeah, I know. Well, he said that'd be okay with him. I saw him a couple of times after that, and every time he'd ask about the coat, I told him that was in the works, you know. Mm -hmm. Well, finally got the coat. It was beautiful. Never saw the guy again. I'm out 46 bucks. Crummy Scott, he'll leave me with that coat. My own money, too. 46 bucks. I don't make enough to lose that kind of money, you know. Well, that's too bad, Jackson. But why do you figure this Scott had anything to do with the burglaries? Well, I just told you, for one thing, the money. Always had a lot, but he never had a job. No place to get the money. Not only that, but one night, well, I saw him. We were going out to dinner, and he said he couldn't quite make it then. That something had come up, that he had to take a rain check, you know? Uh-huh. Well, I asked him what had come up, what was so important. He said he had to see a guy over in East L.A., some sort of a business deal. he say what this deal was about? No, he wouldn't say. The next day, he shows up loaded. Got to roll on choke a horse. I asked him where to get it. I kid him about being one of the guys who ripped the safe in the Argosy plant. What did he say to that? Nothing. Just got real serious, you know? Asked me why I asked him that. What well, made me think he was in on the job? I kept telling him I didn't know anything about it. I was just kidding. He finally bought it and said it was okay, but he said I shouldn't go around saying things like that. All right, go ahead. Well, I got the coat and looked Scotty up to give it to him. Wouldn't pay for it. They lost the coat thing up or something. I don't know. Set the wrong size and I'm stuck with it. He wouldn't have anything to do with it. I figure since I ordered it for him, it ain't my fault that it's big. He should pay for it, you know, 46 bucks. Now, any way you look at it, I laid out the dough. I figured he should make good on it. He wouldn't do it. And I got sore, and I figured that maybe you'd like to know how he acted about the Argosy job. Lousy bum. 46 bucks that coat cost. You know where the Scott lives? No, I haven't got the slightest idea. But I got his phone number, though. I'll give you that. Can you give us a description on him? Sure, he's a sneaky little guy. No wonder the coat won't fit. A little bit of guy, you know. Yeah, now you say his full name is Leonard Scott, is that right? Yeah, crummy bum. I hope you get him. Well, we'll talk to him, Don. He knows something about it. I'll bet money on it. He knows. Say, I don't like to bring this up, but uh, you guys could do me a big favor, you know. What's that? Mm, no, I don't suppose you could. What is it, Don? You know anybody could use a size 52 trench coat? We continued to talk to Don Jackson. We got the description of Leonard Scott and his phone number. 3.15 p.m., we drove back to the city hall and checked the name through R&I. We came up with several possibles. The mug shots were pulled on them, and they were shown to Jackson. He was able to identify one of them as the man he told us about. The suspect had a record for burglary and had served two terms in the state penitentiary at San Quentin. He'd served his full term and was not on parole. We checked the last address on his convict registration card, and we found that he lived in a rooming house on West 11th Street. The phone number he'd given Jackson was the same as the one on the registration card. We drove over to talk to him. We found that he wasn't in his room, and from the landlady, we learned that he was expected back around 7 that evening. We checked his room in company with the landlady, and then we called the office and told them where we were in the event they had to contact us. We waited in the living room of the house for the suspect to return. 7.15 p.m. Sure. Yeah. He matches the description, doesn't he? Come on. Just a minute. You Leonard Scott? Yeah. Who are you? Police officers like to talk to you. What's this all about? It'd be better if we went up to your room. Oh. 
All right, come on up. Can't you give me some idea what this is all about? We'll talk to you about it. Go ahead. Open the door. Go ahead. Yeah. Okay, what's the pitch? You've been through it before. You're an ex-con. You know the pitch. You tell us what you do for a living? My work. Doing what? I'm a salesman. What do you sell? Different things. What's all this prove? You guys coming in here making like big men? I'm going straight. I work for a living. Now, either tell me what this is all about or get out of here. You remember what you were doing on August 4th? It's a long time ago. You remember what you were doing? You have to think about it. It's a long time ago. Right, you take your time. We'd like to know. August 4th, huh? Yeah. No, sorry, fellas. Can't remember a thing. How about the 5th? Same there. 6th? Nothing. How about the 7th of August? Well, I can give you a hand there. I had a dinner with a friend. Then we went to a show. I had a few drinks after, and then I came home. Who's the friend? Fella I know. What's his name? Why I gotta tell you that? We gotta check your alibi. What do I need an alibi for? I haven't done anything. My time's clean. I got nothing to explain to you. Now, maybe you can clear up a few things for us. I would like to help the cops out. What do you want to know? How come you remember what you were doing on August 7th? You got trouble with time before then, haven't you? What's so important with the dates? Maybe if you tell me what you're after, I can help you out. You quit being cagey, maybe I can come up with the answers. The Argosy Manufacturing Plant had their safe ripped open on that night. You look good for the job. Oh, you're out of your mind. Yeah, we got a witness who tells us you showed up with a pocket full of money the next day. You've fallen twice before for burglary. You can't account for your time before or after the day, but you happen to have an alibi for the night of the heist. You got no steady job, but you got plenty of money. Now, come off it, Scott. We got you nailed for the jobs, and you know it. You got a choice of giving us a hand on this thing, and it'll be marked down in your favor, or you can be a big man and stand for this thing alone. It's up to you. We'll play it any way you want. You figure you can make me for the jobs? Looks like it won't be too tough. You're in the middle, Scott. Why don't you cop out? What do I get for turning pink? I told you it'd be marked down that way. How about it, Scott? All right, I guess i got to go with you. I wasn't in on the jobs. I didn't really have anything to do with the casing. I helped a little bit. Not much, just a little. Where'd you figure in it? Once I worked as a lookout for him. Who are they? I can give you the names. I'd like to see you get them, lousy bunch. Hope you get them good. Make every one of them lousy bums the way they treated me. What do you mean by that? Big deal. Had the cops running around in circles. Big deal. Nothing. Work along with them. Everything would be fine. Big deal. How many of them are there? Four. Four real bums. They said they were going to take care of me. They told me I'd get my share of the money. Lousy liars. One job I was with them. After that, they told me I hadn't done enough to earn my way, that I wasn't any help to anybody. Well, next time you see them, you can tell them. Yeah? They were wrong. We got the names of the four men who were involved in the burglaries. We took Leonard Scott down to the city hall and pulled the packages on the four suspects. He gave us a positive identification on them. We checked with Captain Wisdom and it was decided to wait until we could catch the suspects in the actual attempt to commit a burglary. We checked out the address of the four suspects and got as much information as we could on them without letting them know that they were under surveillance. Additional teams of men were assigned to the stakeout. Each of them was watched 24 hours a day, and each of the teams of detectives were in constant contact with the burglary division. Two days passed. None of the suspects made any attempt to make contact with the others. We met with the district attorney, and it was decided that in the interest of bringing the gang to justice, the first suspect, Leonard Scott, should be released from custody to act as an informant for us. He would be kept under constant surveillance. Frank and I were assigned to follow him. In the next three days, he went about his business as usual. Each evening, he'd leave his rooming house and walk through the bars in the downtown area. He told us that contact and information regarding the burglaries was made by the leader of the gang, one of the suspects named Howard Ramsey. On Monday, August 24th, we saw Ramsey approach Leonard Scott. They talked briefly in the rear of a bar on 6th Street, and then Ramsey left. We waited for about 15 minutes, and then we saw Scott leave the bar. We followed him down the street to an all-night coffee stand. We sat down next to him at the counter, and at the first opportunity, he told us what Ramsey had said. You guys haven't got long to wait. What did he say? The deal's set. It's going to be a machine shop out in West L.A. Rumble is the safe has over 25 grand in it. Biggest job they've tackled. He say how it's going to work? Yeah, I'll fill you in on it. Thought you might want to get in touch with your office, so... How's that? They're going to work tonight. listening to Dragnet, the authentic story of your police force in action. Don't you want to try a cigarette with a record like this? Chesterfield, first to give you premium quality in both regular and king size. Chesterfield, first choice of young America. From a survey of 274 leading colleges and universities. Chesterfield, first to give you this report. 
A doctor has been making thorough examinations of a group of Chesterfield smokers every two months for a full year. And he reports no adverse effects to the nose, throat, and sinuses from smoking Chesterfield. Try Chesterfield, regular or king size. Chesterfield is America's best cigarette buy. p.m. We got the rest of the story from Leonard Scott. The plan, as he outlined it for us, was that the four other suspects would not meet until they were at the plant that was to be burglarized. We got in touch with the men who were following the suspects and told them what had happened. 10.07 p.m. We met with Captain Wisdom and put the operating plan into effect. It had been arranged that all of the men following the suspects would be in three-way radio cars so that constant communication could be kept between the units of the operation. Additional officers were planted on the roofs of the buildings surrounding the plant to be burglarized. These men would be equipped with walkie-talkies so they could keep in constant touch with each other and with us in a three-way radio car. In this way, we could direct operations and we'd have a complete picture of what was happening in the immediate vicinity. A blockade system was set up to be put into operation once the suspects had entered the trap so that escape would be impossible. 11.45 p.m. The plan was completed and the men involved were in their assigned positions. We followed Leonard Scott to his rooming house and he changed to his working clothes. He came out of his house and we followed him out the freeway to Hollywood. From there, he drove out Sunset Boulevard to Whittier Drive in Beverly Hills. And then he went out Wilshire Boulevard toward West L.A. As we drove, we could hear the other units reporting the position of the men that they were following. All of the suspects left their homes at approximately the same time, and it looked as if they would get to the plant within a couple of minutes of the scheduled time. Scott had told us that they would not meet at the plant, but they'd rendezvous at a drive-in a couple of blocks from the plant. There, they would be given their instructions. 2.16 a.m., the five cars pulled into the drive-in, and after a brief conversation, they all left and drove toward the plant. 2.23 a.m., all the police units got into their positions as arranged. Frank and I took up our position, and we listened to the reports coming in over the radio. Unit 1KY80, Unit 1KY80, Rubles, come in. Unit 1KY80 to Rubles, go ahead. I'm on the roof of the building directly across the street from the factory, Joe. I can see the suspects now. How many of them are there? I can see three. I think there's a couple more at the corner as lookouts. Hey, Donovan's down the block. Maybe he can see the others. Unit 1KY80 to Donovan. Come in, please. Over. This is Donovan. Yeah, there's one of them on the corner down here. He drove up and got out to take a look at the motor of his car. He's over there working on it now. Uh, this Rubles, I can see another one at the other corner. He's changing a tire. Uh, got the jack under the car, but he's not trying to get the wheel off. Uh, the others are at the factory door now. Do you see anything where you are, Joe? Not much. Shadows across the street. I can't see the doorway. What are they doing now? Uh, they're inside now. They forced the lock on the door and got inside. Uh, doors closed. Now, I can't see him anymore, Joe. All units, this is Friday in Unit 1KY80. All units move in to apprehend suspects. Repeat, move in to apprehend suspects. Units 2R4, 5, 6, and 7, and Unit 2R20 move to blockade positions. All right, let's go. All right. They got the place covered and back okay? Yeah, all covered. All right. This ought to do it, huh? Right. All right, let's go. Yeah. Well, I got the lookout. Yeah, I see. Well, let's take it easy, huh? See him? No. There's a light back there. It looks like the office. Wait a minute. Must be back there. Sounds like they're putting the bar into the back of the safe, doesn't it? Yeah. Uh, Rubles? Uh, let's go. They're in the office now. You want to move in from that side? Right. All right. Let's go. All right. Come on, get on it. We haven't got all night. That safe built like a sardine can. There's no reason to take this along. We're doing the best we can. We got the ten of fire bricks giving us trouble. Here, let me take a look. All right, hold it right where you are. Cops, let's get out of here. Watch him, Joe. I'll get him. Right. Come on, Ramsey. You got no place to go. The building's surrounded. Back here, Joe. Get out of here, cops. You're never going to take us. 
Hold it up. Don't shoot anymore. I give up. I give up. Come on, cops. Come on and get it. He ain't talking for me. I've had it. I don't want any more shooting. I give up. I throw your guns out here. <laughs> He's mine. All right. Come on out of here. Get over there. Get your hands back of your head. Stand right there and don't move. I gave up, didn't I? I didn't want any more of it. Come on, Ramsey. Your partner was smart. Why don't you play it that way, too? You come and get me, cop. All right. You win. I'm out of shells. Don't shoot. Throw that gun out here. All right, now, come on out of there. Keep your hands back of your head. Come on, move. That's good right there. All right, all right. Come on, Ramsey. Over there next to your partner. Now, stand still, both of you. Put your hands against the wall. Stand still. I don't move. All right, they're clean, Joe. All right. There were three of them. Where's the other one? I made a break for the front door. They got him out there. Well, lousy luck all the way around. How'd you know? Who told you? That doesn't make any difference. Well, somebody had to tell you. You'd never have found out if somebody had yeah, told you. Yeah, that's right. Come on, let's go now. Well, who told you? Who turned Fink? Somebody had to tell you, didn't well, they? don't you worry about it, mister. What do you mean? You're going to have a lot of time to figure it out. Now, let's go. The story you've just heard was true. The names were changed to protect the innocent. On January 14th, trial was held in Department 89, Superior Court of the State of California, in and for the County of Los Angeles. In a moment, the results of that trial. Now, here is our star, Jack Webb. Thank you, George Fenneman. I'd like to talk to you people who don't smoke Chesterfields. I'm convinced that if you try just one carton, you'll find that they're best for you. They're milder, and they have a wonderful taste. But most important, they have premium quality in both sizes, regular or king size. So pick up that carton, will you? Chesterfields. Try them. Howard Allen, Ramsey, Jack Irwin, MacArthur, and the other two suspects were tried and convicted of 15 counts of burglary in the first degree. They received sentences as prescribed by law. Burglary in the first degree is punishable by imprisonment in the state penitentiary for a period of not less than five years. Because of his cooperation, Leonard James Scott was given a lighter sentence and at the conclusion of his prison term was placed on probation for a period of two years. Ladies and gentlemen, we wish to thank the editors of TV Guide for the cover picture and story on Dragnet. You can get TV Guide at your favorite newsstand. just heard Dragnet, a series of authentic cases from official files. Technical advice comes from the office of Chief of Police W.H. Parker, Los Angeles Police Department. Technical advisors, Captain Jack Donahoe, Sergeant Marty Wynn, Sergeant Vance Frazier. Heard tonight were Ben Alexander, Olin Soule, Vic Perrin, Jack Crucian. Script by John Robinson. Music by Walter Schumann. Hal Gibney speaking. For a million laughs, tune in Chesterfield's Martin and Lewis show, Tuesday on this same NBC station. And sound off for Chesterfield's. Either regular or king size, you'll find premium quality Chesterfield's much milder. Chesterfield is best for you. Chesterfield has brought you Dragnet transcribed from Los Angeles. Now, new Fatima has the tip for your lips. Fatima tips of perfect cork. King size for natural filtering. Fatima quality for a much better flavor and aroma. So remember, new Fatima has the tip for your lips. Fatima, see how smooth they are. Remember, Fatima is made by the makers of Chesterfield, Liggett and Myers, one of tobacco's most respected names. <laughs> Sound off for Chesterfield. Chesterfield is best for you. First cigarette with premium quality in both regular and king size. Chesterfield brings you Dragnet. Ladies and gentlemen, the story you're about to hear is true. 
The names have been changed to protect the innocent. You're a detective sergeant. You're assigned a robbery detail. You get a call from the San Diego Police Department that three hold-up men are thought to be heading for your city. You know they're armed. You know they're dangerous. Your job? Get them. Years ahead of them all. Chesterfield is years ahead of them all. The quality contrast between Chesterfield and other leading brands is a revealing story. Recent chemical analyses give an index of good quality for the country's six leading cigarette brands. The index of good quality table, which is a ratio of high sugar to low nicotine, shows Chesterfield quality highest. Chesterfield quality highest. 15% higher than its nearest competitor. Chesterfield quality highest. 31% higher than the average of the five other leading brands. Yes, Chesterfield is first with premium quality in both regular and king size. Don't you want to try a cigarette with a record like this? Chesterfield. Dragnet, the documented drama of an actual crime. For the next 30 minutes, in cooperation with the Los Angeles Police Department... You will travel step by step on the side of the law through an actual case transcribed from official police files. From beginning to end, from crime to punishment, Dragnet is the story of your police force in action. It was Monday, October 5th. It was warm in Los Angeles. We were working the night watch out of robbery detail. My partner's Frank Smith. The boss is Captain Didion. My name's Friday. I was on my way into the office, and it was 4.58 p.m. when I got to room 27A. Robbery. Hi, Murph. Seen Frank? Yeah, he was here a couple of minutes ago. I think he went down the hall, said he'd be right back. Thanks. How are the kids? Eh, we're in the cycle again. What do you mean? Eh, the cold cycle. Oh, yeah. Oldest boy brings one home with him, gives it to his sister. Then it goes to the baby, then to the wife, and then to me. By the time I got it, the oldest boy's ready to catch it again from me. Doesn't seem to be any end to it. Yeah, I see what you mean. Reading the other day where if you take care of a cold, you know, take a lot of pills, stay in bed, you can shake it in a week. All right. Don't do anything special for it, and it'll take seven days to get rid of it. Joe? Hi. Got an APB here from San Diego. Boys down there really drew themselves a gem. Yeah, can I take a look? Yeah, here it is. Yeah. I can hear him moan all the way from here. What is it? Well, I had a jewel robbery at a hotel on the coast. Three men took 135000 in jewels and at least 15000 in cash. 150000 huh? Any leads on them? No, APB gives a description, a list of the stolen jewelry. That's about all. When did it happen? It says 1.30 this morning. Yeah, it's going to keep him busy for a while. That Mort's screaming like an eagle, Joe. Why? Well, I talked to him last week, said he was going down to Mexico to do some fishing. Been saving days off for the last three months. Won't get to go now. Yeah, I get it. Robbery, Friday. Yeah, go ahead. San Diego. Huh? Yeah, hi, Mort. Yeah, we got the APB. How's it going? Yeah. Uh huh. When do you figure they left? Yeah. Okay, Mort, yeah. All right, we'll keep an eye open. Right, bye. What's he got? Well, Davis, Walk, and Hewen are coming up. They're driving? Yeah, they figure the hold-up men are heading this way. The early editions of the afternoon papers came out, and they carried the complete story. Three men had entered the Carlton Surf Hotel at 1.30 a.m. All three were armed, and they forced the manager to open the safe. Inside the vault were the jewels and the other valuables that had been deposited with the management for safekeeping by the guests. After looting the safe, the three men had robbed five of the guests who had entered the lobby during the time that they'd been going through the safe. After taking all the money and valuables they could find, the three men forced the manager and the guests into a back storeroom of the hotel and they locked them in. None of the victims could tell the San Diego officers what kind of a car had been used, but all of them were able to give good descriptions of the three men. The San Diego Police Department had been called, and the men from the Detective Bureau had begun an immediate investigation. From the phone conversation I'd had with Lieutenant Mort Gear, they had evidence to believe that the three men were heading up for Los Angeles. While the three detectives from the San Diego Department came to L.A., Lieutenant Gear, Sergeant Tony McGuire would continue the investigation down in their city. 11.12 p.m. Sergeants Carl Davis, Jerry Walk, and Pappy Hewen arrived at the city hall. They filled us in on what had happened. The way the thing looked, it figured that someone who had either worked for the hotel or was working for it had engineered it. 
How'd that check out? The identification we got? Yeah. Virgil Russell worked for the hotel a year ago as a busboy in a dining room. All the victims gave a positive identification on him. Well, how about the other two, Carl? Nothing on him yet. What made you figure they might be coming up here? Well, Russell's got a record, checked his package, and found that he has a sister in San Diego. Checked her, and she gave us a lead. Yeah. Said her brother and two men came by the house early this morning. Her brother's been staying with her the past few weeks. Anyway, he came by this morning, packed his clothes, said he had to come up to L.A. on business. Was she having an address up here for him, Carl? Not good. Said he told her he'd get in touch with her. He was staying with a friend in place out on Olympic Boulevard. Anything on that address? Yeah, a package gave an address out there. Russell had listed a friend of his when he was arrested. We figured he might be out there. Got a good description of the car. One thing is going to help. Yeah. Sister told us that she asked her brother about the other two men. Wanted to know if they didn't want to come to the house. Mm -hmm. Russell said no. They were waiting for him. But the three of them were in a hurry. She couldn't give us a description of the other two. Well, what time this happened? About 5.30 this morning. Uh, well, they came right up here. They'd get in about 8 then, wouldn't they? Yeah. You're pretty sure that these are the right ones now? Looks like that. Identification of the mugs. Russell's sister told us when he was packing, a brooch fell out of his grip. She picked it up for him. Give me a description of it? Yeah, matches one that was taken from the hotel in the theft. Large diamond with four rubies in the setting. Looked real good for the job. Did you get a broadcast out on the car? Yeah, Russell's sister told us it's a 53 Nash red and black continental hookup. She said Russell just got back from a trip through Arizona, Nevada, New Mexico. Said that he had the rear window covered with those stickers. You know, the ones they get from the gas station. Yeah, I know what you mean. Window's supposed to be covered with them. Shouldn't be hard to spot. Well, maybe he figures that, too. Might have him taken off, huh? Possible. It's a lead, though. Something else to look out for. Any chance he might have gotten across the border into Mexico? Yeah, it's possible, but it isn't likely. As soon as we got word on the car, we got out a supplemental APB on it and got in touch with the authorities down the border. They said they hadn't seen a car that matched the description across the border. Well, if they'd gotten to the border, the officers down there would know about it anyway. Yeah, I talked to Al Gaten from our office. He said they'd be on the lookout for him. Our pawn shop detail got right on it, Carl. We got the description of the jewelry out all over town. We haven't had any reports on it yet, though. They aren't going to try to sell it piece by piece. There's too many of those pieces are easy to recognize. Yeah. They'll probably try to pedal through a fence and have it broken up. Well, we'll get the word out to our informants. Ask them to watch out for it. Yeah. Heist that big can't be kept quiet for long. Bound to be rumbles on it someplace. I'd like to check out the place on Olympic. It looks like it's the best lead we got. Okay. We're a walking healing, you know. Went down the hall with Murphy. Wanted to check some things at R&I. Well, might as well get on out to Olympic, huh? You got the address? Yeah, you better check the place first. Could be rough. What do you mean? Well, all three of them are armed. Russell served time twice before at the joint. Yeah. I don't think he's going to want to go back. <laughs> We checked the name of Russell's friend through our files. We found that he had no record. We drove out to the address on Olympic and we talked with the neighbors. From them, we found out that it was not a private residence. We talked to the woman who lived next door. We asked her about the man listed in the San Diego package as a friend of the suspects. She told us she hadn't seen him. Directly in front of the rooming house, we found a car answering the description given us by the sister. There were no lights on in the rooming house. Walk and Hewen covered the rear of the place. Frank, Carl Davis, and I went up to the front door. Pretty dark. I can't see anybody in there. Can you? No, I can't. Check the window. See if I can spot anything. Right, Carl. Well, let's try the door. Yeah. Who is it? Come on, open up. Beat it. Nobody gets in here. All right, Frank. Let's hit it. <laughs> All right, stand right where you are. Hold well, on. I'm not doing anything. What are you doing? Breaking in Get here? Get your hands like out in front of you. Sure. I'll shake him, Joe. He's clean. Everything okay? Yeah, Carl. I'll get walking you and Who else in the house? Nobody but the landlady. She's upstairs. Her and her daughter. Nobody else here. What's your name? Pete Ellis. Where's Russell? I don't know any Russell. All right, we'll look around. Come on. What's in there? Dining room. There ain't nothing in Open there. Open it up. See? Nobody here. No. Yeah. All right, we'll check the other room. Where's this door go? Bedroom. Ain't nobody in there. Open it up. Joe, nobody in the kitchen. Check the back porch. Walking Davis are upstairs. All right, we'll try this one here. Come on, you open it up. It's locked. It can't get in. There's a key in the door over here. Let's see if it fits. Virgil! Virgil! Get out, Virgil! It's a cop! Get out! All right, get out of the way, you. Come on, let's hit it. Get yeah. out! On the bed, Joe. I see. All right, come on, you out of that bed. Hey, Joe? Yeah? There's a bottle of sleeping pills on the table here. Yeah, there's an empty bottle of whiskey. I guess he's dead drunk. Upstairs is clean, Joe. Russell, huh? Yeah, he's drunk. I guess we're pretty lucky. 
Under his pillow there? Yeah. Three guns. With the suspects in custody, we searched the house. In the back bedroom where we'd found Virgil Russell, we found a folder with all of the newspaper stories of the hotel robbery. In each instance, that portion of the story which referred to the thieves themselves was outlined in pencil, and there were small notations along the margins of the newspaper. A complete search of the house netted us nothing. There was no sign of the loot from the robbery, although each of the suspects had a large amount of money in their possession. We talked to the landlady, but she was unable to tell us anything about the suspects. She said that she had rented a room to Peter Ellis over a year before, and that the suspect had moved out after living in the house for only two months. She said that she hadn't seen them again since that night when they arrived at the house and asked for rooms. We called the office and arranged for a stakeout on the place, and we took the two suspects back to the office. We ran Peter Ellis through R&I, and we found that he had one previous conviction on a robbery charge. 2.15 a.m., we talked to Virgil Russell in the interrogation room. All right, all right, I ain't trying to con you into anything. I was in on the heist, I'll admit it, but I ain't gonna be no fink. You ain't gonna get any other names out of me. You got the money we found on you from that hotel robbery, is that right? I don't know where else it'd come from. I got no reason to con you about the hotel job. I pulled it. I ain't afraid to admit it. I'm just not turning think, that's all. Maybe we can get it out of Ellis. He won't tell you anything. You're pretty sure about that. He admits he was in on the robbery. Well, so what? We all had a deal. If any of us got caught, they wouldn't tell about the others. You think Ellis and that other guy would go that route, standing in the arrest alone? Sure. We had an agreement. Oh, come on now. Tell us how much you got for the jewels. You can tell us that and not tell us who the other man is, can't you? Yeah, yeah I suppose so. Isn't any way you could tell if I told you how much we got? How much? 7000 How much? 7000 Who set up the deal to sell the stuff? Your partner? Yeah, he handled all that. He fixed it for you to get 7000 bucks for all the jewelry? Yeah, that's right. Well, you made a good deal, all right. 7000 for $135,000 worth of jewelry. <laughs> Wasn't worth 135 That's just the papers making it sound big. No, no, Russell, you're wrong. That's what the stuff is worth. Are you kidding? You got that report, Frank. Yeah, yeah. Now, wait a minute, that's, that's maybe what they claim the stuff is worth, but you know how people are always jacking things up on the insurance companies? The stuff was worth, well, uh, maybe 15000 not a cent more. Yeah, Joe, here it is. Mm. This is the report you got from the insurance company, Carl. That's it. Would you like to read it yourself, Russell, or do you want me to read it to you? Well, let me see. All right. What a lousy bum. Oh, no good, good... He's a thief, that's what he is, a, a thieving thief. That's the kind of a guy you say you had a deal with, huh? Let you think he was doing you a big favor, some deal, $7,000. If we'd picked him up, he'd have screamed like an eagle. He's your pal, all right. Well, no good thief. I can't believe it. Who'd he sell the stuff to, do you know? No, no, I don't, and that's the truth. I, I saw the guy, but I don't know who it was. How'd the deal work? Well, earlier tonight, we got together out in Westwood. He called the fellow who was going to handle the deal, told him to meet us here. Who's he? A fink, a lousy fink. What's his name? Payne, Al Payne. I spell it. Last name. Um, P-A-Y-N-E. You got a record? No, I don't think so. I never heard him talk about it. You give us a description? Yeah. That stuff was really worth 135 grand. He said it was a lot of talk, newspaper talk, he said. Oh, brother, what a laugh. What's his pain look like? Oh, he's about 37, maybe 150, 60 pounds. Both. A little bit of hair on the edge of your head. I'll check the name through R&I, Joe. Right. Do you want to bring the mugs back here? Yeah. Russell? Yeah? That first name, is it Alfred or Albert? I think it's Albert. He's some kind of a promoter. I don't know what he promotes. I think it's just a dodge, kind of a front. I'll be right back, Joe. All right. Let's go ahead with the story about the buy, huh? All right. Where was I? You said you went out to Westwood. Oh, yeah. Well, we were supposed to meet out in the parking lot by the ice rink. Big place out there. Well, we met this guy, the... Fellow Payne called it. He looked at the stuff, said it was worth maybe 15000 the way it was. But he said it had to be broken down before it could be sold. That it wouldn't bring that much when it was all broken down. What did Al say to that? Well, he agreed to it, said it was true. He went right along with it. Lousy deal. He was probably in on the whole thing. Wouldn't be surprised. I just can't get over it. We had all that stuff and didn't know what it was worth. You got any idea who this guy is? No, I, I told you I didn't know. You said this Payne had an office here in town. You know where it is? Yeah, I can show you. We were up there this afternoon while I was setting up the deal. It's in a building over on uh, on 6th. You'd be willing to go over there with us? So you can nail him? That's right. We want to get the jewels back. Sure, I'll go. So what that bum did to me, nothing too bad for him. How are you going to work it, Joe? Well, Russell here will have to introduce me as somebody who wants to buy this stuff. He'll have to tell Payne that I'm willing to pay, say, 50000 for the jewelry. 
That way, Payne will have to get in touch with the other man. I don't think he'll pass up a deal like that. Maybe he figures to make more than that this way. Yeah, but suppose he thinks that Russell here wants to do business with me. He'll get the stuff back. I don't think he'll want to cross Russell. Might work. No, we haven't got much choice. we got to get the stuff back before it's broken up. Hey, Joe, i got some pictures here. I'm going to match the description. What was that? I'm going to match the description. Oh. You want to look at these? Yeah. Joe's going to go see this Payne with Russell and Ellis, try to get a lead on where the stuff is. How are you going to work it? Well, I'll tell Payne I'm interested in buying the jewels, offer him maybe 50000 Picture's not here. None of these is Payne. You go along with this plan, Russell? Sure. I'd like to see you get him and get him good. It's pretty risky. It doesn't look like there's any other way. Suppose not. Russell? Yeah? We know Payne carries a gun. I'm going to tell you something. I want you to remember it. All right. You got any bright ideas about tipping Payne off about Joe? Remember, we'll have men all through the building. All right. We're not going to start any shooting. Yeah. But we'll finish it. You are listening to Dragnet, the authentic story of your police force in action. Chesterfield is best for you. Just listen to the record. For a full year and two months, a doctor has been making regular examinations of a group of Chesterfield smokers, and he reports no adverse effects to the nose, throat, and sinuses from smoking Chesterfields. Don't you want to try a cigarette with a record like this? Chesterfield. First, with premium quality in both regular and king size. Chesterfield. First choice with Young America. And that's from a survey of 274 colleges and universities. Try Chesterfields today. Remember, Chesterfield is America's best cigarette buy. The two suspects, Peter Ellis and Virgil Russell, were taken to the main jail and booked in for violation of Section 211 of the California Penal Code. After that, the officers from San Diego, Frank and I, discussed the plan for finding the stolen jewels. It was agreed that I would go into the office building with the suspect, Virgil Russell. To lessen the chances of discovery, I would carry no gun or any police identification. We were unable to make contact that night, so the following morning, we checked over the physical layout of the building. It was six stories high and had one elevator. There were two entrances to the building, one in the front and one that opened off an alley in the rear. Officers were planted at both entrances. Additional men were stationed on each floor. Two men were on the roof to cut off any possible escape to one of the adjoining buildings. 11.30 a.m. Tuesday, October 6th. Russell called Payne and said that he wanted to see him. Payne told him to come right over to the office. Russell and I got into a car and we drove over. It had been arranged that from the time we entered the building, no one would be permitted to leave until we returned to the main entrance. 11.58 a.m. We got to the office building. We went up to the fourth floor. The sign on Payne's door read, Albert Payne, Investments. Russell opened the door and we walked in. Hi, Verge. What's the bit? Al, like you to meet Joe Ferguson. Joe, glad to meet you. Yeah, same here, Al. You sit down, boys. Now, what's this all about? It's about the stuff, Al. We gotta get it back. Now, what's the pitch? I don't even know what you're talking about. Oh, come off it, Payne. Joe here's willing to up the ante for the jewels. How much? I'll go as high as 50000 I gotta see it first. For 15000 worth of jewels? Papers say it's worth 135 I explained that to you. They upped the value. It's all insured. People up the price of the insurance companies. Papers up the price. They sell more papers. I told you. Yeah, and I ain't buying it. I want the stuff back. I never even got my cut of the 7000 Ellis feels the same way. I told you the money'd be coming. Oh, it ain't coming anymore. I want the stuff back. I don't think we can do that. Most of it's already broken up. No, not much of it could be broken up in the time that he's had it guy that bought it isn't going to like it. Well, that's tough. You just tell him to stop breaking it up. Tell him we want it back. Uh, where do you figure to sell the jewels? I don't see where that concerns you. I'm offering you 50000 for them. That's all you need to know. Come on, Al. Come on. Quit playing games. Let's get on it. You get in touch with the guy you gave him to and get the jewels back. Wait a minute. I got something to say about this. I was in on the job with you. Don't you forget it. I'm only going to say this once more, Payne. You get on that phone and get in touch with your contact. Tell him to stop breaking them up. You set up a meet to get the stuff back. Well, I'll call him. I don't think it's going to do any good. He's probably got all the mountings melted down by this time. Got it all broken up. You call him. We'll see what happens. All right. Now, let me talk to Fred. Fred, this is Al. Yeah. Uh, 
Listen, something's come up. We can't go through with the deal. What? Yeah, I know. I told them. Doesn't make any difference. They want it all back. Yeah, I told them that, too. Doesn't make any difference. Uh, you want the jewels back that have been broken down, too? I told you, Al. I want all of it back. Yeah. Yeah, Freddy says all of it. Okay. And when can you make it? Yeah. All right. Yeah, we'll see you then. Right. Okay, bye. They'll have the stuff for you tomorrow night. Why does he have to wait that long? How do I know? He just said he couldn't get it to you any sooner. Well, you should have let me talk to him. I'd have told him. Yeah, sure. How much of it's been broken up? Well, hardly any. Just got started. Fred says it's almost all whole. Who is this Fred? That's well, none of your business. I asked you a question, Al. You got your answer. Doesn't make any difference who he is. You and your friends lost up the deal. Be happy. You fixed it fine. Well, I'll come out better. Yeah, you better be right. Now, remember, I got a piece of this. I won't forget. What time tomorrow are we going to meet Fred? Well, he said he'd call. Let me know where and when. Well, I can't be any later than tomorrow. I got to be leaving then. You're going to have the money with you when you pick up the stuff, I'll aren't you? have it. All of it. I don't want any of this down payment. I told you I'd have. All right, you call me tomorrow about 10, Verge. I'll let you know the details then. Okay. I hope you're right about this, Verge. What do you mean? Well, this deal, I don't like it. I hope nothing happens to louse it up. Yeah, so do I. Virgil Russell and I left the office and went downstairs. We checked with Frank, Carl Davis, and the other officers from San Diego. Al Payne was taken into custody and booked in at the main jail on suspicion of violation of Section 211 PC. Then we returned to the office. You find out who has the stuff? Yeah, a fellow named Fred. You know who he is? No, not yet, but we will. How'd you figure that? Payne didn't tell you. Well, I saw the number he dialed when he called Fred. It was a Hollywood prefix. That narrows down the area. I can try the number and see who answers. Oh, I'm sorry. I got the wrong number. Excuse me. Did you get it? Yeah. It's the Kingery Trophy Company. You want to check the book? Right. Okay. Okay, okay, all right. King and Cade. Here it is, Joe. Kingery Trophy Company. It's on Las Palmas. Trophy Company. That'd give them a chance to melt the mountings down to metal, wouldn't it? Be easier to get rid of it that way. Makes sense. What do you figure to move in on? Right now. We can drive out and check the place now. Look it over, then we'll go ahead and get him. Uh, what happens with me? we got to take you back to main jail. After the help I gave That's you? That's the way it's got to be. You knew that going in. Yeah, I suppose so. Well, you tell the DA I helped, though, huh? Yeah, we'll see he knows about it. Sure, a bad deal all the way around. A real bad deal. I should have known I couldn't win. Right from the start, I should have known. Nobody can win. Well, still a lot of people trying. <laughs> We returned Virgil Russell to his cell, and then we drove out to the Kingery Trophy Company. It was a two-story building on Las Palmas Avenue in Hollywood. They made trophies and fraternity pins. A large sign on the front of the building advertised that they could duplicate anything in metal. We checked with the neighborhood merchants and found that there was a permanent staff of four employees. The company was owned by a Roger Kingery, and none of the neighborhood people could tell us anything about an employee by the name of Fred. 5 p.m., the employees of the plant left the building. One man remained. From the description we'd gotten from Russell, we figured that he was the person Payne had called Fred. 6.03 p.m., the lights in the rear of the factory went on, and through the windows we could see the suspect working over a small furnace. On a table off to one side, we could see a quantity of jewelry. Frank, Carl, and I went to the side door of the plant while the other officers covered the remaining doors. All right, you ready? Yeah, let's go. Carl? Yeah. I'll hit the door and grab him before he's got the chance to throw the jewelry into the furnace. Right. All right. Grab him, Carl. He's making a break for it. I got it. Hey, what are you guys doing breaking in here like this? Look at that, Joe. Jewelry matches the description of the stolen stuff. Yeah, it looks like it. All right, mister. Stand still. I'll shake him. He's clean. I don't know what you guys are doing. I don't know what this is all about. All right, save it. What's this jewelry doing here? That isn't mine. I didn't ask you whose it was. I asked you what it was doing here. Fella, say, give me $2,500 if I break it down for him. What's the fella's name? guy named Payne said he'd pay me to melt it down for him. You know the stuff was stolen? No, no, I didn't. He just made the deal to melt it down. Didn't he call you this afternoon and tell you to stop breaking it up? Yeah, and then he called back and told me not to pay attention to what he said. Go ahead with the job. I did like he said. Who else is in this with you? What do you mean? Who else here at the factory? Nobody. I'm the only one. I only did it because I needed the money. I don't know where the jewels came from. I didn't care. It didn't make no difference to me. As long as I got mine, I was happy. I didn't know what it was all about. 
Looks like most of it's here, Joe. How many pieces did you break down? Took a couple of the pins apart. Didn't have the time to melt any of the mounting down. It's all there. All the paint gave me. What's your name? Fred Michelson. All right. Let's go. Well, I didn't know they were stolen. I didn't know anything about it. I just did a job. That's all. Just a job. Yeah. I didn't even get paid for it. Don't worry about it. You will. The story you have just heard is true. The names were changed to protect the innocent. On February 18th, trial was held in Department 89, Superior Court of the State of California, in and for the County of San Diego. In a moment, the results of that trial. And now, here is our star, Jack Webb. Thank you, George Fenneman. I want to thank all of you for your interest in Dragnet. Thanks very much for your letters. We really appreciate them, and we'll try to keep right on giving you the kind of a show that you like. I want to thank all of you, too, who have switched to Chesterfield. I know you're going to like them, and I know you'll find they're best for you. Now, you folks who haven't tried Chesterfields, I'd like you to pick up a carton tomorrow. Chesterfield, it's a great smoke. Virgil Nathan Russell, Peter Howard Ellis, and Albert Franklin Payne were tried and convicted of robbery in the first degree. They received sentence as prescribed by law. Fred George Michelson was tried and found guilty of receiving stolen property. He received sentence as prescribed by law. Receiving stolen property is punishable by imprisonment in the state penitentiary for a period of not more than ten years. Ladies and gentlemen, Lieutenant Jack Allen, Los Angeles Police Department. Thank you. On behalf of the Detroit Police Officers Association, I'd like to present this award to Dragnet. I wonder if you'd read it, Mr. Fenneman. Yes, sir. Whereas... The radio and television show Dragnet and its writers, producers, and actors most accurately portray the American police officers and their work. And whereas, the result of this portrayal has been to give the people of this country a new insight into their police departments, bringing with it understanding, sympathy, and an aroused public opinion. And whereas, Dragnet brings credit to the men and women of the police forces throughout America. Therefore, we the Detroit Police Officers Association, representing the patrolmen, detectives, and policewomen of Detroit, hereby cite and commend the show Dragnet and its star, Jack Webb, who plays the part of Detective Sergeant Friday, as the finest and most accurate police program, both on television and radio. Signed this date, March 31st, 1953, in behalf of the association by Thomas Duffy, President, Bruce Finney, Vice President, Francis Klein, Secretary Treasurer. All of us on Dragnet want to thank the Detroit Police Officers Association and our thanks to you, Lieutenant Allen. You have just heard Dragnet, a series of authentic cases from official files. Technical advice comes from the office of Chief of Police W.H. Parker, Los Angeles Police Department. Technical advisors, Captain Jack Donahoe, Sergeant Marty Wynn, Sergeant Vance Brasher. Heard tonight were Ben Alexander, Eddie Firestone, Art Gilmore. Script by John Robinson. Music by Walter Schumann. Hal Gibney speaking. For a million laughs, tune in Chesterfield's Martin and Lewis show Tuesday on this same NBC station. And sound off for Chesterfield's. Either regular or king size you'll find premium quality Chesterfields much milder. Chesterfield is best for you. Chesterfield has brought you Dragnet transcribed from Los Angeles. Sound off for Chesterfield. Chesterfield is best for you. First cigarette with premium quality in both regular and king size. Chesterfield brings you Dragnet. Ladies and gentlemen, the story you are about to hear is true. The names have been changed to protect the innocent. You're a detective sergeant. You're assigned a burglary detail. A wave of burglaries has broken out in your city. The thieves are fast. They're clever. Your job? Get them. 
years ahead of them all. Chesterfield is years ahead of them all. The quality contrast between Chesterfield and other leading brands is a revealing story. Recent chemical analyses give an index of good quality for the country's six leading cigarette brands. The index of good quality table, which is a ratio of high sugar to low nicotine, shows Chesterfield quality highest. Chesterfield quality highest. 15% higher than its nearest competitor. Chesterfield quality highest. 31% higher than the average of the five other leading brands. Yes, Chesterfield is first with premium quality in both regular and king size. Don't you want to try a cigarette with a record like this? Chesterfield. Dragnet, the documented drama of an actual crime. For the next 30 minutes, in cooperation with the Los Angeles Police Department... You will travel step by step on the side of the law through an actual case transcribed from official police files. From beginning to end, from crime to punishment, Dragnet is the story of your police force in action. It was Thursday, December 10th. It was cold in Los Angeles. We were working the day watch out of burglary detail. My partner's Frank Smith. The boss is Chief of Detectives Thad Brown. My name's Friday. We were on the way out from the office, and it was 10, 14 a.m. when we got to the Armstrong Schneider Jewelry Company, the manager's office. Can I help you? Yes, ma'am. Police officers, we'd like to see Mr. Armstrong. Oh, yes. Just a minute. The police officers are here. Yes, sir, right away. Will you go right in, please? Thank you very Thank much. You. Mr. Armstrong's office. Yes, sir. I'm sorry, but he's in a meeting. Won't you come in? Thank you very much. Thanks, sir. Mr. Armstrong? Yes. It's my partner, Frank Smith. My name's Friday. How do you do? Won't you sit down? Thank you very much. Would you like a cigarette? Yes, sir. Thank you. Thanks. I have a lighter. As you know, this firm is probably the foremost fine jewelry store on the coast. Yes, sir. I wonder if you'd tell us about the theft. Yes. Well, we discovered it this morning. About what time was that? Well, about 9.45. That's when we missed it. I guess the necklace was taken about 9. Must have been right after we opened. Could you give us a description of the piece, sir? Yes, I have it uh, right here. Got it from the insurance records. Have a drawing of it. We always have that done on high-priced items. Mm-hmm. Here you are. Thank you. Mm-hmm. What value do you place on the necklace? It's insured for $8,000. firm can't afford to take a loss like that. Could you tell us exactly how it was taken? Yes, I can. It was just after 9. We just opened the front doors. People had started to come in. With lots of shoppers. Christmas, you know. Yes, sir. Well, this one couple came in, asked to see some of our more expensive necklaces. Henderson brought the tray out of the safe and showed the collection to the people. Henderson? Yes. He's the clerk who was waiting on the people. Oh. I uh, gave him his notice. I had to. It looks to me like carelessness. I wonder if we could talk to him. Yes, all right. Thank you. Miss Courtney, would you have Henderson sent in here, please? Yes, right away. What? No, tell him I'll call later. That's right. Have him leave the number and I'll call back. Right, yes. He'll be right in. All right, thank you. How long has this Henderson been working here? I'd have to check the employment records to be sure. Offhand, I think it's been about five years. Ever since we opened at this location, we used to have a store downtown, then we moved out here. Mm -hmm. Where did he work before then? Well, let me see. I think it was someplace up north. Mm, San Francisco, I believe. Yes, he worked in a store up there. Had excellent references. He's a good salesman. But you gave him notice, huh? Well, I felt it was the only thing to do. If he's getting careless, he has no business working in a store that deals with expensive merchandise. Mm -hmm. Excuse me. Yes? Send him right in. What? No, please tell him to call later. No, I'm not into anyone. No one but Sharon. My wife. Yes, sir. Come in. Do you want to see me, Mr. Armstrong? Yes, come right in, Henderson. These are police officers, Mr. Friday and Mr. Smith. This is Charles Henderson. How are you? Hi. How are you? They'd like to ask you some questions about the theft. Yes, sir. Anything I can do to help? Could you give us a description of the couple you waited on? Yeah, I think so. The man was about 35, maybe 40. About how tall was he? Well, maybe 5'11". Might have been 6 feet. I'd say he weighed about 155 pounds, something like that. Uh Uh-huh. How about his coloring, his complexion? It was light. Looked like he'd been out in the sun, though. His nose was all sunburned. I notice it because you don't often see people with sunburns like that this time of the year. You know, December. Mm Mm-hmm. How was he dressed, do you remember? I had a gray hat on, gray chalk-striped suit on, flannel blue shirt, maroon tie. Didn't see his shoes. He had on one of those new round collars, though. You know, rounded here on collar points? Mm Mm-hmm. Was he clean-shaven? No. 
No, he had a little mustache, one of those that looks like it's drawn on with an eyebrow pencil. Just a line, you know the kind. Uh-huh. How about the woman? What'd she look like? There's a small woman, not much more than 5'2", little, about 100 pounds. Real pretty. She had dark hair and blue eyes, very fair. I noticed it because I thought at the time that maybe she dyed her hair. Mm-hmm. Did she have any marks or scars you saw? No. No, I don't think so, no. How was she dressed? Well, she was a little too overdressed. Had a dress and a coat. Had a jewel clip here on her dress. She looked kind of flashy, cheap, you know. I see. Anything about the way they talked and the accent, anything like that? No, nothing I can remember. Would you remember if either one of them wore glasses, maybe? No. The man, though, he had a kind of funny way of talking. What do you mean? Well, he sounded sort of like one of those pitch men on TV. You know, the kind that sell kitchen gadgets, things like that. Mm-hmm. Could you tell us what happened, what they said when they came in, how they took the jewels? Yes, uh, they came in right after we opened and asked to see something in necklaces. Said they wanted to pay around 5000 mm. So I brought out the tray, but didn't find anything that they liked. And then I brought out the other tray. They looked at one of the necklaces. Beautiful thing, 8500 uh, You know, Mr. Armstrong, the emerald-cut diamond with the small sapphires. Yes, I know the one. Beautiful thing. Well, excuse me, can I use that ashtray a minute? Sure. Yeah, thank you. I wonder if you'd go on, please. Oh, sure. Well, I brought out the other tray and showed them the uh, necklaces in it. They both looked for a long time. And then the woman said that she didn't think there was anything there she wanted. Mm-hmm. What was the matter? Didn't they care for our designs? No, it wasn't that, sir. They just didn't see anything they liked. So they moved back to the other tray. And then the woman said she'd found what she wanted. It was a small piece, three diamonds and four small rubies. Did they buy that? No, they said they wanted to think about it. They made a big thing about asking me if I thought that it would be sold before they could make up their minds. Mm-hmm. Well, I told them if they wanted to put a small deposit on it, we could hold it for them. Yeah. Man said he'd rather not do that. He said they'd know by this afternoon. At that time, there were several people in the store, Christmas shoppers, you know. Mm-hmm. Some of them were looking at a display of bracelets we had on the counter. I went over to him to see if there was anything I could do. You know, tell him that I'd get someone to wait on him. I understand. It's a foolish thing to do. I know that. I'm afraid it was. Yeah, I know now. Well, when I got back, the couple was leaving. They told me they'd be in this afternoon and let me know. Walked out of the store, and I stopped to help a gentleman that came in. When I turned back to the trays, I noticed that the necklace in the more expensive tray was gone. Mm-hmm. Would you be able to give us positive identification of these people if you ever saw them again? Yes, I'm sure I would. wonder if you can come downtown with us and look at some pictures, see if you can identify the thieves for us. Of course, if Mr. Armstrong has no objection. Not at all. Would you like me to come along, too? I don't think that'll be necessary right now. If there's anything we need, we can get in touch with you here, can we? Yes, right here at my home. I can give you that number. All right, fine. Okay. Here it is. Thank, Thank you, sir. Well, thanks very much. You ready to go? Yes, sir. I'll get my hat. Just a minute, Anderson. Yes, sir. As soon as you get through down there, come on back. Your job's waiting for you. All right, sir. I'd like to come back. Anything I can do to help, just let me know. All right, Mr. Armstrong. Not at all. I'll get my hat and meet you at the door. Right. Have you notified the insurance company of the theft yet, Armstrong? I have a call into them now. I'm expecting an agent from the firm any minute. Sure hope you can recover it. Yes, yeah, sir. We'll do the best we can. An eight thousand dollar necklace. How do you think they'll go about disposing of it? Break it up? Well, either that or leave it in one piece. That'll make it kind of hard to unload, won't it? Eight thousand dollars? Not at their price. Ten thirty-seven a.m. We talked to the other people in the store. From them, we got verifying descriptions of the two thieves. 11.32 a.m., Frank and I took the clerk, Charles Henderson, down to the city hall and had him go through the mug books. We got out a local and an APB on the pair of thieves, and a description of the stolen necklace was prepared for the Daily Bulletin. The insurance company that underwrote the necklace got in touch with us and said that they were getting out printed circulars to jewelers throughout the country. The victim was unable to make an identification from the mug books. We had the M.O. of the theft run through the stats office, but when the possibles were checked out, we had no new leads. Further interrogation of the owners and employees of the stores in the immediate vicinity of Armstrong and Schneider failed to turn up anything new. The theft was not a new one. For the past six weeks, there'd been a series of burglaries taking place out on Wilshire Boulevard. Most of them had been exclusive women's stores or jewelry shops. To date, all of them had been articles of small individual value, none that approached the value of the necklace taken from Armstrong and Schneider. In an attempt to apprehend the thieves, all of the usual avenues of sale of stolen goods had been checked. None of the precautions apparently did any good. The thefts continued. Another two weeks passed. In that time, the thieves hit three times, all in the same general area. The employees of the victimized stores were questioned. From the information we got from them, we could be certain that the suspects were the same ones we were after. On Tuesday, December 29th, Frank and I got back from checking a lead. 
Well, there's another one that went no place. Yeah. You want to check the book? Yeah, I'll get it. Anything there? Yeah, there's a call here from Alex Olson. Olson? Yeah. Got a Dunkirk number. You know Olson? No, that name doesn't mean anything to me. Say what it's about. No, so just call him. Because it's important. All right. Give me the number, huh? Yeah. There you go. What is this? One nine oh. Is that a nine? Yeah, I think so. Yeah, it's a nine. You don't make nines very good. Lopey can't write. Can I speak to Alex? Oh, Alex Olson. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. The hotel. Yeah. Hello. This Olson? Yeah. This is Friday. Police Department. You want me to call you? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Sure. Sure, I remember. Uh-huh. Yeah, sure. We'd like to talk to you. Yeah. Now, we'll come over there. That's right. You want to give me the address? Just a minute. Yeah. Okay. Right. Right. Bye. Olson, he works for that carnival. You remember we talked to him last year? Says he wants to see us about some burglaries now. Oh, yeah, I remember. He says he's in with the thieves. 11.26 a.m. We drove out to the address Olson had given me on the phone. We talked to the desk clerk at the hotel. He said that Olson had just moved in and that during the time he'd been there, Olson hadn't talked much to any of the other people in the place. The clerk gave us his room number and Frank and I went up to talk to him. All right, then. Joe Friday. Just a minute. All right, come on in. Thanks. All right. Olson, this is my partner, Frank Smith. Uh-huh. Hello. Yeah, I remember you. Sit down. Thanks. You want a drink? No, no thanks. Oh, I gotta have one. What was it you want to talk to us about, Olson? Olson, huh? what was it you wanted to talk to us about? Uh, um, oh, man, I'm a hangover. I really get him. Yeah, now let's get the point, shall we? What's on your mind? Oh, I ought to. I don't know why I drink so much. I feel terrible the next day. I always drink too much. All right, now, look, Olson, maybe you got a lot of time. We haven't. We didn't come over here to sit and watch you drink. Now, get to the point. You said in the phone that you're in with a gang of thieves we're looking for. Now, what about it? Oh, what I told you on the phone is true. It's all true. I'm glad to tell you. Get it over. Get it all out in the open. That's what I need to do. Get it all out in the open. You had any breakfast yet? No, I, I just got up before I called you. Is there any place around here you can get something to eat? Don't make no difference around here. Nobody knows me. I, I think there's a place down the street right next to the hotel. But what's all this about food? I think you'll feel better if you have something to eat, won't you? No, no wait a minute. You've had enough of that. Put it down. I don't want no food. All right, we do. Let's go. You guys are getting a little bossy, aren't you? We want to hear what you got to say. You keep hitting that bottle, neither one of us is going to make it. Come on, Phil. We'll buy you some breakfast. You got a coat? It's cold out. Oh, yeah. yeah. I'm sure glad you guys came. I'm glad to get this off my Wait a minute. Chest. Those dresses in there. Woman's clothes. Those belong to you? Oh, no. I'm just keeping them for a friend. Well, the label's on some of them here. They come from out on Wilshire, don't they? Yeah. You get a gold star. Oh, I'll tell you about that. And that's part of the deal. You want to tell us now? Well, look, you made a deal about some coffee. Maybe it'll help me find my hands. Are you going to back out now? All right, let's go. We'll come back. Sure, you can come back. Take all the time you want to. Look the dresses over. I got some other stuff you'll want to see, too. But come on, let's go. Uh, let's walk down now. Let's not take the elevator. It's too noisy. Murder. All right. Now, what's this other stuff you wanted to show us, Olsen? The jewelry. I got some of it in the dresser. It's cheap stuff. Nothing worth anything. It's cheap. Where'd you get the clothes and jewelry? Oh, Red asked me to keep them for him. Who? Oh, he's the guy you want. He's the one that's engineering the thefts. He's the one. He's a real crumb. Big man. He's the one you want. I'd like to see you get him. How many other people working with him? Uh, three others. You know who they are? Sure. Sure. I know the whole story. Start to finish. I know the whole thing. I'll, I'll tell you. I'll tell you all about it. Uh, let's go out the side way. Now, where's this coffee shop? Oh, uh, wait a minute. Uh, you sure you wouldn't like a belt? Before? No, and neither do you. Now, let's go. Okay, you're calling it. Restaurant's right down here, just a couple of doors. You know where this red is? 
Yeah, I'll tell you. He's the one you want. How about the woman who works with him? Oh, that's May. Red's not the guy who goes into the stores, though. A fellow that works that part of the operation is his brother-in-law, a guy named Hank. What was her name? May. Was May. Is she the woman in the team? Yeah. Red wouldn't trust anybody else. Not him. He's a big man, you know. You don't believe it. You just ask Red. He'll tell you. Big man. Big bum. This is the place? Yeah. Uh, you positive? No, I guess you wouldn't. Booth in the back, all right? Yeah. Hey, Joe, it doesn't look like they got service in the booths. What do you want, Olsen? Well, it ain't what I want, but I'll settle for a cup of coffee. Mm. Joe? Yeah, that's all right for me. I'll get it and bring it back. Mm. Come on, Olsen, let's go back. Mm. Sit down. Mm. All right, now, suppose you start right at the beginning and tell me about it, huh? Who's Red? How do they work the operation? Where can we find them? Tell us everything. All right. Well, first off, Red's real name is Keith Jameson. They call him Red because he's got red hair, I figures. Yeah. What's he do for a living? He works for Carney. Most of the year we're on the road, and it's the off-season, so he's laying up in a trailer camp out in the valley. He doesn't do anything regular now. He just steal. Is he one of the owners of this carnival? No, he runs a pitch game. You know, rings and the pegs. If you play real good, you can win a quarter's worth of slum for five bucks. Mm -hmm. How about his wife? She travel with the show? Yeah, yeah, she travels. It ain't, it ain't a regular show, not Red's part. He's just got a concession, you know. He goes with the show like a leech. He's been thrown out of a dozen carnies for crooked stuff. His brother-in-law's a dip when we're on the road, picks pockets in the crowd around Red's place. He's gotten us all in a lot of trouble. No carny in the country will have us around anymore. Don't take him long to get wise to us. Mm -hmm. He's the one that's in on the burglaries with Red and his wife, is that it? That's right. He lists the stuff. How about his wife? Where does she fit in? Well, she's the distraction. You know, the one that comes up and asks questions, pulls the clerk away so Hank can lift the stuff. In case there's any trouble, Hank acts as lumber, too. What do you mean, lumber? Well, you know, muscle. He takes care of the guys that oh, yeah. beef. Mm -hmm. Hey, can you give me a hand with that, huh, Frank? Yeah, here. Look at my thumb. Stuff splashed on it. Is it splistered? No, it's good hot coffee in there. Hey, Arnold. Oh, thanks. Come on, pass the sugar, will you? Yeah, here you are. Where do you fit into this, Olsen? In no place, really. I'm just along for the ride. I think Red figures sometime the axe is going to fall and he wants my head under it. I usually hold on to the stolen stuff until Red finds a buyer. Does he use a fence? No, he pushes the stuff himself. He usually works on a tip. You know, if somebody wants to buy a piece of merchandise, Red meets him, sets up a deal. Uh-huh. You willing to cooperate with us all along the line on this thing? Sure, sure. I'll go along with you. You know where the necklace is that they lifted a couple of weeks ago? Yeah, yeah, Red's got it. He's looking for a buyer now. You think you can set up a meet for us? Yeah, if he thought you wanted to buy the piece, it could be done. Can you set up the meet? Sure, sure. I want to see you get him. Tell me something. How are you going to come out on this if we pick up Red and the others? What do you want out of it? I got my reasons. I got good reasons. Mm -hmm. You want to tell us what they are? Sure, I got no reason not to. G give me the sugar again. Huh? Yeah. You see, Red figures he's going to make a sideshow character out of me next season. I'm not going to go that route. Yeah? What do you mean? Oh, you know, the wild man from Borneo sit in a pit all day and yell at the customers. Bitch like that always draws a big crowd. Red figures it'll be good for picking pockets. Yeah. yeah I don't know by now. Red's out of his mind. Yeah. Wild man from Borneo. Even a leopard skin won't help. Look at me. Yeah. I only weigh 105 pounds. You are listening to Dragnet, the authentic story of your police force in action. Chesterfield is best for you. Listen to Chesterfield's record. For a full year and two months... A doctor has been making regular examinations of a group of Chesterfield smokers, and he reports no adverse effects to the nose, throat, and sinuses from smoking Chesterfields. Don't you want to try a cigarette with a record like this? Chesterfield. First, with premium quality in both regular and king size. Chesterfield. First choice with Young America. And that's from a survey of 274 colleges and universities. Try Chesterfields today. Remember, Chesterfield is America's best cigarette buy. To 
2.24 p.m., we continued to talk to Alex Olson. He told us what he knew of the operation of the thieves. We went back to his room and searched it thoroughly. We found several pieces of cheap costume jewelry and several of the stolen dresses. Most of the other things in his room were worthless, and as far as we knew, had not been stolen. We took him down to the city hall and had him checked through R&I. He had an arrest record showing several arrests for being drunk in a public place. We checked the name Keith Red Jameson through the files. There was no record on him. There was no record in the moniker file either. Jameson's brother-in-law and the two women were also checked out, but we found no previous criminal record for either of them. Communications were gotten off to Washington to check the possibility that the suspects might have records in other states. 4.40 p.m., we met in Captain Wisdom's office. Olson told us that he'd arrange a meeting for us with Red. While we listened on an extension phone, he called the suspect, told him that he had a buyer for the necklace. A meet was set up for the following morning at the entrance to Alvera Street. Red said that he'd have the necklace with him at the time. 5.37 p.m., Frank, Olson, and I drove out to the trailer camp in the valley. We checked the trailer that Red lived in and also the one his brother-in-law had. We got a good look at the car Red would drive to the meet, and then we arranged for a stake out on the trailer park. 8.23 p.m., the three of us drove back down to the city hall. You ain't going to try and take him at the meet, are you? We had not got around to that yet. Why? Well, you do, and it's going to point straight at me. You ain't going to put him away forever, you know. He's going to get out, and he's going to draw a straight line to me. I don't want that. i got to be protected. We'll take care of you. Don't worry about it. Oh, big deal. You'll take care of me. Well, how? That's what I want to know. How are you going to do it? We'll get him before he gets to the meet. Here you go in here. Look, tell me, how are you going to work it? We'll come up with a way. You ain't going to get near him in plain clothes. I'll tell you that right now. He'll spot you a mile away. Comes to cops, he's got eyes in the back of his head. You can't get anywhere near him in those clothes. Don't worry, we won't. He'll be picked up for something else. We'll find a necklace on him if he's got it, and he'll never know that's what we're after. Well, how are you going to work it? How? We'll be in uniform in a traffic car coming in from the valley. That might work, huh, Frank? Yeah, I think so. He's bound to make a mistake. When he does, we'll be there. Yeah, that would do it. He'll never figure out anything to do with that, never. Yeah, it ought to work. Yeah, that'll work good. Yeah. Uh, you guys wouldn't like No, we wouldn't. No booze. Okay. <laughs> I just noticed the bar across the street. I thought maybe you guys would like to stop there. I'd feel a little better about this if I had a drink. Just a little one. Come on now, bye. Huh? Sorry, Alex. We're going to take you over the main jail. You got a what? For the time being, we got to hold you. Oh, well, now, wait, it ain't the jail that bothers me, not being in jail. It's just that I hear it's pretty rough to get a drink over at the Gray Bar Hotel, you know. That's the only thing that bothers me. There's no room service there. Yeah, well, it'll all work out for you. Oh, I don't know. So I got mixed up in this thing. Seems like I got no choice in anything. It don't seem fair. I got no choice. DA's office will know what you did. It'll be marked down that way. Oh, I got no beef with you guys. You better take it easy with Red, though. Is that right? Yeah, he's got a gun. The following morning at 4.30 a.m., Frank and I were dressed in the uniform of traffic officers. We were parked two blocks from the trailer park in a traffic car. The meet with Red was scheduled for 9 a.m. The officers on stakeout at the trailer park told us that they'd seen no activity in Red's trailer the night before. From where we were parked, we could keep his car under constant surveillance. At 7.45 a.m., we saw the suspect and his wife come out of the trailer and get into the car. We followed them over to Ventura Boulevard and from there down Coinga Pass. We kept far enough behind them so that they'd have less chance of knowing that they were being followed. They turned by the freeway construction point and continued on down Coenga Boulevard. When they got to the corner of Yucca and Coenga, they made a mistake. They turned left from the wrong lane of traffic. Well, that's it. You want to hit the siren? Yeah. I got the light. He's going straight down Yucca, Joe. Yeah. Pull up behind him, huh? Right. Okay, he sees us. He's pulling over. I'll cover the other side. Watch yourself. Right. What's wrong, officer? I didn't do anything. See your operator's license, please? Sure, it's in my pocket. I'll get it. You want to get out of the car, please? Well, I don't have to get out to show you my driver's license. I'd like to have you get out of the car. Don't argue with him, Red. Do what he says. What's all this about, anyway? What do you stop me for? You made an illegal left turn back there, Coenga. Illegal? Oh, you got the wrong guy. See that guy in front of me? He jumped the light something awful. He's the guy you ought to be after. He's the one, not me. All right, move over to the car. What? Over by the car. Now put your hands up there. No, against the car. I don't know what you mean. Now come off it, Jameson. You old wimpy. Get out of here! All right, Jameson, on your feet. What are you doing? You got no right to beat him up like that. Big thing for making a left turn. What are you guys trying to prove? Just wait until the papers get this. We got friends, you All know. All right, lady, friends. take it easy. I won't take it easy. Man makes a mistake, and you cops act like you were the judges. You got no right to treat a citizen like that. Here, Frank, you'll hold this. Yeah. 38 Cove. You play rough, don't you, Red? Ah, shut up. What's this, Red? You leave that alone. That's mine. Doesn't concern you. 
Necklace, Joe? Yeah. So it's a necklace. What's that prove? You got nothing on us. Write out the ticket for the left turn let us go. That's all you got. You got a permit for this gun? No. This necklace is stolen. You know that, don't you? I don't know anything about it. I'm not going to say anything until I see a lawyer. Nothing. I knew this would happen. Always knew it about you. You're yellow. Willing to take a chance as long as you ain't going to be nailed. Let something go wrong and right away you start screaming for a lawyer. Poor excuse for a man. You took a chance and you lost. Well, don't be a coward about it. You got no excuse. None in the world. You got no excuse at all. Well, that makes you even, lady. Huh? Neither of you. The story you have just heard is true. The names were changed to protect the innocent. On April 15th, trial was held in Department 87, Superior Court of the State of California, in and for the County of Los Angeles. In a moment, the results of that trial. Now, here is our star, Jack Webb. Thank you, George Fenneman. I sure hope you were listening real close to what George Fenneman had to say tonight, because it proves what I always tell you. You can't beat the premium quality you get in Chesterfield, regular or king size. I'd like you to try Chesterfield's. They're much milder, and they have a wonderful taste. Henry Donald Swenson, Anna Catherine Swenson, and May Ruth Jameson were tried and convicted of five counts of burglary in the second degree. They received sentence as prescribed by law. Burglary in the second degree is punishable by imprisonment in the state penitentiary for a period of not less than one nor more than 15 years. Keith Walter Jameson was tried and convicted for receiving stolen property on five counts and received sentence as prescribed by law. Receiving stolen property is punishable by imprisonment in the state penitentiary for a period not to exceed ten years. Because of his cooperation, Alex Robert Olson received a lighter sentence and was placed on probation. You have just heard Dragnet, a series of authentic cases from official files. Technical advice comes from the office of Chief of Police W.H. Parker, Los Angeles Police Department. Technical advisors Captain Jack Donahoe, Sergeant Marty Wynn, Sergeant Vance Brasher. Heard tonight were Ben Alexander, Stacey Harris, script by John Robinson, music by Walter Schumann. Hal Gibney speaking. For a million laughs, tune in Chesterfield's Martin and Lewis show, Tuesday on this same NBC station. And sound off for Chesterfield. Either regular or king size, you'll find premium quality Chesterfields much milder. Chesterfield is best for you. Chesterfield has brought you Dragnet transcribed from Los Angeles. Now, new Fatima has the tip for your lips. Fatima tips of perfect cork. King size for natural filtering. Fatima quality for a much better flavor and aroma. So remember, new Fatima has the tip for your lips. Fatima, see how smooth they are. Remember, Fatima is made by the makers of Chesterfield, Liggett and Myers, one of tobacco's most respected names. For Chesterfield. Chesterfield is best for you. First cigarette with premium quality in both regular and king size. Chesterfield brings you Dragnet. Ladies and gentlemen, the story you are about to hear is true. The names have been changed to protect the innocent. You're a detective sergeant. You're assigned a homicide detail. You get a call from a friend who's been offered $5,000 to kill a man. He can't tell you who made the offer. He does tell you that no matter what happens, the man is going to be killed. Your job? Stop it. Years ahead of them all. Chesterfield is years ahead of them all. The quality contrast between Chesterfield and other leading brands is a revealing story. Recent chemical analyses give an index of good quality for the country's six leading cigarette brands. The index of good quality table, which is a ratio of high sugar to low nicotine, shows Chesterfield quality highest. Chesterfield quality highest. 
15% higher than its nearest competitor. Chesterfield quality highest. 31% higher than the average of the five other leading brands. Yes, Chesterfield is first with premium quality in both regular and king size. Don't you want to try a cigarette with a record like this? Chesterfield. Dragnet, the documented drama of an actual crime. For the next 30 minutes, in cooperation with the Los Angeles Police Department, you will travel step by step on the side of the law through an actual case transcribed from official police files. From beginning to end, from crime to punishment, Dragnet is the story of your police force in action. It was Monday, February 9th. It was cold in Los Angeles. We were working the day watch out of homicide detail. My partner's Frank Smith. The boss is Captain Lorman. My name's Friday. I was on my way into the office, and it was 7.45 a.m. when I got to room 42. Homicide. Back to you, Joe? Yeah. You're in early, aren't you? Yeah, I couldn't sleep last night. Dropped off about 3 this morning, then woke up at 5, couldn't get back to sleep. I got up, made some coffee, and decided to come on in the office. Yeah, I had a little trouble last night, too. Sleep you did? I mean, yeah. What's your trouble? I don't know. I got up late yesterday morning. I guess that was it. I'll get it. All right. Homicide, Friday. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I remember. Johnny. Yeah. Mm-hmm. When did you get the letter? Yeah, we'll be right over. Right. Bye. You remember that bartender over in that place on 6th Street, fellow named Johnny? Yeah, is that him on the phone? Yeah, says he's got an offer to make himself a fast $5,000. What for? Somebody wants him to kill a man. Eight ten a.m., Frank and I drove over to John Bronson's apartment. He lived in a new development on Wilshire Boulevard. We checked the nameplates in the lobby of the building, and then we went up to apartment 6B. We rang the bell and waited. Hiya, Joe, Frank. Come on in. Oh, hey, John. Let's say, John. Kind of early to get you guys over here, but I got worried about it and figured I'd better talk to you. Uh Uh-huh. You want to tell us what it's all about? Yeah, come on out in the kitchen. I got some coffee made. Okay. Yeah, sit down there. I'll pour you a cup of coffee. Fine. Good, thanks. Well, it uh, started last night. I guess it was about 10, 10, 15. Pay phone in the bar rang. Kept ringing. I went over to answer it. Well, on the other end, asked for Johnny. Yeah. Told him it was mean, and he hit me with a deal. At first, I thought he was kidding. What did he say? Well, he asked me if I wanted to make a fast 5,000. Of course, I told him, yeah. Then he sprung the snapper, said he wanted me to kill this guy, a fellow named Wilhelm Ulrich. You know this Ulrich? No, never laid eyes on him. First time I even heard the name. Okay, go ahead, John. Well, this guy on the phone started to lay it out. Told me how he wanted it done. Uh, here's your coffee. Thank you. I asked the joker who he was. He said it didn't matter. All that counted, he said, was that I knock off this Ulrich guy. Yeah. I told him I didn't know who the man was, that I didn't know where to get in touch with him to kill him. You know, kind of going along with a gag all this time, thought it was a joke. Uh-huh. Well, this fellow on the phone said he'd give me all the dope I had to have, said I'd get it in the mail this morning. Yeah. Came special delivery just before I called you. Special. Uh-huh. You got the letter, have you? Yeah, I got it in the other room. I'll get it for you. Well, I'll go with you. John, how much have you handled the letter? Well, I opened it up. I didn't know what was in it. Mm-hmm. If I'd have known what it was, I wouldn't have touched it at all, but I didn't know. I looked at it when I found out what was in it and figured I'd better call you. Couldn't see any way to tell who sent it. Maybe you can when you see it. Mm-hmm. When I saw what it was, I didn't touch it anymore. Mm-hmm. Now, let's see here. It's money. Yeah, five $100 bills. And what's the letter say? Just a minute. Get this by the edge here. I don't want to... Uh, it says, Johnny, here's the down payment. You'll get the rest when you finish the job. And the name is Wilhelm Ulrich. The address is 2192 Vine Street, Hollywood. It's written on a typewriter. No signature. That's it. Let me see it, will you? Oh, you can see it here, First off, I thought the whole thing was a joke. I didn't believe it. You know, I just thought it was some drunk trying to be funny. We get calls like that all the time, guys trying to be funny. Yeah. And when I got this letter, I got scared. I ain't going to kill nobody, especially somebody don't even know, not for no 5000 Did you recognize the voice on the phone, John? No, I don't think I ever heard it before. You got any idea why he'd call you? No, I've been clean. I haven't got a record. Nothing like that. I run a clean place. Never done anything that could tie me up with the rackets. Yeah, we know. Well, maybe I ran a little booze during Prohibition. Not much, just a little. Everybody was doing it then, but I'm clean now. Joe, there's a postmark here on the letters, mail in Hollywood. Yeah, I saw that. We can check the postal authorities on the mailbox number, find out when it was picked up, huh? Yeah. Time on it here is uh, 11, looks like 11.45 last night. That's yeah. the time. Uh-huh. You sure that you don't know Ulrich, John? Possibility he's been in your bar sometime, maybe, huh? 
Well, that'd be hard to say. We do a good business. Lots of people come in I don't know. You know, just come in once in a while. I wouldn't know who they were. They keep quiet, and I ain't getting nosy. Yeah. Well, we're going on back to the office. You'll probably hear from the caller again, Johnny, and as soon as you do, you let us know, will you? You going to see this Ulrich fellow? Yeah, we'll talk to him. Might be better if you don't say anything about this to anybody, John. Oh, don't worry. I won't. Okay, we'll be talking to you later. You'll be at the bar? Yeah, I'll be there at four. Okay, thanks a million. No strain. Glad to do it. Can't get over it, that guy calling and making an offer like that. I just can't get over it. He should know better than that. Yeah? Sure, yeah, I don't know. Somebody ain't going to kill somebody they don't even know. We drove back to the city hall and turned the letter over to the crime lab to see if they could find any physical evidence to help us identify the writer. We ran the name Wilhelm Ulrich through R&I and we found no record. A further check on the name and we came up with one possibility. The address listed on the report was the same as the one given in the letter. We pulled the package and checked it. Let's take a look at it. All right. Well, let's see. There's a crime report and a statement here. Report from Georgia Street Receiving Hospital. Well, now, what's the date on that? January 2nd last year. Yeah. Well, it seems this already got a hold of some poison wine. Uh, wine? Yeah. Hey, wait a minute. Yeah? You remember, Joe? He was an old guy. Uh, he was a German. He got a bottle of wine for Christmas and opened it New Year's Day. We worked that case with Lamonica and Galindo. Oh, sure, I remember now. Yeah, we ran down some of the leads for him. They didn't go anywhere. Yeah. That was the one where he didn't know where the wine came from, innit? Yeah. Nothing came from it. The leads didn't go anyplace. As I remember, he's a nice old guy. I wonder why somebody's after him. I don't know. Last time, we couldn't find anybody with a motive. Well, there's one someplace. We'd helped investigate an attempted poisoning of Wilhelm Ulrich over a year ago. Somebody'd sent him a bottle of imported wine. Ulrich had opened the wine for dinner on New Year's and had drunk some of it. A short time later, he was seized with violent stomach cramps. He was rushed to Georgia Street Receiving Hospital for treatment. He was then transferred to the county hospital for further treatment. Examination of the remaining wine showed that it had been dosed with a quantity of poison. Fortunately, Ulrich didn't drink much of the poison wine and he recovered. Detectives Joe LaMonica and Danny Galindo had handled most of the investigation. We'd helped them briefly in checking out some of the leads that they'd gotten. We checked with them again on the case. From the crime report, we got a list of the people that the two officers had interviewed. We checked with them, and they gave us as much personal information as they could. 1.15 p.m. We drove out to see Wilhelm Ulrich. We found him in the yard digging in a rose bed. No, I can't understand it. I never quite believed that about the wine, sir. Well, why do you say that, Ulrich? Well, I found it hard to believe in my heart that anyone would want to do me harm. I have no enemies. No one that hates me enough to want to kill me, I'm sure of that. Well, I'm afraid you could be wrong about that, Ulrich. The officer said that before. Somehow, though, I just can't believe it. I have nothing anyone would want to kill me for. All of the people I know are my friends. We all get along. Yes, sir. Look at that. Isn't that a beautiful rose? Such loveliness. Mm-hmm. No? I'm sorry, officers, you're mistaken about this. I wonder if we could talk to you in the house, sir. Yes, that might be better. I could make you a cup of hot tea if you'd like. No, sir, thanks. Just the same. Have you officers had lunch yet? Yes, sir, thank you. Oh, I thought maybe you'd like a sandwich. Just got some liverwurst from a little place downtown. German, excellent food. Mm-hmm. Here, I'll get the door. Just sit down any place. I have to get the dirt off my shoes. Marta would be very angry if I tracked dirt around. Marta, that's your daughter, isn't it? Yes, she comes over every couple of days and straightens up the house for me. Wonderful girl, Marta. I don't know what I'd do without her. Yes, sir. Now, there's a couple of things we'd like to ask you. Certainly. Anything I can do to help. Well, we'd like to go over the information on the report here. Is that from the last time? The time of the wine? Yes, sir. That's right. All right. You just ask anything you want. I've got nothing to hide. All right, sir. We checked the crime report you filled out last year. Now, has anything changed in your family since then? Uh, no. You gentlemen still working on that? Well, yes, sir. We have another matter to discuss here. Oh, uh, there's one thing that has changed. What's that, sir? The part here about uh, me running the business. Mm-hmm. Uh, that's changed. I still run it in a way. I still supervise it, but Robert, he actually runs it. Oh, uh, Robert. You mean this name here, Robert Davis? Yes, he's my son-in-law, Marta's husband. He takes care of the business now. He's a good boy. Marta's lucky to have him. How long has your son-in-law been running the business, Mr. Ulrich? Well, let me see. It's been about eight, nine months. He took over right after I got out of the hospital. He's done wonders with it, wonders. How's that, sir? Modernized it, changed it all around. Had one of those efficiency experts come in and study the people. 
time and motion men, I think they call them. Mm -hmm. They come in with a stopwatch and look at the people doing the work and figure out how long it should take them to do a certain job, and then they plan how the job can be done faster and cheaper. Wonderful thing, big changes. Yes, sir. I don't want you to take offense at this, Ulrich, but how are the relations between you and your son-in-law? I don't think I understand. Well, you get along. Do you have any quarrels, disagreements? Oh, no, Robert and I never disagree. I found out that it didn't pay to argue with him. Sir? I found out that it didn't pay. He was always right. Uh-huh. Yes, you see, we had a few arguments when he took over the business about this time and motion study thing. I see. You want to tell us about these arguments? They weren't anything serious. I didn't think that it was a good idea to change. I couldn't see any reason for it. Everything was going good. The business was making money. Everybody seemed to be happy. I didn't want to take a chance disturbing a good thing. You know, the golden goose. Mm-hmm. You want to go ahead, please? Well, Robert said that we were behind the times, that if we didn't do something about it, we wouldn't be able to compete with other people. We manufacture women's dresses, you know. Yes, sir, I saw that on the report. I finally told him to go ahead. I thought that he'd fail. He didn't. Now we compete. More dresses, more money. The employees are happy. They have music, coffee times. They like it. But it's all changed. I don't go down there anymore. I don't care much for it. It's changed. So I just stay home and work in the garden. It's Robert's factory now. Uh, you and Robert haven't had any other disagreements, have you? Oh, no. He's a fine young man, running the business very well. He's a good boy. I'm lucky to have him. Well, how about your competitors, Mr. Ulrich? How do they feel about this change in the way you operate your business? They resent it? Oh, no. I haven't really got any competitors. The big manufacturers don't care. I don't make enough dresses to bother them. And the other little men are in the same boat with me. They're too busy running the factories to worry about me. Mm-hmm. Now, can you think of anybody who might want to do a thing like this? How about that phone call? I told you before, I can't. I find it very hard to believe. Well, we'll have to talk to the people that you know, the people around you. We'd appreciate it if you didn't tell anybody what we were after. If you wanted that way, it's so hard to believe. I still think you're wrong. Looks like it's going to rain. Be good for the flowers. It's been dry up in the valley. Farmers need the rain. Yes, sir. Now, you'll go along with us on this thing, will you? Not tell anybody about it? Sure, I'll help. It's all right if I tell my daughter and son-in-law about it, isn't it? Well, it'd be better if you didn't say anything to him or your daughter, not to anybody. But they're going to see you here. They're going to ask questions. They're not stupid. Yes, sir, you could tell them that we were asking about somebody that you employ. How'll that be? What do I say if Robert asks what's about? I, I have no secrets for him. Well, tell him we ask you not to tell anybody about it. Tell him it's police business. Happens all the time. I suppose I could do that, but I don't like it. I don't like it at all. It's lying. Yes, sir, that may be true, but it's the best way. Oh, I guess it's a small lie. I can tell myself that. It's a small lie. Now, we'll have some policemen come out and watch Mr. Elric until we find the person who's doing this. Do you have to do that? Yes, sir, I'm afraid so. Well, no, I, I don't like that at all. Even worse than the lying. No, no, I don't like it at all. Mr. Ulrich, I wonder if you really understand that when we ask you not to tell anybody about this, when we want to keep you under surveillance, it's just for your protection. But if what you say is true, if somebody really does want to kill me, if somebody hates me that much... Yes, sir. Can you stop them? We called the office and had a team of men sent out to keep Wilhelm Ulrich under surveillance. His house and his person were to be watched 24 hours a day until we apprehended the person or persons who wanted him killed. We spent the rest of the afternoon talking to the people in the neighborhood. From all of them, we got the same story. Ulrich was liked and respected through the area. All of the local shopkeepers and their business associates told us that he paid cash for everything he bought and that his credit was good. He was active in the local flower club and had twice in the past served as president of the organization. The neighbors confirmed what Ulrich had told us about his family. His son-in-law and his daughter seemed to be devoted to the elderly man and were constantly trying to get him to sell the house he lived in and come to live with them. 6.42 p.m., we returned to the office. Man, it's really coming down, huh? Yeah, it sure is. You got a raincoat in your locker? Yeah, I got one of those plastic kind in the bag. Oh, yeah, I want to get me one of them. I'll get mine. We'll go over and check the son-in-law. You got his address? Yeah, it's a place out on Ivar. Sure was a nice old man, huh? Yeah, he seems to be. So you want to grab my coat, I'll get the phone. Yeah, I'll get it. Thank you. Homicide Friday. Yeah. Uh-huh. Yeah, John. When? Yeah. No, we'll be right over. Right away. You bet. Frank. Yeah? Call from the bartender, Johnny. Yeah? Says he just got another phone call. Person told him that he'd gotten the down payment for the job, and he wanted to know why Ulrich hadn't been killed. Yeah. Guy said if Johnny didn't get on it, the money wouldn't do him any good. Told him to make up his own mind. Uh -huh. Either he makes good on the job or they'll kill him. You are listening to Dragnet, the authentic story of your police force in action. 
Chesterfield is best for you. Listen to Chesterfield's record. For a full year and two months, a doctor has been making regular examinations of a group of Chesterfield smokers, and he reports no adverse effects to the nose, throat, and sinuses from smoking Chesterfields. Don't you want to try a cigarette with a record like this? Chesterfield. First with premium quality in both regular and king size. Chesterfield. First choice with Young America. And that's from a survey of 274 colleges and universities. Try Chesterfields today. Remember, Chesterfield is America's best cigarette buy. Seven ten p.m. We got to the bar on 6th Street. There were only a couple of people in the place. The bartender, Johnny, told us of the phone call that he'd received. He said that the person on the phone had told him that if he didn't hurry up and kill Ulrich, Johnny himself would be taken care of. We called Lee Jones at the crime lab to ask him if he'd been able to come up with anything on the letter. He told us that there was no way of tracing it. Fingerprints found on the letter were those of the bartender. Photographs were taken of the letter, and along with the money, it was booked for further evidence. We'd gotten in touch with the postal authorities, and they said that they'd give us assistance. They gave us the location of the box where the letter had been mailed, and they said they'd try to find out who sent it. We arranged for a stake out on the bar, and then we called the men at Ulrich's home. They told us that the son-in-law, Davis, and Ulrich's daughter had been there, but that no one else had seen or spoken to the elderly man. 9.32 p.m., Frank and I drove out to check on Robert Davis. We got to the apartment house and rang the bell to the manager's room. Yes? Miss Franklin? Yes, what is it? Police officers, ma'am. We'd like to talk if we could. Oh, well, I suppose it's all right. Come on in. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Right. This is my partner, Frank Smith. My name's Friday. What is it you wanted to see me about? Oh, we'd like to talk to you about one of your tenants, please. Oh? Which one? I bet I can guess. Ma'am? It's about that couple on the fifth floor, isn't it? The Radcliffe's. It's them, isn't it? No, ma'am, it isn't. We'd like to talk to you about a Robert Davis and his wife. The Davises? Yes, ma'am. Why? Well, never thought it. Should be the Radcliffe's the way they carry on. The Davises. I'd never have thought it. What do you want to know about them? Well, it's just a routine investigation, ma'am. Can you tell us how long they lived here? Well, see now. It's been almost six years. They've been in the building, yeah. Yeah, six years, anyway. I haven't always lived in the same apartment, though. Ma'am? When they moved in, they was in a little apartment on the second floor, living room, a pull-down bed, little bitty place. And then they moved up to the sixth floor, two-bedroom, nice place. Nice people. The Davises, oh, I'd never have thought it. Do they have any close friends in the building, would you know? Well, not Mr. Davies. He's kind of the quiet type. Never has much to do with anybody he keeps to himself. Mm -hmm. Now, Mrs. Davis, that's a different thing. She's a living doll. She's nice to everybody and so sweet. Never had a harsh word for anybody. Always a smile. I think Mr. Davis thinks he's too good for anybody. You always seem kind of snooty. Yes, ma'am. Do you ever have any arguments with anybody in the building that you might know of? Well, he's had a few arguments like everybody else does. Like I said before, he thinks he's too good for anybody. He thinks he's better than anybody. He's got no right to either. Ma'am? Why, well, he owes half the people in the neighborhood money. Way behind his bills. Owes me a couple of months' rent. Never seems to be able to pay anybody he owes. I talked to the milkman. Owes him for a month back. Every time he asks for his money, Davis tells him to come back and stop hounding him. Can't understand it. Seemed like such nice people when they moved in. Uh, two years ago, that's when the trouble started. Uh -huh. It was our understanding that he had a pretty good job. Zach. And he has. Uh, works for his father-in-law, manages some kind of a factory. Uh, dresses, I think. Oh, but that isn't it. He makes enough money. He just spends it faster than he makes it, that's all. I think he gambles. Why do you say that, ma'am? Oh, he's always going off on some kind of business trip. At least that's what he says it is, but I know different. Yes, how's that, ma'am? Well, he'd come back from one of those business trips once. Cab pulled up, and uh, it just happened that I was standing out in front. A driver got out and gave him the bill for the cab all the way from the airport. Almost six dollars. Well, anyway, when Mr. Davis got the money out of his pocket to pay the cab bill, a chip fell on the sidewalk. He didn't think that I saw it, but I did. A cab driver did, too. Well, what kind of a chip was it, ma'am? Uh, well, you understand I'm not a gambling woman, so I wouldn't know. But the cab driver, he knew. Oh, you just betcha he knew right away. He picked up the chip and handed it back to Mr. Davis and said something about being in Las Vegas, kind of kidding, you know. Yes, ma'am. Well, I've seen Mr. Davis get upset, but never like that. He grabbed the chip away from the cab driver and told him to mind his own business. 
So that he'd had to chip a long time, that it didn't concern the cab driver. He was real mean. Uh-huh. And then at night, well, the argument that he and the missus had, I never in all my days heard anything like that. Well, what happened, ma'am? Well, uh, you understand that I just happened to be in the hall. I was making sure that the lights on the floor were all on. Those bulbs are always burning out, and I was checking them, you know. Yes, ma'am. Well, anyways, I hear this argument coming from the Davis's apartment. Mrs. Davis is telling how she isn't going to stand for it anymore. Mr. Davis better settle down and get to work and stop this foolishness. She didn't come right out and say what foolishness, but I could tell. I could tell. It was his gambling, that's what it was. Yes, ma'am. Is there anything else that you could think of that you could tell us about the Davises? Uh, no, I don't think so. I'm kind of surprised, though. I don't like him, but I never thought that he'd have the police after him. Well, we're just conducting a routine investigation, Miss Franklin. Oh, now, you don't have to play cagey with me. I know about you, policeman. You and your routine investigations, you ain't fooling me. You want him for something. Now, what is it? Can you tell me? Ma'am, it's just police business, just routine. We'd appreciate it if you didn't say anything to anybody about us being here. Oh, sure, I'll go along with you. I won't tell a soul, not a living soul. Thank you very much, Miss Franklin. I'm going to leave you our card. We'd appreciate it if you give us a call if anything comes up. Uh-huh. Um, Michigan 5211, is that right? Yes, ma'am. You just ask for the homicide division. It's written All down right. there. You just bet I will. Now, I'd be glad to help. I'm just glad to. All right, fine. Uh, one thing, though. Yes, ma'am? Are you sure there ain't nothing that you want those people on the fifth floor for? The Radcliffe's? From the manager's office, we called the Ulrich home. We talked to Mr. Ulrich. He told us about the visit that afternoon from the Davises. He said that he hadn't told Robert Davis anything about the threats on his life. We went upstairs and talked to Davis. We told him that we had a serious matter to discuss with him, and we asked him to accompany us down to the city hall. I don't know what you're talking about. I told the police everything I know about this a year ago. I don't know anything about it. I wish I could help, but I can't. You know, this got me worried. Well, if you haven't done anything wrong, you got nothing to worry about. I haven't done anything wrong. In here. Mm. Go ahead. Mm. All right. Now tell me what this is all about. Frank? Yeah. You want to check the office, see if we got any answers to the calls this afternoon? Right. You got a cigarette? Yeah. Help yourself. Well, let's get to it, huh? I'm going to get home and get some sleep. I've got a rough day tomorrow. This won't take very long. How do you get along with your father-in-law? All right, why? Like to know? Well, I don't see how that concerns you, but you ask, so I'll tell you. We get along fine, me and the old man. We get along just great. Does that make you happy? That's not the point. Anything? No, nothing new. You over to Las Vegas much, Davis? Not much. Why? How often would you say you went over there? Maybe a couple times a year, not any more than that. When was the last time? What's so important about when I was in Vegas last? You guys spent a little more time finding out who's trying to kill my father-in-law. Less time asking questions that don't make any sense. You'd be doing a better job. Why can't you tell us about somebody trying to kill your father-in-law? All I know is what he told me this afternoon. What did he tell you? Not much. Said something about a bartender, something about a phone call. Did he tell you who the bartender was? No, just that it was someplace over on 6th. All right, Davis, come off it, huh? What do you mean, come off it? You want to tell us why you did it, or do you want us to tell you? Did what? I got nothing to tell you. I don't know what you guys are talking about. We talked to your father-in-law this morning. We told him that we'd gotten a report that his life had been threatened. We didn't tell him how it happened. We didn't tell him where our information came from, so he didn't know. All right, so maybe I got it someplace else. Oh, wait a minute. You couldn't have. We didn't talk to anybody else. Well, I heard it someplace. I don't remember, but I heard it. We checked around, found out you gamble quite a lot. You're a steady loser. You owe a lot of money in town, don't you? Isn't that right? Yeah, that's right. Now, I think we can make you for the threat on Ulrich's life. I don't think we'll have any trouble at all. You had the motive. You had the opportunity. First thing in the morning, we'll check with the factory. We'll see if you made a withdrawal of $500. We make that, and you've got big trouble. You figure you're going to be able to do that? We think so, yeah. We'll get your father-in-law down here and ask him what he told you this afternoon. Find out if he did tell you about that bartender, about the bar on 6th, about the phone call. You know, it doesn't look like there's going to be too much trouble making you for this. Save your time. What do you mean? You don't have to go through that thrash. I did it. I tried to have the old man knocked off. Were you the one who sent him the wine last year? Yeah. That's when it started. I started to gamble. Lost a lot of money. Couldn't pay it back. No way to pay it back. Guys I owed the money to were leaning on me. I had to pay them off. Had to. Yeah. I can only think of one way. Get rid of the old man. Didn't you get a pretty good salary out of working for him? Yeah, pretty good, but it didn't go far. Not far enough. I tried to win it back. Make good on the losses I had. I couldn't do it. The more I gambled, the worse it got. I just couldn't do it. Wasn't any other way. 
No other way. I decided to kill the old man. It's the only way. Can't you see that? It's the only way I could get clear. Yeah. I figured if I could get rid of the old man, I'd have everything fixed. Everything would be okay. I guess it worked out all right anyway. What do you mean? Well, there's nothing in the book they can throw at me. He's still alive. I didn't kill him. Who got hurt? You did. Well, how do you figure? I didn't kill him. You're going to jail for trying. The story you have just heard is true. The names were changed to protect the innocent. On June 18th, trial was held in Department 89, Superior Court of the State of California, in and for the County of Los Angeles. In a moment, the results of that trial. And now, here is our star, Jack Webb. Thank you, George Fenneman. I want to thank all of you for your interest in Dragnet. Thanks very much for your letters. We really appreciate them, and we'll try to keep right on giving you the kind of a show that you like. I want to thank all of you, too, who have switched to Chesterfields. I know you're going to like them, and I know you'll find they're best for you. Now, you folks who haven't tried Chesterfields, I'd like you to pick up a carton tomorrow. Chesterfield. It's a great smoke. <laughs> Robert Walter Davis was tried and convicted of attempted homicide. He received sentence as prescribed by law. Attempted homicide is punishable by imprisonment in the state penitentiary for a period of not less than 20 years. You have just heard Dragnet, a series of authentic cases from official files. Technical advice comes from the office of Chief of Police W.H. Parker, Los Angeles Police Department. Technical advisors, Captain Jack Donahoe, Sergeant Marty Wynn, Sergeant Vance Brasher. Heard tonight were Ben Alexander, Vic Perrin. Script by John Robinson. Music by Walter Schumann. Hal Gibney speaking. For a million laughs, tune in Chesterfield's Martin and Lewis show Tuesday on this same NBC station. And sound off for Chesterfield's. Either regular or king size, you'll find premium quality Chesterfield's much milder. Chesterfield is best for you. Chesterfield has brought you Dragnet transcribed from Los Angeles. Now, new Fatima has the tip for your lips. Fatima tips of perfect cork. King size for natural filtering. Fatima quality for a much better flavor and aroma. So remember, new Fatima has the tip for your lips. Fatima. See how smooth they are. Remember, Fatima is made by the makers of Chesterfield, Liggett and Myers, one of tobacco's most respected names. <laughs> Tonight, it's Adventure with Barry Craig on NBC. Sound off for Chesterfield. Chesterfield is best for you. First cigarette with premium quality in both regular and king size. Chesterfield brings you Dragnet. Ladies and gentlemen, the story you are about to hear is true. The names have been changed to protect the innocent. You're a detective sergeant. You're assigned a robbery detail. A suspect has been apprehended. You have a positive identification from the victim. Your job, investigate. Years ahead of them all. Chesterfield is years ahead of them all. The quality contrast between Chesterfield and other leading brands is a revealing story. Recent chemical analyses give an index of good quality for the country's six leading cigarette brands. The index of good quality table, which is a ratio of high sugar to low nicotine, shows Chesterfield quality highest. Chesterfield quality highest. 15% higher than its nearest competitor. Chesterfield quality, highest. 31% higher than the average of the five other leading brands. Yes, Chesterfield is first with premium quality in both regular and king size. Don't you want to try a cigarette with a record like this? Chesterfield. <laughs> Drag 
Dragnet, the documented drama of an actual crime. For the next 30 minutes, in cooperation with the Los Angeles Police Department, you will travel step by step on the side of the law through an actual case transcribed from official police files. From beginning to end, from crime to punishment, Dragnet is the story of your police force in action. It was Wednesday, June 3rd. It was hot in Los Angeles. We were working the day watch out of robbery detail. My partner's Frank Smith. The boss is Captain Didion. My name's Friday. I was on my way into the office, and it was 7.46 a.m. when I got to room 27A. Robbery. Joe? Yeah? You're early. Yeah. I got to run over to Georgia Street Receiving Hospital. What's the matter? I don't know, Frank. I started to get headaches last night. I couldn't sleep. A ringing in my ears. I don't know what it is. Now, hold on. Stay right there. What? Just got up my locker. I'll get it for you. What are you talking about? The headaches get worse when you move. What? When you move around, it gets worse, right? Yeah. Feels like a head's going to blow up? Yeah. Uh-huh. Glad you came to me. I know just what it is. Got stuff right up here. Someplace. Uh, yeah, here it is. There you are, Joe. Take two. Put you right up. What is it? Salt. Salt? Salt. That's your trouble. You don't get enough salt. Same thing happened to me last summer. Ever since then, I always keep a bottle of salt tablets right in my locker. Always ready. Take two. Fix you right up. I don't know. You got a penny? What for? A cup? Now, wait a minute, Joe. We're not going to drink that water anymore. No? Just a minute. Bought a whole case of this for us. There you are, boy. Drink it right out of the bottle. What is it? Poland water, Joe. 100% pure. Right from the springs. Real water. Yeah? Yep. Read right there on the bottle, see? Not carbonated. Full of minerals and good things. Yeah, well, Frank, maybe I ought to wait and see the doctor, huh? Joe, believe me, I know what's wrong. It's happened to me. Same thing. Salt, that's what you need. Yeah. Well, there you are. Poland water and the pills. Fix you right up. Here they are. Go ahead. Oh, look, I appreciate all this. Really, I do. But I think I ought to see the doctor, huh? Joe, don't you trust me? Well, yeah. Take the pills. Salt. Salt. Take them. All right. There now, that wasn't bad, was it? If the headaches don't go away, we can drop by Georgia Street and see the doc. Oh, you want to give me the bottle? I'll put the cap back on. Keep yeah, it fresh for all right. you. Anything in the box? Yeah, an arrest report. We're supposed to check the guy out. Anything on it? Held up a grocery store at the corner of 7th of Francis a week ago yesterday. When did they pick him up? Last night. Victim saw him on the street and called a radio car. Took him into custody and then booked him. Well, let's go talk to him. I'll see what he's got to say. After we get through, we can drop by the hospital if he's still got the headaches. This shouldn't take too long. Well, sure, guy's already confessed. <laughs> We ran the name of the suspect, Thomas Stanford, through R&I, but we found no previous criminal record for any one of his description. 8.10 a.m., we drove over to the main jail. We went up to the second floor and signed in. Stanford was brought from his cell, and Frank and I took him to one of the interview rooms. We gave him a cigarette, and he started to talk. He was quiet and cooperative. Yeah, I did the robbery. A week ago yesterday. I'd like to check some things out here on the arrest report. Sure, I want to get this over with. I, I did it like I told you. Nothing special. Just held up the store. Mm -hmm. Your full name is Thomas Arthur Stanford, is that right? Yeah, Thomas Arthur. My friends call me Tom. Uh -huh. Your home address is 1824 and a quarter South Mariposa Avenue? Yeah, I live with my father, 1824 and a quarter South Mariposa Avenue, L.A. 7. What's your father's name? Arthur. Same as my middle name. I was named after him. You employed? I'm not regular. What do you mean? Well, I don't have a regular job like in a factory or a store. I'm a gardener. I work for different people. Can you give us a list of the people you work for? I'm sure if you got to have them. It's just routine. Oh. Yeah, I'll give them to you. You want to tell us how you committed the robbery? Yeah, I'll tell you. Isn't much to tell, though. It's pretty simple. I went in and held the place up, took the money. That's about all there is to it. Were you armed when you went into that grocery store? Yeah. Yeah, I had a gun. What kind of a gun? Thirty-two automatic. Had eight bullets in it. Where's the gun now? Threw it away. Where? In one of the ponds up in Ferndale. You mean up in Griffith Park? Yeah, just a little up the canyon. There. You want to show us where it is? Sure. All right. If you start right at the beginning, tell us all about the robbery, what you did. Why do you have to know all that? I told you I did it. There's nothing more you have to know. we got to have it for the record. It's just routine, like I told you. You guys do a lot of things. It's routine, don't you? Yeah, we do. Quite a bit. Was there anybody in the store when you went in? Just the woman that owned the place. I guess she owned it. The way she carried on, you thought it was her own money I was taking. Well, I took out the gun, and I told her it was a stick-up. I said for her not to cause any trouble. What'd she say to that? Well, that's when she got hacked at me. Started to yell. What'd you do? 
I guess she figured I meant what I said when I told her to shut up. Anyway, she quieted down, then I told her to get into the back room. They got this little room where they keep the empty Coke and the beer bottles. I told her to get in there. Did she? Yeah, she went into the room, and I locked the door from the outside. And I went to the cash register and punched the no-sale button and took the money. After that, I left the store. You didn't have the money on you when they picked you up last night. Where is it? It's gone. I spent it. You spent it all? Yeah, every last nickel. I had myself a ball. You remember where you spent it? All around, different places. I bought myself some clothes, spent some of it in clubs. Just went. None of it left. You drive a car, Stanford? Yeah. is isn't mine, though. It belongs to my father. It's a big Chrysler sedan. Did you drive that when you held up the grocery store? Yeah, I had it parked down the street on 7th. Mm-hmm. Remember the time when you went into the store? Yeah. It was just after 12. 12 noon. What were you doing in the neighborhood last night? You mean when they picked me up? That's right. Just looking around. You ever been arrested before? No. Never been mixed up with a cop. You ever been in the hospital? Mental institution? What do you ask a question like that for? Routine. Oh. Uh, well, when I was a kid, I had my tonsils out. I was in a the hospital in a couple of days. I don't remember it too well. It was a long time ago. Mm-hmm. How old are you, Stanford? 28. All these questions you're asking me. I told the two cops that picked me up the same things. Why you got to ask them again? Can't you just send me to the penitentiary and get it over with? Got to double-check the story, Stanford. I suppose so. just seems that you're going to a lot of trouble you don't have to. I told you I did it. I'm not giving you any trouble, I confess. No. My father know about this yet? Yeah, he was called. He's going to be pretty sore about it. All right. Sure he doesn't know I used his car. a.m. We checked the suspect out of the main jail and took him over to the store that had been robbed. While Frank waited in the car, I went in and talked to the victim, a Mrs. Alice Kenwood. I told her that we'd bring the suspect into the store and ask him several questions about the robbery. During that time, I told her that we wanted her to observe the suspect so that she could give us a positive identification. I told her that it would be better if she didn't talk to him and that if she had any questions, she could ask them through us. She agreed and said that she would do anything she could to help us in the investigation. I went out to the car and Frank and I brought the suspect into the store. Come on back here, Stanford. What are you bringing me here for? What are you trying to prove? I'd have you explain a few things for us. Well, I told you all I could. I told you I committed the robbery. Isn't that enough? Just a couple of things we'd like to have you clear up for us. Well, what things? I told you how I did it. Well, she'll tell you. That's the woman I held up. She'll tell you it was me. She should know. She's the one who turned me in. How about it, Miss Kenwin? She's the one, all right. I'd know many place. There, isn't that enough? What more do you want? I'd like to have you show us just how you came into the store, what you did while you were in here. You mean the whole thing? Yeah, from the time you came in through the door. All right. Take these handcuffs off and I'll show you. You can show us with them on. It's got to be that way. It's going to make it tougher. Go ahead. Yeah. Well, I came in the door. I came in and she was standing behind that counter. You mean Miss Kenwood? Yeah, her. She was standing behind the counter. I walked over to her and I showed her the gun. I told her it was a stick-up. I told her I wanted the money. That's right. He pointed the gun at me and thought he was going to shoot. All right, go ahead, Stan. Well, she started to yell, told me to get out of the store. Certainly I yelled at him. You think I want anybody coming in here and waving a gun around? Oh, if my husband was here, he'd show you, show you good. You see what I mean? I never saw a woman that could yell so much. Go ahead, Stanford. What'd you do then? Well, I told her if she didn't keep quiet, I'd have to shoot her, and then I told her to get in the room now, and Now, just hold on a minute. He's not only a thief, but he's a liar, too. Ma'am? That's not what he did at all. What do you mean, Mrs. Kenwood? He didn't tell me to get into the back room. There ain't any back room. How about that, Stanford? You're going to listen to her? I'm the one that robbed the place. She didn't. I guess I know what I did. All right, let's take a look back here. Come on. What's behind this curtain here, Miss Kenwood? Just a little space where I keep my empty bottles. Goes right out onto the alley. There, see, that's where I put her. That's where I told her to stay. Mm Mm-hmm. And you said you locked the door. There's no door there. I got confused. It doesn't make any difference. I told her to get back there and stay there until I was out of the store. That's a lie. You did no such thing. You told me to get down on the floor and cover my face. Then you went over to the cash register and you took the money. I didn't move. Didn't want to give you any trouble the way you were waving that gun around. It's a wonder you didn't try to kill me. Well, you're yakking that up. I should have done it. All right, that's enough. Frank? Yeah. You want to take Stanford out of the car? I'll be right with you. Yeah, okay. Come on, Stanford. Let's go. I don't know what you got to go through all this for. I told you I did, and I never saw anything like it before. You can't even confess around here. Nobody believes you. Miss Kenwood? Yes, officer. Are you sure that's the man that held you up here? I said it before. I'm positive. There isn't any doubt in my mind. Uh-huh. Now, you heard what he said, how he said he robbed you. Is that the way it happened? Well, everything was the same except where he said that he put me in back there. That wasn't true. 
He made me lie down on the floor right there. Told me to stay still for five minutes, not to move. Said that if I caused any trouble, he'd come back and shoot me. Mm-hmm. I think he's crazy. Anybody would wave a gun around like that. It's terrible. I wish my husband was here. He'd show that snip. He's in the army, you know, my husband. Yes, ma'am. Awful thing. Him overseas getting shot at and young punks like that roaming around the streets with guns, threatening people. It's a terrible thing. Now, this is pretty important, ma'am. I want to ask you once more. You're sure that's the man who held you up? How many times do I have to say it? I told you that it is. He admits it himself. What more do you need? Well, I don't know, ma'am. There's just something here that isn't right about the whole thing. Doesn't make any difference. He's the man. There's no mistake about that. Well, you just let me know when you want me in court. I'll be there. I want to see him get what's coming to him, every bit of it. Yes, ma'am, so do we, if he's the right man. Twelve twenty-two p.m. We drove the suspect back to the city hall for further questioning. Frank took him to the interrogation room, and I checked into the squad room. Pardon me? Yes, sir? Sergeant Friday? Yes, sir. Something I can do for you? I'm Arthur Stanford, Tom's father. Oh, yes, sir. I understand my son is here. Is that right? Yes, sir, he's here. Wonder if I could see him, talk to him? Yes, sir, I think that can be arranged. Has he told you why he did it? Has he? Well, he's given us some reasons, sir. None of them are very good. I can't understand it. Just isn't any reason for him to do a thing like this. No reason at all that I can see. Mm-hmm. I don't know what to do, Mr. Friday. I left the house this morning and all the people in the neighborhood knew about it. They all knew. I walked down the street and they turned away from me. I could see him watch me through the windows of their houses. I could tell what they were thinking. My son's a thief. Common thief. And in my heart, I know it's true. I don't know what to do about it, Mr. Friday. Can you tell me? No, sir, I'm afraid I can't. Well, maybe he can. May I see him? Yes, sir, he's across the hall. This way. Right over here, sir. I, uh, wonder if I could have a cigarette? Yes, sir. Here you are. Here's a match. Thank you. I'm not sure what I'm going to say to him when I see him. Wish I had some time to think. Well, you don't have to go in now if you don't want to, sir. Oh, it wouldn't help any to put it off. Won't get any easier with time. I might as well get it over with. All right, sir. Hi, Pop. Why'd you do it, son? Well, I did it because I wanted to. I wanted the money. I didn't know any other reason you robbed somebody. I wanted the money, so I did it. You could have come to me. I'd have tried to get the money for you. You know I'd have tried. Where'd you get it? Where'd you get that kind of money? All your life, you've been grubbing for pennies. I don't want small money. I want to be rich. I will be, too. All right, take it easy, Stanford. It's all right, Mr. Friday. I understand. All my life, you've been saying you understand. I'm getting sick of it. As long as I can remember, you've been telling me to get out and do something on my own. Well, I finally did it. Now you aren't happy with it. You expect me to throw my hat up in the air because you're a thief? Oh, knock it off. I'm tired of you giving me lectures all the time. Yakety yak. Never stop. That's enough of that, don't you think, Stan? Well, you keep out of this, cop. This is a family matter. It doesn't concern you. This is between my father and me. Well, tell me why. That's all I want. Why? Tell me so I can face the neighbors, so I can tell them you had a reason. Tell them your son's a bum. Well, they know that already, but that's not a reason to steal. It's good enough for me. They're not going to listen to you anyway. They already made up their minds about me. They did that a long time ago. Come on, Stanford. Let's go back to jail. Sure. Anything else here to do? He never understood. He never did. Let's go. Yeah, one thing I'd like to ask first. What's that? You're going to jail for a long time. I have to live while you're gone. Mm-hmm. It's your worry. Well, it always has been. I want to know what you did with the garden tools. I'll have to have them to get along. I don't know. I left them someplace. You remember where? think. I need those tools. I'm not sure. Maybe at Mrs. Howard's. Maybe that's where I left. Over on 12th? Yeah, I did her place last Wednesday. I guess I forgot to pick the stuff up when I left. It must still be there. And I'll go over and get them. Wait a minute. What do you want? He said he did some gardening for this Mrs. Howard last Wednesday. That'd be a week ago yesterday, is that right? That's what I said. You remember what time you were there? Most of the day. I got there about 10 in the morning. Left about 4 in the afternoon. I was in a hurry to get away. That's why I forgot the tools, I guess. You leave the place at all during the day? Not till I finished. What are you trying to prove with all these questions? It's about the robbery, Stanford. Yeah? If you were at this Howard woman's house, how could you held up the grocery store? It don't make no difference how I did it. I don't have to explain it to you. No, you're wrong about that, Stanford. Is that right? Too many things here don't add up. The way you confess, the difference in your story about the robbery. Now, this thing about you being at the Howard house. I don't know why you're lying about this, Stanford. Yeah? But we're going to find out. <laughs> You are listening to Dragnet, the authentic story of your police force in action. Chesterfield is best for you. Listen to Chesterfield's record. For a full year and two months, 
A doctor has been making regular examinations of a group of Chesterfield smokers, and he reports no adverse effects to the nose, throat, and sinuses from smoking Chesterfields. Don't you want to try a cigarette with a record like this? Chesterfield. First with premium quality in both regular and king size. Chesterfield. First choice with Young America. And that's from a survey of 274 colleges and universities. Try Chesterfields today. Remember, Chesterfield is America's best cigarette buy. We continued to talk to the suspect, Thomas Stanford, for another hour. He refused to say anything about the conflicting aspects of his story. His father pleaded with him to tell us the truth, but other than admitting he was responsible for the grocery store robbery, he'd say nothing. We got the address of the house where Stanford had said he'd left the gardening tools. 3.15 p.m. After taking the suspect back to the main jail, Frank and I drove out to talk to the Howard woman. Place sure looks nice. Well kept. Yeah. Look at those carnations, Joe. Ever seen anything so pretty? Yeah, they're very nice. You know, fate tries them all the time. Never seems to have any luck with them, though. Plants come up all right, but the flowers just don't seem to get very big. Mm-hmm. About size of half a buck. Little bitty things. Yeah. Sure smell good, though. I get the bell. Yes? Miss Howard? That's right. Is there something you want? Police officers, ma'am. We'd like to talk to you. Policeman? What do you want to see me for? Well, it's about a man who did some work for you, Thomas Stanford. Oh. Yes, come in, won't you? Thank you very much. My name's Friday, Mrs. Howard. This is my partner, Frank Smith. Oh, how do you do? How do you do, ma'am? Just sit down there. I'm having a late lunch. Can I get you anything? No, thank no, you. No, thank you, ma'am. Sure you wouldn't have a glass of iced tea or something like that? No, thanks, Miss Howard. How about this man, Stanford? Oh, yes, Tom. He's a good gardener. Does a beautiful job on the place. You should take a walk around the grounds. He keeps it just beautifully. Yes, ma'am. Could you tell us when he was here last? Oh, well, I'd have to think about that. Let's see. Well, I think it was a week ago yesterday. Yes, that's right. Last Wednesday. He comes once a week. He should have been here yesterday. Called his house when he didn't show up. No answer. Probably forgot. He's very forgetful, you know. Is that right? Oh, yes. But take the last time he was here. He walked off and forgot all of his tools. Lawnmower, clippers, everything. I had to take it back to the garage. Just left it on the lawn right out in front of the place. Mm-hmm. You ever had any trouble with him? What do you mean by trouble? Well, any arguments, disagreements? Well, on a couple of occasions, we've had words about what flowers to put in. He's wanted to plant one thing, and I've wanted something else. They've never been serious, though. Yes, ma'am. I suppose I shouldn't say this. What's that, Miss Hart? Well, frankly, I've never thought that Tom was real bright. He seems sort of backwards. How do you mean, backward? Well... When it came to thinking out something for himself, he just couldn't handle it. If you told him to do a thing a certain way, he'd do it. Never vary from the way you told him. Mm -hmm. You'd ask him to figure something out, and he was dead. Seemed like the motor was turning over all right, but he just couldn't get the clutch out. Gears just wouldn't work. Yes, ma'am. That's why I say I don't think he's very bright. He just can't seem to think for himself. No initiative. Do you remember what time he was here on Wednesday? Well, now, let's see. He got here about ten in the morning. It was right after that radio show about the Friends. I'd just finished listening to that when he got here. And that goes off the air at ten. Uh, have you ever heard it? No, ma'am. Oh, you should listen sometime. Uh, these people tell why they need a friend to help them out of trouble. Well, I listen to it every morning. Makes me feel pretty lucky, those poor people. I sure appreciate what I've got when I hear what they have to say. Uh-huh. Was Stanford here all day, ma'am? Yes, all day. He didn't leave until, um, let's see... I guess it was about five, someplace around in there. Uh, it seems to me it was just before the five o'clock news, just before that when he left. Mm -hmm. So he got here at ten, and then he left just before five o'clock, is that right? That's right. Mm -hmm. Any chance that he might have been away without you knowing it? No, no, I'd have known it if he had. He was out in the backyard most of the morning, and then he took care of the front later in the day. Well, what's he do about lunch, Miss Howard? Uh, what do you mean? Well, does he bring his lunch with him? Once in a while he does, yes. Well, he didn't on Wednesday, though, I'm sure about that. How do you mean, Mrs. Howard? Well, along about lunchtime, it was uh, right after the uh, noon news, I made up a little plate for him. A couple of sandwiches, potato chips, and some pickles, little tiny sweet gherkins. I made it up, and I took it out to him. Yes, ma'am. I took this nice plate out to him, and where do you suppose I found him? Where? Out behind the garage, sitting next to the compost box. What do you suppose he was doing? What, ma'am? Reading a comic. All about cops and robbers. 
Uh, one of those with a picture on the cover of the crooks trying to shoot their way out of the bank. Mm -hmm. I told him that he'd better get on the ball, let the clutch out, and get to work. I told him that I wanted the yard finished up by five and that I didn't want any funny business about it. What did he say to that? Well, he just looked at me for a long time and then he said, Okay, warden. Just like that. Okay, warden. But he got to work. Right away, and he finished up on time. You see, my son and daughter-in-law were coming over. It was his birthday, and we'd planned a little party. I wanted the place to be nice for them. Yes, ma'am, we understand. Is it possible that Stanford could have gotten away from the yard at all between 10 and 5? No. No, I'm sure of that. He was here all the time. All right, ma'am. Thank you very much. What's this all about? Is Tom in some sort of trouble? No, it's just a routine investigation, Miss Howard. I'm going to give you our card in case you think of anything else. Here you are. Oh, uh, thank you. Michigan... 5211, is that right? Yes, ma'am. Ask for robbery division. That's extension 2511. It's right on the card. Oh, yes. Mm -hmm. Poor Tom. All this trouble. It's too bad. Yes, ma'am. And just wish this was New York. Beg your pardon? Well, if this was New York, everything would be all right. Well, how's that? That program about the friends? Yes, ma'am. Tom could sure use one. <laughs> We left Mrs. Howard's home and talked to some of the people in the neighborhood. They told us that the Howards were respected people in the community, and some of them verified the fact that Stanford had worked for almost two years. The man who lived directly across the street from the Howard house said that he'd talked with Stanford on the afternoon of the robbery. He said that he'd asked the suspect about the seeds that he used to raise the carnations that were planted along the front of the house. He went on to say that he'd been working in the front yard of his own house all afternoon and that he'd seen the suspect throughout that time. We drove back to the grocery store and talked with the victim, Mrs. Kenwood. Under questioning, she admitted that she could have made a mistake about the identification, but she said that if she was wrong, the thief could act as a double for Tom Stanford. 10.30 p.m., we drove back to the main jail and picked up the suspect. We took him back to the city hall and talked to him in the interrogation room. He was sullen and refused to answer our questions. Stanford? Yeah? I'd like to have you tell us the truth this time. I told you it isn't my fault. If you don't believe me, it isn't my fault. Now, look, Stanford, we talked with this Mrs. Howard. She told us that you were working for her all day a week ago Wednesday. So what's that proof? Well, you admit it's true then, huh? Sure, it's true. I was working for then her. Then how could you have gotten to the grocery store and held it up? Stanford? I did it. I haven't got anything more to say. I did the robbery. Smith, you got tonight's papers? Yeah, I picked them up earlier. Anything in them about me? I didn't see anything. There must have been something, some story about me with my name. Well, if there was, I didn't see it. Well, maybe it didn't look good. Maybe. There's got to be something, a picture or something. No. Well, let me look. Where'd you leave the papers, Frank? It's quite a room. Would you get them and let me look? Sure. Pretty important to you that you're in the papers, isn't it? I just want to see them, that's all. Well, he'll bring them back. You must have made a mistake. There's something about me. There's got to be. It isn't every day there's a robbery like this. The papers would write it up big, wouldn't they? I don't know. Well, sure they would. There was a story when the place was robbed, told all about how it was done. It was just a little story, but now they've got me. It seems you should have a picture. Here it is. Let me see. There's nothing on the first page. <laughs> Robbery happened a week ago. It's old news. Yeah, but you just caught me last night. Nothing. Not one lousy word. Nothing at all. That makes a difference, doesn't it? Sure it does. Sure. If there isn't anything in the papers, how are people going to know I did it? How are they going to know? They won't. But they got it. They got it. Don't you see that? If they don't know that I did the robbery, there ain't no reason for it. No reason at all. What do you mean, Stafford? Well, there won't be no pictures, no nothing. People still think I'm nobody. No one's going to know that I did do something. No one will know. Well, the way it looks to us, you didn't do it. There should be a story about it, about how he confessed... Maybe not a picture, but at least a story, something. You didn't do it, did you? Stanford? Come on, you didn't hold up that story, did you? No. No, I didn't. I thought I could get away with it. I thought that if I confessed, you'd put me in jail and people would look at me different. And they wouldn't laugh at me anymore because I'd done something. Mm -hmm. Poor dumb Tom. That's what they say. Poor dumb Tom. Just once I wanted to show him. Show him that I could do something. You ready to go? Back to the jail? That's right. 
You think we could stop on the way over? I'd like to pick up something. Yeah, what's that? Other papers. Might be something in them. The story you have just heard is true. The names were changed to protect the innocent. On June 4th, a meeting was held in the district attorney's office, city and county of Los Angeles, state of California. In a moment, the results of that meeting. Now, here is our star, Jack Webb. Thank you, George Fenneman. I'd like to talk to you people who don't smoke Chesterfields. I'm convinced that if you try just one carton, you'll find they're best for you. They're milder, they have a wonderful taste, and most important, they have premium quality in both sizes, regular or king size. So pick up that carton, will you? Chesterfields. Try them. A 5.10 report was filed on Thomas Arthur Stanford and he was released from custody. Ten months later, on May 22nd, James R. Rogers was apprehended while attempting to hold up a liquor store at the corner of 3rd and Temple Streets. While being interrogated, he confessed to committing the robbery that Stanford had been accused of. The physical appearance of the two men was almost identical. Rogers was tried and convicted of robbery in the first degree and received sentence as prescribed by law. You have just heard Dragnet, a series of authentic cases from official files. Technical advice comes from the office of Chief of Police W.H. Parker, Los Angeles Police Department. Technical advisors, Captain Jack Donahoe, Sergeant Marty Wynn, Sergeant Vance Brasher. Heard tonight were Ben Alexander, Virginia Gregg, Vic Perrin. Script by John Robinson. Music by Walter Schumann. Hal Gibney speaking. For a million laughs, tune in Chesterfield's Martin and Lewis show Tuesday on this same NBC station. And sound off for Chesterfields. Either regular or king size, you'll find premium quality Chesterfields much milder. Chesterfield is best for you. Chesterfield has brought you Dragnet transcribed from Los Angeles. Now, new Fatima has the tip for your lips. Fatima tips of perfect cork. King size for natural filtering. Fatima quality for a much better flavor and aroma. So remember, new Fatima has the tip for your lips. Fatima. See how smooth they are. Remember, Fatima is made by the makers of Chesterfield. Tonight it's Adventure with Barry Craig on NBC. For Chesterfield. Chesterfield, first with premium quality and best for you. Chesterfield brings you Dragnet. Ladies and gentlemen, the story you are about to hear is true. The names have been changed to protect the innocent. You're a detective sergeant. You're assigned a homicide detail. A man has been shot and critically wounded. There's no trace of the suspect. Your job, find him. Here is Chesterfield's record with smokers, and important to you. No adverse effects to the nose, throat, and sinuses from smoking Chesterfield. That's the report of a doctor who has been examining a group of Chesterfield smokers for a full year and two months as a part of a program supervised by a responsible independent research laboratory. Don't you want to try a cigarette with a record like this? Chesterfield. First with premium quality. Chesterfield. First choice of young America. And that's from a survey made in 274 colleges and universities. Try Chesterfields today. Chesterfield, regular or king size. They're much milder and best for you. Dragnet, 
the documented drama of an actual crime. For the next 30 minutes, in cooperation with the Los Angeles Police Department, you will travel step by step on the side of the law through an actual case transcribed from official police files. From beginning to end, from crime to punishment, Dragnet is the story of your police force in action. It was Sunday, April 26th. It was raining in Los Angeles. We were working the night watch out of homicide detail. My partner's Frank Smith. The boss is Captain Lorman. My name's Friday. I was on my way back to the office, and it was 11.44 p.m. when I got to room 42. Homicide. Hi, Frank. Hi. Does anybody call? Yeah, Lopey call. Wants to know if he left his overshoes. No, I didn't see him. It's quit raining anyway. What are you doing there? Just a minute, Joe. What's the scale for? The needle's bent a little. Now, what are you doing? Yeah, weighing my stuff. Your what? Weighing my stuff. Oh, yeah. I guess everybody ought to know what his stuff weighs, huh? Yeah. Let's see. I'm a gun. Better take the bullets out first. What are you doing that for? Weigh them separate, Joe. Keep track. Yeah, that's right. Now, the bullets. Uh-huh. Handcuffs. Frank, did anybody ever ask you about all this? And my bullet clip. Look, I'm a member of the club here, too. What's this all about? Pencils? Four? Yeah, press kind of hard. Yeah. Other stuff in my wallet. Change. Keys. Boy, no wonder my feet kill me. What? Six pounds, two and a half ounces. That's what I carry, Joe. Working night's got a flashlight, too. That's good for another pound. You figure that's what makes your feet hurt, huh? Sure. Uh -huh, yeah. Six pounds, two ounces. How much do you weigh, Frank? Any calls? Come on, how much? Joe, I get that all day from Faye. Never thought I'd get it from you. Yeah, that's a hot shot. I'll get it. What do you got? Shooting on East Berendo. 11.45 p.m. We swung out of the City Hall garage and headed south on Main Street. The streets were still wet after the rain. Code 3, red light and siren. And even with that, driving a fast car is no picnic. You can be wrong at every corner. Big buildings to block off the sound of your siren. Cars to shield the red light from oncoming motorists. It's no fun. There'd been a shooting and we had to get there. As Frank and I swung around the last streetcar on Main Street and picked up Berendo, we heard the police radio operator dispatching ambulance G-13 to the address we were headed for. We didn't know what direction the ambulance was. So for the next few blocks, we drove with added caution, knowing that our siren would keep us from hearing theirs. Five blocks ahead through the mist, we could see the red lights of a police car parked at the curb. A radio car in the area had gotten the call and answered it immediately. It was 11.52 p.m. when we pulled up in front of 1981 East Berendo. The large house was dark. Two neighborhood women stood in the driveway and directed us to the back of the house where we found the officers from Unit 1A6. We checked with them and got the information that they'd come up with. They suggested that they canvass the immediate area for any information on the assailant. Frank and I went in through the back door of the house. The victim lay on the floor. He was unconscious and bleeding profusely. His head was held in the lap of another man. Are you the doctor? No, sir. We're police officers. The ambulance is on the way here. If I could just stop the bleeding, it's his chest. Do you know who did this? No. Has he been conscious at all since you've been here? Just for a second. Did he say anything? Well, I heard the shot and came right over. He was laying here on the floor right here. Poor guy. Yes, sir. Did he say anything? Help me. That's all he said. Help me. I didn't know what to do. I got this towel from the sink and tried to stop the bleeding. Fist in my handkerchief, that's all I had. Can't do much, but I had to try. I had to keep pressing. That's all I could think of. Keep pressing. Try to stop it. Yes, sir. Do you feel all right, sir? Oh, yes, yes, I'm all right. Got to help him. Here, let me get in there and take care of that. All right, come on, sir. I can get under. I can got it, it, Joe. All right. Yes, sir. Come on, sir. Get up. That's all right. You'll handle this. The excitement. Can't seem to get my breath. Something we can get for you? No, oh, I'll be all right. I think I'll get a drink of water. I'd rather you wouldn't touch that glass, sir. Huh? Oh, yeah, fingerprints. Well, I can wait. Oh, say, I did touch that towel. Hope it didn't hurt anything. Didn't mean to. No, sir, I don't think so. What's your name? Paul West. I live right next door, right across the driveway, Gray House. Uh -huh. Wonder if you could tell us what happened. Sure, I want to help all I can. I live right next door, and I was the first one here. Anything I can do, I want to help. Yes, sir. I've known Charlie for, oh, I guess it's maybe 40 years. Long time. Charlie, that's the man's name here? Yes, Charles Stahl. How you doing, Frank? That's pretty bad. I don't know. Would you tell us what happened here? Well, it was right after Charlie left my place. That's when I heard the noise. What noise, West? I was out on my porch putting out the cans, getting the boxer ready when I heard the noise. First off, I thought Charlie was doing the same thing, getting the cans ready. Well, what kind of a noise? Well, like he dropped the box. I know now that wasn't it. Uh -huh. Joe, 
Just a minute, boys. Yeah. I think he's coming around. Is he coming to? You gonna say anything? Who shot him? All right, just a minute. What's his name again? Stahl. Mr. Stahl. Mr. Stahl. Maybe you talk to me. He knows me. We're friends. Let me talk no, to him. Wait right there, will you? Wait. I just wanted to help. All right, stay right there. Now, Mr. Stahl, we want to help you. Can you tell us who shot you? Hey, what you saying? Is he giving you the All right, name? Hold it, Wes. Just a minute. How about it, Frank? He's dead. Did he say anything? Yeah. Not much help. Huh? Ask me not to shoot him again. It was a couple of minutes before midnight when Charles Stahl died in Frank's arms. According to the next-door neighbor, Paul West, the victim was 55 years old. He was not married, and he lived in the big house on Berendo by himself. The ambulance crew returned to Georgia Street Receiving Hospital after making out a DOA report, and the coroner's office was asked to pick up the body. Twelve minutes later, coroner's deputies Maxwell and Martinez arrived. Before the murdered man's body was removed, the crew from the crime lab photographed the scene, and Frank and I signed the property receipt for the money and the personal effects found on the body. We asked the crime lab to check a 32 caliber Smith & Wesson revolver found on the floor under the kitchen stove. There was one empty cartridge in the cylinder. We put in a call to gun records, but we found nothing on the gun. A call to R&I on the victim of the shooting turned up nothing. Latent fingerprints found nothing on the murder weapon. The crime lab crew found no footprints in the ground near the house, but they did find several marks of tire tracks and one good impression left in the moist dirt in the alley behind the house. A plaster cast was made of the imprint, and it was returned to the office to be booked as evidence. We checked with the officers in Unit 1A6, but they said that in canvassing the neighborhood, they'd been unable to come up with any new leads. 12.21 a.m., we checked back into the house, and we talked to the neighbor, Paul West. Now, what kind of a job did Stahl have? Owned a print shop, Stahl Press, over on the east side. Was he in business by himself? What do you mean? Well, did he have any partners? No, Charlie owned it right out. Had the pink slip, you might say. Mm -hmm. Can you give us the address? Sure. Biggest print shop on the east side. Printed just about everything. Posters, display cards, things like that. He gave me some cards last Christmas. Here, take a look. That's my name. Embossed. Yes, sir. Did it himself. Mm -hmm. That's very nice, sir. Uh, can I have that back, please? Oh, sure. Here you are. Embossed. Anybody in the shop with him? Any employees? Well, there's the Becker kids, Pete and Alvin. They work in the shop, do they? Yeah, I've been with him. I guess it's been about five years. How's he get along with them, would you know? Fine. I never heard about any trouble. I've been kind of friends with the family. Charlie was pretty fond of them. Did he have any personal enemies, maybe because of the business? No, not that I know of. Uh-huh. How long did you say you've known Stahl? Been about 40 years. We grew up together. I see. His father and mine built these houses at the same time. Charlie and I went to school together. Belonged to the same club. We were soldiers together. Served in the 146th Field Artillery in the war. Was that the last war, sir? Oh, no, the big one. First World War. Oh, I see. Came back and we lived right here, side by side, all this time. We've been friends, Charlie and me. Good friends. you got to catch the person that did this. you got to get him. You said earlier that Stahl had been over to your house tonight. Yes, that's right. Did he have any special reason for the visit? Well, he didn't need a reason. Charlie was always welcome. Always. Well, yes, sir, we understand. Of course, tonight's Sunday. We had a game. Sir? Bridge. Always play bridge on Sunday night. Never miss. Well, what time did he get to your house? Same time as always, right after supper. Well, what time's that, sir? Right after 7.30. We were just finishing supper when he came in. Charlie sat down and had dessert and coffee with us. Mm -hmm. Rice pudding with raisins. Charlie had two dishes. Then we started to play bridge. Oh, I see. Now, who else was there? You mean the game? Yeah. Oh, just Rose and Paula. Rose, my wife, and Paula's my daughter. Anything unusual happened tonight? Uh, just once. Yeah, what was that? Well... A bit of grand slam in spades and made it. Even with Rose, seven spades. Well, that's not exactly what we mean, Wes. Yeah, pretty unusual. Yes, sir, but did anything happen with Stahl? Sure, he almost hit the ceiling when we made it. Got pretty mad, did he? Sure. Since we've been playing, most he ever did was make a little slam. Mm -hmm. He went right home after that. I guess that's when he went out to empty the cans. Anyway, that's when I heard the noise. That was the shot, sir. It must have been. I didn't know it at the time, but I guess that's what it was. What'd you do after you heard the shot? Well, now, at the time, I didn't know what it was. I thought maybe Charlie had fallen and hurt himself. Mm -hmm. I looked over at his place, but there wasn't any lights on. I went out the curb with a box of cans. Came back, and I didn't see Charlie, so I walked over. I see. I called to him, asked if he was all right. Didn't get no answer, so I came in. Found him right on the floor, where he was when you came in. You're the one who put in the call, is that right? Yeah, I called the operator and told her to get an ambulance right over that Charlie had been shot. Told her to send a policeman. Now, what time was it when Stahl left your house? Oh, remember? it must have been about 11.15 or so. Earlier than usual, we always play almost to midnight. I guess Charlie got miffed about the grand slam I made, and then Paula kidded him about the woman. What woman is that? 
Oh, it wasn't anything. I went out and looked. Nobody there. Sir? A couple of times, Charlie thought he heard a woman coughing outside the window by his house. I went over to the window, looked out there, but there wasn't anybody there. Well, did you hear this coughing? No, not really. After Charlie started talking about it, I thought I did, but when I went out to look, there wasn't anybody there. His imagination, that's all. He was mad because of the slam. Well, did you hear anything at all when you were out and back? Huh? Well, when you went into Stahl's house, did you hear anybody around? A car, maybe? Something like that? No, not a soul. Uh, Wes, could somebody have gone out the front of the house when you came in the back? Wouldn't seem it could be. I'd have heard him if they did. Well, then you'd say that whoever shot Stahl wasn't in the house when you went in, is that it? Pretty sure about that. Of course, they might have left before I went in. Sir? Well, I'd already took the box of cans out the front after I heard the noise. If there's anybody in the house, they could have gotten out then. But you didn't see anybody, did you? No, nobody at all. Do you know if Stahl has any relatives in Los Angeles? No. He hasn't, huh? Hasn't got any any place, none at all. Always kind of worried him. Well, why is that? Well, he used to say he didn't have any folks to leave his things to. The house, the print shop. Mm-hmm. He made a will, though. All legal with a seal and all. Official. He used to talk to me about it. I see. You know who the beneficiary was, would you? Not now. What? Well, I knew who it was, but he said he was going to change it. He said he was going to put a new name on. Well, did he say whose? Nope. Just said I'd be surprised. We looked through the victim's desk for the will. In one of the bottom drawers, we found a locked tin box. In a box of paper clips, we found a key that fit. In the top liner of the box, there was a Purple Heart ribbon and an American Victory Medal from the First World War. In the bottom of the box, there were several government bonds and the will. In it, he left the house and the rest of his possessions to a Mrs. Margaret Becker. The print shop and the business, he left to Mrs. Becker's sons, Peter and Alvin. The will was dated three years previously. On a separate piece of paper, we found an address for a Mrs. Margaret Becker, the Lone Star Motel on Sepulveda Boulevard. 1240 a.m., we affixed the public administrator's seal, which the coroner's deputy had left with us, to the door of the victim's house. We talked with the wife and daughter of the neighbor, Paul West. They confirmed the story he'd given us. On the way to talk to the Becker woman, we stopped and called the office. They checked the name through R&I, but they came up with no identification. We called Sergeant Jay Allen at the crime lab, and he told us that the tire marks found in the rear of the victim's house were made by three B.F. Goodrich tires and one truck tire. He said that the cast they'd made was of the truck tire, as it was the only one they could lift, and that it was made by the left front wheel. There was a car parked in front of the manager's cottage. The registration listed Margaret Becker as the owner. Legal the same. We checked it. Motor's cold. Yeah. Tires don't match. Well, nice try. Yeah. Let's go. I get it. Late? Yeah. 115? Hmm. Probably asleep. Yeah. What's the matter? Can't you read? Sign says no vacancy. That means full up. N-O, that means no. Waking somebody at this hour? Yes, ma'am. And don't We're... ask me if I know someplace where you can stay because I don't. Good night. Just a minute, Miss Becker. How do you know my name? Police officers. What do you want around here? I run a clean place, no trouble, license all paid up, nothing wrong. We'd like to talk to you. What about? You know a man named Charles Stahl? What are you asking that for? We'd like to know. And I want to know why you're asking. What's this all about? Anything wrong with Charlie? That's why you're out here? Yes, ma'am. What's wrong? Well, it's pretty serious. Well, go ahead. You can tell me. Well, he's dead, Miss Becker. Come in. Thank you. What's the matter, Margaret? Who are these fellows? Who are you? What are you doing here? They're policemen. Well, we don't need you. We got the whole thing cleaned up. We took care of it ourselves. Nobody sent for you. We took care of him. No, Daddy. They're here about Charles. Charlie stole? Yes, sir. That's right. Charlie here? Well, where is he? He's not here, Daddy. Something's happened to him. What? He's dead. Dead? Charlie? Yes. Well, how did it happen? An accident? No, sir. Oh, poor Charlie Stahl. He's a nice boy. Too bad. I thought you was here about the fellow number eight, the loud one. What's that, sir? man from Texas came in tonight pretty drunk. We had to take him in. Daddy put him to bed. He was pretty drunk. Heavy, too. That's what he thought you were out here for. Couldn't even get out of his car. Margaret had the pocket for him. Loud, you know, real drunk. Wore his pants inside his boots. What was it you wanted to see me about? There's a few questions we'd like to ask you. About Charles? Yes, ma'am. When was the last time you saw him? Must have been a couple of weeks ago. I saw him last week, uh, April 22nd. Went fishing down on the pier. Miss Becker, what was your relationship with Stahl? Good friends, that's all. We knew each other almost all our lives. I used to live next door to him. Went through school together. I always thought they were going to get married. Charlie was a good boy. You see much of him lately? Mm, no, not too much. I've been busy here with Daddy, and Charlie's had other things to do. Moved next door to him on December 14th. Exactly 42 years ago, come winter. 
You know if he had any enemies, ma'am? No, can't think of anyone who didn't like Charlie. Didn't catch anything at the pier. Bad bait. You've been home all evening, have you? Yeah. Why'd you ask that? What's well, just routine. You think I had something to do with it, that it? No, ma'am, we don't. Pinheads, that's what you need. I beg your pardon, sir? Pinhead anchovies, that's what you need for pier fishing. You yeah. say it's routine, but I don't like you coming in here, waking us up with all these questions. We've had a bad night, that drunk coming in here. We've been on the go ever since then. A few years ago, I used to be able to get a lot of pinheads. Not anymore. You want to make any accusations, you talk to Paul West. You just talk to him. Try your routine questions there. Paul West? Yeah, Charlie's neighbor. He's never liked Charlie, never. Anyone heard Charlie? It was Paul. Well, why do you say that, Mrs. Becker? Now, years ago, Charlie was sweet on Paul's sister. On the way back from the beach one night, there was an accident, and Paul's sister was killed. Never forgave Charlie. Always held him to blame. Well, why was that, Miss Becker? Charlie was driving. Paul hated Charles for it. Now the thing with the daughter. Paul didn't like that either. Somebody did something to Charlie. You routine the man next door. You talk to Paul West. Now get out of here. I want to get some sleep. If you got any more questions, you come back in the morning, and I'll talk to you then. You get out of here now. Yes, ma'am. But what did you mean, the thing with her, West's daughter? All right. I'll tell you that. You've got to get out of here. Yes, ma'am. A couple of months ago, Paula came home, divorced her husband, and moved home. Right away, Charlie got sweet on her. Paul didn't like it. Didn't like it at all. Did you ever say anything to stall about it? You bet he did. They had a lot of arguments, a lot of them. You talk to Paul West. He's the one you've got to talk to. Now, good night. We'll be back in the morning, ma'am. I'll be here. Don't worry. I'll talk to you then. I'm going fishing tomorrow. Are they getting pinheads now? There's a new one, huh? West's daughter. Yeah. Better check it out. Hold it a minute. Let's take a look back at the carport here. There it is, a Texas license plate. Yeah. I'll check the motor. How about it? Radiator's warm. How about the wheels? Three Goodrich tires and a truck tire. You are listening to Dragnet, the authentic story of your police force in action. Years ahead of them all. Chesterfield is years ahead of all cigarettes. Chesterfield quality is highest. Here's the proof. Recent chemical analyses give an index of good quality for the country's six leading cigarette brands. The index of good quality table, which is a ratio of high sugar to low nicotine, shows Chesterfield quality highest. Chesterfield quality, highest. 15% higher than its nearest competitor. Chesterfield quality, highest. 31% higher than the average of the five other leading brands. Don't you want to try a cigarette with a record like this? Chesterfield, first with premium quality and best for you. Try Chesterfield today, regular or king size. <laughs> The information we'd gotten from the crime lab gave us the make of the tires that had left the imprints in back of the victim's house. Three of the tires had been identified as being of Goodrich make. The fourth was a truck tire. The car we'd found in the carport of cabin number eight had tires that matched the description. 1.26 a.m., we went back to talk to Margaret Becker. I'd like to know just what this is all about. Why you're snooping around asking questions. Now, why don't you come right on out with it? Come on, you think I had something to do with Charlie being dead, isn't that it? No, ma'am, we told you before, this is just a routine investigation. We're trying to get the facts here. You still haven't told us about Charlie. Was he killed? Yes, ma'am. You think I did it? We didn't say that. Not in so many words you didn't, but that's what you meant. You found the will. That's what made you think it was me, isn't that it? You knew about the will, didn't you? Certainly I knew about it. Charles told me when he had it drawn up. Said he didn't have anybody else who wanted to see that me and the boys were taken care of. Too bad about Charlie Stall. He's a good boy. He's going to take care of Margaret. You ever say anything to you about changing the will? Yes. Told me about it the last time I saw him. Had lunch together and he told me then. Tell you what changes he was going to make? No, not right out. I didn't have to. I knew. I could tell. The way he's been acting lately, I could tell. So could I. Well, what do you mean the way he's been acting? Was there anything wrong? Well, this thing with Paula. Told you about that. Charlie's been acting like a fool, falling all over, gushing sweet talk. Silly. Mm -hmm. Well, she had him in a trance. Her just 25 and him 55. Talk about spring and winter. Well, that was them. How'd Paula feel about this? How'd you expect her to feel? She thought that Charlie'd leave her the money, house, everything. She went right along with it, real brazen. Sir, 
Yeah? You said earlier that you thought your daughter and Mr. Stahl might get married. Is that right? You better did. They always been in love. Daddy, that's not true. Well, it is true. I'm your father. Now, you, you show a little respect. After that no-good Becca walked out on Maggie, she and Charlie started to see each other again. Went real nice. Then Paula come into town, and Charlie Stahl took up with her. Mm-hmm. Charlie Stahl made out his will so that everything went to Margaret and the kids. Then he decided he'd change it. You knew about the will, too, huh? Sure, I was a friend of Charlie's. We used to go fishing all the time, talk about things. I told him that he was wrong to even think of changing his will. Uh, I told him that he was wrong. What time did you say that car from Texas got in, ma'am? I told you, about 10.15. Well, ma'am, is it possible that somebody could have taken the car out without you knowing about it? Hey, wait a minute, Margaret. That ain't right. What? It wasn't that late. It was only about 8 when he come in. I remember because I was in bed at 8.30... I put him to bed and then come back and went to bed myself. I wanted to get some sleep, kind of going fishing in the morning. You're pretty sure about the time, are you? Well, you bet. I remember because I got in bed and turned on the radio. Listen to that uh, radio program about the detective. Fell asleep before the end. Never did find out who stole the jewels and did the murder. What was your daughter doing when you came back? Just sitting there. She went out to put the car away and I went to bed. Mm -hmm. How long was she outside? I don't know. A few minutes, I guess. Can you tell us a little closer than that? Not very well. I told you I went to sleep. I didn't hear her come in. Miss Becker, I wonder if you get dressed, please. We'd like to talk to you downtown. What for? Well, we have a report from our crime lab. They found some tire tracks in back of Stahl's house tonight. They were fresh tracks. They'd been made since it stopped raining. Those tracks match the car you got parked back there. And you think I drove the car over to Charlie's? Well, we'd like to talk about it. Why? Why'd I do a thing like that? Why'd I want to kill Charlie? Maybe because he was going to cut you out of his will. Looks like a pretty good motive. Oh, you two are out of your minds. All right, ma'am. We'll lay it out for you. You better do that. Make an accusation you can't back up. The way the evidence looks, we got a pretty good case here. The way it looks, you took the car and you drove it over to Stalls. He was next door playing cards, so you waited in the kitchen for him to come back. A couple of times, you coughed while you were waiting. He heard you. He came over to the window to see who it was. Because it was dark, he couldn't see you. I haven't heard a story like that since I stopped reading fairy tales. He came home and you killed him. Then you heard Mr. West next door. He came over to see what it was. You went out the back way to the car that you'd parked in the alley. And you drove it back here. That's the way it looks to you, is it? Yes, ma'am, that's the way it looks. You figure she killed Charlie Stoll? Yes, sir. You're going to arrest Margaret? We want to talk to her about it. Oh, going to take her down to jail, huh? Yes, sir. Mm-hmm, well, I'll go and put my clothes on. Well, that isn't necessary for you to go with her, sir. Well, she's not going. What? I killed Charlie Stoll. Daddy. You killed him? Yep. Got tired of how I was treating Mark. Got good and tired of him talking about how he was going to change the will. I couldn't let him do that. I just killed him and drove the car over and did it. What time was all this? Huh? What time did you go over to Stalls? Right after the fellow from Texas. I guess it was about nine. What time did you kill him? Oh, it must have been 10.30 or so. I had to wait for him to get through playing cards. I had to wait for him to come home. Why are you doing this, Daddy? Why am I doing it? I said somebody's got to take care of the kids. Somebody's got to take care of you. I'm an old man. I ain't much use to anybody. All right. Come on, Miss Becker. You want to get dressed now? She ain't the one. I did it. I killed Charlie Stahl. I already confessed. Why don't you believe me? Why don't you arrest me now? I did it. No, I'm afraid not. You got the times a little mixed up. Stahl wasn't killed at 10.30. No, he's just trying to help me, but he doesn't have to. Him and me were both here all night. Neither one of us left. I was in bed and asleep at midnight. Why do you say that? What? Why do you think Stahl was killed around midnight? I didn't say that. He said that you were home and in bed by midnight, didn't you? Just a figure of speech. I think I've talked enough to you. I don't have to say anything more. I'm going to see a lawyer about it. You got no right. I'm the one that did it. I'm the one. Why'd you kill him, Mrs. Becker? You want to tell us? Get old, nobody believes you. How about it, Miss Becker? I'll get dressed. You did kill him then, huh? Yes, I did it. Wasn't because of the money, though. You gotta believe that. It wasn't because of the money. Ma'am. Yeah. I loved him. Deep in my heart, I loved him. Always did. Even when we were kids. I thought he was gonna marry me. Then he met Paula. You shouldn't have done it, Margaret. I loved him and he didn't want me. He wanted Paula. You know what that's like? What's that? Love somebody and them not want you. Begins to eat at you. Pretty soon you can't stand it anymore. That's why I did it. Not for the money, you understand? I just wanted him. Yeah. Just him. That's all I wanted. Not his money. You believe that? I never wanted his money. I just wanted him. You believe that? Well, it really doesn't make any difference, does it? How do you mean? You didn't get either one. The 
The story you have just heard is true. The names were changed to protect the innocent. On August 6th, trial was held in Department 89, Superior Court of the State of California, in and for the County of Los Angeles. In a moment, the results of that trial. Now, here is our star, Jack Webb. Thank you, George Fenneman. Friends, all of us on Dragnet are proud to be associated with Chesterfield because, believe me, Chesterfield is years ahead of all cigarettes. You just can't beat a cigarette that was good to begin with and keeps getting better all the time. But, of course, you can't find out how much you'll like them till you try them. So that's what we'd like you to do. Get a carton of Chesterfields, regular or king size. That's all it takes. I know you'll agree that Chesterfield is best for you. <laughs> Margaret Alice Becker was tried and convicted of murder in the first degree. She was sentenced to life imprisonment on the California Institute for Women, Corona, California. Further investigation proved that the suspect's father, John Samuel Woodbridge, was not implicated in the murder. He was not held. You have just heard Dragnet a series of authentic cases from official files. Technical advice comes from the Office of Chief of Police, W.H. Parker, Los Angeles Police Department. Technical advisors, Captain Jack Donahoe, Sergeant Marty Wynn, Sergeant Vance Brasher. Heard tonight were Ben Alexander, Vic Rodman, Helen Cleave, Ralph Moody. Script by John Robinson. Music by Walter Schumann. Hal Gibney speaking. For a million laughs, tune in Chesterfield's Martin and Lewis show, Tuesday on this same NBC station. And sound off for Chesterfields. Either regular or king size, you'll find premium quality Chesterfields much milder. Chesterfield is best for you. Chesterfield has brought you Dragnet transcribed from Los Angeles. Have you tried new cork-tipped Fatima? It's the smooth smoke. Here's why. New Fatima tips of perfect cork. King size for longer filtering. And Fatima quality for a much better flavor and aroma. Remember, Fatima has the tip for your lips. Try new Fatima. See how smooth it is. Fatima is made by the makers of Chesterfield. Liggett and Myers, one of tobacco's most respected names. Chesterfield. Chesterfield. First with premium quality and best for you. Chesterfield brings you Dragnet. Ladies and gentlemen, the story you are about to hear is true. The names have been changed to protect the innocent. You're a detective sergeant. You're assigned to homicide detail. You get a call from a man telling you that a woman has been badly beaten. Before you can get the name of the victim or any other information, the caller hangs up. Your job? Investigate. Here is Chesterfield's record with smokers, and important to you. No adverse effects to the nose, throat, and sinuses from smoking Chesterfield. That's the report of a doctor who has been examining a group of Chesterfield smokers for a full year and two months as a part of a program supervised by a responsible independent research laboratory. Don't you want to try a cigarette with a record like this? Chesterfield. First with premium quality. Chesterfield. First choice of young America. And that's from a survey made in 274 colleges and universities. Try Chesterfields today. Chesterfield, regular or king size. They're much milder and best for you. Dragnet, the documented drama of an actual crime. For the next 30 minutes, in cooperation with the Los Angeles Police Department, you will travel step by step on the side of the law through an actual case transcribed from official police files. From beginning to end, from crime to punishment, Dragnet is the story of your police force in action. 
It was Friday, June 10th. It was hot in Los Angeles. We were working the night watch out of homicide detail. My partner's Frank Smith. The boss is Captain Lorman. My name's Friday. I was on my way back from the main jail, and it was 8.10 p.m. when I got to room 42. Homicide. Frank? Yeah? Wait a minute. I want to talk to you. I'm not going anyplace. Oh. Well, I talked to Evans. I couldn't get any more out of him. The arraignment's still set for the 14th, isn't it? Yeah, that's right. And can't you settle down for a minute and stop that pacing up and down? What's the matter? Something on your mind? On my leg. Oh, something wrong with it? Not a thing. Just walking. Well, I wish you could manage to stand still for a minute. I'm getting a little bilious following you around the room. You know how far it is from here to the business office? What do you mean? How far? Well, it's just across the hall. Is that what you mean? 25 feet? No, you're wrong. It's one two hundred and tenth of a mile. Well, that's good to know. It's one sixth of a mile to the crime lab, including the stairs. An eighth of a mile to Sal's Cafe. Four trips to R&I equals a quarter of a mile. Never knew that, did you? No. Our grand total tonight so far is over six miles. We're only half through. What do you think of that, Joe? Well, what's it all prove? Well, this is a walking job we got. Well, everybody knows that, don't they? Yeah, but I'm the only one in the department who knows exactly how far we walk. That's fine. Any calls come in while I was out? No. Like to know how I do it? What's that? It's done with a pedometer. Measures miles. Just fastened on your leg, see? At the end of the day, you know exactly how far you walk. Yeah. Gonna measure everything, Joe. Keep track. Gonna know exactly how far everything is. What for? Somebody might want to know. Who? I get it. Homicide, Friday. Yeah. Now, what's that address again? Yeah. Right. Now we got one to roll on. What do you got? Ambulance follow-up, Westlake area. Yeah. Woman's been beaten. 8.14 p.m. We left the city hall and drove to the address we'd been given. 8674 Cambria Street was a large private home that had been divided into apartments. The house was quiet and there was no sign of any disturbance. There was a woman sitting in a glider on the front porch. We went up and talked to her. Something I can do for you? Police officers, ma'am. We got a call that there'd been some sort of trouble here. What kind of trouble? A woman had been beaten. Is that right? It must be some kind of joke. Nothing like that here. You sure you got the right address? The one we were given, ma'am. You got an apartment 104? Yeah, the last one back on the left. Rockman's live there, Mr. and Mrs. We'd like to see the apartment. Go ahead. Anything happened around here, I'd know about it. I'm the landlady. Anything happened, I'd know about it. Go ahead, you won't find anything. Thank you very much, ma'am. Here it is. I'll get it. Better try the door, huh? Yeah. Nobody here. It looks like they had a party, huh? I'll yeah. check the back. No? No one out there? Coffee on the table's cold. You find anything? Where's that door go, ma'am? Bedroom. Joe, this girl on the bed. No. Yeah, it really worked her over, huh? How about it? See if I can find her pulse here. Yeah, she's still alive. Uh, what is it? Something happened to Hazel? Joe? It's pretty bad. Both eyes black, bleeding. Is this Mrs. Rockman here? Yeah, it's Hazel. What's wrong? Where's her husband? I don't know. When did you see him last? Well, about five minutes ago. Where was that? On the front porch. He just walked out. <laughs> The ambulance crew arrived and immediately removed the victim to Georgia Street Receiving Hospital for emergency treatment. We got in touch with Officer Ed Barrett of the hospital detail and asked him to try to get a statement from the victim if she regained consciousness. We locked the door to the Rockman apartment to preserve any physical evidence we might need, and then we went down and talked to the landlady, Mrs. Ruth Baker. We found her on the front porch. We asked her what she knew about what had happened. I sure wish I could tell you more. How about Hazel? Is she going to be all right? We don't know yet, Miss Baker. She's pretty badly beaten. Mm-hmm. Well, what do you want from me? Some questions we'd like to ask, ma'am. About what? I've told you what I know. Do you know where Mrs. Rockman's husband was going? No, I don't. I don't much care either. Did you say anything at all when he went out? Not a word. Just walked out in a sort of daze, like a trance sort of. He didn't say anything at all to you? I just got through telling you that he didn't. Yes, ma'am. Mr. and Ms. Rockman fight often, would you know? No, not any more than any married couple. Miss Baker... Yeah? wonder if you can give us a description of Mr. Rockman. 
Description? Yes, ma'am. Tell us what he looks like. You figure he did that to Hazel, huh? That's what we want to talk to him about. What kind of description do you want? About how tall is he? About as tall as he is? That'd be 5'10", huh? If that's what you are. How much would you say weighed? Wouldn't even make a guess. I don't notice things like that. Yes, ma'am, but would you say it was medium build or heavy? I'd say medium. Not too heavy, not too skinny. Medium. What color is his hair? Black. How about his eyes? Brown. Real dark brown. He wear glasses? No. Was he clean shaven? What do you mean? Well, do you have a mustache? No, he had one a while ago. He tried to grow one, but Hazel made him take it off. It never grew real well. A little scraggly thing. What was he wearing when you saw him last? Shirt and pants. Could you tell us what color the shirt was? No, and I can't tell you what color the pants were either. It's dark out here. I didn't pay much attention when he left. Just thought he didn't feel well. Sick from the party. All right, Miss Baker. May I use your phone? Sure, help yourself. It's in the living room, right inside the door to your left. You can't miss it. All right, ma'am, thanks. I'll call this engine. All right. You know, Miss Baker? Yeah? Does Mr. Rockman drink much? Why do you ask that? Well, I wonder if there might be some bar in the neighborhood that he might have gone to, maybe. No, he doesn't drink much at all. Once in a while, he and Hazel have a glass of wine before dinner. You know, sharpen the appetite, just a glass of wine before dinner. Mm -hmm. And you haven't any idea where he might have gone? Not the slightest. Does he have any relatives in the city? I can't answer that. You mean you don't know? Must have some people someplace. Most of us do. But I'm not the kind of person who pries into the private lives of my tenants. They pay their rent, no loud parties, and I don't bother them. How about this party tonight? Yeah, what about it? Was there any trouble? Not that I knew about. You didn't hear anything? Any loud talking? Any arguments, maybe? Nope, I wasn't at the party. Wasn't invited. Hazel gave it for her Tony friends. Gonna play bridge. I wasn't there. Yes, ma'am. Could you tell us who was there? Never been able to get the hang of the game. Don't like cards. Chinese checkers, that's my game. Never could understand bridge, so I wasn't invited. Well, can't you give us a list of the people who were there? I suppose. Why do you need it? We'd like to talk to him. Well, I guess it'd be all right to give them to you. How's Hazel? You heard yet? No, ma'am. Sure terrible thing. Not that maybe she didn't deserve it, but it's sure terrible. Why do you say that, Miss Baker? What do you mean, why do I say it? I say it because it's true. No other reason to say something. Yes, ma'am, but what do you mean? Just that it was bound to happen. Somebody was bound to haul off and slap her mouth shut one of these days, the way she talked. Ma'am? Accusing. Always accusing. Thought everybody in the world was after her. Always tell me that she knew about me, that I wasn't fooling anybody. The word she'd use. And her supposed to be so Tony. Well, did she have any enemies around her? Anyone to make her think that, would you know? Well, she didn't have any right-out enemies. There were several people who didn't like her. They thought she was too snooty for them. I call the office, Joe. They're putting out a broadcast. Did you check him? Yeah, nothing on him. Mm -hmm. Hope it's all right, ma'am. I left your number in case they want to reach us. Sure, it's all right. Can you give us the names of the people who were at the party tonight, ma'am? Yeah, there was Lily Davis, the Harrises, and there was some fellow with Lily that I never saw before. You know where you can get in touch with him, do you? Well, the Harrises live up in 203, and Lily has an apartment 105, right across from the Rockmans. She ought to be able to tell you something. Don't know if it's going to be the truth, but she'll think of something to tell you. Yes, ma'am. Is she a good friend of Mrs. Rockman's, do you know? Oh, you bet. They're thick as thieves. Always having little lunches by themselves, talking secrets, buzzing around. Thieves. Myself, I never took to Lily. I always thought she was kind of wild. Divorcee, you know. All right, Miss Baker, thank you very much. We'll be in 105 if there are any calls. Appreciate it if you let us know if Mr. Rockman comes in. Don't mention to him that we're here. Mm-hmm. All right. That was 105, you said? Yeah. Better talk to this Davis woman, huh? Yeah. Maybe she can tell us where Rockman is. Yeah. 105. Here it is. Yes? Miss Davis? Yes. Is there something I can do for you? Yes, ma'am. We're police officers. Well, what is it you want with me? We'd like to talk to you, ma'am. Oh, well, come in. Thank you. I wonder if it'd be all right if we left the door open. I suppose so. Any special reason? Well, we like to keep an eye on the apartment across the hall. Well, what's it about? We understand that you know the Rockmans pretty well. I suppose so. Why? You have any idea where Mr. Rockman might be? No, I don't. Isn't he across the hall? No, ma'am, he isn't. 
Well, I don't know where he is. Have you talked to Hazel? No, ma'am. Well, why don't you ask her? She should know. We were wondering if you could help us out. No, last I saw of him was when he left their place. Uh-huh. Say, I wonder if you'd mind if I went ahead with what I was doing. Ma'am? <laughs> Probably seems silly to you, but it's a hobby of mine. Wire sculpture. Silly, but it gives me a chance to relax. Yes, ma'am. Well, you go right ahead. I don't think I got your names. Well, my name's Friday. This is my partner, Frank Smith. How do you do, Mr. How do you Smith? do, ma'am? Mr. Friday. Well, what's all this about? Herman done something wrong? No, it's just a routine investigation, Miss Davis. Oh, mm-hmm. We understand that you were at their place tonight, a party, huh? Well, yes. Hazel was going to have a couple of tables of bridge. Anything unusual happen while you were there? No, nothing that you'd call really unusual. Who was there, ma'am? Oh, well, myself, the Harrises, they live upstairs, and Tom Reeves. Another couple were coming over after dinner, but they called and said they couldn't make it. It's just as well. None of us felt much like playing. Why was that? Well, Hazel wasn't feeling very well. She and Herman had a little argument. You know how it is, kind of uncomfortable. Excuse me. Hello? Yes. Oh, yes, Tom. No. Well, you've got to understand she wasn't feeling too well. Mm Mm-hmm. Just one of those things. Yeah. What? No, I've got a meeting that I want to go to tomorrow night. Modern art, yes. At a place down on Melrose. Well, sure, if you if you want to. Mm-hmm. All right. You want to pick me up about seven? Right. Okay. See you then. Bye. Excuse me, that was Tom. He's a nice boy. I just met him tonight. The Rockmans set it up. Mm-hmm. What was this argument that the Rockmans had? Do you know what that was about? Well, it was nothing, just a little thing. Hazel hadn't been feeling well lately. It's awfully easy to set her off. I guess sometimes Herman doesn't realize it. Yes, ma'am, but what caused it tonight? Well, you see, Hazel's been thinking that there was somebody been following her, spying on her. She told Herman about it tonight. That made him a little angry. And, well, then at dinner we just sat down. Mrs. Harris said that she'd seen a picture of the dress that Hazel had on in the morning paper. Well, Hazel didn't understand. I guess she thought that Mrs. Harris was being nasty about it. And she got up and left the table, went into the bedroom. Yes, ma'am. Herman got up and went in after her. Came out and said that she wasn't feeling well. It kind of threw a damper on the evening. So when the other couple called and said that they wouldn't be able to make it, we all decided to call it quits. Mm-hmm. Was there any reason for Mrs. Rockman to feel that there was somebody spying on her? Oh, no, Mr. Friday. It was just one of those things. She'd go along fine, feel good, and then she'd wake up in the morning and start to think about things and she'd get depressed. Well, when she's like that, there isn't anything that can lift her out of it. We used to talk about it. I'd try to help her. Same thing happened to me, I know. It's just one of those things. Yes, ma'am. Maybe if they'd had children, it'd be different, but lately she hasn't been feeling well, and she and Herman haven't been getting along. He just didn't seem to understand. She'd get angry, and he'd work late, and the more he worked late and stayed away from home, the more she'd fret and get angry. It's just a vicious circle. Nothing anyone can do about it. It'll pass with time. Mm -hmm. When Rockman went in to see his wife, did they argue? Well, they had a few words, a little loud, nothing serious. Then he came out and said that everything was all right. Well, ma'am, did Rockman ever get violent toward his wife, do you know? What do you mean, violent? He ever hit her? No, I don't think so. A couple of times when I was over there, he looked like he might be thinking of it, but I never saw it. I think if he ever did hit her, Hazel would have told me. We were very close, as I said. I tried to help her. Mm-hmm. Just a few loud words, that's all I ever knew about. Anyway, after Herman came out of the bedroom, we all decided to leave. This fellow, Tom, he wanted to go on, you know, out someplace, but I was a little tired, and I'd just met him tonight, so I begged off and came home. Yes, ma'am. Can't you tell me what this is all about? Miss Davis? Hello, Mrs. Baker. Something you want? I want to see the police. Mr. Smith, your office called, said you were to call this number right away. Here's the number they gave me. They said you'd know I wrote it down. Thank you, ma'am. Here, you want to call, Joe? Yeah. What if I could use your phone, Miss Davis? Sure, help yourself. Thank you. Isn't this the most awful thing you've heard in all your life? What? What about Herman? What he did? Terrible. They ought to send him away for a long time. A good long Dr. time. Dr. Hall, please. What are you talking about? All the ambulances, the police, never had a thing like this happen before. All the excitement and what Herman did, just terrible. That's all terrible. Mr. Baker, would you wait just a minute, please? Well, somebody tell me what this is all Hello, about. Hello, Doc Hall, this is Joe Friday. Yeah. Now, we're here now. She is. 
You're sure about that, right? Yeah, well, he's out, right. Now we'll call him right out. Yes, it does. Right. Bye. It's Georgia Street. Yeah. Ms. Rockman died. It was something else. What? She wasn't beaten. She was shot to death. You are listening to Dragnet, the authentic story of your police force in action. Years ahead of them all. Chesterfield is years ahead of all cigarettes. Chesterfield quality is highest. Here's the proof. Recent chemical analyses give an index of good quality for the country's six leading cigarette brands. The index of good quality table, which is a ratio of high sugar to low nicotine, shows Chesterfield quality highest. Chesterfield quality highest. Fifteen percent higher than its nearest competitor. Chesterfield quality highest. Thirty-one percent higher than the average of the five other leading brands. Don't you want to try a cigarette with a record like this? Chesterfield. First with premium quality and best for you. Try Chesterfield today. Regular or king size. Nine ten p.m. We called the crime lab and Ray Pinker and a crew were sent out to check the physical evidence at the scene. We contacted Ed Barrett at the hospital, but he said the woman had not regained consciousness. Frank and I went upstairs to talk with Mr. and Mrs. Harris. They gave us substantially the same story we'd gotten from Lily Davis. They agreed that when Rockman went into the bedroom to see his wife, they'd heard loud voices but nothing else. They stated positively that as far as they knew, there'd been no shot fired while they were in the Rockman apartment. 9.17 p.m. We checked with the other people in the apartment building. None of them could report having heard a shot. From them, we got the same story of Mrs. Rockman's actions. Some of the neighbors said that they didn't get along with her. Others seemed to understand her feelings. 9.22 p.m., we checked back with Ray Pinker and the crew from the crime lab. We didn't spend a lot of time here, Ray. The husband looked good for it. We were trying to round him up. Shooting was a real surprise, huh? Looked like a beating to us. We couldn't tell. The boys from Georgia Street got her out of here right away. Yeah. Did you come up with anything, Ray? Yeah, a couple of things. How you fellas got it figured? Well, talking to the neighbors, looks like the husband does. Talk to him? No, he walked right out after it happened. Got out a broadcast on him. Nothing's turned up yet, though. Mm-hmm. How's it look to you, Ray? Well, I'm not sure I can go along with you guys and the husband. Well. I talked with Doc Hall. We aren't going to be able to know for sure till they post the body. Woman was slapped around, we know that. Yeah, we saw her. It looked pretty brutal to us. You mean the black eyes? Yeah. From what Doc Hall says, that didn't come from beating. He says the bullet did it. Was he pretty sure about it? it looks like it. Autopsy will prove it. Where'd you find the gun? Under the bed. Over here, right side. Mm hmm. Indentation on the floor here. Evidently fell from her hand, bounced back under the bed. Any prints on it? Lifted three clean ones. You been able to make them? Lifted some from the dressing table over there. Perfume bottles, mirror. Looks like they might belong to the dead woman. Check them for sure later. And you figure maybe she did herself then, huh? Well, it's beginning to shape up. Well, how about the shot, Ray? Nobody we've talked to heard it. Here's the explanation for that. This pillow here. See the bullet hole here? Burn? Yeah. Doc Hall says she'd be shot in the back of the right ear. She must have held the gun in the pillow. That muffled the sound. What noise there was wouldn't be heard very far. Well, how can you be sure it was suicide, Ray? Just an idea now. We roll the dead woman's prints, run a blotter test on her, see if she fired the gun. Check for nitrate, we'll know for sure. Well, how long will that take? I'll be finished in an hour or so. I'll let you know then. From where I sit, though, it looks like she did it herself. Yeah. I still don't understand about the black eyes, though. The way I get it, the bullet entered just behind the right ear. Passed behind the eyes. I've seen it a couple times before. Yeah, but Doc Hall said that she'd been slapped a couple of times, right? Yeah. Said he found a couple of bruises on her cheeks. Not enough to do any damage, though. Sure not enough to kill her. Mr. Friday? Mr. Friday? Yes, ma'am. Can you come right over to my place? Herman's on the phone. What's that? Mr. Rockman. He called to find out how Hazel was. All right. Phone's right there. Thank you. Hello? 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 Well, he's not there now. What'd he say? Well, he asked me if I knew how Hazel was. I told him that she was dead, and then I asked him where he was. Did he tell you? No. He just said for me to tell people that he was sorry he did it, for me to tell them that, that he didn't mean it. Mm-hmm. He said he didn't mean to kill Hazel. Well, the way it looks, he didn't do it. Then you better find him right away. Ma'am? He thinks he did, and he's going to kill himself. We talked to the landlady, Ruth Baker, but she was unable to tell us where Herman Rockman was employed. Lily Davis told us that he was a car salesman employed at a lot in the south end of town. 
We asked Miss Davis to stay by our phone in the event that Rockman called back and to let us know immediately if he did. We found an address book in the desk in the living room of the apartment, and we began to call Rockman's friends and relatives. None of them had seen him or could tell us where he worked. 9.45 p.m. It had been 20 minutes since the husband of the dead woman had called and said that he was going to kill himself. At 9.46 p.m., we contacted a brother-in-law of the dead woman, and he told us that as far as he knew, Rockman had been employed by the Bateman Auto Agency in Gardena. We got the number from information, and I put in the call. Hello, is this the Bateman Auto Agency? Well, this is Sergeant Joe Friday, Los Angeles Police Department. Yes, sir. Do you have a Herman Rockman working for you? Yes, sir, that's right. R-O-C-K-M-A... Uh-huh. I see. When was that? Yeah. You any idea where he's working now? Uh-huh. Yes, sir, I understand. Yeah, well, have you got the number? Fine, yeah. Would you know if they're open this time of night? I see. Okay, all right, sure, I'll hold on. How about it? Says Rockman did work for him. He hasn't seen him in a couple of... Yes, sir. Yeah. Uh-huh. That's 03, right? Yes, sir. Thanks very much. Says he's heard Rockman's working for a company out on Washington Boulevard now. Huh. Left him a couple of weeks ago. Hello. Do you have a Herman Rockman working there? Hello. Hello. Somebody answered. As soon as I asked about Rockman, he hung up. Think it was him? There's no way of telling him. We better check on it quick. You got the address? Yeah, it ought to take us about five minutes to get there. Let's go. We still got a chance. 9.50 p.m. We left the apartment and we drove out West Lake Avenue and turned down to Washington Boulevard. We traveled Code 3, but because of the possibility of alarming Rockman, we turned off the siren six blocks from the address of the used car lot. 9.54 p.m. We got to the place. The lot was dark. At the rear, in back of a line of cars, we could see a small shack. I hope he's here. Yeah. There's no lights on. The door's locked. Let's try the side. There's a window around there. Right. Can you see anything? No, the window's dirty. Got your flashlight? Yeah, here you go. Right, give me it. How about it? He's in there. Looks like he's out. Come on. Let's hit it. Right. <laughs> Full of gas. Kill your flashlight. Right. I'll get him out of here. You want to get that heater? Right. The window's stuck. Break it. How about it? He's still alive. Fresh air should bring him around. Yeah. Rockman. Rockman. Come on, Rockman. You're all right. Come on. Sit up. What? Why'd you do it? Why'd you stop me? No reason for you to kill yourself. I got a reason. I killed Hazel. I didn't mean to. I loved him more than anything. I, I didn't mean it. I didn't know I hit her that hard. All right, settle down. Settle down. You didn't kill her, Rockman. Nobody asked you to come down here. I called you to take care of her. I, I knew it was too late. I killed her. She's dead, and it's my fault. Oh, why'd you come here? Why'd you stop me? All right, now take it easy, will you, Rockman? Straighten yourself out here. You didn't kill your wife, Rockman. You understand? What? We don't think you killed her. We think she did it herself. Huh? Oh. Well, she wasn't well. She was sick. She, she didn't know what she was doing. She did the wrong thing, didn't she? Her way wasn't right. I loved her, you know, very much. Yes, sir, we understand. Doesn't really make any difference. You stop me. No difference. Sir? Doesn't make any difference that you stop me. I loved her. No difference at all. How's that? I died with her. The story you have just heard is true. The names were changed to protect the innocent. On June 15th, an inquest was held in the coroner's office in and for the county of Los Angeles. In a moment, the results of that inquest. Now, here is our star, Jack Webb. Thank you, George Fenneman. Friends, next Sunday, June 21st, is Father's Day. Your neighborhood dealer has the special Chesterfield Father's Day carton on sale right now. So remember the guy who never forgets you. Don't give him just any cigarette. Give him premium quality Chesterfields, regular or king size. They're best for him. At the coroner's inquest, it was decided that the wound that killed Hazel Eileen Rockman was self-inflicted. The death was listed as a suicide. 
Her husband, Herman George Rockman, was not held. You have just heard Dragnet, a series of authentic cases from official files. Technical advice comes from the office of Chief of Police W.H. Parker, Los Angeles Police Department. Technical advisors, Captain Jack Donahoe, Sergeant Marty Wynn, Sergeant Vance Brasher. Heard tonight were Ben Alexander, June Whitley, Lillian Byeth. Script by John Robinson, Ben Alexander. Music by Walter Schumann. Hal Gibney speaking. For a million laughs, tune in Chesterfield's Martin and Lewis show, Tuesday on the same NBC station. And sound off for Chesterfields. Either regular or king size, you'll find premium quality Chesterfields much milder. Chesterfield is best for you. Chesterfield has brought you Dragnet transcribed from Los Angeles. Have you tried new cork-tipped Fatima? It's the smooth smoke. Here's why. New Fatima tips of perfect cork. King size for longer filtering and Fatima quality for a much better flavor and aroma. Remember, Fatima has the tip for your lips. Try new Fatima. See how smooth it is. Fatima is made by the makers of Chesterfield, Liggett and Myers, one of tobacco's most respected names. <laughs> off for Chesterfield. Chesterfield, first with premium quality and best for you. Chesterfield brings you Dragnet. Ladies and gentlemen, the story you are about to hear is true. The names have been changed to protect the innocent. You're a detective sergeant. You're assigned a missing persons detail. You get a call that a man is missing. He failed to return from his work the day before. There are no leads to his whereabouts. Your job, find him. Here is Chesterfield's record with smokers, and important to you. No adverse effects to the nose, throat, and sinuses from smoking Chesterfield. That's the report of a doctor who has been examining a group of Chesterfield smokers for a full year and two months as a part of a program supervised by a responsible independent research laboratory. Don't you want to try a cigarette with a record like this? Chesterfield. First with premium quality. Chesterfield. First choice of young America. And that's from a survey made in 274 colleges and universities. Try Chesterfields today. Chesterfield, regular or king size. They're much milder and best for you. Dragnet, the documented drama of an actual crime. For the next 30 minutes, in cooperation with the Los Angeles Police Department, you will travel step by step on the side of the law through an actual case transcribed from official police files. From beginning to end, from crime to punishment, Dragnet is the story of your police force in action. It was Tuesday, June 16th. It was warm in Los Angeles. We were working the night watch out of Homicide Division, missing persons detail. My partner is Frank Smith. The boss is Chief of Detectives Thad Brown. My name's Friday. I was on my way back to the office, and it was 11.59 p.m. when I got to room 24. Missing persons. What was his mental condition when you last saw him, Mr. Ford? Where'd you last see him? Was he driving his car? Mm-hmm. And what time was that? Yes, ma'am, but what was the exact time? I see. And your address? And the phone, please. Now, can you think of anything you forgot to tell me? Right. Right. Now, you gave me that before. 
Mm-hmm. Now, uh, was your husband a drinking man, ma'am? I see. Okay, Miss Borg, we'll make a check. Call you back. Yes, ma'am, we'll do our best, thanks. Anything? Man by the name of Borg missing. Mm-hmm. Well, I'm sure glad my wife doesn't call for help every time I miss a meal. Trouble with most guys is they let a woman keep tabs on them, check on everything they do. Let me see that 97, will you? Yeah, there you go. It's everything his wife gave me. Mm-hmm. When you get the jails and records, I'll check Georgia Street County Hospital in the morgue. Looked like a routine investigation. Lots of things can keep a man from getting home. A few drinks, sick friend, unexpected business conference, a flat tire on an isolated road, maybe just boredom. But there are other things that can keep a man from getting home. It had to be checked out. Henry Borg, 51, male, white American, address 1571 East Barendo Street, had failed to return home at the usual time on Monday. His wife called one of the men he worked with and found that he hadn't been at work all day that day. He still hadn't come home the next afternoon. She called us. I checked the Gaga file to see if he was one of our regular customers, mental case or alcoholic. He wasn't. Frank and I checked the jails, the hospitals, and the morgue. They had no record of him there. No John Doe's fitting his description. And Borg had no criminal record. We could assume that he was at least alive. Frank called Mrs. Borg back, told her not to worry, and asked her to call us immediately if she heard from her husband. Wednesday, 3.10 p.m., still no word of Henry Borg. The day watch had made another check of the jails, the hospitals, and the morgue. Mrs. Borg called three times. The day watch officer's notes described her as very upset. I called her back and asked her to come in the next day to file a missing persons report. I asked her also to bring in the best picture she had of her husband. Thursday, 2.40 p.m. Mrs. Borg was waiting with Frank when I got to work. She'd already filled out the Form 316. She was holding an aging Pekingese dog in her arms. Joe, this is Mrs. Borg. How are you, ma'am? My partner, Joe Friday, ma'am. Uh, hello, Officer Friday. I talked to Mr. Smith and filled out the paper. Here's that picture you wanted. Oh, yes. Thank you very much, ma'am. It's a good likeness. Mm-hmm. Now, Ms. Borg, I see here that you haven't put anything down under personal habits for your husband. Well, I don't understand. Well, does your husband drink at all, ma'am? Henry? No. He takes a glass of beer with his supper when he comes home, but he's not what a person would call a drinking person. Gamble? Gamble? Yes, ma'am. Cards, dice, horses. Oh, I should say not. He never does nothing like that. You've never known him to gamble at all, then? Henry? I should say not. Now, Miss Borg, you say here that your husband has no relatives. Oh, only a brother, Ed. Older brother. But I didn't put him down. We don't know where he lives. Haven't heard a word about him in nine, ten years. Mm-hmm. What about your family? Your husband friendly with your family? My family hasn't spoke to me since the day I married Henry Borg. Mrs. Borg, I see you only have one friend listed, a Hal Bishop. That's the man your husband rode to work with, isn't it? Yes. Do you know Mr. Bishop's address? No, I don't. Did your husband ride to work with Bishop every day? You say he left his car at home Monday. Did he ever drive it to work? Well, he usually drove our car, but then he'd ride with Mr. Bishop pretty often, too. I didn't think anything about it. It didn't seem like anything. Well, did your husband spend much time with this Bishop? No, just at work. Henry used to like to spend his free time with me. All right, now, ma'am, please don't get upset here. Did your husband have any financial problems, debts that were worrying him? Financial difficulties, like bills and things? No, Henry always took care of it. Do you think there might have been anything you didn't know about that was worrying him? Officer, if Henry was worried about anything, I'd have known it. He'd have told me for sure. Mm -hmm. Now, what about your home? Do you own it? What do you mean? Was there a mortgage on it, I mean? Yes. Do you have the pink slip on your car? No, no. Well, is it possible that your husband was behind in the payments? No, no, he would have told me. Well, did he owe money down where he worked? No, not that I know of. His job, maybe. Was he worried about that? Mr. Snyder, that's his boss. Well, he always said Henry would have a job as long as he was in the contracting business. Henry makes good wages. Mm-hmm. Now, you say here his mental condition was good. Has that ever been poor? You ever know your husband to black out? How do you mean, black out? Well, has he ever suffered from lapse of memory? Is there any history of epilepsy in his family? History of epilepsy? Oh, no, not Henry. Why, he's a healthy man. He hasn't had a sick day. Now, Miss Borg, have you and your husband been getting along lately? What do you mean by a thing like that, officer? You think Henry and I had a fight and that's why he left. Is that what you think? No, ma'am. We don't think anything here, but these are the things we have to check out. Well, it's a waste of time. Don't you think I'd have already told you that? If Henry and I'd had a fight, I'd have told you first off. It's the first thing I'd have said. Yes, 
Something's happened to my husband, officer. I just know it. Something's happened to him. Did you and your husband go out together much, ma'am? Well, one night last month we went to the Coconut Grove there in the Ambassador Hotel. And we used to go up the movies pretty regular. Was he in the habit of leaving the house at night alone? No. Just when he went out with Francine. Francine? Well, yes, our, our Pekingese here. p.m. Thursday, June 18th. Began to look as if Henry Borg was in trouble. From what we'd been told, he wasn't a man who had just suddenly decided to leave home. We had to find out if the facts we'd been given were accurate. Thursday, 4.10 p.m. We contacted Borg's friend, Hal Bishop, just as he was leaving the construction job where they both worked. He said he hadn't gone by Borg's house to pick him up Monday because Borg hadn't asked him to. The way they worked it, Borg always told him the day before if he wanted a ride. At first, Bishop said he hadn't noticed anything strange about Borg recently. Then he decided Borg had been a little irritable the last few days. He said it wasn't like him to be irritable. That he'd never known Borg to miss work before. And that he'd never heard of any trouble between Borg and his wife. He said that Borg didn't talk much about his wife. We called on the neighbors of the Borgs. They said nothing to indicate any flaws in Mrs. Borg's story. Henry and Martha Borg were average people in an average neighborhood. He went to work every morning at 7 a.m. Came home at 5.15 his neighbors didn't know much about him. He was a quiet man. They lived in the same house for 13 years. Martha Borg was 47, maybe 48. They never had visitors. After 13 years in the same neighborhood, she apparently had no close friends. Two of her neighbors had noticed that in the past year, Martha Borg would leave her house three or four times a week at 11 a.m. Always at 11 a.m. She invariably got back before her husband did. The neighbors said she usually brought some shopping home with her. They did go out frequently in the evenings. However, there were no reports of family trouble between Martha and Henry Borg. Thursday, 6.20 p.m., we talked to Adolph Wernicke, whose grocery store was on the corner a half a block from the Borg home. They'd been trading with him ever since they moved to the neighborhood. I don't know what to tell you about Mr. Borg, officer. He always seemed like a nice fellow to me. He didn't say much, but nice. Sure is funny, him disappearing like that. Mm -hmm. You got any idea if he had any trouble with his wife? No, that wife, she's a funny one. Different from Mr. Borg is day and night. Well, how's that, sir? I don't know. High hat, sort of. She's all right, I guess. Kind of show-off, though. Kind of person who dresses up when she goes shopping around the corner. Likes to buy fancy groceries. Stuff I never get calls for. Like those anchovies up there on the shelf. Now, I'll bet you I won't sell two cans of them in a year. But Mrs. Borg comes in and she'll buy them. Now, Mr. Borg, he don't like that kind of stuff at all. Told me so himself. Yes, sir. But how'd they get along? Do you ever say anything about his wife? i tell you the truth, officer. I don't know. As far as a man and his wife arguing, I don't pry. Hurts business. Come to think of it... He did say one thing. That was a long time ago, about two or three months ago, maybe more. Well, what was that? What did he say? Well, he came in here, just about like this time it was. Didn't buy anything, just kind of hung around. I remember, he seemed out of sorts. I asked him if he was feeling all right. He said he was. Just felt like he had to get away from the house. Now, that'll happen to a man. Just feel like you got to get away for a while. But you know what I mean, officer. No, sir, I'm not married. Thursday, 7.50 p.m. Borg's description and the circumstances of his disappearance have been broadcast to all units. Still no word. 4.10 p.m. Friday, June 19th. We checked Borg's union. He hadn't reported for a new job. We filed an all-points bulletin. 8.5 p.m. I checked back into the office. Mrs. Borg was waiting. Sergeant Friday, I'd like to know just what's going on around here. My husband has been missing almost a week, and I don't see why something hasn't been done about it. If you can't find my husband, then why don't they put more men on this case? This is a terrible thing. I'm a woman alone, and the police haven't done a single thing. My husband may be dead. He may be dead, and nobody's doing anything about it. In my work, you hear it every day, but you can't get mad. It's against regulations, and you can't blame them either. They're in trouble, so you let them talk. You try to explain. They don't listen, but you try. Well, we're doing all we can, ma'am. They're always talking these days about giving policemen more money. It seems to me there are certain policemen who aren't even earning the money they get right now. Yes, ma'am. What are you doing for my husband? Miss Borg, here's the file on it. Now, we've made regular checks on the hospitals, the jails, and the morgues. Thursday night when you came in to file that Form 316, we had a complete description of your husband broadcast to all radio units in the city. It was teletyped to every police division. Today, we sent out an all-points bulletin over the state wire. Every police department, sheriff's office, and highway patrol unit in the state knows that your husband is missing. Here, you can see the bulletin right here, ma'am. Now, in these cases, ma'am, we start with nothing. We don't know where they've gone or why they've gone. Most of them turn up by themselves. Some of them don't. We do everything we can to find the ones that don't. Miss Borg, there are 4,000 police officers in this city looking for your husband. (laughs) 
8.57 p.m. When we thought Mrs. Borg was feeling better, we sent her home. We reminded her again to notify us immediately if she heard from her husband. 9.10 p.m. The desk at Central called and told us that they'd picked up a John Doe. From what they said, he apparently was suffering from amnesia. While I went down to Homicide to check out some reports, Frank went over to Central to see the man they picked up. 9.16 p.m. Frank came back to the office. Joe. Yeah. I checked out that John Doe at Central. Anything on him? Yeah, it's Henry Borg. You are listening to Dragnet, the authentic story of your police force in action. Years ahead of them all. Chesterfield is years ahead of all cigarettes. Chesterfield quality is highest. Here's the proof. Recent chemical analyses give an index of good quality for the country's six leading cigarette brands. The index of good quality table, which is a ratio of high sugar to low nicotine, shows Chesterfield quality highest. Chesterfield quality highest. 15% higher than its nearest competitor. Chesterfield quality highest. 31% higher than the average of the five other leading brands. Don't you want to try a cigarette with a record like this? Chesterfield. First with premium quality and best for you. Try Chesterfield today. Regular or king size. <laughs> p.m. Officers Gorman and Mayer brought in Henry Borg, alias John Doe. They found him wandering around in the 900 block down on South Spring Street, the financial district. Wasn't much reason for anybody to be loitering around there at that time of night. All the businesses in the area were closed. The officers investigated. When they questioned the suspect, he would not or could not reply. They took him to Central Division, where the watch commander, Lieutenant Hale, had him shaken down. His wallet was missing. No papers, no identification. In his pockets, the officers found eight cents a key ring and several keys. No cigarettes, no matches. He was dressed in a good quality worsted suit, very rumpled. No tie, no hat. Norman and Mayer had rolled his prints at the city hall and sent them to Leighton Prince for classification. During this time, no one let him know that we had any idea who he was. The two officers that had picked him up stood by. Frank and I walked over to where he was sitting. Do you know who you are? Feel sick? Been drinking, maybe? Would you have a rough night? Look, if you can talk, mister, I think you better make things a lot simpler here. We're trying to help you. How about telling us who you are? Maybe there's something wrong with you, mister, but we don't think so. We want to know who you are. We want you to tell us. If you don't, the only thing we can do is let them book you at city jail as a John Doe. That's the law. Now, look, if you're trying to hide something, if you're wanted, we're going to know it in a few minutes anyhow. If you want to wait, we'll wait it out with you. You want us to think you're an amnesia case, is that it? Well, maybe you got a good reason, but it won't work. I've been in this department a long time. I've seen a lot of phony amnesia cases. I've only seen one real one, and he didn't act like you. You want to know what I think? I think you're pulling a phony. Come on, how about it, mister? I got it. Missing persons, friend. All right. You bet. Thanks very much. Right. Okay. That was Leighton Prince, mister. They got your fingerprints classified. Now, we know you're not wanted for anything. Look, we know you're not a bum. Your clothes are good, and you look like a guy who takes good care of himself. A man like you doesn't walk around without a wallet. What happened to you? You got a problem? Tell us about it. Maybe we can help you. Now, why don't you tell us who you are? You probably got a wife. She must be mighty worried about you right now. All right. Book him. I lost my wallet. How? I don't know how. Where? I don't know where I've been. Now, you listen to me, mister. We want to know who you are. We want to know where you've been, and we want to know right now. I don't know who I am. Let me see your hands. What? Your hands. Come on, hold them up. Let me see them. That's it. Now, I'm going to tell you something about yourself, mister. You work for a living, don't you? Hard work with your hands. Like a mason, maybe, huh? Yeah, maybe you're a mason or a hod carrier. You could be a painter. Some kind of construction work, I'd say. Something like a plasterer, for instance, huh? You couldn't be a plasterer by any chance, could you, mister? I don't know. Okay. You ready to talk to us now, Henry? I wasn't trying to fool you. I was only trying to fool myself. Now, we've been looking for you since Tuesday, Borg. Your wife's pretty worried. I'm not going back. 
No matter what you do, I'm not going back. We're not going to make you go back. That's up to you, boy. All they pay us for, mister, is to find you, to make sure you're okay. None of our business if you go back. I'm not going back. All right, now, look, you're pretty upset, Borg. Why don't you tell us about it? It's crazy. It's crazy what I did. It doesn't make any sense. You fellas, you wouldn't be interested. Maybe I'll just go if it's all right with you. I'll just go. Yeah, it's all right. It's okay if you want to. Look, we're going to be around here another hour. We haven't got much to do. Our work's all cleaned up. We're just about ready to go home. Why don't you stick around and talk to us, huh? We'd kind of like to hear what happened. Yeah. Just might help you clear things up in your mind if you talked about it. Oh, it's crazy. I know it's crazy, but I guess I do want to tell somebody about it. How about a cigarette? Will that help? Yeah. Can I give you a match? I am a man 50 years old. I work hard. I learned my trade as a boy of 16. I've been at it ever since. My wife and me, we got a new car. We got our own home. Almost paid for. A man my age, when he gets home nights, he wants to take it easy. Read the paper. Watch the television. Bought a $400 TV, 21-inch screen. Yeah. You want to know what happens when I get home? She wants to go out. Don't make any difference how tired I am. It don't make any difference if I've been working hard all day. She wants to go out. Do you know what that's like? Well, it doesn't sound like the reason a man would leave home, boy. I don't mind it once in a while if it was just once in a while, but she's after me every minute I'm home. Here for the last few years, it's been every night. I don't know what's come over her. She didn't used to be like that. Martha used to be a sensible woman. Now she acts silly like a young girl. She's different. Goes in for fancy clothes, all kinds of fancy food, even anchovies. And I don't like anchovies. Last month, I swear, she even made me take her down to the Ambassador Hotel. Imagine me at the Ambassador Hotel. All I ever hear from her is we've just got a few years left to have our fling. I don't want any fling. I'm a plasterer. That's hard work. I get home, I want to rest. It isn't like I cared if she goes out. She goes to the movies almost every day. Goes before noon, she tells me, before the prices go up. I don't care about the money. I want her to have a good time, the clothes, the things like that. I don't care. I love my wife. I guess you think I'm crazy after what I did, but I love my wife. I see, sir. And that dog, that Francine, what kind of a name is that for a dog? You ought to hear her talk to it like it was a person. How long you had the dog, Borg? I don't know. Two, three years. Well, the reason I ask, it seems funny that you just decided to leave home last Monday. Dog's been around two or three years. The ambassador thing was last month, he said. Well, what did it? It was the lessons. Lessons? The dancing lessons. What? But there's this social club up around Pico and Figueroa. People go there to dance. People our age, she says. Only I can't dance. That's when she gets this idea, I gotta take dancing lessons. Did you ever hear of anything like that? A man my age has got to take dancing lessons? That's when you left. It was Sunday afternoon when she got this idea. She kept picking at me all afternoon. It really got me. I thought about it all night. I couldn't sleep. Monday morning, I just didn't go to work. I got drunk instead. Got sick, too. Just couldn't think of anything else to do. Yes, you know the rest. I lost my tie, my wallet, lost my hat, too. And they picked me up. I was just kind of wandering around when they picked me up. Seems like a shame when a man can't even go home. Mm -hmm. You sure you don't want to go home now, Borg? Maybe if you talk things over with your wife. No, no, it wouldn't do any good. Nothing I could say to her would do any good. I can't go home. Well, it sure has been interesting hearing you talk, Mr. Borg. It's almost like hearing somebody tell about me, remember, Joe? Yeah. You had something like this? Had it. With me, it was canasta, though. I hate cards, a waste of time. 
Yeah, I sure thought it was the end for me and Faye. Remember, Joe? But it wasn't? No, for a while, Eric sure looked like I was going to lose my happy home. Guess I would have, too, but I talked turkey to her. You know what I mean, Borg? No. What do you mean? Talk turkey to him. Make him understand. You let a woman push you around, Borg, you're dead. Well, with Martha... I... Look, they're all the same. I sat her right down on the sofa, and I said, Now, look, Faye. And I told her what the scar was. She took it, too. It's the only way to do. You try what I say, Borg. You'll see I'm right. I can just see, Martha, if I ever tried to put my foot down. That's what I thought. I was all set to give it up. Move in with Joe here, right, Joe? Yeah. Then I figured I might as well at least get a load off my chest. Once I got started, I lost my temper. You know, it's a funny thing. Faye's always thought more of me since then. You ask her. She'll tell you so herself. Says she respects a man who'll stand up for his own rights. Right, Joe? Yeah. I don't know. With me, I I don't think it would work. Sure it can. Now, Borg, you listen to me. You tell her you're a working man. Tell her when you get through work, you want to take it easy and nobody's going to run you. Set her straight, Borg. Get tough if you have to. She won't give you any trouble after that. I just don't know. Martha... Did... Won't do any harm to try it. I'd like to see Martha's face just once if I even told her to shut up. I wouldn't want her to have anything handy to throw. Borg, look, it's 12.10. We've got to be getting home now. You take my advice. You go home, too. Have a talk with her. See if you can't work it out. No. No, Sergeant. Thanks a lot, but I can't go home. Well, like I told you, it's none of our business, but I think you ought to try it. Well, here. Well, look, you're going to need car fare. Here's a dollar. You can take this and go on home. That'll get you there. Yeah. Okay. You'll get this back, Sergeant. I'll pay it back to you. I, I guess maybe you're right. Can't hurt anything to try it. That's the stuff. Thank you a lot. I didn't mean to put you fellas out this way. Good luck to you, Borg. You'll see. It'll work. Maybe it'll work. Well. But I don't know. Martha. I'll get out of cancellation, Joe. I should wrap it up, huh? Yeah. What time did you say it was? It's 12.10. Yeah. Well, Joe, I better make a phone call first. This time of night? Why? What's the matter? I just remembered I told Faye I'd call her. Friday, July 28th. A month had passed since Henry Borg had left our office to go home. We'd heard nothing further from him or his wife. We assumed that they had reconciled their problems. 6.10 p.m. Officers? Oh, hello there, Borg. Nice to see you again. Hi, Borg. I was afraid maybe you fellas wouldn't remember me. It's been a while. I tried to get out and see you before this. Well, fine. How are things going? Did it work out like I said? I brought you something, Sergeant. Some cigarettes for both of you. Like you to have them. I hope it's the right brand. Well, yes, sir, that's the right brand, all right, but you don't owe us anything. I want you to have them. That's all right, sir, you keep them. All right. Well, anyway, here's that dollar, the one you loaned me. Okay, Borg, thanks very much. I sure owe you fellas a lot, and I really mean it. My wife and I, we sure appreciate what you fellas did for us. Was that clock right? Yes, sir. Uh Uh-oh, got a rush. Got an appointment. Be late if I don't hurry. Appointment? Yeah. Got to get over to Arthur Murray's. The story you have just heard is true. The names were changed to protect the innocent. On July 31st, a meeting was held in the office of the captain of homicide. In a moment, the results of that meeting. Now, here is our star, Jack Webb. Thank you, George Fenneman. Friends, we hope you've been listening to Dragnet regularly, and we hope you've tried our Chesterfields. If you haven't tried them yet, then tomorrow's your day. Get a carton, regular or king size. It only takes one carton at Chesterfields to show you why Chesterfield is best for you. Believe me, they're much milder with a wonderful taste. America's best cigarette buy, Chesterfield. Since the subject, Henry George Borg, had committed no crime, he was not held and the case was officially marked closed. just heard Dragnet, a series of authentic cases from official files. 
Technical advice comes from the office of Chief of Police W.H. Parker, Los Angeles Police Department. Technical advisors, Captain Jack Donahoe, Sergeant Marty Wynn, Sergeant Vance Frazier. Heard tonight were Ben Alexander, Vic Perrin, Irene Tedrow. Script by Paul Coates. Music by Walter Schumann. Hal Gibney speaking. For a million laughs, tune in Chesterfield's Martin and Lewis show Tuesday on this same NBC station. And sound off for Chesterfield's, either regular or king size. You'll find premium quality Chesterfield's much milder. Chesterfield is best for you. By special request, Dragnet is being sent to our servicemen and women all over the world. Chesterfield has brought you Dragnet, transcribed from Los Angeles. Have you tried new cork-tipped Fatima? It's the smooth smoke. Here's why. New Fatima tips of perfect cork. King size for longer filtering. And Fatima quality for a much better flavor and aroma. Remember, Fatima has the tip for your lips. Try new Fatima. See how smooth it is. Fatima is made by the makers of Chesterfield, Liggett and Myers, one of tobacco's most respected names. Sound off for Chesterfield. Chesterfield, first with premium quality and best for you. Chesterfield brings you Dragnet. Ladies and gentlemen, the story you are about to hear is true. The names have been changed to protect the innocent. You're a detective sergeant. You're assigned a homicide detail. A young girl has been shot with a 22 caliber rifle. It was reported a suicide. Your job, investigate. Here is Chesterfield's record with smokers, and important to you. No adverse effects to the nose, throat, and sinuses from smoking Chesterfield. That's the report of a doctor who has been examining a group of Chesterfield smokers for a full year and two months as a part of a program supervised by a responsible independent research laboratory. Don't you want to try a cigarette with a record like this? Chesterfield. First with premium quality. Chesterfield. First choice of young America. And that's from a survey made in 274 colleges and universities. Try Chesterfields today. Chesterfield. Regular or king size. They're much milder and best for you. Dragnet, the documented drama of an actual crime. For the next 30 minutes, in cooperation with the Los Angeles Police Department, you will travel step by step on the side of the law through an actual case transcribed from official police files. From beginning to end, from crime to punishment, Dragnet is the story of your police force in action. It was Monday, June 8th. It was warm in Los Angeles. We were working the day watch out of homicide detail. My partner's Frank Smith. The boss is Captain Warman. My name's Friday. I was on my way into the office, and it was 8.03 a.m. when I checked into room 42. Homicide. Joe? Yeah? Back here in the skipper's office. Ray Giese wants to talk to All right. You. Morning, Joe. Hi, Ray. What do you got? Suicide. Anything on it? Oh, uh, here's the report. Team from the business office went out last night. Get on it right away, will you? Right, Ray. Let's go, huh? Yeah. Want to check this stuff before we get started? Might as well give us an idea what we got to do. What's the report say there you got? Well, let's see. According to this, business office got a call at 2.30 this morning. Landlady out in the West Lake Park District called in and said that this young girl had committed suicide. They get an ID on her? No, they got her listed as Jane Doe, number 17. There's a description here. Better check it with missing persons, huh? Uh-huh. How'd the landlady happen to find the body? Well, according to the report, she heard the water running in the apartment, finally went up to see what it was. She knocked on the door, nobody answered. She opened it and went in, found the body. 
Well, the girl didn't live in the apartment then. No, the place is rented to a Ross Mitchell. Anything on him? No, says he wasn't home. He was checked through R&I, no make on him. How about prints on the victim? No go. Checked him out. Nothing on her here. We could send him on to Washington. Yeah. And they found a suicide note. It's a copy of it here. What's it say? Ross, I've tried to make you understand. Nothing seems to do any good. I've told you that I won't stand in the way of your career, but you don't want to try to make a go of it. I know this doesn't solve anything. It's the only way I can think of. Any signature? No. The report says that the original copy's over at the crime lab for processing. Yeah. Well, I guess we better start with the landlady, huh? It's the best lead we got. Glindo and Bates are out there now. The place was staked right away. Friday, you want to check, too? Right, thanks, Ray. It's Friday talking. Yeah. Uh-huh. No, we just got it. Is that right? Okay, Max. No, have him wait there, will you? No, we'll be right over. All right, thank you. Well, it's a little break. Max over at the coroner's office says they know who the girl is. Yeah. Her father just identified the body. Eight fourteen a.m. We left the city hall and we went over to the hall of justice. We met the victim's father, a Mr. Robert Andrews Paul. He told us that there could be no mistake. The body was that of his daughter, Gloria Z. Paul. The attendant had given him some smelling salts, and after introducing us, he'd left to close off the viewing room. I don't understand why she'd do it. None of it makes sense. Well, when did you see your daughter last, Mr. Paul? Saturday afternoon. That was the last time. I never saw her again. She was gone Saturday night and all day yesterday, is that it? Yeah. You hear from her at all? No. Weren't you worried about her at all? No, sometimes she doesn't come home, stays with a girlfriend, but when I didn't hear from her last night, I got worried, started calling around. she say where she was going when she left? Told me she was going over to see Peggy. Said the two of them were going to a show and that she'd be home for dinner, sure. Well, who is this Peggy? Peggy Rockwell, a friend of Gloria's. Uh-huh. Have you talked to her? What? I say, have you talked to this Peggy since your daughter disappeared? Yes, I called her last night. I talked to her then. I was most out of my mind. I didn't know what to do. I talked to her last night. She didn't know. Did your daughter know anybody named Ross Mitchell? Ross Mitchell? No, I don't think I've ever heard the name. Why do you ask that? Well, I just wondered... You know something about this you're not telling me, is that it? No, sir, we don't. Well, it must be something like that. You don't just come up with a name like that out of thin air. you got to have a reason. Now, look, I'm a father. i got a right to know. All night sitting there waiting for the phone to ring, calling her friends, thinking she's been in an accident, imagining all kinds of things. If you know something, you should tell me. I've got to know. How am I going to tell her mother? Poor woman's almost dead with worry. She doesn't know about this. All she knows is that the baby's gone, that's all. The baby's gone. Glory is dead. I don't know what to do. All right, Mr. Paul, try to take it easy. I'm sorry if you got a cigarette. Yes, sir. Here you go. Here, I'll give you a light. I'm sorry about that. It's all right, sir. We understand. Then do you think you can give us an address where we can talk to this Peggy Rockwell? Yeah, she works at a restaurant over on 7th. I've got a home address, too, if you want it. Yes, sir. We hope you'll understand this, Mr. Paul. We don't mean any offense here. What's that? Did your daughter have any steady boyfriends that you know about? No, I don't think so. No one that she went with steady. No one man she liked more than the others? I think there was. I, I don't know who. Her mother asked her about it a couple of times, wanted to know who the fellow was, but Gloria would never say. Just said that it wasn't serious, it didn't matter. I'd seem to get along with this man, would you know? All right, I guess. I told you, I never saw him. I didn't know who he was. But whenever Gloria had a date with him, she acted like it was something special. Did your daughter have a job? Not regular. She used to model once in a while, and then maybe she'd pick up a day's work in pictures. Not much. Mm -hmm. Can you think of any reason why she'd want to take her own life? No. She seemed pretty happy. Never gave any indication there was anything wrong. Has she been ill lately under a doctor's care? No, not that I know about. Well, Mr. Paul, is it possible she might have been seeing a doctor and you wouldn't know about it? No, her mother would have known. She'd have told me. Now, I'm pretty sure she was feeling all right. Anything about her job that bothered her? What do you mean? Well, was she happy with what she was doing, the kind of work she was doing? Oh, yeah. Gloria didn't want a career. She was looking for a husband, one to settle down and raise a family. Mm -hmm. Well, can you think of anything at all that might make her want to take her own life, as I asked you before? I can't understand it. None of it makes any sense to me. Where she was found, she didn't know anybody in that part of town. I don't know what she'd be doing over there. Could she drink? I don't think I understand. Well, did she drink much, sir? Bars, cocktail lounges? No, she didn't. Now, Gloria was a good girl. She didn't drink or smoke. She was a good girl, and I don't understand all this. First this thing with Ross, and now you want to know if she drinks. I don't know what you're trying to get at, but I don't like it. You're trying to make Gloria something that she isn't. She's a good girl, always has been. 
Just a home and family. That's all she wanted. Nothing more. I don't know why you're asking me all these questions. I'm her father. You're the police. It's up to you to find the reason. That's your job. Not to come around and say things about my girl. I'm sorry. We're not saying anything, Mr. Paul. You are, too. You're trying to make me believe that Gloria wasn't a nice girl. Now, I know different. I raised her since she was a baby. Gave her all the care I could. I don't know why she'd do a thing like this. You don't? No. Why ask me these questions? Well, sir, you said it yourself. Huh? You're her father. We continued to talk to the father of the victim. From him, we got a list of the girl's friends, the address, and the names of the people that she worked for. While we were talking to him, he was unable to give us any idea as to why his daughter, Gloria Paul, might want to take her own life. He insisted that he didn't know anybody or any one of his daughter's acquaintances named Ross Mitchell. A telephone call was put through to his wife, but she was unable to tell us who the man was. 8.20 a.m., Mr. Paul recovered from the initial shock, and he went home. 8.39 a.m., we drove over to the rooming house where Gloria Paul had been found. On the way, we stopped to call the crime lab to see if they'd been able to come up with anything in the dead girl's effects to help us. Lieutenant Lee Jones at the lab told us that they hadn't finished their investigation yet. 8.50 a.m., we arrived at the house and talked with the landlady, Selma Keene. It's terrible. Poor little thing. You haven't seen Ross Mitchell yet, has No, he hasn't come in. I told the officers last night that I didn't expect him until noon today. Have you seen the girl before? Once in a while. She'd come in with Ross, wait for him, and then they'd go right out. Did you see her last night, sir? I told the officers that were here last night that I didn't. Uh, didn't you talk to them at all? Well, yes, ma'am. We have the report they filed, Mrs. Keene, but we'd like to get some additional facts from you. It seems like a waste of time, but I suppose you have to. Yes, ma'am. Do you have any idea when she might have come in? No, not the slightest. When was the last time you saw Mitchell? Saturday around noon. He came in and told me that he'd be out of town over the weekend. Uh, said for me to keep an eye on the place. Yes, ma'am. Did he tell you where he was going? He said he was going to visit an assistant director friend of his over in La Cunada. Did he say what the friend's name was? No, they're working on a picture together. Ross just met him the other day. Asked him out for the weekend. Ross is very good at making friends. Mm -hmm. Do you know where he's working? No. Ross just said it was a sea adventure. Doing it in full color. 3D, too. I guess it's going to be quite a spectacle. They didn't have all the gimmicks in my day. Ma'am? Didn't have 3D or the other things. In my day, we acted. We knew how to act. From the heart. These youngsters are good flack. Can make a star out of anybody. Oh, things have changed. And here, this one. That's me with the pith helmet. This was made over on Catalina Island. We were shooting a jungle picture. We acted. No doubles for us. Real actors. Mm -hmm. When was this, ma'am? A few years ago. Now, why are you asking all these questions about Ross? Well, the note the girl left was addressed to him. <laughs> that doesn't mean anything. Just some lovesick girl. Doesn't mean Ross had anything to do with it. How'd you happen to find the body? I went to bed about 10.30... They were running one of my old movies on TV, and I stayed up to see it. You happened to catch it? A thing called The Floods Will Come. I made it over at Catalina. I starred Nick Benton, real movie idol. Uh, here's one of the stills from the picture. Yes, ma'am. Uh, here's the whole company. That's me. And that, that's Nick with the puttees. He'd put on a little weight. I remember he had to do road work while we were there to trim down. Held the company up for a week. The grand picture. They didn't do it right on television, though. Look, look, Orny. I guess the way they ran it through the machines. You know, we all looked uh, pasty. Even Nick. Yes, ma'am. Would you go on, please? Uh, well, after I saw the rest of the picture, I went up to the kitchen, got a bowl of shredded wheat to eat in bed, came back to the bedroom, and I heard this noise. What noise was that, ma'am? Like somebody was running water in one of the taps. Went on and on. Pretty soon it started to bother me. I couldn't understand it. Uh-huh. Finally, I went up to see who it was. Noise came from Ross's apartment. Mm -hmm. I knocked, but there wasn't any answer, so I unlocked the door and went in. I thought something was wrong. And that's when I saw her. I see. She was lying on bed. Right away, I called the police. Now, before you went up, did you hear any other noises? Any sound of a struggle, anything like that, maybe? No, just the water running. Well, how about the shot, ma'am? You hear that? No, no, I didn't. A lot of shooting in the picture I was watching. Did you touch anything in the room? No, I turned the lights, but that's all. Room was dark when I went in. Just turned on the lights, and then I called you. According to our report, there wasn't any purse found with the body. Did you see one when you went in there? I didn't. But if I had, you'd gotten it. What are you trying to say? That I stole her purse? Is that what you're trying no, to say? No, ma'am, that's not what we're trying to say. Better not. 
I've got a reputation in this town. I know a lot of big people. I'm not going to have you come in here and call me a thief. Well, we didn't mean to offend you, ma'am. Mm-hmm. Who has a key to Mitchell's place besides him, ma'am? No one. He's got the only one. I don't like a lot of keys to the rooms out. I tell all the tenants that. Have you got any idea how the girl might have gotten into the room? No. Do you know who the gun belonged to? Yes, it was Ross's. You're pretty sure about that, are you? Yes, I saw it when he moved in. Commented on it then. He said that he'd had it since he was a kid. Kept it out of sentiment. Mm -hmm. now, what's this all about, anyway? You seem to think that there's something wrong. Is that it? No, ma'am. It's just that in things like this, we have to make a complete investigation. You can understand. Oh, well, I want to do all I can to help you, but I do have an appointment. If there's nothing more you want, I'd like to be going. That's all right, Miss Keene. If we want to talk to you, we'll be able to reach you here? Yes, right here. We'll give you a call to tell you about the inquest. Am I going to have to be there? Yes, ma'am. You and Mitchell. Why him? Well, it was his apartment, ma'am. But he didn't have anything to do with well, it. Well, maybe so, ma'am, but he'll still have to be there. It's not fair. A thing like this can ruin him. By the time the papers get through with it, he'll be finished. It can ruin his career. He doesn't know anything about it. He won't be able to tell you anything. Well, you're wrong there, ma'am. Huh? He's got a lot to explain. We went upstairs and met the officer staked out in the room and looked at the apartment where the girl had been found. 9.20 a.m. We gave our card to Thelma Keene and asked her to call us if she thought of anything else. We also asked her to notify us immediately in the event she heard from Mitchell. The stakeout on the room continued. 9.52 a.m. We drove over to the coffee shop on West 7th Street to talk to the girl's friend, Peggy Rockwell. We found her in the back of the place typing out the day's menus. What about Gloria? Something wrong? When was the last time you saw her, miss? Well, let's see. Saturday night, she stayed at my house. Left about noon on Sunday. I had the day off. Figured that maybe we'd do something, but Gloria said she had something to do. Last I saw her was on Sunday morning. You know a man named Ross Mitchell? That bum. Why do you say that, Miss Rockwell? Because he is. Real no good. You pretty friendly with Miss Paul? Well, Gloria thought so. Turned out he was just using her. Well, how do you mean? Thought at first she could get him some jobs. Turned out when he could do better, he dropped her. They were going to get married, and then he thought he could do better, so he dropped her. Mm-hmm. Say, do you mind if I go ahead with these menus? The boss will be sore if I don't get through with them. No, you go right ahead, miss. We can talk while I'm doing it. Yes, ma'am. I took a course once, touch typing. Didn't think I'd ever use it. Boy, was I fooled. You go right ahead, miss. Well, this Ross really gave her the rush. Had her take him around, introduce him to her friends. She got him a couple of jobs. She's the one who introduced him to Mike. Mike? Yeah, Mike Cowell. That's Ross's agent. Peggy set it up. She's done just about everything for him. Then the bum acts like this. What do you mean, miss? Treated her so bad. Say, how do you spell croquettes? Well, I, I think it's C-R-O-Q-U-E-T-T-E-S. O Q E T T E S. Turkey. They had roast turkey last night. I don't understand how people can eat them, but we sure sell a lot of them. Did Miss Paul say she was going to see Ross over the weekend? Yeah. She said she had an appointment with him Sunday. Said she'd called him and set it up. You know what time? No, just said she wasn't going on like this. Had to be straightened out. Mm -hmm. I don't blame her. She's told her friends they were going to get married, and at the last minute, Ross would back out. Her family know about Ross? No. Father didn't mind her doing a little work in show business, but he didn't want her to marry anyone in it. She thought that if they just got married, then the family would understand. Joe. Yeah. I'll call the crime lab, see if they've finished. Yeah, fine. Thanks. How did Miss Paul and Mitchell seem to get along, ma'am? What do you mean? Well, did they have any arguments or disagreements, would mm, you know? Not often. Most of the trouble they had was about getting married. Ross kept saying that it wouldn't do him any good to be married now. He thought that it might hurt his career. That's all he thought about. Were you ever present in any of these arguments? Once. We'd gone out on a double date, went to a place down at the beach... Had dinner and then stopped on the way back for a couple of drinks. Uh -huh. Ross got pretty drunk, got into a big thing about his career. Yeah. He went on and on about how hard he'd work, how much the theater meant to him, all that kind of stuff. I see. Finally, he said right out they would kill anyone who tried to stop him just like that. He'd kill anyone who tried to stop him. Joe, yeah. See you a minute. Would you excuse me, please? Sure. Uh, just a minute. Yeah. Um, is there one L or two L's in broccoli? Just one, ma'am. Oh, thanks. Yeah. Just talked to Lee Jones. Yeah, did he finish up? Yeah, something's wrong. What's that? He thinks the girl was murdered. You are listening to Dragnet, 
the authentic story of your police force in action. Years ahead of them all. Chesterfield is years ahead of all cigarettes. Chesterfield quality is highest. Here's the proof. Recent chemical analyses give an index of good quality for the country's six leading cigarette brands. The index of good quality table, which is a ratio of high sugar to low nicotine, shows Chesterfield quality highest. Chesterfield quality highest. Fifteen percent higher than its nearest competitor. Chesterfield quality highest. Thirty-one percent higher than the average of the five other leading brands. Don't you want to try a cigarette with a record like this? Chesterfield. First with premium quality and best for you. Try Chesterfield today, regular or king size. Ten thirty-seven a.m. We drove to the crime lab and talked with Sergeant J. Allen. He told us that when they checked for powder burns on the body, they hadn't found any. They measured the reach of the dead girl and found that it would have been almost impossible for her to have pulled the trigger on the rifle, leaving the fingerprints they found on the gun. Water test failed to show any traces of nitrate powder on her hands. They checked the handwriting on the suicide note found in the room against samples of Gloria Paul's writing and found that they didn't match. From their findings, they said that it was their opinion that the girl had not killed herself, that she'd been murdered. We went back to the city hall and got out a local and an APB on Ross Mitchell. We called the landlady of his rooming house. She hadn't heard from him. 12.30 p.m., we went back to the rooming house and relieved the stakeout. We asked the landlady not to say anything to Mitchell about our being there. 12.45 p.m., still no sign of the suspect. 1 o'clock, 1.30. Who are you? What are you doing in my place? Come on in. Who are you? Police officers, come on in. Close that door. Put that suitcase down. What's this all about, anyway? What have you guys been doing here? The place is You, all Ross Mitchell? Up. Yeah, why? You know a girl named Gloria Paul? What's she got to do with it? You know her? Yeah, I know her. When's the last time you saw her? Say, what's this all about? What's all these questions? When was the last time you saw Gloria Paul? Friday night, I guess. Don't you know for sure? All right, Friday night. You haven't seen her since? I told you, the last time was Friday you night. You didn't see her Sunday? No. Where were you Saturday and Sunday? Out of town. Where? La Cunada. Can you prove you were there? Why? Can you prove you were there? I don't like all this. You guys coming in here asking a lot of questions. What are you trying to prove? Who are you staying with? A friend of mine. What's his name? I'm not going to have him dragged into this. You haven't got any choice. Well, that's what you say. You haven't told me what this is all about. I'm not telling you anything. Will you tell now me? you look, Mitchell, understand this. We're not here to pass the time of day. You better come up with some answers quick. Now, who are you with? friend of mine, guy named Sid Austin. What's his phone number? You going to call him? We've got to check your alibi. Now, what's his number? Won't do any good to call him. Thought you said you were there. I was. Then we got to call him. Well, he won't be able to tell you anything. He wasn't there. He just let me use his place. There wasn't anybody there. Who's got a key to this place besides you? You mean here? That's right. Nobody. You got the only key, huh? That's right. The landlady's got one, just the two of them. You got any idea how somebody else could get in here? No. Why? How well do you know Gloria Paul? What's she got to do with it? How well do you know her? We used to go together. Anything serious between you? She thought we might get married. How'd you feel about it? I don't think that's any of your business. Maybe it is. How'd you feel about it? I liked her. She was a nice kid. Nothing more. No. Now you look. I think it's about time you told me what this is all about. Something to do with Gloria, is that it? That's right. What? She's dead. Huh. All right. Can I please have a cigarette? Yeah. Here. Here's a match. Thanks. How'd it happen? Thought maybe you could tell us. Why'd you figure that? Where'd you see her last? Up here. This room? Yeah. When was that? I told you, Friday night. Do you have any trouble with her? No. No argument? I told you no. Well, how'd it happen? Can't you tell me? You own a twenty-two rifle? Yeah. You got bullets for it? Yeah, why? Where do you keep it? Closet over there. You keep it loaded? No, the bullets are on the shelf in the closet. All right, come on, Ross. We better go downtown. What for? I want to talk to you. What for? You got to tell me before I have to go. You got to tell me what you're holding me for. Suspicion of murder. Now, come on. taking him? Downtown. Why? We want to talk to him. You didn't have anything to do with it, did you, Ross? I don't even know what this is all about. All I know is that Gloria's dead. She killed herself in your room. What? In your room, Ross. It was suicide. Well, they're arresting me for murder. Oh, you can't do that. Ross didn't have anything to do with it. It was suicide. That's what you said. All right, come on, Mitchell. Well, you can't do that. It was suicide. You want to take him out of the car, Frank? Yeah. Come on. You can see that you're making a mistake. He didn't have anything to do with it. He's going to have enough trouble with that girl killing herself in his apartment. You can't arrest him for murder. It was suicide. 
What are you trying to tell us, lady? What? Something you want to say here? No, you're making things up. All right, let's go. Yes. Yes, go ahead, take him, go ahead. If he wants to be a star, let him. Go ahead and take him and serve him right. The way he treats people. I tried to help him. God knows I tried. Got him to meet a lot of important people, a lot of contacts. You think he was interested? You bet he was. How does he show it? I'll tell you how. He thanks me for all I've done for him by running around. Chasing after that young nobody, that Gloria. I tried to reason with her. Tried to talk some sense into her. Told her that she couldn't do anything for him. Told her that I could make him a star bigger than anybody. She said she loved him. She doesn't know how to love. You want to go ahead? Came over here all the time begging Ross to marry her. I told her to get out of his life and stay out to leave him alone. He didn't need her. When was all this? Sunday evening she came here all dressed up. Oh, when they're young, they know everything. I'm one of the biggest stars this town ever had. She's a nobody. I know what's good for that boy. Didn't you tell us you didn't see the girl Sunday, isn't that right? That's what I said. Did you see her Sunday? Yes, I did. She wanted me to let her into Ross's apartment. I told her he wasn't there. She said it didn't make any difference. She'd wait for him. No. Yeah. I told her to leave him alone. She didn't understand him. Didn't know how to take care of him. I know the right people. He could have written his own ticket in this town. He could have been big. You don't want him. I killed her. All right. Do you want to get a coat, ma'am? Yes. It doesn't make any difference. I did it to help him. I thought you'd think it was suicide. I didn't think you'd figure anything else. You wrote the note, did you? I did. That's what you've got to understand. For him, that was all that counted. He'd married her and he'd been through. I had to stop it. I didn't want to kill her. But you can see I couldn't let him marry her. Ross is a fine actor. Real talent. Doesn't come along often. All right, lady. Let's go. He'll understand, won't he? He'll know why I did it. He'll understand. I wouldn't know, ma'am. Huh? We'll let you ask him. The story you have just heard is true. The names were changed to protect the innocent. On October 14th, trial was held in Department 89, Superior Court of the State of California, in and for the County of Los Angeles. In a moment, the results of that trial. Now, here is our star, Jack Webb. Thank you, George Fenneman. Friends, Dragnet Radio is taking a summer vacation. We'll be back in the fall. George Fenneman will tell you all about that in a minute. Meanwhile, I hope you'll watch our TV show regularly, and I also hope that all of you who are not Chesterfield smokers will try them. I like to feel that when we resume broadcasting in the fall, every one of you will have switched to Chesterfield. You'll find they're best for you. And, of course, when you go on that vacation this summer, be sure to take along a couple of cartons, will you? Chesterfield. We all hope you have a very pleasant summer. Thelma Alice Keene was tried and convicted of murder in the first degree. She was sentenced to life imprisonment in the California Institute for Women, Corona, California. just heard Dragnet, a series of authentic cases from official files. Technical advice comes from the office of Chief of Police W.H. Parker, Los Angeles Police Department. Technical advisors, Captain Jack Donahoe, Sergeant Marty Wynn, Sergeant Vance Brasher. Heard tonight were Ben Alexander, Virginia Gregg, Vic Perrin. Script by John Robinson, Ben Alexander. Music by Walter Schumann. Hal Gibney speaking. For a million laughs, tune in Chesterfield's Martin and Lewis show Tuesday on this same NBC station. And sound off for Chesterfield's, either regular or king size. You'll find premium quality Chesterfield's much milder. Chesterfield is best for you. 
By special request, Dragnet is being sent to our servicemen and women all over the world. Chesterfield has brought you Dragnet transcribed from Los Angeles. Tonight, ladies and gentlemen, Dragnet leaves radio for the rest of the summer. We'll be back early in September. Watch then for our return. Check the radio listings of your newspaper for the day and time. Please note, however, that if Dragnet is seen on television in your community, it will continue throughout the summer. Have you tried new cork-tipped Fatima? It's the smooth smoke. Here's why. New Fatima tips of perfect cork. King size for longer filtering. And Fatima quality for a much better flavor and aroma. Remember, Fatima has the tip for your lips. Try new Fatima. See how smooth it is. Fatima is made by the makers of Chesterfield, Liggett and Myers, one of tobacco's most respected names. Sound off for Chesterfield. Low in nicotine, highest in quality, best for you. Chesterfield brings you Dragnet. Ladies and gentlemen, the story you are about to hear is true. The names have been changed to protect the innocent. You're a detective sergeant. You're assigned a robbery detail. For the past three weeks, a lone thief has been victimizing stores and check-cashing agencies. You've got a description of the man, but so far you've failed to identify him. Your job? Get him. Before you buy your next pack of cigarettes, think this over. A doctor has been examining a group of Chesterfield smokers with special attention to the nose, throat, and sinuses. His latest report, after a full year and a half, says no adverse effects from smoking Chesterfield. Don't you want to try a cigarette with a record like this? Chesterfield, regular or king size, they're low in nicotine, highest in quality, best for you. Dragnet, the documented drama of an actual crime. For the next 30 minutes, in cooperation with the Los Angeles Police Department, you will travel step by step on the side of the law through an actual case transcribed from official police files. From beginning to end, from crime to punishment, Dragnet is the story of your police force in action. It was Friday, June 10th. It was warm in Los Angeles. We were working the day watch out of robbery detail. My partner's Frank Smith. The boss is Chief of Detective Stad Brown. My name's Friday. We'd gotten a call that there'd been a holdup, and it was 10.36 a.m. when we got to the corner of Alvarado and Catalina Streets, the Harrison Check Cashing Agency. I'm sorry. You'll have to come back. We've had some trouble, and we're not open for business. Come back in the barn now. Police officer, sir. Oh, well, where have you been? I was held up, you know, held right up. Yes, sir. Yeah, fellows in the police car was here, and they told me that you'd come out. Well, where have you been? It's taken you long enough. Did, didn't you use the siren? Yes, sir. We came out just as soon as we got the call. Just seems us taxpayers would get better service than that. Well, now, sir, the call just came in four minutes ago. Oh, well, all right then. Well, now, let me tell you all about it. Yes, sir, if you would, please. Oh, you just bet I would. Well, now, first off, I had trouble sleeping last night. I knew right off it was going to be a bad day. I can always tell, you know, when I've had a bad night, the next day's always a doozy. Did you give the officers in the radio car a description of the man? Who yeah, you? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. I sure did. I gave it to them right off. Now, are you going to let me tell you all about the holdup? Yes, sir. If you go ahead, please. Well, I had a bad night. Real bad. I knew... Oh, oh, say, say, my, my name's Harrison. Avril Harrison. I don't think I got you a fellow's name. Oh, this is my partner, Frank Smith. My name's Friday. Oh, how well, do you well, do? Well, glad to know you, yeah. Darn fool next door kept pounding the typewriter all night. He never let up. Sir? The man next door. That's why I didn't get any sleep. Some crackpot trying to be a writer. Oh, it's an awful thing. All night long. Dit, 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 ding, dit, dit, ding. All night. Not a wink of sleep. Yes, sir. If you just tell us about the robbery, please. You ain't interested, huh? 
Well, no, sir, it isn't that. It's just that the more time we lose here, the harder it's going to be to apprehend the suspect. You can understand that. Oh, well, yeah. Now, maybe if you just answer some questions for us, it might be easier and possibly a little faster. Huh? Okay. Far away. What time did the man come in? About 10, 12. Was he alone? Yep. Did it look like there might have been anybody else with him? Nope. Do you know if he drove an automobile? Couldn't tell. I see. Well, would you tell us exactly what he said and what he did from the time that you first saw him? Came in, 10, 12, had a gun, walked over to me, pointed the gun, told me to stick up. <laughs> that the way you fellows want it? Well, you just relax, Harrison, will you, and tell the story in your own words. I'm trying to do just that. Yes, sir. Maybe if I went slower, it'll be easier for you boys. All right, sir, you go right ahead. Well, he came in, stood around for a minute, then come over to the counter. I asked him if I could help him. Uh-huh. We cashed checks, you know, payroll checks. First off, I thought that's what he wanted, to cash a check. Wasn't, though. I asked him what he wanted, and he pulled out the gun, told me to keep quiet and hand him the money. Pointed the gun right at my heart, right here. My heart. Are you with me so far, boys? Yes, sir, go ahead. So I gave him the money, all there was in the drawer. I see, sir. About how much was taken, Mr. Harrison? About $1,500. He just took the paper money. He didn't want the silver. Had two paper bags. Looked like he'd carried his lunch in them. All kind of wrinkled, you know. Yes, sir. Had me put the money in them. Then he told me to lay down on the floor. Lay there and count to a hundred. Buy ones. Told me not to move until I'd finished. He said if I did, he'd come back and kill me. The way he told me, you knew he meant it. After that, he left. All right, sir. What if you can give us a description of the man? Sure, but I already gave one to the other cops. Ain't that enough? Well, we'd like to have you tell us, if you would, Mr. Harrison. Oh, them other fellows don't work with you, huh? Well, yes, sir, they do. But we'd just like you to describe the man to us. Well, what's the matter? What they tell you? Well, yes, Mr. Harrison, they'll tell us, but the questions they ask you are for getting out of broadcast. We have to fill out a report and try to get the man who did this. Oh. <laughs> Seems like a pretty funny way to operate. Don't tell the other cops what's going on. How tall was the man, Harrison? Well, let's see. I'd say about, ooh, five feet, maybe eight to ten inches. Mm hmm How much did he weigh, would you know? I'm just guessing, you know, see, I'm not sure. Yes, sir, we understand. Well, I'd say he weighed maybe, oh, 150, right around in there. How old was he, would you know? Maybe 25, 26. How about his coloring? Was he dark or light complexion? No, dark. He had black hair, brown eyes, mean-looking eyes, like steel balls. Kind you pick up with vacuum cleaners, steel, hard. Yes, sir. How was he dressed? Had a pair of Levi's on. Levi's and a blue shirt. He had a brown leather jacket on, too. One with a fur collar. Was he clean-shaven? Oh, yes. His face looked like he just had a shave. And the talcum powder on it. Mm -hmm. Do you wear glasses, sir? Yeah. What kind were they? I couldn't tell you. Just glasses. Well, do they have metal or plastic frames? Oh, plastic, yes. Mm -hmm. Light, you know, kind of tan plastic. Heavy. You know, the kind that don't have the little curly things around the ears. Just big pieces that went over the top. Mm -hmm. Did the man touch anything with his hands? No, no, he didn't. The other officers asked me that, too. He didn't touch a thing. Was anybody else present at the time? No, no one else. I was the only one here. Well, the man have any marks or scars that you noticed? No, leastways not that I saw. Was there anything unusual about him? Anything that might help us identify him? Mm, well, that mustache should help. Sir? His mustache. I think it's phonier than a three-dollar bill. Looked like it to me. Well, I thought you said the man was clean-shaven. I did. All around the mustache. I didn't think he meant like that. He's probably clean-shaven under that, too. Sure looked phony to me. Why do you say that? It was red. He was dark. Had black hair, black eyebrows. Well, it seemed like he'd come up with a red mustache. <laughs> seemed like it to you? It's hard to say, sir. Well, it seemed like it to me. Not at all. I'll tell you something else. What's that, sir? I think them glasses was fake, too. Glasses them was funny, you know, like it hadn't been ground, kind of flat. I think they was phony, just like the duster. Duster? Mustache. Red mustache with black hair. Phony. All right, sir. Thank you very much. And we'd like you to come down to the office and look at some other pictures, if you would, see if you can identify the man. Be glad to. Well, I'll not do it today, though. Why is that, sir? Well, I already told you. You had a picture of him down there. I'd probably miss him. This has been a real bad day for me. Ah, well, tomorrow will be better, though. Why is that, sir? Going to get some sleep tonight. That's so? Bribe the landlady. Yeah. She left me in his room. I took it. What's that, sir? Ain't gonna do much typing without his ribbon, is he? For the past three weeks, we'd heard the same story. A man had entered a check-cashing agency or a small neighborhood store and at gunpoint taken all the currency. Each time, he'd hit just after the owner or the manager had come back from the bank. The descriptions we'd gotten in each theft was the same. 
Each of the victims looked over the mug books, but they were unable to identify the suspect. The stats office had made an M.O. run going back ten years. The leads they turned up were run down, but they led us nowhere. Communications to George Brereton up at CII in Sacramento had turned up no new information. We were right where we were after the first robbery. We had a suspect we couldn't identify, a suspect that we couldn't find. 10.45 a.m., the latest victim closed up his place of business and started to accompany us downtown. As we walked out of the store, a police car pulled up to the curb. In the back seat was a man of about 25 years of age. The officer told us that they'd caught the man running down an alley three blocks away. The man who matched the description of the thief identified himself as Rudy Martin. While the radio car officer stood by, we took the suspect over to our car to see Averill Harrison, the victim. Caught him already, huh? Is this the man who held you up, sir? Uh, let me get out and take a good look. All right. Mm-hmm. 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 Tell him to turn sideways, north and south. All right, sir. No, no, I'll turn sideways. That's him. Are you sure? That's the man, even without his mustache and glasses, I can tell. He's lying. He don't know what he's saying. Don't you talk that way to me, young fella. And where's my money, huh? What'd you do with my money? I haven't got it. I never took any money from you or anybody else. You're crazy. I'll teach you to talk to All me right, like Harrison. that. All right, Never mind. Now, if we need anything more, we'll be back to talk to you. You mean you ain't going to take me downtown now that you caught the fellow? No, sir, we'll get in touch with you later. You make him tell you where he hid the money. Fifteen hundred dollars, all in paper. You make him tell you. All right, sir, we'll do that. Thank you very much. Yeah. Well, I'll be right here. Anything you want me to do, just give a holler. I want to see this fellow get what's coming to him. Yes, sir. Here's our card, and you call us if you need to. Yeah, you do that. Make him tell you what he done with the money. All right, you want to get back, Martin? I'll check with the radio car, Joe. You want him to follow us to the office? Yeah, tell him we'll take Martin here to the robbery division. We'll check him later. Right. All right, Martin, put your hands up as high as you can. With handcuffs on? With them on. You ain't going to find anything. All right, get them up. See, I told you. This is a bad thing that man did. I haven't done anything to him. I didn't take his money. Come back, Martin. Back in the seat. You ever seen that man before? No. No, I haven't. Is he mad at you for any reason? I told you, I never saw him before. Well, he says he knows you. He says you held him up a little while ago. He's crazy. Why did he say something like that without a reason? I don't know. Your wallet back here? Yeah. All right, slide up a little. Any money in it? No, all I got some change, maybe 40, 50 cents. Just a few cards there and a couple of phone numbers, that's all. There's no money. Mm-hmm. Who's this? This is Johnny Salvatore. He's a friend of mine. Chris Turan. Another friend. They haven't done nothing. They're both nice guys. And look, you got no right to do this. You got no right to arrest me. I just want to talk to you. If you haven't done anything wrong, then you haven't got anything to worry about, have you? That sounds good, but what am I doing sitting here in his car with you? All right, now tell us the real story, huh? I have nothing to tell. I was over by Central Avenue when these two cops came by and picked me up. I wasn't doing anything. Officers say you were running down an alley. They say that you wouldn't stop when they told you to. Now, how about all that? I was scared. You can see how that had happened, can't you? What'd you do with the gun? Wasn't any gun. The victim says it was. I don't know what you're talking about. You registered for the draft, Martin? Yeah. Well, where's your draft card? Isn't it in the wallet? No, it isn't. Guess I must have lost it. You ever been arrested? Did you hear me, Martin? Hmm? How about it? Yeah, a couple of times. What for? Back. Where? Here, back east. Where back east? KC. You sure that's all? Yeah. What were you doing in that alley this morning? I was on my way to see a guy. Who? A friend of mine. Okay, Joe. Yeah? I'll call in. We can get started. Right. 1K80 to control 1, 1K80 to control 1. Control 1 to 1K80, go ahead. Prisoner in custody, show us out to room 27A, City Hall, KMA 367. Roger, 1K80, KMA 367. You all set? Yeah, let's go. Now, who's this friend you're going to see, Martin? You have to know that? We have to know. Chris Tarrant. What are we going to see him about? job. He said he could line one up for him. Where do you live? Room and house down on wall. All right. You want to tell us what you did with that money? What money? I don't know how to tell you any better. I didn't have anything to do with that guy. I don't know nothing about any robbery. I was on my way to see a friend about a job. A couple of cops picked me up. That's all there is to it. Nothing more. Now, if you think you can make this thing stick, then you go right ahead. I don't think you can. Well, we got a lot of time, Martin. So have I. I got nothing to do. Night's sleep and a couple of meals. That's what I stand to come up with. I got no problems. Go ahead. Lock me up. 
You're going to have to let me go. I don't care what the old guy says. I didn't hold him up. Not him nor anybody else can say I did. The clothes you got on match the ones the hold-up man wore. So what? A lot of people wear these kind of clothes. The victim identified you. The guy made a mistake. I told you that. All right, Martin, you called it. I hope you know what you're talking about. Hmm? The victim of the robbery identified you, and there's five more we think we can tie you into. We make you on the rest of them. You've got real trouble here. Now, you'll save us and yourself a lot of time if you'll tell us the truth. You wouldn't know it if you saw it. Well, there's one way to find out, isn't there? Yeah. Try us. Ten fifty-two a.m. We took the suspect back to the city hall and we talked to him for over three hours. He refused to admit any knowledge of the holdups. We checked him through R and I and we came up with the arrest record that he told us about. In checking his record, we found that the suspect was wanted for draft evasion. In the meantime, the other victims of the holdup man had been brought down to the office. The suspect was placed in a show-up with several other persons. They all failed to identify Martin as the thief. In checking further with the last victim, Harrison, he stated that he'd probably made a wrong identification. We had a search of Martin's room made, but we were unable to come up with anything. The two friends he'd mentioned were checked out, but there was no record on either one of them. The suspect was turned over to the federal authorities for prosecution on the draft evasion charge. We were right back where we started three weeks before. The next morning, Saturday, June 11th, we started all over again. This time we went back into the files 15 years. Anybody who even vaguely matched the description was checked out. The M.O. of the thief was rechecked. The machines came up with an additional 17 possibles. Each of these were checked out. It took us two weeks, and at the end of that time, we were back where we started again. We had nothing but a description that apparently didn't match anybody in our files and an M.O. that didn't fit any known criminal. During the time that we'd been checking out leads, the bandit was inactive. Additional cars from Metro Division had been assigned to the detail, and rolling stakeouts were maintained around check-cashing agencies throughout the city. The hold-up man had apparently dropped from sight. Saturday, June 25th, I checked into the office. Robbery, Smith. Yeah. Oh, yeah, Ben. Huh? Oh, just a minute. Little John. You see him, Joe? No, I don't think he's here. Little John? No, he's not here. No, Ben, he isn't here. All right, wait a minute. I'll check the book. Yeah, here. No, I left about an hour ago. Yeah, I'll be back. Want to call you? Okay, wait a minute. Here's a pencil. Uh Uh-huh. 0281. Right, yeah. Okay, Ben. I got something here. Teletype from San Diego from Hewan and Davis. Yeah, what is it? I'll read it to you. RE, your APB, dated June 10th, RE robbery. Robbery occurred this city last night. MO and description matches your suspect. We have identification as Jerry Lane. San Diego number 146382. Are sending mug shots. Huh, looks like a break. Well, it might have been. You didn't let me finish. Yeah. He got away. p.m. A special delivery letter arrived from San Diego with the mug shots of Jerry Lane. There was also a note from Sergeant Carl Davis. He explained that the suspect had held up a small liquor store in the city and had badly beaten the owner. A witness was shown the mug books and was able to pick out the bandit. He was identified as a Jerry Lane. He had only one arrest record, and that was for a misdemeanor offense in San Diego County. We checked the name through our identification bureau, but there was no record on him in our files. The mug shots from San Diego had been taken over four years previously, but the victims of the robberies in Los Angeles had no trouble identifying it, even without the glasses and the mustache. Additional broadcasts were gotten out carrying the name, and radiograms were sent to Washington and to Sacramento requesting any available information. Another week passed while the search went on. During that time, the holdup man hit once more, this time in National City, just south of San Diego. From the reports we got, the M.O. matched the one previously used. The suspect made good his escape. Tuesday morning, 11.30 a.m., Frank and I had been out running down a lead. We just got back to the office. Well, there's another one that didn't go anyplace. Yeah? You know, Joe, if somebody could figure out a way to filter out the bad leads, it'd sure save a lot of legwork, wouldn't it? Yeah, I guess I'll get it. Robbery Friday. Yeah, all right. It's Hewan. Yeah? Hi, Pappy. Yeah. When was that? Yeah, anything on him? Mm-hmm. Yeah, well, you're probably right. Well, I guess the only thing we can do is put out another broadcast. Yeah. No, nothing up here. What'd you say? Right, yeah. Well, if anything else turns up, let us know, will you? Right. Oh, wait a minute. Say hello to Carl. All right, Pappy. Yeah, we'll be talking to you. Right. Thanks. Bye. What's he got? Well, it's our suspect, Jerry Lane. Yeah? He's going to have to stand for more than a 211 charge now. What do you mean? Latest victim just died.
You are listening to Dragnet, the authentic story of your police force in action. It's so satisfying to know that my Chesterfield is low in nicotine, highest in quality. Chesterfield, low in nicotine, highest in quality. A fact proved by chemical analyses of the country's six leading cigarette brands. And it's so satisfying to know that a doctor who has been making thorough examinations, especially of the nose, throat, and sinuses, reports no adverse effects from smoking Chesterfields. His report is a part of a program supervised by a responsible research laboratory and is based on thorough bi-monthly examinations of a group of Chesterfield smokers over a period of a year and a half. That's 18 full months now. Don't you want to smoke a cigarette with a record like this? Regular or king size. Chesterfield is low in nicotine, highest in quality. Best for me, best for you. From the information we got on the phone, it looked like Jerry Lane would be headed for Los Angeles. One of the witnesses to the latest robbery said that the suspect drove away in either a 1942 Plymouth or a Dodge Coupe. The color of the car was listed as either a dark blue or black. Descriptions of the car and of the suspect were printed up and distributed to all law enforcement agencies between Los Angeles and the Mexican border. Al Gayton from the San Diego Department got in touch with the Mexican authorities and a close check was kept on all cars crossing into Mexico. According to our information, Jerry Lane had robbed at least eight places and stolen a little under $9,000 in a period of six weeks. While we continued our investigation, the San Diego authorities followed up the leads they had. In the course of checking out the friends and associates listed on Lane's arrest record, they came up with the information that he had at one time been employed as a musician in a downtown nightclub. They interviewed the employees of the place, but they were not able to get a definite lead on the suspect. With the mugshot that they'd sent us, and knowing that he was a professional musician, we checked with the local office of the Musicians' Union. They told us that he was not in good standing, and they were unable to give us the address of the suspect, but they did give us the name and address of a bar where he'd worked several years before. At 8.30 p.m. that night, Frank and I talked to one of the waitresses in the place. No, they cut out the band a year or so ago. Not enough business to keep it going. Uh Uh-huh. Did you work here when they did have a band? Sure. I've been here since they remodeled the place. Been four years, anyway. Hey, you fellas like a drink? Be on the house. No, thank you. No, ma'am. You know a man named Jerry Lane? What does he do? Well, he's a musician. We understand he plays clarinet. Lane? Yeah, it seems to me I do remember him. Not too tall, kind of nice looking if you went for the tight. Yeah, I remember him. You know where we can get in touch with him? No, I haven't got the slightest idea. Got to be a pretty big lush. Had to let him go. Union told him, lay off the booze, but he didn't pay no attention. Always showing up late. A real lush. Possible the owner might know where he is? It isn't likely. I'm married to the owner. I know most of the stuff that goes on around here. I see. Can you give us any idea where we might be able to get a lead on him? Some of his friends? Maybe another musician? No. Hey, wait a minute. Ma'am? I might know someone. Let me make a phone call. Well, if you give us the phone number, we can put in the call. No, I'd rather not do that. You see, this girl used to see a lot of Jerry. Maybe she don't want to get mixed up in a thing like this. I'll call her and find out. If she knows, she'll tell me. If she doesn't, there's no harm done. Okay. Got a dime? Just a minute. There's two nickels. Mm, thanks. I'd rather you leave the door open, if you will. All right. Hello. May I speak to Betty Hodgen, please? Yeah. All right. They're calling her. Good. Nice girl. Never figured out what she saw in Jerry. Mm-hmm. Hello, Betty? Betty, this is Naomi. Um, just fine. You? Oh, yeah, he's fine. <laughs> Say, Betty, I hate to bother you, but do you know where I can get in touch with Jerry Lane? Yeah. Uh-huh. Yeah, wait a minute. Have you got a pencil? Yeah. Here you go. Now, now what's the address, Betty? Uh-huh. Yeah, I got it. No, no, it's nothing serious, no. <laughs> no, business isn't that good. Yeah, we still got the piano. Sure, I'm gonna keep it. All right. Well, thanks, Betty. You guys are in luck. Yes, ma'am. Here's the address. It's a club down on 6th. Mm-hmm. Betty says he's there almost every night. 9.42 p.m. We called the office and had another team of men sent out. We notified homicide detail that we'd picked up another lead, and they sent out a team of men to give us any help that we might need in apprehending the suspect. 
The address we'd been given was the Georgetown Club, a small place on West 6th Street. When we got there, the place was crowded and the band was in the middle of the second set. We checked with one of the bartenders. Sure. That's Jerry playing clarinet. See? Gray suit. Yeah, does he work here? No, he shows up almost every night, sits in with the band. Union doesn't like it. They talk to the boss about it. He's trying to get the bomb out of here. Costs a lot of trouble. That right? Sure. Always he comes in drunk or else he acts like he's high on toll. You want me to get him for you? Yeah, tell him there are a couple of friends who'd like to talk to him, will you? I'll do it right now. Uh, you don't want me to say you're cops? No, we don't. I didn't think so. Okay, I get it. Thank you. Some place they got here, huh? Yeah, sure is crowded, isn't it? All right. You better watch him. He's probably armed. Yeah, let's get him outside. It'd be easier to take there. Too many people here. Yeah, the bartender's got him now. Now let's let him get outside before we move away. Right. Yeah, there he goes. Come on. Yeah. Sure. Well, where are they? You said a couple of friends. Where are they? You said they would be here. Now wait a minute. Here they are. Oh. Oh, uh, you? Where did I know you fellas from? You Jerry Lane? Yeah. What do you want to see me about? I got to get back in there. If you fellas don't need me no more, I'll get back to work, huh? No. Yeah, thanks a lot. Go ahead. No problem. All right, now, what's this all about? I don't know you guys. The police officers, you're under arrest. What for? Frank? Yeah. Stand still. What are you trying to do? You got nothing on me. Stand still. You stay away from me, cop. Now, leave me alone. All right, hold it up, mister. <laughs> <laughs> Come on, on your feet. Get up. Now stand still. Knees clean, Joe. Now put your hands behind you. I didn't do anything. You got no reason to shove me around. Cut my mouth. It's bleeding. Yeah, well, that makes two of us, mister. What are you after me for? What have I done? I have too much to drink. Is that it? I wouldn't bother anybody in there. That's a nice try, Lane, but it won't work. We got a half a dozen positive identifications on you for robbery. I didn't hurt anybody. You killed a man. Yeah. The last one, I, I heard he died. Is it true? Did he die? That's right. I didn't know what I was doing, you know. I, I wasn't responsible. I just didn't feel so good. It wasn't my fault. He wouldn't give me the money. I didn't know what I was doing. That's going to make a difference, isn't it? I didn't know what I was doing. I wouldn't know about that, Lane. It's going to be up to the jury, but you can bet on one thing. What's that? They'll know what they're doing. The story you have just heard is true. The names have been changed to protect the innocent. On December 17th, trial was held in Department 92, Superior Court of the State of California, in and for the County of Los Angeles. In a moment, the results of that trial. And now, here is our star, Jack Webb. Thank you, George Fenneman. Friends, the big Labor Day weekend is coming up, so make sure you have plenty of Chesterfields. Get a couple of cartons when you do your weekend shopping. Now, I can tell you why you should be smoking Chesterfields in just ten words. Chesterfield, low in nicotine, highest in quality, best for you. Gerald Carlisle Lane was tried and convicted of murder in the first degree and was executed in the lethal gas chamber at the state penitentiary, San Quentin, California. You have just heard Dragnet, a series of authentic cases from official files. Technical advice comes from the office of Chief of Police, W.H. Parker, Los Angeles Police Department. Technical advisors, Captain Jack Donahoe, Sergeant Marty Wynn, Sergeant Vance Brazier. Heard tonight were Ben Alexander, Vic Rodman, Lillian Bayef, Harry Bartell. Script by John Robinson. Music by Walter Schumann. Hal Gibney speaking. Watch an entirely new Dragnet case history each week on your local NBC television station. Please check your newspaper for the day and time. Chesterfield has brought you Dragnet transcribed from Los Angeles. Have you tried new cork-tipped Fatima? 
It's the smooth smoke. Here's why. New Fatima tips of perfect cork. King size for longer filtering. And Fatima quality for a much better flavor and aroma. Remember, Fatima has the tip for your lips. Try new Fatima. See how smooth it is. Fatima is made by the makers of Chesterfield, Liggett and Myers, one of tobacco's most respected names. (laughs) Thank <laughs> you.